Ask Reddit 2, Part 2. I shit you guys not. What I experienced with my cousins and friends in that cabin in the woods was some of the scariest shit I've ever witnessed. We were all there having a good time, not really paying attention to the fact that there were 12 people in the cabin. Even though we didn't all know each other that well, it wasn't until later that I realized that there was an extra person in the trailer with us for at least a day eating with us. I couldn't figure out who it was because nobody had interacted with them or even noticed their presence. The girl, Kiera, had been praying to Jesus, and we all went outside with big-ass sticks to investigate, but there was no one there. We counted again, and there were only 11 people. We went back into the trailer and locked the door, explaining what had happened. Kira said that she had realized it too, and that when she was about to say something, the extra person had grabbed her leg hard and leaned over toward her, saying something she couldn't even understand. We were all terrified as we huddled together, and eventually, I fell asleep. When I woke up, the sun was just coming up and half the people were asleep and the other half were up packing to leave. Some people still wanted to stay until the sun was all the way up, but I just wanted to get the fuck out of the woods. Kira said that she didn't want to be out in the woods alone for another night, so we decided to split up. Four people left, but I had to stay because I had the key to the cabin and I had to lock up. I was super pissed at this point because people weren't taking the situation seriously, and I decided I didn't want to be out in the woods for another night myself. I spent the rest of the day trying to convince the others to leave, but some people still wanted to stay in the woods. Tanner left with the others to go get a rifle and said he would be back. By 4 p.m., there were only seven of us left in the cabin, and Tanner still hadn't returned. We were all getting extremely fucking antsy, and the only reason I stopped begging them to go back was because Tanner had gone to go get a gun. At around 5 p.m., one of my cousins who had stayed with us said that Kira was outside by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. I was thinking to myself, why the hell would she come back if she was so scared? And then I got this nasty feeling in my gut. I realized I could smell just a twinge of the coppery smell that had been gone for quite some time now. I told the others what I'd noticed, but they all laughed, and they asked if I set this up to scare them. I asked them why the fuck I would do that, and one of the girls went outside to go get Kiera. She got halfway to her and stopped cold. Kiera started heaving. Sort of like if someone with their back turned was laughing without actually making any sound. It was then that I realized there wasn't a fucking sound in the whole woods. It was dead silent. This was in September. It was usually hot during the day, but chilly at night. You could usually hear big ass geese honking or some kind of bird or squirrels chit chatting. But there was no sound at all, and I started to panic. I stepped out of the door and told Kiara to come back in the fucking trailer right goddamn now. She backed up into the trailer and we locked the fucking door. We pulled down all the shades except for one and put a guy there in a chair to watch her. She stood there for another 20 minutes or so while we all huddled inside, nervously peeking through the shades. It was dead silent outside except for the occasional rustling of leaves in the wind. The only sound we could hear inside the trailer was the rapid beating of our own hearts. Eventually, the guy who was watching her turned to us and whispered that she was still there, standing motionless with her back to the cabin. I couldn't take it anymore and stepped out the door, yelling at her to come back inside right now. She slowly turned around, and as soon as I saw her face, my stomach dropped. It wasn't Kiara. The girl standing outside had the same pale skin and dark hair as Kiara, but her eyes were different. They were completely black, like giant pupils that took up her entire eye socket. She was staring right at me with the same slack-jawed expression, making me feel like I was the only thing in her universe. I could smell that same coppery smell again, only this time it was stronger. It was as if the scent was emanating from her. I yelled at her to leave, but she just stood there, swaying slightly back and forth. It was then that I realized there wasn't a sound in the whole forest. 
It was eerily quiet with no birds chirping or leaves rustling. All I could hear was the sound of my own breath and the pounding of my heart. I quickly backed into the trailer and locked the door, telling everyone to pull down all the shades except for one so we could keep an eye on her. We watched her through the window as she continued to stand there, staring blankly into the distance. I remember feeling like she was waiting for something or someone. I didn't know what to do, but I knew that we had to keep her out. After what seemed like an eternity, we heard a loud banging on the door. It was so forceful that the whole trailer shook. We all jumped up terrified, scrambling to find a place to hide. My cousin was holding on to one of the girls, while the other two were giggling nervously. Tan and I were frozen with fear, not knowing what to do. And then we heard Tan's voice outside, screaming to be let in and to stop fucking around. We all breathed a sigh of relief and quickly opened the door for him. Tan stumbled in, holding a rifle in his hand. He looked shaken and pale, as if he had just seen a ghost. He told us that he had just walked up to the campsite and saw a girl standing there, but it wasn't Kiara. He said she had turned towards him with a slack-jawed look and just stared him down, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said that it wasn't until he was almost halfway to the trailer that he realized that she was getting closer to him. She had started off by the fire, and without him even seeing her move, she had been turning, inching closer. He said he just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin thinking it would open, and when he got to the door it was locked. He turned and it was about halfway distance to the door, and as he finished his story, he looked around the room and then pulled me to his side, whispering in my ear, You know, there are only seven of us in here, right? My heart sank as I realized that he was right. The goat man had slipped back into the trailer while we were out sorting out who was going where, and then when we all went outside to talk earlier in the day, we looked out the window but there was no one out there. So we recounted everyone and realized that there were only seven of us in the cabin instead of eight. Tan had brought back a couple of boxes of ammo and his rifle, and he had told his dad that there were some kind of animals in the forest. But he didn't think that his dad would believe him if he said that it was a goat man. He said that his cousin was supposed to be coming down for a few hours, and in the morning we could all go back to his place, and his cousin would drive us back home. Now, I was really fucking terrified, but I at least felt better because we could be American and shoot the fuck out of whatever it was if it ever came back. However, my cousin got into a huge argument with one of the girls because she thought that I was trying to be funny and prank them, and that she was getting really scared, and that I wasn't funny. He kept telling her that I'm not that kind of person, and she said, well, how do we know the girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig? Or if it's really the goat man, how do we know that this is the real Tanner and that goat man just didn't kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So we fucking got into a huge argument about this where me and Tan were like, we could seriously be in danger because at the very least someone's been sneaking themselves into our fucking trailer without us knowing and mingling with us. And at worst, something bad is in the forest fucking with us. One of the girls was crying and saying that she wanted to go right now and we were trying to tell her that we shouldn't because none of us were walking through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point, the sun was starting to go down and it was getting a little cloudy out. We ate something and turned on the radio for a while, but we couldn't really get a station out there with anything decent. So we turned it off. At about the same time, Tan's cousin showed up. He was like 19, I think. And at this point, the sun was just barely over the horizon and he had one of those heavy-duty lantern flashlights and another rifle. He walked up to the trailer, and we whispered to Tan, asking if he was sure that that was his cousin, and he said yes. The guy looked behind him and all around the camp and then walked in. He kind of glanced at all of us and looked a little confused. He said, where's your other little buddy at? I figured she would meet up at this cabin. Is she a little slow or something? He also asked whether he had been cooking blood in the cabin because it smelt like blood and hot pans all the way up the trail. We were all like, nope. But we asked him what the fuck he was talking about with the girl that he saw. 
He had come down the same trail Tan had been using, and he had come upon one of Yu's guy's buddies standing in the middle of the trail, looking at him slack-jawed. He had asked her a bunch of questions, but all she said was nothing and just looked at him. Then she smiled at him, and he said he kept walking. She couldn't seem to keep up with him and kept lagging a little bit behind. He said he asked her if she was hurt or something, and if she needed any help, but she just continued to stare. And eventually, he had been walking and turned around a bend of the trail, but when he turned around and went back to see if she was okay, the trail was empty. He'd assumed maybe she had just taken some shortcut through the woods. We told him the whole story of what had been happening, and although we half expected him to say that we were full of shit, he just listened attentively and then sat down on the couches in the living room. We explained that we had noticed an extra person in the cabin who we couldn't identify, and that the girl Kiera had felt someone grab her leg and lean over toward her. But when she turned to look, no one was there. We also recounted how we had all gone outside and seen Kiara standing by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. And how she heaved and laughed without making any sound, while the woods remained eerily silent. Furthermore, we shared with him the encounter that Tanner had with a different girl in the woods, who had been staring at him slack-jawed, smiled, and then disappeared. We mentioned the strange coppery smell that had come and gone through the ordeal, and how we were all on edge and worried about what was happening. Tan's cousin listened intently and then suggested that we all stay together for the night and try to get some rest. He also mentioned that he had brought a rifle with him that he could keep watch throughout the night. We agreed that this was the best course of action and settled down, with everyone huddled together in the living room of the cabin. Despite our fear and anxiety, we managed to drift off to sleep, comforted by the presence of Tan's cousin and the knowledge that we were all together. However, peace was short-lived, as we were awoken in the middle of the night by a loud banging on the cabin door. We all jumped up in terror, unsure of what to do, but Tan's cousin quickly grabbed his rifle and headed toward the door. He cautiously peered out of the peephole, and then slowly opened the door, revealing a disheveled and frightened Kiara. She stumbled into the cabin and collapsed onto the couch, shaking and hyperventilating. We all gathered around her, trying to calm her down and find out what had happened. Through sobs and gasps, she recounted how she had been wandering in the woods and had gotten lost. She had been wandering aimlessly for what felt like hours when she suddenly heard the sound of footsteps behind her. She turned around to see a figure in the distance, but it was too dark to make out any details. The figure had started running towards her, and she had panicked and started running as well. She had eventually stumbled upon the cabin and had been relieved to see that the door was unlocked. As she finished her story, we all exchanged nervous glances, realizing that we were all still in grave danger. Despite our fear, we knew that we had to remain calm and come up with a plan to get out of the woods as soon as possible. We decided to wait until dawn and then make a run for it, sticking together and keeping a lookout for any signs of danger. As we waited for the sun to rise, we stayed alert and kept our eyes peeled for any signs of movement or activity outside. Finally, as one of the first rays of light began to filter through the trees, we made our move. We grabbed our things and headed out of the cabin, sticking close together and moving as quickly as we could. As we made our way through the woods, we could feel the weight of the previous night's events still bearing down on us, but we knew that we had to keep moving forward. Only after what felt like hours, we emerged from the woods and saw the familiar sight of civilization. We all let out a sigh of relief and collapsed onto the ground, exhausted but grateful to be alive. As we looked back into the woods, our hearts racing, we couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The sun was setting and the woods were becoming increasingly dark and ominous. It was as if the woods were alive and watching us, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Tan's cousin seemed to believe our story, but he was also clearly on edge. He told us that we should all stay inside the cabin and keep the doors and windows locked. He also suggested that we should take turns keeping watch throughout the night. As the night wore on, the atmosphere inside the cabin became increasingly tense. We could hear strange noises coming from outside, and every time there was a sudden noise or movement, we all jumped in fear. At around midnight, I was on watch duty 
staring out into the darkness. Suddenly I saw movement in the woods and my heart leapt into my throat. I reached for the rifle and aimed in the direction of the movement. It was then that I saw a pair of eyes staring right back at me from the darkness. They were glowing like the eyes of an animal, but they were much too high off the ground. I raised the rifle and fired a warning shot, hoping to scare off whatever it was, but the eyes didn't move. They just started staring back at me, unblinking. I fired another shot, and this time the eyes disappeared. The rest of the night passed without incident, but none of us were able to sleep, and as soon as the sun rose, we packed up all of our things and left the cabin, vowing to never return to those woods again. To this day, we still don't know what was out there in the woods with us, but we all know that we were lucky to make it out alive. The memory of that night still haunts us. We all avoid going camping or hiking in the woods whenever possible. More weirdness in my otherwise peaceful home. Yesterday evening, I decided to move the phone mount on my motorcycle. The bike was parked on her back deck under the pagoda. My garage was currently filled with my son's old furniture from his apartment. It was getting dark, but I figured it wouldn't take long, so I went ahead with the task. Moving the phone mount was a relatively easy job, but it did require some light. I got the mount into position. I wanted to tighten it enough to stay in place using the small torque screws that came with the kit. I intended to wait until morning to tighten them properly, as it was getting dark and I couldn't see them very well. Once the screws were tight enough to hold the mount in place, I stuck the small wrench that came with the kit on the magnet on the back side of the mount and called it a day. And this morning, when I went out to finish the job, I couldn't find the wrench or the magnet where I'd left it. I searched the whole area, but it was nowhere to be found. I assumed a squirrel or some other animal must have taken it, like the shiny wrench, as it had happened before. As I was about to go inside to get a regular Torx wrench for my toolbox, I noticed that my windshield bag was unsnapped, which was weird because I was very conscientious about keeping it snapped shut. I kept some small items in it that I didn't want to lose. When I checked the bag to my surprise, the wrench was inside, right on top. I found this strange, but I reasoned that maybe I'd struck the wrench to the magnet and I'd put it in the bag instead. It was a plausible explanation and I didn't think much of it. However, when I tried to tighten the mount screws, I realized that they were already fully tightened and I couldn't tighten them any further. They were completely wrenched down. This feeling left me a little freaked out and I talked to my wife and son. Both of them denied touching the bike. I wasn't scared, but I was definitely weirded out by the whole situation seemed like something inexplicable had happened with the phone mount and the wrench. I couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling and I started to wonder if there was something supernatural or paranormal at play. I've heard stories of strange occurrences and unexplained phenomenon, but I haven't experienced anything like this before. It made me question my logical explanations and rational thinking. Throughout the day, I couldn't help but keep thinking about the incident. I went back to the bike several times checking the mount and the screws, but everything seemed to be in place. I even tried to recreate the scenario, but I couldn't explain how the screws had tightened on their own. As the day went on, my curiosity turned into a sense of intrigue. I began researching online to see if anyone else had experienced similar incidents with their motorcycle and other objects. I came across forums and stories of people who had encountered strange happenings on their bikes, including unexplained noises, objects moving on their own, and even the sightings of ghostly figures near their motorcycles. While I was initially skeptical, the sheer number of accounts and testimonials made me question my skepticism. I delved deeper into the world of the paranormal experience and theories, trying to find answers to what had happened to my motorcycle. I also reached out to a fellow motorcycle enthusiast and asked if they had ever encountered anything similar. Some shared their own eerie stories, while others dismissed it as mere coincidence or natural explanations. Nevertheless, the conversations and discussions added to my fascination with the inexplicable events surrounding my motorcycle. Days turned into weeks and I couldn't shake off the mystery of what had happened to my motorcycle. I became obsessed with finding an explanation, spending hours researching, reading books and articles, and even consulting with experts in the field of the paranormal phenomena. I visited local motorcycle shops and asked if they had heard of similar incidents, but most of them dismissed it as pure coincidence or simply shrugged it off. However, my determination to uncover the truth only grew stronger. 
I set up cameras around my motorcycle, hoping to capture any unusual activity. I even stayed up late into the night, keeping a vigilant watch, hoping to catch a mysterious occurrence. Weeks turned into months, and despite my efforts, I couldn't find any concrete evidence or explanations for what had happened with my motorcycle. The mount remained secure, and the screws stayed tightly fastened. The wrench remained in my toolbox, and there are no more unsnapped bags or strange occurrences. But to my curiosity and fascination with the paranormal world continued to grow. I delved deeper into the subject, studying different theories and researching various cases of unexplained phenomena. I connected with others who had experienced similar encounters and exchanged stories and ideas. One day while browsing through an online forum, I came across a thread discussing supernatural experiences with motorcycles. Some of the stories were eerily similar to what had happened to me. Many riders shared their encounters with unexplained noises, objects moving on their own, and inexplicable occurrences surrounding their bikes. Some even claimed to have seen apparitions or felt a strange presence around their motorcycle. One story in particular caught my attention. A fellow rider had shared a similar experience with their phone mount and wrench mysteriously disappearing and reappearing in unexpected places. They also tried to find logical explanations but eventually concluded that there might be something supernatural at play. This thread led me down a rabbit hole of paranormal stories related to motorcycles. I found tales of haunted roads, cursed bikes, and mysterious motorcycle-related legends from all around the world. The stories were diverse and intriguing, ranging from encounters and ghost riders, from sightings of phantom motorcycles, and even tales of motorcycles that seemed to have a mind of their own. While I was initially skeptical, the sheer volume of stories and accounts from fellow riders made me question my rational explanations. I began to consider the possibility that there might be some truth to these paranormal experiences. As my obsession grew, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I reached out to investigators and experts in the field, seeking their help in unraveling the mystery surrounding my bike. I invited them to my home and showed them the camera footage and shared my story in detail. The investigators were intrigued by my experience and conducted thorough investigations around my bike. They used various equipment, including EMF detectors, thermal cameras, and EVP recorders to capture any sign of paranormal activity. We spent several nights monitoring my bike, hoping to capture any unexplained occurrence. Although we didn't capture any definitive evidence, the investigators couldn't fully explain some of the anomalies that we did witness. There were unexplained fluctuations in the electromagnetic fields around the bike, and some of the thermal images showed unusual heat signatures. We also captured some EVP recordings with some mysterious voices that couldn't be explained. The investigators concluded that while there's no concrete evidence of supernatural activity, there were indications that something out of the ordinary might be happening with my bike. They suggested that it could be a case of residual energy or manifestation of a spirit or entity attached to the motorcycle. Armed with this new information, I continued my research and exploration into the world of the paranormal phenomenon. I connected with other riders that had similar encounters and formed a small community of enthusiasts that shared their stories and theories. We discussed possible explanations ranging from residual energy from previous owners to spirits attached to objects to dimensional portals. Despite not finding a definitive answer to what was happening with my motorcycle, my fascination just kept growing stronger. I became increasingly invested in uncovering the truth and understanding the mysterious occurrence that seemed to defy logical explanation. I spent countless hours scouring books, websites, and forums looking for any clue that could shed light on the inexplicable events surrounding my motorcycle. I reached out to experts in the field of the paranormal research seeking their insight and opinions. I even went on road trips to visit haunted sites and locations known for motorcycle-related legends, hoping to find some answers. During my investigations, I encountered other riders who had experienced similar inexplicable events with their motorcycles. We exchanged stories, shared our theories, and tried to piece together the puzzle. Some believed it was the work of mischievous spirits, while others thought it could be a case of residual energy from previous owners or even a glitch in the fabric of reality. As time went on, I began to experience more strange occurrences around my motorcycle. There were instances of my motorcycle starting up on its own, despite the ignition being off and lights flickering. There were also times when I felt an eerie presence around my bike as if something or someone was watching me. One night, as I was conducting another investigation around my bike, I noticed a faint glow around the phone mount. As I approached it, the glow seemed to intensify, and I could feel a palpable energy in the air. I cautiously reached out to touch the mount, and as soon as my fingers made contact, I felt a jolt of energy surging through my body. 
Startled, I pulled my hand back and the glow dissipated. I was both fascinated and terrified by the experience. It was clear to me that there was something beyond the realm of the ordinary at play here. But what could it be? I decided to dig deeper into my research, exploring more esoteric and lesser-known theories about the intersection of the paranormal and motorcycles. I came across stories of ancient rituals involving motorcycles, tales of motorcycle clubs with secretive occult practices, and even accounts of motorcycles being used as conduits to otherworldly entities. One particular theory that intrigued me was the concept of a motorcycle guardian spirit. According to some beliefs, motorcycles can develop a spiritual presence that protects and watches over their riders. These guardian spirits are said to have their own consciousness and can sometimes exhibit mischievous or malevolent behavior if not appeased or respected. Armed with this, I decided to approach my motorcycle with a different mindset. I began to acknowledge and respect the possibility of a guardian spirit attached to my bike. I would offer prayers and blessings and even performed a ritual of gratitude expressing my appreciation for my motorcycle and its mysterious presence. To my surprise, the strange occurrences around my motorcycle seemed to subside after my change in approach. The mount remained secure and the screws stained, tightly fastened. The wrench remained in my toolbox and there were no more unsnapped bags or unexplained phenomenon. It seemed as though the guardian spirit, if indeed there was one, had accepted my gestures of respect and appreciation. With time, my initial fear and uncertainty gave way to a sense of wonder and awe. I realized that there are still many mysteries in the world that defied rational explanations, and that some phenomena were beyond the reach of science and logic. I continued to share my story and experiences with other writers and enthusiasts, hoping to inspire curiosity and open-mindedness toward the unexplained. I became known as the Motorcycle Paranormal Guy, and was even invited to speak at local motorcycle clubs and events about my journey about the world and the paranormal and motorcycles. In the end, while I never found a definitive answer to the strange occurrences surrounding my motorcycle, my journey led me to a deeper appreciation for the mysteries of the universe and the intricate connections between the physical and metaphysical realms. I learned to approach the unknown with an open mind to respect the possibility of unseen forces at play, and to be willing to explore unconventional explanations. My experience had taught me that there were countless mysteries waiting to be unraveled, and that the human understanding of reality was limited to our current knowledge and perceptions. As time passed, my motorcycle became more than just a mode of transportation. It became a symbol of curiosity, exploration, and the unexplained. It served as a reminder that there were still realms beyond our comprehension, and that there were forces at play in the world that defied conventional understanding. I continued to enjoy riding my bike, relishing the freedom and the thrill that it brought me. But now, with a newfound reverence for the unknown, I remained vigilant, keeping an eye for any further unexplained events, but also embracing the mystery and the notion that some things may never have a definitive explanation. Occasionally, I would still notice a faint glow around the phone mount, and I would offer a silent nod of acknowledgement, acknowledging the possibility of the guardian spirit that might still be watching over my motorcycle. But whatever it was, it was a playful spirit, a residual energy, or simply a series of coincidences, I'd come to accept that some mysteries were meant to remain unsolved. In the end, my journey into the world of the paranormal and motorcycles had not only expanded my understanding of the unknown, but had also enriched my life with a sense of wonder and awe. I had opened my mind to the new perspectives, deepened my appreciation for the intricacies of the universe, given me a unique story to share with others. So as I continued to ride my motorcycle with the phone mount securely in place and the wrench safely in my toolbox, I'm reminded of the enigmatic nature of our world and the infinite possibilities that lie beyond our comprehension. And while I may never have a definitive answer to the strange occurrences surrounding my motorcycle, I am confident in knowing that some mysteries are meant to remain unsolved and that the unknown will always hold a sense of intrigue and fascination for those willing to embrace its enigmatic allure. It's been five days now, and I'm feeling tempted to use a Ouija board. Day one. I woke up at 3 a.m. the first night. It's a common occurrence for me, so I didn't think much about it. I groggily glanced at the clock, rubbed my eyes, and tried to fall back asleep. Day two. The next night was different. 
I woke up at 3.33 a.m., feeling disoriented, and I stared at the wall while lying on my stomach in bed. It was as if my eyes were open before I was even fully regaining consciousness. I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that something was off, but I brushed it aside and tried to go back to sleep. Day 3 The following night was when things took a strange turn. I jolted awake at 4.43 a.m., and as I turned to look at the same time, I saw something that sent a chill down my spine. A folded old-time screen, the kind people used to change behind, fell in front of me. It happened just a second after I woke up, as if it had been waiting for me to open my eyes. I quickly snapped a photo, but I couldn't fathom how the screen had ended up there, and I had no idea how to attach a photo to share with anybody. Day 4 On the fourth night, I was hanging out with my roommates, trying to distract myself from the strange things the past few nights. My fan was already on, but the light was off, and suddenly the light turned on in front of us. It caught us all off guard, and we tried to rationalize it as a circuit malfunction. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Day 5, Present Time now I'm at the present moment, and the events have only escalated. I was in my roommate's room trying to calm my nerves when I heard a loud crash coming from my own room. My heart raced as I rushed to investigate, and I was horrified to find out that my Ouija board had fallen off of the top shelf. The shelf is so high that I need a step stool to reach it, and there's no logical explanation for how it could have fallen on its own. The incidents were becoming too frequent and too strange to dismiss as mere coincidences. I couldn't shake the feeling that something or someone was trying to communicate with me and I was getting increasingly unnerved. My mind was filled with questions and doubts and I found myself constantly on edge anticipating the next inexplicable event. I confided in my roommates, but they were as puzzled as I was. They tried to rationalize the occurrences attributing them to being faulty wiring or drafts in the house. But deep down, I knew there was something more to it. I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched, of unseen eyes following me wherever I went. Sleep eluded me, and I found myself dreading the nighttime, knowing that it would bring more unsettling experiences. I became obsessed with finding answers, scouring the internet for stories of similar occurrences and consulting with experts in the paranormal field. But despite my efforts, I couldn't find any plausible explanations for what was actually happening here. As the days went by, my mental state deteriorated. I became paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder and jumping at every little sound. I isolated myself from my roommates, afraid of whatever was haunting me would harm them too. My once peaceful home had turned into a place of unease and fear. I decided to take matters into my own hands. I took drastic measures to try to rid myself of the strange things. I performed rituals, cleansings, and even sought the help of a psychic. But nothing seemed to work. If anything, the incidents only seemed to intensify. It was as if my efforts to confront the unknown entity had only provoked it further. The lack of sleep and constant state of fear took a toll on my physical and mental health. Dark circles formed around my eyes and my once cheerful demeanor turned into a constant state of anxiety. I was on edge, always on high alert, trying to anticipate the next inexplicable event that would shake me to my core. One particularly unsettling night, I woke up to the sound of footsteps in my room. My heart pounded in my chest as I grabbed a flashlight and cautiously investigated, but there was no one there. I searched every nook and cranny, but the room was empty couldn't shake off the feeling that someone or something had to be there, lurking in the shadows, watching me. The experience left me trembling and on edge for days, unable to find any explanation for what had happened. Desperate for answers, I decided to dig deeper into the history of the house. I visited the local library and uncovered some unsettling information. It turned out that the house I was living in had a dark past. It had been owned by a family that had experienced a tragic loss years ago. Rumors of paranormal activities had circulated in the town, but most people had dismissed them as urban legends. Armed with this new information, I delved further into the history of the family that had once lived in the house. 
I discovered that they had used a Ouija board in attempts to communicate with their deceased loved one, but had unknowingly unleashed something malevolent. The occurrences that they had been experiencing seemed to mirror their own, and I couldn't shake off the feeling that their tragic history was now repeating itself with me. With a renewed sense of purpose, I sought out the help of a paranormal investigator. They conducted an extensive investigation of the house using various tools and techniques to communicate with any potential entities. The results were chilling. Electronic voice phenomena, EVP recording, captured eerie voices. And the EMF readings were off the charts in certain areas of the house. The investigator confirmed that there was indeed a presence in the house and it seemed to be drawn to my energy. Armed with this information, I decided to confront the entity, head on. I conducted my own research on how to communicate with spirits safely, and I gathered the necessary tools, including the Ouija board that had fallen off the shelf. With trepidation, I set up the board in the living room, surrounded by candles and a protective symbol. As I placed my hands on the planchette and asked questions, I felt a surge of energy in the room. The planchette moved erratically, spelling out cryptic messages that sent shivers down my spine. It seemed like the entity was desperate to communicate, but its messages were confusing and unsettling. I could feel its anger and frustration, but I couldn't decipher its true intentions. The session left me emotionally drained and more confused than ever. I couldn't make sense of the messages I had received, and I was no closer to understanding the true nature of the entity that was haunting me. The activity in the house seemed to have escalated with objects moving on their own, disembodied voices echoing through the walls, and it had an oppressive atmosphere that hung heavy in the air. One night I woke up to find scratches on my arms, as if someone or something had clawed me while I slept. The marks were deep and painful, and I was filled with dread. I knew that I had to take drastic action to rid myself of the entity once and for all. I sought the help of a renowned psychic medium, who conducted a cleansing and a blessing ritual on the house. The energy in the house shifted, and the activity seemed to subside for a while. But just when I thought I was finally rid of the entity, it returned with a vengeance. One night I woke up to the sound of whispers in my ear. I could feel icy breath against my skin, and my heart raced in fear. Turning on the lights, but there was no one. The whispers continued growing louder and more insistent. I tried to ignore them, but they followed me everywhere I went in the house. Feeling desperate and exhausted, I decided to reach out to a paranormal expert who had dealt with a similar case. The expert, a seasoned investigator, with years of experience, came to my house and conducted a thorough investigation. They confirmed that the entity was indeed still present, but its energy seemed to be growing stronger. The expert explained that sometimes, entities can become attached to a particular place or person, and it can be challenging to remove them. They suggested a more aggressive approach involving a cleansing ritual that would require my active participation. I agreed, willing to do whatever it took to regain control of my home and my sanity. The cleansing ritual was intense and emotionally draining. We smudged the entire house with sage, performed prayers and chants, and set up protective barriers. I could feel the entity's presence growing more agitated, but I stood my ground, determined to confront it once and for all. As the ritual reached its climax, there was a sudden surge of energy in the room. Objects flew off shelves, furniture moved on its own, and the temperature dropped drastically. The expert and I stood our ground, holding on to our faith and determination. We continued with the ritual, pouring out all the energy into cleansing the space. Finally, after what felt like hours, the activity ceased. The house was quiet and the oppressive atmosphere lifted. I could feel a sense of peace and relief wash over me. The expert confirmed that the entity had been banished, and I could finally breathe a sigh of relief. In the aftermath of the ordeal, I reflected on the harrowing experiences I'd gone through. It had been a grueling journey filled with fear, uncertainty, and sleeplessness. But it had also been a profound learning experience. I had learned to confront my fears, seek help when needed, and never underestimate the powers of the paranormal. Months passed and the house remained peaceful. I had finally regained my sense of safety and security in my own home. The scratches on my arms had healed and the dark circles under my eyes faded. I had learned to appreciate the simple joys of a good night's sleep in a peaceful home, 
knowing that not everyone is as fortunate as me. To this day, I'm not sure what exactly haunted me during those sleepless nights. Was it the restless spirit of the family that had once lived in the house? Or is it something more malevolent that had been drawn to my energy? I may never know for sure, but the experience has left an indelible mark on me. I no longer dismiss stories of the paranormal as mere superstitions. I've come to believe that there are forces beyond our own understanding, and that some places may hold a dark history that can linger long after the events have passed. I'm more cautious about dabbling in the unknown, and I have learned to respect the boundaries of the spirit world. As I look back on my ordeal, I'm grateful for the support I received from my friends and family and the paranormal expert who helped me through the darkest moments. It was a journey of self-discovery, resilience, and facing my deepest fears. Though the scars may remain, I have emerged stronger, wiser, and with a newfound appreciation for the unexplainable mysteries of the world. The figure on the cove. In Ireland, you're never far from the sea. I'm very used to my proximity to the water. In a way, I imagine many of you aren't due to simply geography. I was born on the north coast of Ireland, technically in Northern Ireland, near Bally Castle, a small town up there. Like most coastal towns, our part of the world comes alive in the summer with people from all over, but in the winter, it's quite barren and isolated. Unlike most people, it was that time of the year in the beginning of late autumn and running through the middle of spring that I enjoy sea the most. There's something quite special about having access to sprawling beaches when most people don't bother to give them a chance. Even on dull days, the roar of the sea in all of its expanse calms me, particularly at dawn or dusk when the light of the sky makes the water glimmer with a mystery that I can't characterize. My story begins and ends with the sea. Before I really begin, I'd like to give you a brief rundown of Selkie or Silky lore. Selkies are a type of being who, legend has it, inhabit the sea around the northern British Isles, although they can be traced as far as Iceland. The sea north of Ireland is inhabited by seals, and it isn't uncommon to see a colony of seals or perhaps an individual further around the towns. I don't know if there exists an animal more charming than a seal, with its lively bark and its smiling face, so like that of a human. The Selkie takes the form of a seal, but is really being with the ability to remove its coat and take on a human-like form. Traditionally, tales speak of Selkies appearing as beautiful women, but if you delve deep into folklore, Selkies appear in all kinds of human forms. Legend has it that they appear in groups in moonlit beaches at certain times during the year, far from human eyes. Here they will remove their seal coats and take on their human bodies dancing with jubilance to music under the light of the moon before eventually returning to the sea. It sounds like a very innocent myth, but there is a much darker side to the Selkie. Ireland isn't a large country, and so relatively speaking, you can never be too far from humanity and civilization. If misfortune strikes and human catches sight of a group of Selkies, they'll dart into the coasts and make their way back to the sea without hesitation. If, however, the human takes hold of one of the coats, their skin, then the Selkie is bound to him. The Selkie cannot return without this. Consequently, stories tell of man taking Selkies as wives, keeping the seal skin hidden away. The Selkie will never stop longing for its home and family, but it'll be trapped in the home of their captor for the remainder of their lives until they're able to recapture their lost coat. Most would never succeed in doing so. Like most myths, I would have always taken Selkies with a pinch of salt. That is until I was 17 and had my own experience that was really unexplainable unless you place some credence on Selkie lore. As I say, I was born on the coast, just outside of town. Teenage life can be challenging for anyone, but for me, this was amplified by being a queer person in a very small community. It wasn't easy, but I found some solace in nature, which, as I said, provided me with headspace at a time when I needed it more than anything. Ironically, the best tonic for my sense of isolation was isolation. A self-built isolation on those evenings when I could walk ten minutes to the beach and enjoy the setting sun, which made the water glisten with hope and that unexplainable sense of mystery. I spent hours down there, particularly on those cold days when contact with other people would be minimal. 
Mostly there wouldn't be much to say about those evenings. I would walk and walk and walk and walk and eventually begin to switch off. Not terribly exciting, but steady and constant. There was one evening, however, when my path took a different turn. There was a section on the beach that was somewhat shrouded by dunes and rocks, a quiet cove a few miles down from the side of the beach I started at. We were deep in spring at this point. I know this because I never could have made it that far along the sand in the w winter months when daylight was minimal. I was trying to maximize my time here before the tourist season began and the area would begin to fill with people from all over. On the beach, I was stricken by the sight of what looked like a young man. The light was beginning to dim, and the sea had a purpley hue. He was strewn out in the sand, his form slender and somehow gentle. It would have been somewhat unusual to see someone this far out in the beach at this time of year. But not altogether shocking. What was shocking was that he was entirely naked, with not a single item of clothing in sight, either on his body or on the sand. And I'll inform you now that although winter had ended, an Irish spring is hardly warm. It isn't rare for snow to fall as late as March or April, and the wind, particularly by the sea, is biting at times relentless. You can understand my shock then seeing this naked figure on the beach that day. What made it more bewildering was that his body appeared to glimmer. It was as though he was formed from matter related to the sea before us, which gleamed in much the same way as pale skin imitated its hue moving softly with the sun to create something that transfixed me. I ordinarily, I'd just have been deeply embarrassed by anything related to nudity or sex. I was an awkward 17-year-old from rural Ireland. But this was different, in the same way that the sea. This day was calming and soothed me. It was as though he was inspired by the same effect, though somehow magnified. I lost track of the time spent in that spot, and I'm embarrassed to write now that I stood staring at what I thought was a naked man for an amount of time, but I can only be honest. And then it was over. He opened his eyes suddenly and appeared to become stiff in a way that contrasted until then relaxed form. I saw him turn his eyes to me, which widened in shock. These eyes, I remember, were striking, even from a slight distance. They were gray, but startling so, almost sinking into the whiteness that surrounded them like watercolor piercing, despite the lack of hue. His entire form was one pale, glistening shape that melded together and appeared translucent in the dimming light. He quickly and soundlessly rose to his feet and moved with a sharp fluidity to the rocks behind him. Still frozen, I watched as he emerged from the rocks, carrying what looked like a silvery piece of cloth, which matched his own body. I say cloth, but it didn't move in the wind, which was blowing in from the sea. It seemed solid and heavy but he carried it effortlessly to the sea at a fast pace, eyes staring intently at me the entire time. When he reached the sea, he stepped into the water with that coat and buried himself into the waves, and then he was gone. At this, I shook myself back to life and moved toward the shore myself. Much as I tried, I couldn't make out his form anywhere. He had vanished into the roaring endlessly without any physical trace. I was bemused but exhilarated. I remained there for around ten minutes more before making my own way home. The images of the evening etched into my mind for the duration of the walk, which was guided by the light of the now fully risen moon. My parents were frustrated when I reached my house, upset that I had been out for much longer than I had expected, but their words seemed to drift over my head. I was a quiet teenager and I imagined I wasn't surprised to them that I didn't have much to say, so no matter their frustration didn't speak to anyone at the time about what I had encountered on that evening. Being a bit of an outcast already, I hardly wanted to appear even odder. But it would be a few years before I really found a group of friends with whom I could mull these thoughts over with. <clears throat> I did, however, spend the next weeks burying myself in online literature about anything that might have been connected to the image on the figure on the beach. I came across Selkie stories and immersed myself in Selkie lore, Although it didn't entirely match what I had seen, it was the only mythos I could find that was somewhat similar. I returned to that part of the beach many times, especially in summer when daylight was much more generous. It saddened me that it never came across as being that I had seen it at night. On one occasion, however, I had resigned myself to walking back home when I heard a bark coming from the shore. I was delighted to see three silvery seals in the water, a 
few meters out into the sea. They moved playfully, their voices filling the air. It struck me that one, little smaller than the other two, was looking at me watchfully, small eyes intent. The light of the setting sun hit its body, which sparkled with its rays, and I smiled back, waving slightly. I don't know if this was the being I had seen that evening some months before. It may have been, or it may have just been an ordinary, albeit beautiful seal. What I do know is that I didn't want to disturb him or frighten him, so after waving, I began my walk home. I pray that whoever or whatever he was, he knows now that I meant him no harm, and when I encountered him, I enjoyed the evening light on the cove. Rather, I would love to be able to communicate with him. How much seeing it meant to me and how much peace it brought to my mind seeing one other creature enjoying the glory and beauty of nature on a spring evening in Ireland. Paranormal Experience so yeah, let me tell you about this really interesting experience I had with this necklace that I won on an online auction. It was a beautiful piece, and I was pretty proud of myself for winning the bid. The seller was a German man, so it took a while for the package to arrive, but when it finally did, I couldn't wait to put it on. From the moment I held it in my hands, I felt a strange connection to it, too. I started wearing the necklace every day, and for the first month, everything seemed fine. But then weird things started happening to me. And it was on a Sunday or Saturday morning, I remember being in a relaxed state, maybe even half asleep, when I heard the voice of a little girl talking to me. I couldn't understand what she was saying, but I was certain that it was a girl's voice. The strange part was that everyone else in the house was asleep, so it made me freak out a little bit. Then another strange event happened on Wednesday night. It was around 10 p.m., and I usually go to bed around 9 or 9.30. I was feeling relaxed, and I was in that half-asleep state, half-awake state, when I realized I was hearing a female voice, humming a tune that I could recognize. The thing is, my parents were downstairs, and my brother was sleeping, so I couldn't figure out where the voice was coming from. It scared me at first, but I tried to brush it off and just let myself fall asleep. After these events, I talked to my mother about what was happening. You see, I always had a tendency to see weird things and have strange experiences, but I had never really talked to anybody about it before. My mom was trying to understand why this was happening to me, and we had a long talk in private. As we were discussing possible reasons, she mentioned something about my room, and that's when it hit me. The necklace. It was a vintage piece from the 1920s or 30s, and I suddenly had a hunch that it might be related to the strange occurrences. I decided to take some action just to be safe. I got some holy water and poured it over the necklace, hoping that it would cleanse whatever energy was attached to it. After that, I did have a few more events, but I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination playing tricks on me again. Despite the strange experiences, I couldn't bring myself to stop wearing the necklace. There was something about it that drew me in. Even with all the unexplained occurrences, I felt like there were memories of the girl who had worn the necklace before me still lingering within it. It's hard to explain, but I didn't mind. In fact, I found it somewhat comforting to think that a part of her was still in the necklace. But it was just my imagination, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something special about this piece of jewelry. I continued to wear the necklace every day, and over time, the strangest events seemed to subside. I learned to accept that there might be just some mystery surrounding the necklace, but it didn't bother me anymore. In fact, I grew to appreciate the unique history and the energy that the necklace seemed to possess. It became a part of my daily routine, and I found myself feeling a sense of connection to the girl who had worn it before me. Years have passed since I first won the necklace, and I still wear it to this day. It's become a cherished item in my collection, and I often find myself wondering about the girl who owned it. What was her story? Why did the necklace seem to have a mysterious effect on me? Was it just my imagination, or was there something more to it? These questions plagued my mind as I continued to wear the necklace every day, despite the strange occurrences that seemed to be connected to it. One day while doing some research about the necklace's origins, I came across a news article from the 1920s that caught my attention. It was about a young girl who had gone missing in Germany during that time period. 
the article mentioned that she had been wearing a distinctive necklace similar to the one I now possessed. Could it be possible that this necklace was somehow connected to that missing girl? The thought sent chills down my spine and I couldn't shake off the feeling that the necklace was not just a piece of jewelry, but held some kind of deeper significance. I decided to dig deeper into the history of the necklace and its previous owners. After some extensive research, I discovered that the necklace had indeed belonged to a young girl named Anna who had gone missing in Germany in the 1920s. She was never found, and her disappearance remained a mystery. The necklace had been up for auction by a collector who had acquired it from a real estate, and that's how it ended up in my possession. Armed with this newfound information, I couldn't help but feel a strong sense of curiosity and intrigue. I wanted to know more about Anna and what had happened to her. I reached out to local historians and even managed to track down some of Anna's distant relatives in Germany. Through my conversations with them, I learned that Anna had been a young girl with a passion for music. She had been an aspiring singer and had a beautiful voice. She had worn the necklace as a lucky charm during her performances, and it was known to hum a particular tune that was her favorite. As I delved deeper into Anna's story, I realized that the strange occurrences I had experienced such as hearing a little girl's voice and humming in my half-awake state, seemed to align with Anna's interests and habits. It was as if the spirit was somehow connected to the necklace itself, and her presence was still lingering in it. Despite the initial fear and confusion, I began to sense empathy towards Anna. I could understand her love for music and her attachment to the necklace. It became clear to me that Anna's spirit was not haunting me, but rather seeking some kind of connection or recognition. I decided to embrace Anna's presence and honor her memory. I started to learn the tune that she would hum, and I practiced singing it. I also visited her hometown in Germany, where I paid my respects to her grave and left flowers in her memory. As time went on, the strange occurrences gradually subsided, but I continued to wear the necklace every single day. It became more than just a piece of jewelry to me. It was a symbol of a young girl's dreams and passions and a reminder that the mysterious connection I had experienced. I shared Anna's story with my close friends and family and they were all fascinated by the tale of the necklace and its history. Some were skeptical, dismissing it as a mere superstition, while others were more open-minded and intrigued by the possibility of the supernatural. Regardless of others' opinions, I felt a deep sense of gratitude for having had this unique experience myself. It had opened my eyes to the mysteries of the world that made me realize that there were still many things beyond my comprehension, and it had also given me a sense of empathy towards those that had experienced unexplained phenomenon or had beliefs in the supernatural. Years passed and I continued to wear the necklace, but the strange occurrences had ceased completely. I had moved on with my life, but I still held a special place in my heart for Anna and the necklace. I had come to see it as a cherished memento, a connection to a young girl whose story that had touched me deeply. One day out of the blue, I received an unexpected visitor. A woman in her 70s introduced herself as Gertrude, Anna's niece. She had heard about my interest in Anna's story and had come all the way from Germany to meet me. Gertrude explained that she had grown up hearing stories about her Aunt Anna and had disappeared so mysteriously all those years ago. She had inherited some of Anna's belongings, including old letters and photographs, but the necklace was missing. She had always wondered what had happened to it. When she learned that I had the necklace and I had been wearing it all this time, she was overwhelmed with emotions. She told me that Anna had been very dear to her and her family and they had always hoped for some closure or resolution about the mystery of her disappearance. As Gertrude and I talked, we shared our experiences and feelings about Anna. She was grateful to hear that I had honored Anna's memory and had tried to understand her story. She also confirmed that Anna had indeed been passionate about music and had loved to sing, and the necklace had been a significant symbol to her dreams. Gertrude expressed her desire to have the necklace back in the family as she saw it as a precious heirloom that rightfully belonged to Anna's memory. I understood her sentiments and gladly handed over the necklace to her. It felt like the right thing to do and I was glad to have played a part in bringing some closure to Anna's family. As Gertrude left, 
She thanked me with tears in her eyes and told me that she believed Anna's spirit had found peace knowing that her necklace was back with her family. I felt a sense of fulfillment and closure as well, knowing that I'd been able to honor Anna's memory and bring some comfort to her family. In the end, I realized that the mysterious effect of the necklace on me had been a combination of my own emotions and experiences, as well as the intriguing history and story behind it. It had led me on a unique journey of discovery and empathy, and it had ultimately brought a sense of resolution to a long-standing mystery. I continued to cherish the memory of Anna and the necklace, but the strange occurrences never returned. I learned to appreciate the beauty of life's mysteries and the wonders of the unknown, and I carried the lessons and memories of the experience with me for the rest of my life. Has anyone had similar encounters or have insight on the phenomenon I'll detail below? I never thought I'd be the type of person to believe in something like this, but lately I can't help but feel like there's something more going on than what meets the eye. It all started about six months ago and I began to notice a presence around me at night. At first it was just a feeling like something was watching me, but then I started to see them, these shadow people that seemed to be everywhere. And the more I watched, the more I realized that there was something different about them. I've always believed that psilocybin could grow and allow us to perceive more than our normal senses allow. And maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe these entities are something that exists beyond our normal reality. Something that we can only see when our minds are open to the possibility. I don't know, but I do know that these encounters are real and they happen every night. The entities seem to be combination of two different phenomena that people have been encountering forever. They start off as shadow people, but as I focus on them, their form seems to dissipate. And I'm left looking at actual human beings. Their fashion sense is even very modern too, like they could be walking down the street in any American city. But they're not solid at all, and they're pretty translucent, like ghostly-like. I currently live in a fenced-off vacant property in an urban area. I was hired to live here as security and clean up the property to prepare for development. But the recent price increases in construction supplies, the development companies put the project on hold, leaving me here with these entities as my only company. What's interesting is that they never arrive alone. There's typically dozens of them, broken up into little crowds doing their own thing. And while they seem to be silently communicating with each other, I can't hear anything at all. It's like there could be loud music or cheering from their perspective, but from mine, it's completely silent. One thing that's really strange is that I never feel threatened or creeped out by their presence, even when they're watching me. Like they are over right now as I write this, I feel content and safe. If they were actual people, I would feel very uncomfortable and likely act hostile towards them depending on the circumstance. But these entities, I don't feel any negative vibes at all. I've tried to do some research online to see if there's anything out there that can explain what I'm experiencing, but I haven't found anything that matches up with what I'm seeing. That's why I've decided to reach out and try to obtain some understanding regarding my recent experiences. I don't know what these entities are or what they want, but I'm hoping that something out there can shed some light on the situation or someone. Any information is welcome, and I'm open to any questions, comments, or discussions that can help me achieve a better level of understanding. For now, I'll just keep observing and try to make a sense of what's happening around me. I've always been a believer that there's more to psilocybin than just hallucinations. To me, it feels like it can open up a portal to another dimension or reality, allowing us to perceive things that our normal senses don't allow. That being said, I recently experienced something that left me feeling completely puzzled. I'm hoping to gain some insight by sharing my story. It all started with my sisters took mushrooms at a campfire. One of them had a bad trip, so I had to go and get her. I brought her puppy with me and took her home, putting on a TV show Friends to help her settle down. Everything seemed back to normal, and I decided to head back to bed, leaving her downstairs. About ten minutes later, I heard a pounding on the front door, and my sister was yelling my name. I started heading down the stairs, and she was heading up, looking very worried. I asked if someone was there, and she said that she didn't know. There was another knock on the door, and I started to feel uneasy. I opened the door, but there was nobody outside. My sister looked petrified and said she was sure she was about to die. I tried to calm her down and eventually went back downstairs with her. 
She made me dump cold water on her head a few times. There were a couple more knocks on the side window, even though no one was there. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was there outside my house, even though I couldn't see it. This experience left me on edge for a few minutes, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was connected to my sister's bad trip, and if I was somehow experiencing something too. This event made me think back to my experiences with psilocybin and how it can open up portals to other dimensions or realities. It feels like we're able to perceive more than what our senses typically allow, and I wonder if this is what happened to me and my sister that night. I'm a skeptic by nature, and I always try to come up with a scientific explanation for my unusual experiences. However, this time I couldn't explain what happened, and it left me with more questions than answers. I've always been able to explore the unknown, but this experience left me feeling a bit uneasy. I'm now even more cautious about what else is out there that we can't see or explain. I've always believed that there are things in this world that are beyond our understanding, and it seems like I've been experiencing one of them for the past six months. I've seen what appear to be entities that have aspects of both shadow people and translucent ghosts. They usually make their presence known only at night, and they seem to be able to observe me as much as I'm observing them. I spent countless hours observing them, and I can say that for sure, they're not threatening or giving off any negative vibes. These entities usually appear as shadow people at first, but once I focus on them, their shadow form dissipates, but they take on the form of a human being. They're translucent and seem to be dressed in modern fashion. It's almost as if they're attending a party with dozens of individuals broken up into little groups doing their own thing. I can't hear anything from my perspective, but from their perspective, there could be loud music or cheering voices. I have been living in a fenced-off vacant property in an urban area, hired to serve as security to prevent trespassing and clean up the property. The property was supposed to be in development, with plans to build an apartment complex on it, but the project's been on hold due to skyrocketing prices of lumber and construction supplies. So I've been here for quite some time spending my time on the presence in these entities. One thing that surprises me is that I don't feel threatened or creeped out by them when they're around. I don't even feel bothered when they're watching me which is the case as I write this. There are at least two of them fixated on me. And as though it's a bit eerie regarding the overall situation, the actual presence and watchfulness don't bother me at all. I have tried to find information online about this specific phenomenon, but I've come up empty-handed. I don't know what these entities are or what they want, and I've been trying to understand them better and find some explanation for what I'm experiencing. But so far, I've been unsuccessful. I don't know if they're trying to communicate with me or they're just passing through. In conclusion, I'm reaching out to anyone who might have some insight to this phenomenon. I welcome any information, questions, or comments that could help me achieve a better understanding of what I'm experiencing. Thank you for taking the time to read my post, and I hope that all together we can shed some light on this mysterious phenomenon, and why the text repeats itself so many times. A spirit has been following me around for many years. I only found out about it recently. Ever since I moved into my new house last year, I've had a feeling that it's haunted. Strange things happen, like books or glasses disappearing only to reappear in places I would never put them in. I still find missing cups or plates under my bed from time to time. My dog Joe is not a hoarder, and he never touches anything that he knows he's not allowed to so he's not to blame. Sometimes I see things moving quickly in my peripheral vision, only to disappear as soon as I take a turn to take a better look. There have been unexpected and unexplained temperature changes and weird sounds in the middle of the night. My dog also seems to be afraid of the basement. He'll never go down there no matter what, and always barks at the door whenever he walks past it, or just walks around the dining room table and get as far away from possible from it. One hot summer night, the electricity was off, and I was sleeping when I felt a frozen cold hand squeezing my shoulder, jolting me awake with a start. I thought it was only a dream at first, but then I touched my shoulder, where the ghost hand had been only a few seconds ago, and it was still cold compared to the rest of my body, which was warm and sweaty. That's when I was really convinced that my house was indeed haunted. But apart from those weird things, I've never seen any apparition. Or 
something far worse than just a ghostly hand groping me in the middle of the night. I've tried to coexist with the ghost by acknowledging its presence with simple gestures like saying greetings each time I arrive home or saying see you before I leave. And it seems to work out well, but a few weeks ago something happened that left me feeling even more confused and scared. I met this girl on Tinder and we agreed to hang out at my place. As soon as I opened the front door for her, her face turned pale. I invited her in, but she told me that she was sorry and that it wasn't a good idea and then left abruptly. I was confused and really offended, I mean. I know I'm not the most good-looking guy on the planet, but come on. I had sent her my photo earlier, and she seemed to have no problem with my face then, so why all of a sudden did she change her mind as soon as she saw me in person? I dropped her a message asking if there was something wrong, and she told me that she didn't want to offend my friend if we were going to have sex that night. I thought she was talking about Joe, so I said, come on, my dog won't hate me because I have a one-night stand. I know he's a good Christian, but using him for subtly ugly shaming isn't cool. Then she said she wasn't talking about Joe, but the spirit in my house. I said, oh, you can see it? And she said, yeah. I asked her what it looked like, but she refused to elaborate and only told me that it's a he. Then he asked how long I've had it in there following me around, which I didn't understand. She said she could tell that things had been following me around for a long time, which is weird. I told her I'd been living there for a year, and she said the spirit's been with me long before I moved into that space. We arranged another meetup at a restaurant, and she said it was still following me around. I called my mother the other day and asked if she had ever made a deal with a spirit or something, and being a devout Christian, she and my father both took offense to my question. <clears throat> but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more to the spirit than what I had previously thought. I started doing some research on my own and found out that there are many different types of spirits, and not all of them benign. Some can be malevolent, and others can be attached to a person or an object, following them wherever they go. As I delved deeper into my research, I stumbled upon the concept of residual hauntings, which occur when a traumatic event or emotion is imprinted on a location, causing it to play out repeatedly. This made me think about the history of my house and the land that it was built on. Maybe something traumatic had happened here in the past, and this is why the spirit was following me. I started looking around for more information about the history of my house and found out that it was built on the site of an old plantation. I couldn't find any information about it, or any traumatic events that might have occurred there. But I did find out that the original owners were slave owners, this information sent chills down my spine. I started to wonder if the spirit following me was that of a slave who had suffered on this land. I wonder if he was angry or seeking revenge. And that was why he was making his presence known. I didn't know what to do, so I turned to the paranormal investigator to help. The investigator came to my house and performed an investigation. He found evidence of a residual haunting in the basement but he couldn't find any evidence of a malevolent spirit. He suggested that I try to communicate with the spirit and see if I could find out what it wanted. I was hesitant at first, but eventually I decided to try. I sat in the basement with a candle and asked the spirit to communicate with me. At first there was silence, but then I heard a faint whisper. It was hard to make out what the spirit was saying, but it sounded like maybe it was asking for help. I was taken back by this and I asked the spirit what kind of help it needed. The spirit stopped, and I felt a cold breeze brush past me. Suddenly, I knew what I had to do. I needed to help the spirit move on to the afterlife. I contacted a local psychic medium. She came to my house to help me. She performed a ritual to help the spirit move on, and it worked. The strange occurrences in my house stopped, and I felt a sense of peace that I'd never felt before. Looking back on this experience, I realized that not all spirits are malevolent, and sometimes they just need help moving on. I also learned that it's essential to do your research and seek professional help when dealing with the paranormal. Is anyone interested in hearing my experiences seeing heaven? 
When I was about 13 years old, I had an out-of-body experience that transported me to a place that was not of this earth. Let me begin to explain some background information that ties into what happened. I've been involved in my church my entire life, although I never really cared for it. When I was old enough, I became part of the staff team, and I was sort of a junior usher, responsible for catching people who fell and the seating of those who were walking in. Even though I wasn't too into the whole church thing, I enjoyed my job. Oftentimes, while the pastor would pray over people, you could feel the energy in the air. The air would thicken and it would suddenly get hot. I even watched crazy people get unpossessed. A few months into doing this, I began to become quite intrigued by how it all worked. As I've always enjoyed the paranormal, but I wasn't ready for what I was about to experience. It was my night off from ushering, so I was mixed into the congregation. I loved to sit in the background and blend in, but for some odd reason, I wanted to sit up front. I stood and clapped, singing along with the band and singers, trying not to stand out. I was already nervous being close to the front. Suddenly in my ear, the music began to fade, to background noise. And I heard something whisper in my ear, Let's go, in a commanding yet angelic voice. Creeped out, I stopped singing and clapping, and panic set in. I began to question what was happening, and it was almost quiet. Again I heard, Just let go. By now, I was sweating, and I ignored it, and I tried to focus on the band on stage. I said to myself, I can barely hear them, yet they're right there. Panic turned into fear. The voice came back. Joseph, do not fear. Let go, and let me show you something. This time, the voice was comforting. It eased my panic and fear, and I closed my eyes. Suddenly, I felt my arms begin to lift on their own commanded by something subconsciously. As my arms reached full extension, a calmness came over me. The music faded into a mute. It was dead silent, and I felt a hand embrace mine. At this point, I wasn't scared. It all seemed familiar in a way, like home. I was not even bothered by the hand touching mine. I must have stood there for a few minutes, yet my arms felt weightless, and they didn't grow tired. The voice found me again in the dark. What I'm going to show you, not many have seen. You get to see this because you are special, and I need you to fulfill your time on this earth. You will do many things in your lifetime, cast out spirits, speak to dry bones, and tell prophecies. The voice didn't scare me, it just gave me comfort. Look up, child, open your eyes and see. I opened my eyes and it was nothing, a dark void. I began to scan the plane I was in and spotted a hallway with a distorted light at the end. I walked toward the light and it was almost calling my name, inviting me in. As I walked into this hall, which I can only describe as a movie theater hall, right before you see the screen, it was lined with lights where the floor met the wall. Yet, as much as I studied them, I couldn't tell where the source of light originated from. And as I got closer to this distorted light, Sound started coming through. I could hear music, yet it was nothing like anything I've ever experienced before. It was like my senses were heightened and everything was more vivid and intense than in the physical world. As I looked around, I realized that I was not alone. There were other beings there with me. But they were different from the people I'd seen on Earth. They were glowing and their energy was palpable. They emanated a sense of love and compassion that was beyond anything I'd ever felt before. They had an aura of wisdom and serenity that was almost overwhelming. One of the beings approached me, and I felt a wave of peace and calm wash over me. It communicated with telepathy, and I could understand everything it said without words. It told me that I was there for a reason, and that I had a purpose in life, and that I had a mission to fulfill. The being showed me visions of my future and the things I would do, the people I would meet and the experiences I would have. It told me that I would encounter challenges and hardships, but that I would find joy and fulfillment in my life's work. It showed me a glimpse of my destiny, and I knew in my heart that it was true. As I stood there surrounded by the love and the light of these beings, I felt a sense of belonging that I'd never felt before. I felt like I was home, that this is where I truly belonged. I knew that I'd come back to the physical world, but I didn't want to leave. 
I wanted to stay there forever, surrounded by the beauty and the peace of this otherworldly realm. But the being told me that it was time for me to go back. I said that I had a lot of work to do, but I had to fulfill my purpose and live out my destiny. It embraced me one last time, and I felt a surge of energy flow through my body. Suddenly, I was back in the church, standing in the middle of the congregation. As I looked around, everything seemed different. The colors were brighter, the air was cleaner, and the people seemed more alive. I felt a sense of gratitude and love for everyone around me, and I knew that I'd been given a gift that I could never repay. I knew that I had to share my experience with others and help them see that there was more to life than just the physical world. From that day on, my life was never the same. I went on to become a spiritual leader and healer, using my gift to help others find their own purpose and destiny. I traveled the world sharing my stories and spreading the message of love and compassion that I'd learned in that otherworldly realm. And although I knew that I could never fulfill or describe the beauty and wonder of that place, I also knew that I would carry its memory with me always, as a reminder of the power of love and the promise of a greater destiny. I think my mom has a demon attached to her. I recently made the difficult decision to cut contact with my mother. It wasn't an easy choice, but after years of dealing with her narcissistic behavior in the presence of malevolent spirits that seemed to be attached to her, I realized it was the best option for my own well-being. It's a complicated situation, and while I won't deny that there are other reasons for our estrangement, the spirit was definitely a factor. It all started when I was just six years old. My mother and her friend became interested in witchcraft after watching the movie The Craft. As someone who's pagan myself, I know that playing with things you don't understand is never a good idea. My mother started off with well-intentioned blessings and some folklore magic, but things quickly spiraled out of control. She used random objects to reach out to spirits believing anything that would respond and move an object. When we moved into our home, things got more active and weirder. I remember at first we moved in, a spirit would slam our basement door shut and stomp down the stairs. At first I thought it was just my parents having a fight, but they were always sleeping in their room when this happened. The dining room chairs would move on their own, with the chairs being pulled out or pushed in when we left them out. The most terrifying experience was when we left the chairs pushed in at the table and after we were leaving the room, a few moments, we heard the scuff of a chair on the floor. When we looked, the chairs were resting on the top of the table face down, like they do in bars when they close up for the night. But that was just the beginning. We heard someone yell, shut the fuck up, from the basement when my parents were yelling at my brother and me. I don't blame the ghost, honestly. One night, my brother and I complained of smelling rotting meat and decay. We heard what sounded like a dog fight happening in the basement, but we only had one dog at the time, and she ran to hide because she heard it too. Those were just the most notable situations that happened. Besides hearing small children singing old schoolhouse songs at 4 or 5 in the morning when we were just kids. Every once in a while you could hear a growl. Not a dog growl, but a gravelly, gritty, deep growl. Damn near in your face. When my parents divorced, we moved into my grandmother's house next door. But that house was also haunted. With the sound of a woman crying around 11 at night, almost every night... The objects being thrown around got so bad that my dad had to keep me at his house, which was also haunted. My mom eventually moved into another town, but the houses she lived in were also haunted. My stepdad got pushed downstairs and later got scratched badly. My mom was shoved into a wall so hard her ribs cracked. The spirit seemed to change people's attitudes on a whim. Calm moments would become violent and unnecessarily angry. Now my mom claims that her brother's spirit is around after he committed suicide, and my stepdad claims the same thing about his brother. They both claim to have seen a black hooded mass in their new home. My mom has seen a child in the kitchen when my brother was in school, and she heard the child singing or crying. Before I cut contact with her, I would house sit for her, and would have gruesome nightmares and be awoken by an odd jolting feeling 
like being electrocuted but with a sense of anxiety. It scared me so much that I couldn't stay the night, and after I woke up I felt fine. However, the experience left me feeling uneasy and I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. That wasn't the first time I felt this way around my house, and I knew that it wouldn't be the last. As the years went by, my mother and I moved from one haunted house to another, and the hauntings only got worse. It seemed like no matter where we went, the same aggressive spirit followed us. Like a lovesick puppy. And it was a complete fucking asshole. I couldn't help but wonder where my mother had picked up this thing that attached to her. And if there is any way to get rid of it without hurting anyone. If it was a demon, what kind was it? Baba Duke, Christian lore type? The ghost of a pissed off chicken that KFC slaughtered? I needed to better understand what it was doing so I could repel things like it and keep it away from me and others. But that was easier said than done. And all these years, the spirit continued to follow my mother and it seemed like it was just waiting for an opportunity to jump to someone else or continue messing with people. It was a disturbing thought that this entity may still be out there looking for another victim to haunt. As for the origin of the entity, it's difficult to say. It's possible that it was somehow connected to the witchcraft that my mother and her friends were experimenting with when I was a child. It may have been attracted to the energy and the attention that they were giving to the spirit world and latched onto my mother as a result. It's also possible that the entity was connected to the properties that we lived in, particularly the old mining house that my mother moved to, the tunnels that once connected the house that they have created a portal to the entirely different world. Whatever its origins may be, the important thing is to find a way to repel it and prevent it from causing harm to anyone else. If it's a demon or malevolent spirit, it may require a spiritual cleansing or exorcism to remove it. Seeking the help of a professional psychic or spiritual healer may be necessary too. It's also important to protect oneself from negative energies and entities by practicing spiritual protection methods such as visualization, prayer, and the use of protective crystals and herbs. In conclusion, my experiences with the malevolent entity that followed my mother have been frightening and traumatic. It's something that I don't wish on anyone, and I hope that by sharing my story, others may be better prepared to deal with similar situations if they ever arise. The paranormal world is a mysterious and often scary place, and it's important to approach it with caution and respect. Mysteries of the Han Riskaya Hospital I've heard many stories about an abandoned hospital in Moscow that was infamous for its dark past. It was built during the 1970s after the authorities approved the construction of a modernized medical facility. However, the site was the city's northern district, which was once a graveyard. Despite the skepticism surrounding the project, the planners remained undeterred and went ahead with the construction of the 10-story building designed with harsh, brutalist architecture and a capacity to hold up to 1,300 patients. In the summer of 1980, construction of the project finally commenced, and people in the vicinity watched as the concrete behemoth gradually began to rise from the ground. After two years, the building's outer shell was complete, but work came to a halt when the funds set aside for the construction work were exhausted. It was then discovered that the site was a wetland, resulting in the basement levels of the building being continually flooded, causing the project to go bankrupt. With no security, the abandoned hospital soon became a magnet for murderers, drug dealers, drug addicts, cultists, homeless people, and those looking for adventure. As time passed, the building's partially completed internal structures began to degrade, and people who ventured inside suffered misfortune. The remains of those who died while sheltering from the elements of the site were discovered by others who were trespassing there. Furthermore, the bodies of murder victims were also found within the grounds of the derelict buildings, leading to concerns of possible serial killings. One such victim was a reverend local pensioner who died in 1985 after her dog ran off while she was walking in the vicinity of an abandoned site. After summoning up the courage to follow the dog, she made her way into the reception area of the building before recoiling in disgust. The area was literally riddled with rotting bodies and bones of several other dogs and smaller animals. 
Some time later, a group of boys who had decided to explore the basement levels of the building discovered the old lady's body floating in a large crater of water. With horrific injuries to her back and lower torso, and both of her legs had been broken and shattered. Another incident occurred in 2005 when a popular boy, Alexei Kryaskonikin, who was known amongst his friends as Edge, went missing. After a search, his personal belongings were found on the eighth floor, and his body was later discovered lying in a side room on the hospital's second floor. Like the previous elderly victim, he had suffered catastrophic injuries after a severe fall, but his body had been located in a small enclosed room, leaving the situation unexplainable. Many other stories have circulated throughout the local community, such as three teens who were found slain at the same site at some point during 2006. There's also the tale of an urban explorer whose body was discovered at the bottom of one of those empty lift shafts, brutally twisted and broken. Unfortunately, the exact number of hospitals' victims remains difficult to verify as the city authorities have reportedly refused to release any official figures. Despite the darkness that surrounds the abandoned hospital, there's surprisingly one bright story. Local tales tell of a friendly spirit by the name of Raff, who inhabits the building and acts as the keeper of the abandoned hospital. Raff allegedly helps lost people find the exit and rescues trapped people, such as those whose legs are stuck between concrete blocks or have fallen into an elevator shaft. Nobody knows for sure if the deaths which occurred there were the results of supernatural activities or the grim deeds of a human killer, but everybody seems to have an opinion on it. Some blame the cultists, while others believe that the deaths were the work of serial killers who may have had been using the abandoned building as a place to commit their crimes, or as somewhere to display their grisly trophies. There are also those that speculate that the deaths have been the result of the supernatural. For them, the fact that the land which was repurposed for the construction was a former cemetery is perhaps a true cause of the horrors. They believe that the spirits of the dead rose from their graves, electing to punish the living who were trespassing into their domain. Whatever the true cause of the deaths, it is clear that the abandoned hospital was a place of great tragedy and horror. The stories of death and misery associated with the building have created a reputation for it's one of the scariest places on the planet. Despite the dangers, people continued to make pilgrimage to the site, hoping to catch a glimpse of the supernatural or to satisfy their curiosity about the dark history of the building. After many years of reported tragedy, the abandoned facility was finally sold off to a private company in 2018. The sale brought an end to the long and tragic history of the building, and it seemed as though the dark secrets of the hospital's past would finally be laid to rest. In October of that year, the building's superstructure was eventually demolished before being completely cleared away, removing all traces of the hospital and its sinister past, once and for all. As for the stories of the supernatural and the cultists, they live on in the memories of those who knew the hospital during its time of abandonment. Some even claim that the spirit of a friendly entity named Raff still inhabits the site, acting as a keeper to the abandoned hospital and helping lost and trapped people find their way out. Regardless of whether or not these stories are true, the legend of the abandoned hospital will continue to captivate the imaginations of those who seek out stories of horror and the unknown. I never told anyone about this. Last night, I had a really scary encounter that shook me to my core. To give you some context, my father was a drug addict, and I was addicted to heroin. He had tried to kick the habit when I was a teenager, but ended up relapsing and going into rehab. However, he was a great person despite his problems. After high school, I became completely unorganized and had no sense of direction for myself. I ended up partying a lot and doing drugs and getting drunk as much as I could. I decided to enroll in a trade school to become a medical assistant, but I wasn't ready for it. During that time, my uncle passed away inside my aunt's guest house from cancer. After his services, my aunt offered me a guest room to stay for a while. I was going to school and my father agreed to give her rent money. 
I packed up my things and moved over the next few nights, but then strange things started to happen. Since my sister took the cat that always slept with me, I started feeling a strange spiritual presence in the room. I could feel the cat's presence walking around the bed, but the cat wasn't physically there. The cat stopped walking around after a few minutes, and I started to feel fear growing inside of me. I couldn't move, and I tried to sleep, but I heard voices in my head. The voice was driving a car into a big storm, and I was freaking out badly. I was telling this voice that it would be just fine and calm right down, but then I started to feel a bed shake, and it was getting more and more intense as the seconds passed. I woke up screaming, and the bed shaking stopped, and I started to cry. The cat came back, and it was standing next to me, which wasn't helping. I moved into another room and slept just fine. One night I made a poor choice and I went to go to a party with my friends. Despite knowing that I had an important test to study for, I spent all my money on cocaine and alcohol and got so drunk and high that I couldn't remember how I got home. As I laid down in bed I heard footsteps outside the window, but every time I looked I saw nothing. Then I heard a blanket on my chest and started slowly falling down. But I was so fixated on trying to see if anybody was outside that I didn't question why the blanket was slowly falling down. Suddenly I grabbed what felt like an extremely cold and lifeless hand, and before I could look down to see whose hand I was grabbing, I was yanked by the neck of my shirt and pulled forward pretty hard. I also heard a loud and very threatening grunt. I jumped out of bed in extreme pain and ran to the corner of the room. So much tension was in the air, and every time I blinked my eyes, I could see my uncle's face looking at me with such hate and discomfort. So much fear had taken over my body that I was unable to move. After about 15 minutes of being petrified, I slowly walked over to the door and turned on the lights. I tried to convince myself that it was just the drugs and that I didn't actually experience what I thought I did. But the neck hold of my shirt was stretched out, which was a physical evidence sign it was actually contradicting everything I was trying to convince myself of. I stayed up for hours by myself and I couldn't help but cry. It was like I was suddenly realizing how bad I was messing up and how selfish I was being. The next day I was very quiet and I didn't say anything or speak a single word for the next 24 hours. I was too frightened to be alone in that room, so I decided to sleep on my aunt's couch for the night. I felt like I needed to be around people, even though I didn't want to tell anybody about my experience. I didn't want them to think I was crazy or on drugs. The next day I was feeling shaken up by what had happened. I couldn't concentrate on anything and I barely spoke a word to anybody. I just kept replaying the events of the previous night in my head, trying to make sense of what had happened. As the day wore on, I realized that I couldn't keep this to myself any longer. I needed to talk to somebody about what had happened. So that evening, I confided in my aunt about the strange occurrences in the guest house. To my surprise, she didn't think I was crazy at all. In fact, she told me that she had always felt that there was something off about that room. She had never experienced anything like what I had, but she had always felt a sense of unease whenever she was in there. She suggested that we call in paranormal investigators to see if they could shed any light on what was happening in the room. At first, I was hesitant. I didn't want to make anything worse or attract even more negative crap to the house, but eventually I agreed, feeling like I needed some answers. The paranormal investigator arrived a few days later and immediately got to work. They set up cameras, recorders, and other equipment throughout the guest house and asked me to recount my experiences. As we sat and waited for any sign of activity, I couldn't help but feel anxious. What if nothing happened? What if I was just imagining things? But as the night wore on, strange things started to happen. Doors creaked open and shut on their own, and we heard footsteps and whispers coming from empty rooms. At one point, the temperature dropped so suddenly that we could see our breath in the air. The paranormal investigator was able to capture some of the activity on his camera and recording devices. They told us that they believed the guest in our house was haunted by the spirit of my deceased uncle, who had passed away in that very room. It was a chilling revelation, but it also brought me some comfort. I felt like I finally had some answers, and I knew that I wasn't going crazy or imagining things. After that night, I never slept in the guest house ever again. 
my aunt and I decided to close it off and use it only for storage. But even though we knew the truth about what was happening in there, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease whenever I was near the room. Mutual sightings over the course of just under a year. In 2006, I was living with my sister in her two-story townhouse. She hadn't mentioned anything about experiencing unexplained activity, so when I discovered the first mild occurrence, it was exciting to me because I never felt afraid of these things before. I'm a skeptic by nature, but I also believe that there are things beyond our understanding. After being there for about a week, I heard heavily masculine footsteps in my sister's upstairs bedroom while we were downstairs. I brushed it off, assuming it was her female neighbor and the sound coming through the wall somehow. However, my sister informed me that her neighbor was not at home. She had heard the sounds all the time. Within a few days, I watched as the dining room chandelier started to sway on its own. Assuming it was from the AC as there was no ceiling fans, I checked and the AC was off. The chandelier swayed faster and faster, then slowed, then moved faster again. My sister said it was normal but freaky. There were no passing trains or traffic or anything else to cause this. Another day, the TV turned itself on and began displaying wild patterns and colors that looked intelligently designed but beyond what pixels could do in 2006. We tried turning it off and it wouldn't, so we unplugged it and went black. Then back to the patterns and colors. Fed up with the craziness, I decided to try recording an EVP. My sister handed me her Motorola razor and I began to politely ask it if we could please ask it some questions. We wanted only information including a name, age, perceived historical time, and reason for it being there. I waited after my questioning, still recording but staying silent. The entire recording was roughly one minute and a half. When I played it back, my voice could be heard politely imploring, and right after my first statement, there was a loud male voice directing, Go ahead. My sister and I both heard it right away, and her hair stood up on the back of her necks. I played it over and over again, assuming it was my sister being impatient. And I caught her voice in the device. She swore it wasn't her, and the voice was not hers. I was watching as I recorded all this too. She was silent the entire time. She began to get extremely scared and upset as I replayed it over and over, so I stopped. I asked her to please download it onto her computer, but she deleted it the next morning because she thought it was demonic. I kind of hold those same beliefs. Finally, while I was showering, a female voice was lightly singing in my bathroom. My sister was on the other side of the house, but I thought she had entered my room. I looked out and there was no one there. The singing and then humming got louder and louder, but no one was present. A few minutes later, I got out of the shower, dried off, put on my robe, and heard whistling. I went to the side of the house my sister was in and asked her about singing, humming, and whistling. She denied it. She can't even whistle at all, so I know that part wasn't her. A few nights later, I heard a loud noise coming from downstairs in the kitchen. I went downstairs and saw the kitchen cabinets open, with glasses having come out and hit the countertop and floors without breaking. I told my sister about it the next morning, not wishing to wake her, and she said she had had this happen one other time by themselves, and the glasses moving through the air to the surfaces below. She then proceeded to tell me about the other occurrences, such as doors opening and closing on their own, objects moving and strange noises in the house. Apparently, she had been experiencing these events for some time, but didn't want to alarm me because I'd just moved in. I wasn't scared, but rather intrigued by these experiences. I've always been fascinated by the paranormal and have never personally experienced anything like this before. As time went on, the activity in the house seemed to increase. We would hear footsteps upstairs when we were both downstairs, doors opening and closing on their own, and objects moving without explanation. One day, my sister even saw a full-bodied apparition in the hallway. She described it as tall, dark, and it appeared to be wearing a hat. It only appeared for a few seconds before disappearing, leaving her shaken and terrified. And despite all this, I still wanted to investigate further. 
I decided to set up a camera in the house and try to capture any paranormal activity on film. I placed the camera in the living room, facing it towards the stairs, and turned it on before heading to bed. The next morning, when I checked the footage, I saw something that sent chills down my spine. At around 3 a.m., the camera had captured a figure walking down the stairs and disappearing out of frame. It was a shadowy figure that seemed to be wearing a hat, just like the one my sister had described. From that moment on, the activity in the house seemed to increase even more. It was like we had opened some sort of portal and all sorts of spirits were now able to come through. We would hear voices, footsteps, and strange noises all throughout the day and night. We even began to feel like we were being watched all the time. Like something was always lurking just out of sight. Eventually, we decided that we couldn't handle living in that house anymore. The constant activity was just too much for us to handle, and it was starting to affect our mental health. We moved out soon after that and hadn't experienced anything like that since. Looking back on that time, I still can't explain what was happening in that house. Was it a haunted house? A portal to another dimension? I may never know for sure. But I do know that it was one of the most intense and unforgettable experiences of my life. R.S. Haunted Church I have a story that happened to me in 2020 that I just can't seem to forget. It was during the COVID-19 pandemic and everyone was getting laid off. I didn't have any family where I was living, so my friends and I decided to stay together. And staying cooped up alone for two months didn't seem like a great idea. We had already worked together previously, so I quarantined at their house with them. After two weeks of everything being closed, we got really bored and decided to explore the bush, where we knew we couldn't see people. We ended up going in a lot of really cool abandoned towns and firehouses. My friends live on reservations, so they had to access a lot of land that was only to them. One day we decided to go to this abandoned church located right off the highway on the edge of the reserve. I'd seen it multiple times while driving along the highway. I always wondered what the backstory of it was. It was really dilapidated. And now after knowing what I know after the event, I don't know why they didn't tear it down. When we first entered the church, there was a two-door entrance, and we entered the first floor from the outside. This led us into the little square room with a ladder going up into the attic. There was a second door leading into the church itself. No amount of money could have gotten me to go into that attic. It was pitch black and rickety, and the vibe just wasn't there. We closed the outside door, and as soon as we entered the second door, the room fell stale and lifeless. The air was very stale and still, and it almost felt like we had stepped into a sensory deprivation room. It just felt wrong. We walked past pews towards where the podium was located on the small little stage that overlooked the room, and there was a rickety staircase that led up to the second floor of pews. I went up and checked it out, but nothing out of the ordinary was found. We continued toward this small back room behind the stage, and this is where things got freaky. There were five of us in this church, my friend, her husband, her two daughters, and myself. We were a few steps away from this room entrance when the sticky, cold feeling washed over me. It was so intense and suddenly I verbally said, it just got really cold in here. And right when I finished that word, the second entrance door into the church itself that we had not left open slammed shut so loud. We all went silent and just looked at each other. My friend actually questioned if we were meant to still be in there. This is where the history lessons come in, which I didn't know previously to entering the building. This was at some point a residential school. And it's not far from where all those bodies of indigenous children were found buried in British Columbia. I had no idea it was a residential school at any point, and I'm not sure I would have entered it had I previously known all this, and I'll never go back due to what happened later. So, my friend's husband gave us a historical rundown of the place, and we decided to leave shortly after because the vibe just wasn't there. That night, I ended up going back home to my house. I felt kind of off and fell asleep quicker than normal, and in the middle of the night around 2am, I sat up in bed out of a dead-ass sleep. 
I opened my eyes and suddenly I let out this breath as if I was underwater for a while. It was a long-winded breath, and I had never done this before. It's almost as if I was throwing up air. In the brief seconds after exhaling, all that crossed my mind was the church and an entity. It's hard to explain because I don't even know what happened, but my thoughts were cued into the church and an entity. A literal second after this, I dropped down on my back and I was asleep until I woke up the next morning. I remember the night's events vividly as it hadn't been sleeping the whole time, but I was. I think that church had a very dark history, and going in unprotected and ignorant to the past made me very vulnerable to whatever entities were stuck inside, and one latched onto me. I've had many paranormal experiences in my life, and I'm sensitive to whatever is on the other side. But this was the first and only event where something like this happened. Sometimes I feel like there's a force watching over me, and that's what ejected this entity out or away from me. I've had many moments in my life where I was very close to death, and miraculously, I didn't get hurt. I really believe someone is watching me and has my back, because the way this thing got expelled out of me felt so real. And even now, I struggle to really explain it clearly enough. I'm trying. I never went back, and I never planned to. Even when other friends mention that they want to go check it out, I want no part of it. I do have video footage of when the door slammed in the church, but the faces of my friends will have to be edited out. So if anyone's interested in seeing that, I'll gladly find a way to blur them and send a link over. The video clearly shows none of us near the entrance of the door when it slams shut directly after I mention how cold it's gotten. Looking back on that experience, I think about how lucky I am to have made it out of there unscathed. I also wonder how many other abandoned buildings hold such dark and terrifying secrets. It's a reminder that we truly never know what we're going to get ourselves into when we explore the unknown, and it's always important to be cautious and aware of the potential dangers that may lie ahead. Does anyone remember this story? It's been nine years since I've heard this story, and I'm not very thrilled to be the storyteller, so bear with me. I also may not get all the details exactly right. I honestly don't even know if the story actually existed, and it was just a bunch of made-up stuff from kids I went to school with, but a lot of my classmates used to recite this story an awful lot, so I figure it may come for the internet for me. All I know is that it used to creep me out. Keep in mind, here's a few alternate versions of the story, too. But I'm not going to go into those, so I'm going to stick to just this one. So anyway, it went something along the lines of this. There's this family, a mother, father, and daughter. The daughter's name was Sally, I think. I don't think the parents were named originally for the sake of the retelling. I'm going to call them Mary and John. I can't for the life of me remember accurately. I don't know the reason why, but there comes a point where Mary and John decide to get rid of their daughter. I may be wrong, but I believe... It could have been because of her bad behavior issues or something like that. So anyway, by get rid of, I mean they literally take Sally to a random location in the middle of nowhere and just leave her there. Again, I'm a little foggy on the details, but I'm pretty sure the parents decide to murder her and dump the body somewhere that won't really be found. A bit extreme, but to each their own, I suppose. So once the body's dealt with, John and Mary return home and go to bed. Fast forward a couple weeks and the parents are in bed trying to sleep when John's awoken by the faint sound of a voice. Concerned and scared, he gets up to go check it out. He searches the house but finds nothing and assumes it's just a dream. The following night, the same thing occurs, but this time, the voice is heard by both parents. John explains his experiences from the night prior and both him and his wife become increasingly worried that maybe someone might be in the house. Both sit quietly for a moment until they hear the voice again. They begin to realize that the voice is repeating itself every few seconds, and they can't seem to make out what it's saying as it's too quiet. Suddenly the voice stops. John hesitantly scouts the house once again and finds nothing. The next night, Mary's unable to sleep due to her paranoia about what had happened previously. In an attempt to ease her mind, she checks that all the doors and windows in the house are locked. After getting back into bed hoping to fall asleep, she suddenly hears the voices again. Terrified, she quickly wakes her husband, 
and like before, the voice seemed to repeat itself at an interval of a few seconds, though this time it's different. This time the voice has become slightly louder and clearer. John and Mary are petrified when they recognize the voice as none other than Sally's. They sit in fear as Sally's voice softly and repeatedly chants the word. Sally is 70 miles away. After speaking these lines for several minutes, the voice stops once again. John and Mary consider calling the police, but ultimately come to the conclusion that this would be a risk that they'd get caught. From that night onward, John and Mary would try their best to ignore the horrifying voice of what seemed to be their own daughter chanting each night. Since the police were not an option, there was really nothing they could do but hope that some kind of prank or something was happening. They really didn't know what to believe. There was no way that this could be possible. Hearing their own deceased daughter's voice, they had noticed that a family with seemingly troublesome children had moved in next door not long after Sally's death. Mary had witnessed these kids messing around with other people's property before, like damaging mailboxes and such. But with this in mind, Mary and John hoped that they were just getting messed with. However, at the same time, the chanting continued, and things only got more unsettling. Each night the voice would get louder and seem to get closer, and they would say the same thing, but with one small difference each time. It would claim to be closer each night. When the voice first became audible that John and Mary had spoke the words Sally is 70 miles away, and the night after that, Sally is 60 miles away, and then 50, 40, 30, and so on. By this point, both parents would refuse to sleep, staying up all night scared and disturbed as to what they were hearing until one night it stopped. Finally, after a week of listening in horror and being depraved to sleep, Mary and John were able to get some. Things returned to normal and through their experience then left them terrified. The couple tried their best to forget both what had happened and what had been done to their daughter. They moved on and they were living their lives normally. This was until one night after several weeks they heard the voice again, and this time it was loudest and the closest it had ever been. John and Mary were in complete disbelief as to what they were hearing. Mary on the verge of tears yelling out for the voice to stop while John sat silent, too scared to talk. Again, the voice would say its chant, but this time it was different. This time it began with, Sally is at your front door. A few moments later, the voice would speak again and say, Sally is in the kitchen. But this time, John and Mary were the most scared they had ever been in their lives, with the covers pulled up to their mouths as they sat, unable to move, looking straight ahead waiting and hoping it would go away. After almost a minute of waiting, the voice spoke again. Sally is at your bedroom door. A few weeks later, the parents were found dead in their bed covered in blood. My first and only paranormal experience still blows my mind. As a 28-year-old adult, I still remember the story that happened when I was just 15 years old. At that time, I was a little pothead that loved smoking weed, so at every chance I got, I was basically every day I'd get high with my friends. But that's not the point. I grew up in a town in the UK that was huge for a town with nearly 100,000 people. Where I used to live was an estate full of houses. I had a best friend at the time who lived about 20 or 25 minute walk away from my house. But in order to get there, we had to walk through a wooded area that led to a big lake that you would walk around to get near his house. One day, randomly, I was out with my friend and many others when we noticed a lot of police presence in the area near the woods. And there was a police helicopter up in the air. Being curious, we followed the police to the woodlands that separated our houses. We went through the woods to the lake where the police and ambulance workers were amongst many bystanders at this point. We got there and started asking people who we knew what had happened. We were told that a young boy around the age of seven had drowned in the lake nearby. And it was right near the path where everyone was gathering. Over the next couple of days, the police were trolling the lake looking for a child who they knew was there because his friend ran out to help when he fell in and couldn't get out. Two or three days later, after he slipped in, the authorities found the young boy's body, which was big news in my town. No later than 24 hours after the boy was found, the
the local council installed a black metal bench on the footpath near where he had died with a little plaque commemorating his life. That very next day, I was out with my friend near where I lived, and we were getting high, and a bunch of other friends that we knew were there too. By the time we were done getting high, we decided to go back to his house to sleep, because my mom would have gotten crazy over the fact that we were that high. We started to walk back to his house at around 11, and it was really dark out. We passed my house and eventually got to the woods. We walked through the woods and got to the start of the lake. We started walking down the side of the lake down the path toward where the kid drowned and the bench was. We were just talking nonsense as high teens did when I noticed that when the bench got into sight, there was a man that sat on it. Now I was a bit freaked out, but I didn't say anything yet. It was 11 p.m. near the woods in the dark, so it was creepy. But when I got a little closer, I noticed I could see what the man was wearing, and he was dressed as a priest. You know, black jacket, white collar. Upon seeing this priest, I breathed a sigh of relief, because I was presuming that he was maybe praying or something of the sort, maybe for the kid that had drowned. So after noticing this priest, I just watched him sit there as I got closer and closer. I didn't say anything to my friend who was right next to me, but we collectively stopped talking once we noticed him. As we got closer, it was more obvious that he was a priest, and then once we got within five meters, he was gone. I felt like I blinked and he just disappeared. When we were walking past the actual bench where I saw him sit, there was nobody there. But if he would have gotten up and walked away, I would have seen him because it was a one-track walkway. But he just vanished. After I got to the bench, I turned to my friend who was just as confused and spooked as I was. I asked him if he had seen the man that sat on the bench. I didn't want to say what type of man because the way he was dressed was very obvious as to what type of man he was. But I asked him, Did you just see that man sitting on the bench? He said, Yeah, the guy dressed like a priest. When I tell you my heart sunk, I can't explain that feeling or that situation. What gets me is that I purposely asked my friend that he was a man and he corrected me by saying that the man was a priest. If it was a person, they would have just maybe got up and walked away, straight down the line in the path, which we would have seen. Or they would have just walked right past us, but no, when we got close, poof, gone. Still to this day, it's my only paranormal experience, but it blows my mind every time I think about it. I still wonder if that priest was a ghost or if he was a real person. Perhaps he was there to offer his prayers to the young boy who drowned. But why did he disappear so suddenly? Was it some kind of supernatural occurrence? Or was it just a trick of the light? If we were seeing things, maybe. These questions still plague me, and the incident left a lasting impression on me, too, and I became more curious about the paranormal. I started reading books on ghosts, hauntings, and the supernatural. I even visited haunted places and went on ghost hunts with friends. But nothing ever came close to that one experience I had by the lake. Looking back on that night, I realized how easily we could have been in danger. Walking in the woods at night while under the influence of drugs was not the smartest thing to do. But we were young and foolish, and we thought nothing could harm us. Little did we know that we were about to have a brush with the unknown. In conclusion, that night by the lake remains one of the most mysterious and puzzling experiences of my life. It taught me to be more aware of my surroundings and to always keep an open mind. Who knows what other strange and unexplainable events might be lurking around the corner. Evil Spirits in the Creek So a couple of weeks ago I was headed out to my family cemetery, about five miles outside of town. I hadn't been out there since a couple of days after Christmas right after I had learned that my dad had finally lost his battle with lung cancer. I've spent a lot of time at the cemetery over the last few years. I like to go out there and do audio recordings, and just for the fact, it's just so peaceful out there. Well, it used to be. I've had some really bad experiences out there in the last couple of years. I have gotten some really nasty EVPs, and it turned into a very dark place at night. But that's a story for another time. Now when I go out there, I always stop at the little country church, about a mile down the road. 
The reason for this is because the church used to belong to my great-grandfather and my great-uncle, both of whom preached there. And I go there and ask for their protection and guidance before going to the cemetery. But on this night, I changed my pattern for some reason. Instead of going to the church first, I drove on past the cemetery, about a half a mile, to some property that my aunt and uncle own. There's a small creek that runs along the road. Just before you get to the creek is where my life started out, the old homestead. Now at the bottom of the hill over the creek, crosses under a road and makes a sharp turn to continue following the road. In that turn is what used to be a pretty deep hole. My mom and dad grew up right down the road from there, and all my family used to swim in that hole and fish. Now it's been a very long time since my parents and my uncle even saw me swam there. As a matter of fact, over the years that hole's been filled in, and so no more. Just a shallow bend in the creek. Back in the day, one of my uncle's high school friends drowned there. My uncle also drowned there, but they were able to revive him, thank God. So when I arrived there, I backed my truck into the drive. I was barely off the roadway and left my headlights and the motor running. I was only going to be in there for a minute, and I started to record a video on my iPhone, and I was describing why I was going to the cemetery. Now, during all of this, at one point, I thought I saw something pop up from the creek and then go back down really quickly. However, I tried to ignore it and kept going about with my video. After a minute or so, it happened again. I didn't miss a beat and kept on filming, but noted that it appeared to be a figure, human in nature, but grayish white, kind of skinny, but I didn't see a face. Once again, I kept right on going, trying to ignore what I had seen, and then it happened a third time. This time it looked more gray than white and there was no face, and at that moment, the feeling of something dark, unfriendly, and mad, and I was there. And it was washing over me, and every hair in my body stood straight on end. I start saying, this isn't good, repeatedly. And then I got the feeling that something aggressive and mad as hell was approaching very quickly. I tried to get out of there as quickly as I could, but it wasn't quick enough. Anyone ever get that, some call spirit jumped? It's where a spirit or entity jumps into your body. It's brief most of the time, but not brief enough. Your body goes into survival mode, adrenaline dumps, but not like a normal adrenaline dump. This is like 10 times worse. It may also feel like your breath is sucked right out of your lungs and it's a struggle to breathe in any air. It's scary as hell when it happens. You also feel like something evil has reached into your body and grabbed your soul. It's a very demanding warning to get the hell away and by any means necessary. When I pulled out of there, I headed straight up the road to the church, but before I could get there, I heard a very ominous growl over my left shoulder and got hit a second time. This time was much worse than the first. I became very vocal and demanded that it get away and out of my truck, but it stayed until I reached the church. When I pulled in, I called upon my great-grandfather to help. Then I was hit a third time. It was brief, but the point was getting across to me. I could feel everything lighten up, as they say. The hairs went down, and I became relaxed fairly quickly. I left the church and went back home, where I had my daughter bring out my Bible, and I didn't go inside until I was certain that whatever it was had left me. The next morning, I went to the family cemetery, stopping at the church first, of course. I used the Necrophonic app, which I used quite a bit from time to time. I didn't even ask about the night before, but I was told that there was evil at the creek. Stay away from the water. They called it dark water. I had never in almost three years of using that app ever gotten those responses, or any mentions of water or dark water. And no, I was not under the influence of anything. I take no medications, and other than PTSD, I have no mental health issues. This particular area is pretty rural. The area had a lot of Native American activity, and it's within 300 feet of a known burial ground, as well as another cemetery that had long been forgotten. As a kid, the woods around the area always seemed to have a dark side, but always felt watched when we were playing in the woods around there. There's also a piece of property within a quarter mile that was rumored of being owned by a witch. Dravo Park 
when you know not to return. Dreyfo Park is one of the many parks along the Great Miami River in our area. It used to be my favorite place because we could walk our rescue pit bull there, and it was a city park, so we were all permitted to use the boat and kayak ramps. Here are the reasons I will not be going back, nor will I pull out my kayak at that ramp. First, we took our dog to walk in the basketball field. He was being reintroduced to the new situation, people, and smells due to him being prior stressful environments that caused him to bite when he got scared. And everything scared him at the time. So, limited people were best. We walked the entire tree line down to the water and then back to my car along the same tree line. Whenever I get out of my car, I always attach my keys to my belt due to my habit of just settling things down. Well, guess what? No keys on the belt. It was startling to get so dark so my husband immediately walked to the tree line once, maybe two, three more times. And while he's doing that, I'm settling on the ground with the pup right in front of the car. He can't find the keys and I'm starting to make plans for a pickup. He walks to the driver's side, open the door, and let the dogs in. And you could see his look of confusion as he closed the door and pulls the key out of the lock. Just the car key. My keychains and other keys were gone. We looked at each other, and I'm sure the look of our faces resembled maybe the look that I had on my face. As his hands met the key, my entire spirit team is screaming, leave now. But I was frozen maybe five or seven seconds, and it felt like something tall was standing behind me. I got cold chills, and then I hear a whisper, leave. I turned to see if someone was behind me. But there wasn't anything, and my gut knew that. During this whole 30 seconds from the time he found the key to us both jumping in the car, my dog was barking and growling in the back seat. Needless to say, we got out of there fast. Here's the next story and the best part. Last March, Cincinnati had record rainfall. We decided to take my daughter to Dravo Park an hour before dusk. The temperature was 45 degrees when we start the walk down to the boat ramp. There's a hill to the left right there that rises up about 50 feet and then flattens out in the woods behind there. Prior to this day, I wouldn't have known how high the hill goes up due to the tree and the large amount of tropical Ohio brush. We could see that the water had risen to the top of the hill and back about 70 or 100 feet. We decided to go explore the top of the hill because the water had taken the brush out from the entire area. As we were walking, you could see the path that was rushing water, took and through the mud. We walked about 20 minutes in or so, and I noticed the sun's going down. My husband and daughter were in the front of me, and I say, We're losing light. we got to turn back now. And I pivoted on my foot and turned around, stopping, immediately gasping. There stood a man less than 10 feet from me. He was old with many wrinkles. He was tall and wearing old-style colors. His jacket was blue and his pants were blue. His hat looked like a thick bear and strands of hair poking out all around it. He was skinny and looked emasculated and frail. He didn't move and just stood staring at me with his hands at his side. A couple seconds slowly crept by and I hear my daughter say, Mom, Mom. I turned to see what was wrong and when I turned, he was gone. Apparently they had been calling my name for a better part of a minute and I didn't hear them. So what I thought was ten seconds was a lot longer for them. So I'm freaking out and we immediately hike back to get back to the car. As the sky loses its last bit of light, guess what? No keys. That's when I really freaked out. There were no lights in this park at all, and the temp was dropping. There was no way we could turn around and go back into the woods to look. The car was locked, and yes, we checked the door. I called my older daughter to get a ride out of that place. Next day, my husband took his bike to went back to go look for the keys, and he found the car key. He said he walked the whole area we were and didn't see them. But as he walked back to the boat dock at the top of the hill where the concrete meets the grass, there were my keys, stuck in the ground, standing straight up in the area I never walked in. I vowed never to return, and I should have kept away, but I didn't. Two weeks ago, we were teaching my youngest to drive in the back road, because there's a lot less traveling there. She was pretty nervous in about 20 minutes into it, and then she was done. Dravo Park was on the right, so I told her to turn right and park and switch. She starts to make the turn into the parking spot and the car lunges forward. There were woods about eight feet from the concrete barrier at the top of the spot. I'm screaming, brake, brake. And I see her leg move up and down, trying to brake with no avail. 
Then suddenly the car stops within an inch, to spare throwing all of us forward. Once it was in park, I turned to her and asked her what she didn't brake for, and why she was hitting the gas and pulling into a parking spot. At this time she's crying, saying that she was braking and that it weren't working. At the time, I didn't believe her. Once I was home, I started to think about all the creepy things that had happened in Dravo Park, and I determined I'm never going to go back. I will never dock out my kayak there, and I'll never kayak the extra three miles to the next pullout. What do y'all think? Haunted Park? A dark time in my life. In October 2018, I decided to move in with my girlfriend for the first time. I'll refer to her as Jane. Little did I know what would happen in the five months that would follow. If I knew, I would never have agreed to move in. I vividly remember the night that everything started. It was a very important night, and I'll come back to this part later in the story. One night, Jane's mother and brother came over to stay with us. Unfortunately, I wasn't feeling very well, so I decided to relax in our bedroom while they hung out on the porch till late at night. Jane came in at some point and asked if I needed anything. She seemed genuinely concerned. A little while after that, I was in bed alone with my eyes closed when I felt a hand on my arm, and I opened my eyes. Jane was kneeling next to our bed, touching me and asked if I needed anything again. She had a really condescending look on her face, which was initially just annoying to me. I replied that I was fine, I closed my eyes again, hoping she'd let me rest. A minute later, I opened my eyes again because I didn't hear her leave the room or open the door to leave. She was gone. I looked next to the bed because I was thinking, is this crazy chick laying on the floor or something? She wasn't there, so I looked at the door and saw the hallway light coming from underneath it. Now, I was never asleep, and I was questioning how I never saw the light shine in when she came in the room or heard it. I went to text her to see if she had just come in the room again, but decided against it. I didn't ask at this point because I didn't want to seem crazy to her family that was over, and honestly, I knew that that was the right choice. She had never come into the room. A few nights after that, I remember laying in bed with Jane and feeling her hand touch my thigh, and then I felt the fingers drag away. She was asleep, and I was creeped out. Eventually, I told her about it the first night, and we both just agreed that it was something really weird. We both just brushed it off. About a week after that first incident, I woke up in the middle of the night and I saw a black sphere just floating in the corner of the room near the ceiling. I sat up, rubbed my eyes, and at this point, I was wide awake and it was still there. It started to move towards me across the room, got about a foot away from my face and stared into it. What I saw was facial features, more lion-like than human. I remember big teeth and what instantly stood out to me was that its face looked very condescending. I felt like whatever this was, it wanted me to know that it was the same thing I crossed paths with weeks prior. I told Jane about the things that were happening, and she never thought I was lying, but I'll admit that there were times I seriously started to question myself until things started happening to other people around me. I'll get into that soon. One day I went out to our back porch to smoke, and when I stopped outside, the porch light dimmed way down. I thought she turned on a machine in the house or something. I went to tighten the bulb, but there was a glass fixture around where it was screwed in, and I just decided I didn't feel like getting a screwdriver. A minute later, I came back full strength as always. This porch can't be accessed from anywhere and inside the apartment, it's screened in. There's no other door to the outside. The next few days were a blur to me. I didn't know what to do or who to turn to. I couldn't stay in that apartment for any longer and I had to get out of there. I was afraid for my life and I knew that if I stayed there any longer, something terrible would happen to me. I started looking for a new place. I didn't want to live alone, so I looked for a roommate. After a few days of searching, I found someone that was looking for a roommate too. We met and I told him everything that had happened to me and he believed me and offered to let me stay with him until I found a new place to live. A few days later, I moved in with my new roommate and I felt safer there, but I was still haunted by what had happened to me and I couldn't sleep. I was afraid to be alone. One day, I woke up to a loud noise in the middle of the night. I went to investigate and I saw the front door was wide open. I was alone in the apartment and I knew that I'd locked the door before I went to bed. I searched the apartment, but there was no one there. 
I started to think that whatever was haunting me had followed me to this new place. I didn't know what to do, so I decided to seek help of a paranormal investigator. The investigator came to my apartment, and we went through the place with all this equipment. We found nothing unusual, and he told me that there was no evidence of any paranormal activity in the apartment. I was relieved, but still didn't feel safe. I decided to see a therapist. I needed to talk to someone about what had happened to me. The therapist listened to my story and told me that what I experienced was probably a manifestation of my own fears or anxieties. He said that I needed to confront my fears and try to move on from what had happened. Over time, I started to feel better. I no longer felt like something was following me, and I was able to sleep at night. I moved into a new place and I started a new chapter of my life. Looking back on that time, I still don't know what to make of it, though. Was it all in my head? Was it a manifestation of my own fears and anxieties? Or was there really something paranormal going on? I may never know the answer, but one thing's for sure. I'll never forget those five months that I spent with Jane. It was a time in my life that changed me forever, and I'll always be haunted by the memories of what happened in that apartment. My second poltergeist encounter. This took place in early 2000s, maybe 2004, in an apartment I lived in with my parents and my brother. Before I tell the story, let me describe what my room looked like. It's relative to the story. My room was pretty basic. Imagine a square. And on the bottom of the square is the entrance to the room, and to the left, on the same wall, is a built-in closet with mirrored doors. On the left wall, is a daybed-style bed, looked like a fancy couch. On top of the wall is the window covered with Venetian blinds and cheap colored aluminum ones. I always close the blinds when I go to sleep, and they were in the down and closed position and the room was rather dark, important to note. On the right wall is my computer desk and some shelves. When I would lie in my bed, my head would be towards the windows and my feet towards the closet. I can see the windows from the closet mirror when I look towards my feet. All right, so the story. It was an early Saturday morning back in early 2000. Something and my mom comes into my room and places the cordless phone, remember those, near me on my bed. Why, I hear you ask? It's because the answering machine we have is not good enough for her, so she needs me to answer the phone when she's not home. Makes total sense. My mom places the phone near my head and tells me she's going out with my dad to answer the phone if it rings. Me, barely conscious of her even talking to me, grunts my ascent back to sleep. Around 10 o'clock that morning, my phone rings. It's my friend. Let's call her Jenny. She had a bad habit of calling me every Saturday at 10 a.m. to wake me up because she's bored. No matter how many times I asked her not to call me so early, as if it was my only day off during the week and I'd have to sleep in, she still called every Saturday at 10 a.m., I groggily answer the phone, and this is the short conversation we had. Me. Hello? Jenny. Way too cheerful. Hey, how's it going? What are you doing? Do you want to meet up? After a few seconds to realize who I'm talking to, uh, I'm sleeping. Come on, let's meet up on board. Do you want to come? Do you want me to pick you up? Give me a little bit of time. I'll fully wake up and call you back. Okay, don't take too long. I'm bored. Uh Uh-huh. I hang up, roll over, and fall asleep for about five seconds. And that's when the room floods with light, with the sound of a whoosh. I open my eyes and look down toward the mirror, and at the window, and the blinds are now open. You know how Venetian blinds have one string for pulling the blinds up, and another stick thing that you twist in order to open it and close the shutters? Well, the shutters were open in the blink of an eye, just whoosh, and they were open. I jump to a sitting position instantly with my arms over my head, as if being held at gunpoint, blinking the bright daylight suddenly streaming in through the window, screaming in an empty room, Okay, okay, I'm up, I'm up, goddammit. I picked up the phone and called Jenny, and fully awake now, I said, I'm ready, will you come pick me up now? She said, okay, great, I'll call you when I'm downstairs, I'll be there in 20 minutes. I told her, don't worry about it, I'll be there waiting already. I changed clothes at the speed of light and ran out of my room downstairs and spent the next 15 minutes smoking furiously until Jenny arrived. 
Later that day when I got back home, I was calmed down enough to see what the fuck happened with the blinds. I mean, if they were open and they fell down, I'd blame gravity or the cheap string that held them together. But they were opened in the blink of an eye. They went up. Against all knows of physics and forces of nature, they went up. I know the blinds were down beforehand because I already woke up twice prior to that happening and the room was rather dark. Usually to open the shutters, you take the stick thing and twist it about 20 times to get them to open fully. I never, and I mean never, was able to open them that fast myself. I even put the stick thing between my palms and tried rubbing them really fast in one direction to get them to open that fast, but nope, didn't work. It only opened a small fraction at a time. That stick thing doesn't open the blinds that easily. It's been around 20 years since that day, and I still can't figure out what the fuck. I guess it was friendly spirit. A spirit who knew I would be asleep for a few hours more and make Jenny just wait and wait. Also, more likely she'd have called me back a few times, and I'd hang up each time with a promise to get up in order to fall asleep again, an accurate description of what would have probably happened. They know me so well. So the spirit decided to save us both the trouble and just wake me the fuck up. Maybe the walls between realities or space-time or whatever was thin that day. With that apartment, and so in one reality I went back to sleep while in the other parallel reality I actually got out of bed and opened the blinds and went on with my day, I don't really know. This is not the only poltergeist activity that's happened in that room. I'll write about that other experience next week titled My Third Poltergeist. I used to sleep with the nightlight on as I became scared of the dark after a bunch of experiences when I was in my early 20s. And that day made me realize that ghosts or spirits don't need darkness in order to haunt or interact with you. My terrifying experience with the demon. I've been thinking about it for a while now, and I believe it's time to share my story. It's a true story that happened to me, and I'm here to tell all of it. I'm not trying to prove anything to skeptics or anyone else, I'm just sharing my experience. Those who have experienced anything similar to what I've experienced will understand that it's possible. Let me take you back to when I was 13 or 14 years old. I'm 21 now. I used to watch ghost shows for fun and entertainment, but I never believed that what I saw could actually happen to me. I believed it was possible, but I had my doubts. One night, I did something dumb. I was so curious about the existence of genies that I sat in prayer one night, and after finishing my prayer, I called out to Allah and asked him if genies were real and to let me have an experience of my own. I don't know why I asked for that. I know it was dumb, but I was curious. And this is where it all started. After making that prayer one night, while getting ready to sleep, I heard a woman say to me in a soft, soothing voice with an accent I'd never heard before, Go to sleep, sweetheart. It was as if she was right behind me, and at that moment I hadn't experienced anything like that before. I thought it was because I was tired. I fell asleep and woke up the next morning getting ready for school. I was putting on my clothes when something came up to my left ear and started speaking in this deep, guttural voice that no human man or woman could ever make. It was speaking in a language I'd never heard before in my entire life. In that moment, I didn't understand what was happening, and I was frozen in fear. It terrified me. All I know is that, as soon as it was done, I went to my mother in a panic and everyone was asking me what was wrong. After that incident, I started to feel something watching me, and I felt it more when I was alone. I was uncomfortable to be in my room alone. I always had this creepy, scary feeling at certain times in the night, almost as if it was a perfect opportunity for this thing to attack me. And one night, it was in one of those uncomfortable nights, so I lay in my bed listening to Quran with headphones. Suddenly, this thing came up to my ear again, and blocked the sound of the Quran playing in my ear. It was as if it completely muffled out my earphones. Then it began to speak in this deep, guttural voice in a language I couldn't understand. It freaked me out, and I was shaking and scared. One thing about me was that I stayed on my prayers, and I read and I listen to the Quran constantly. But if I ever missed my prayer, this thing would come for me. 
when I missed a prayer, it was almost like an opportunity for it to come after me. It hated prayer. And one time I stood and prayed in my own head and said, Alu Akbar, loudly. And this thing screamed, no, in a high-pitched voice. This jinn would also constantly growl during the night at the bottom of the stairs like an animal. Let me share with you the last three experiences I had with this jinn. One night, I went to my cousin's house, and the house was mainly full of female family members. The only male was a boy who wasn't older than the age of seven. And one night, I woke up while everyone was fast asleep. I could hear snores. I got up, went to the kitchen, and started preparing breakfast. I decided to make pancakes my favorite breakfast food. As I was mixing the batter, I realized I'd run out of eggs. I was annoyed because I didn't want to leave my house to go to the grocery store. However, I remembered that my neighbor, Mrs. Johnson, had some chickens in her backyard, and she often gave me fresh eggs. So I went over to her house and asked if she had any spare. When I knocked on the door, Miss Johnson greeted me warmly and invited me in. I explained my situation, and she happily gave me a dozen eggs. As I was leaving, she reminded me that she was having a potluck later that day and invited me to join in the festivities. I accepted her invitation and told her that I'd bring some of my famous homemade salsa. After leaving her house, I went back to my kitchen and finished making pancakes. They turned out perfectly golden brown, and I served them with a side of fresh fruit and some syrup. I sat down at the table and enjoyed my delicious breakfast. Later that day, I went to the potluck at Mrs. Johnson's house. She had a beautiful garden, and she had decorated her backyard with flowers and balloons. There were lots of people there, and I recognized many of them from the neighborhood. I brought my homemade salsa, and everyone raved about how delicious it was. We all sat together at the long table enjoying the food and conversation, and I learned that one of the guests was a retired astronaut who had been in space several times. He shared some amazing stories about his experiences, and we all listened in awe. As the sun began to set, the party wound down, and people started to say their goodbyes. I helped Mrs. Johnson clean up, and we chatted for a while longer. She told me about her grandchildren and how much she loved spending time with them. After saying goodbye to Mrs. Johnson, I walked back to my house, feeling grateful for the wonderful day that I'd had. I reflected on how lucky I was to have such a great neighbor to live in such a friendly and welcoming community. And as I walked into my house, I felt content and happy, ready to relax and enjoy the rest of my day. How did the grape move? So a little background before I get into detail about what happened. I'm a very science-based person. If something happens that confuses me or someone else, I do my best to use science to explain that phenomenon. And it hasn't failed me yet, other than questions about physics that just haven't been answered yet. And the best you can do is form a theory. So last night, I couldn't use science to figure out how an item moved across the way it did. I reached a block, and I have no other explanation other than it was either a glitch in the matrix, as some like to say, or a spirit. With that in mind, I hope you read this, or hear this, with an open mind. Last night, my roommate and I were in the kitchen of our house. Housing is on my college campus. And I was eating grapes, and I had this amazing idea to try and make a raisin out of it. And I put it on top of the box at the center of our kitchen table. Yeah, I'm aware that it wouldn't turn into a grape that way. It was just because it seemed too stupid. Anyway, I was continuing to cut up food for my dinner, and my roommate was sitting in one of the chairs nobody else was in in the house. And no music was playing. And out of the corner of my eye, the grape just pretty much moved close to the edge of the table and didn't roll off. The grape didn't slightly roll off the box and then continue to roll to the edge. No, it had a little bit of air, and once it hit the table, it was still and didn't continue to roll. It was as if someone had walked by and was like, I'm going to move this grape, because why not? Usually, if something like that were to happen, the noise would be made by someone hitting the table, which would mean that because someone hit the table, the grape would move. But that's the thing, nobody hit the table. Another thing to mention is that it wasn't just me who was confused. When I saw the grape move, I was silent for five to seven seconds. 
And then I looked at my roommate to see if they saw anything or if I was just crazy. And that's a thing. He was already looking at me to figure out if I had seen what he saw. At this point, we have a grate moving on its own, getting a little bit of air, and it was moving through the air pretty fast, fast enough to the point that I had been in almost flicked from behind or picked it up with a hand and then placed it back down. Nobody had moved or hit the table because it was just me and my roommate, and there was no sound of something hitting the table. So now my roommate and I are being scientific people, we decide not to take the pictures of where the grapes was, or excuse me, not only to take the pictures of where the grapes were, but where it had landed, and we tried to recreate the experiment. After making a border of where the grape exactly landed, we decided to put the grape back on the box and bump into the table as if someone were to hit the table just in case we actually did hit it and just didn't realize. What we found was that no matter how hard we were to bump or hit the table, the grape either would just wobble on the box, or if it did manage to roll, it would only slowly roll off the box and wouldn't go far at all. We tried blowing on the graph to see if maybe the air conditioner would have done something, but didn't think so because we were trying to rule every possible scenario out. After countless efforts, we reached the conclusion that we had no idea what had moved it we began to bring a little spirituality into the mix. Once everything was ruled out, either because the grape was moving too fast, it was in the air for too long, or somehow I had a little bit of air time, we decided to try to act like a spirit. As one person sat in the chair, the other walked by and moved the grape similarly to how it looked to us. We found that this was the only scenario that allowed the grape to move the way that it did. My roommate and I were pretty convinced that the only explanation that we have is that it was some sort of spirit. As much as I'd like to grab onto that concept, I tried to bring a little more science into the mix by thinking about separate timelines crossing where my roommate did, and in fact moved the grape. And somehow our timelines crossed, and so on, but that scenario has some problems and whatnot, and they're a little confusing. A cool idea I had, but Maybe it was the future us, and we somehow were able to travel back in time and move the grape almost like what happened in Interstellar when they thought that they were communicating with aliens, but it was actually them the entire time. Sorry for the spoiler. Traveling back in time, as some know, has a lot of multiverse theory. Then it gets a little bit more promising, but again, there's more problems that come with that, and I was thinking that it was a spirit. While one is more scientific, the other seems more reasonable. By now, I hope you have a pretty good understanding of what happened, and I hope some people would give their input and ideas as to what happened, because nobody can be right or wrong. But some theories may be better than others at explaining this particular phenomenon. I also included some pictures so you can get a better idea of what we're talking about here. Someone who wasn't there stayed upstairs, the upstairs boogeyman. When I got married, my husband and I moved into an old house that he inherited. The house was built in the early 1920s, and although it had visible age and history, my husband had been working on remodeling it and had made a decent amount of progress by the time that we moved in. However, there was something about the house that never felt quite right. I couldn't explain it, but it just felt off. Maybe it was because I knew a couple of my husband's family members had passed away in the house. I experienced all the typical ghostly encounters that you hear about. The feeling of being watched, the feeling of not being alone when you were alone, and so on. But there was one experience that even my husband was baffled about. One night, he and I had settled into bed, and we were on our way into falling asleep when we heard movement upstairs. At first, I didn't move or say anything thinking I had imagined it, but the sound of footsteps above us got louder and louder. My husband sat up saying, You hear that too, right? I was pretty much shaking and mumbled. Of course. As it sounded like the footsteps were running across the upper floor, my husband hopped out of bed and ran to the door and up the stairs. A few minutes later, he came back down the stairs into our bedroom and shut the door. At first, he didn't answer when I asked what it was. 
After prying at him again, he simply said, I'm sure it's just my great-grandmother checking in on us. She was one of the family members who had passed away in the house. But I wasn't convinced. This didn't feel like a friendly family ghost just visiting. It felt plain malicious to me. After that night, I started hearing the sounds of movement upstairs when no one was up there. Then the distinctive squeaking noise of our stairs, when someone was walking on them, started happening when I was alone downstairs. I can still feel the chills all over me when I'd hear this right behind me while sitting on the couch in the downstairs living room. One day, my friend had the bright idea to buy a Ouija board and to use it in the house. After telling her some of what I was experiencing, she was dying to try and see if anything would make contact. I flat out refused, but did keep the board upon her insisting that I may at some point want to try it. I took the board, still in its box, and placed it on a shelf at the top of a small linen closet we had. I closed the door with every intention of forgetting the board was even there. However, after this, that closet door never stayed shut. I would find it half open almost every time I walked by it. I started thinking I was actually shutting it completely, and it got to the point where I'd make sure I heard the door latch and would even pull on the doorknob to be sure that it wasn't open. Yet sometime later, I'd go get a towel and find it half open. All while, it would just be me in the house. I'll never forget one of the terrifying experiences I had before we finally moved out. My husband was working a double shift at his job, and it was dark by the time I made it back home that evening. After getting home, I went to straightening up the house. As I was picking things up, I reached down and nearly grabbed a massive black spider. I recoiled in horror before realizing it was a fake plastic spider my nephew had been playing with earlier in the day. I was half relieved and half annoyed, as I was always on edge any time I was alone in the house anyway and grabbed the creepy toy and flung it hard up the stairs. There is a bedroom up there where I kept toys for my nephew when he visited. I planned to pick it up and pack it away in his toy box when I went up there to straighten up the room later. Side note, my nephew was terrified to sleep up there and would often not play up there alone because of what he called spookies. As I turned away from the steps to go back to cleaning the downstairs, I heard a whooshing through the air and then something slammed against the wall at the bottom of the steps. I jumped to see what in the world it was and felt my blood run ice cold. There that stupid toy spider lay on the floor at the bottom of the steps as if someone or something had thrown it back down the stairs, hard. I left that house. I left with my keys and my phone and called my husband. I told him that I was going to my parents' house until he got home. As previously mentioned, we moved shortly after this experience and I was never alone in that house after dark again. That house has sat vacant since we left, still debating on selling or renting it out. My husband still insists that it was his prankster grandmother. I still refer to it as the upstairs boogeyman. Thinking back on that experience, I wonder what exactly was causing those strange occurrences in that old house. Was it the lingering presence of a deceased family member? Or was it something much darker and more sinister? I may never know, but I'm glad to be farther away from that house. The incident with the door handle turning on its own had shaken me to the core. I couldn't help but wonder if there was something more sinister lurking in the shadows of my apartment building. I tried to brush it off as a freak occurrence, but deep down, I knew there was something not quite right about the building. Over the next few weeks, strange things began to happen with increasing frequency. I would hear footsteps outside my door late at night, but when I checked, there was never anything there. Objects would move inexplicably, and sometimes I would catch a glimpse of some strange shapes or shadows out of the corner of my eye. I tried to tell myself that I was just being paranoid, but the unease that had settled in my chest wouldn't go away. It was as though something was watching me, waiting for me to let my guard down so that it could pounce. One night I decided to do some investigating. I waited until midnight, when I knew that most people would be asleep, and then I crept out of my apartment and into the stairwell. It was eerily quiet, and the only sound was my own breathing and the soft click of my footsteps against the concrete. 
I made my way up to the fourth floor where I knew there was a storage room that was rarely used. As I approached the door, I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. I knew that I was taking a risk, but I had to know what was going on here. I pushed the door open slowly and stepped inside. It was pitch black, and for a moment I couldn't see anything. Then as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw something move in the corner of the room. I froze, unsure of what to do next. It was as though something was watching me, sizing me up, trying to decide whether or not I was a threat. My mind raced with possibilities and I wondered if I had made a mistake by coming here alone. Then suddenly there was a flash of movement and I felt something brush past me. I suddenly stumbled backwards, tripping over a pile of boxes and I fell to the ground. When I looked up, I saw a figure standing in front of me. It was tall and thin with long arms and legs that seemed to stretch on forever. Its face was twisted into a grotesque mask with eyes that glowed red in the darkness. I screamed, scrambling backwards as fast as I could. The figure advanced towards me. Its long limbs reached out to grab me. I knew that I had to get away or else I'd be trapped forever in this particular nightmare. I scrambled in my feet and ran toward the door, praying that it would open. To my relief, it did, and as I burst through into the stairwell, grasping my breath, I didn't stop running until I reached my apartment, and even then, I locked the door behind me, huddled in the corner, trembling in fear. I knew that I'd seen something that night, something that was not of this world, and I didn't know what to do. The next day, I called in sick to work, and I spent a day researching paranormal activity in the area. I found a website that listed all the reported hauntings in the city, and as I scrolled through the list, I felt a chill run down my spine. There on the list was my apartment. It was said to be haunted by a ghost of a man who died in a freak accident on the fourth floor. His spirit was said to roam the building searching for something that he had lost in life. As I read through the accounts of other residents who had experienced strange phenomena, I felt a sense of validation. Finally, I had proof that I wasn't just imagining things. There was something truly eerie about this building, and I wasn't the only one who noticed it. But at the time, I couldn't help but feel a sense of dread. If the building was truly haunted, what was I supposed to do? I couldn't just move out. I had signed a lease for a year, and breaking it would mean paying a hefty fee. I decided to take matters into my own hands. I began researching ways to cleanse the haunted space and came across a number of different methods. Burning sage, sprinkling salt, reciting prayers, and more. I wasn't sure which method was the best, but I knew that I had to try something. So that night, armed with a bundle of sage and a bottle of holy water I had borrowed from a friend, I set out to cleanse my apartment. I started with the living room moving clockwise around the room and wafting the smoke from the sage around the edges of the walls. I recited a prayer under my breath, asking for protection and guidance. As I worked, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me, as though I was doing something important and powerful. When I finished with the living room, I moved on to the kitchen, then the bedroom, and finally the bathroom. By the time I was done, it was well past midnight, and I was exhausted, but I felt a sense of accomplishment, for the first time in weeks, I felt as though I had control over the situation. Over the next few days, things seemed to calm down. I didn't hear any more strange noises or see any more shadows out of the corners of my eye. I began to wonder if I had truly banished the ghost from my apartment. But then, as I was getting ready for bed, I heard a soft tapping on my window. I froze. When I turned to look, I saw a figure standing outside, staring in at me with glowing red eyes. I knew then that I'd been foolish to think that I could banish this ghost so easily. It was still here, still watching me, still waiting for me to let my guard down, and I knew that I had to be ready in case it decided to strike again. My possibly haunted apartment. A few weeks ago, I posted a strange occurrence in my apartment where I heard a girl or a woman say, uh-oh, one night when I was alone. Since then, I've been compiling a list of other weird things that have happened in my apartment. As I go over them, I can't help but wonder what other people would think. It all started in early 2021. I'd moved into the apartment in late 2019, and for the first year and a half, I hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary. But all that changed one day. 
I was hanging out with some friends in a Discord voice chat when I glanced down the length of my hallway. Just by turning my head, I could see down the hallway into the dining room, and from there, I could see my desk. To my surprise, I saw what looked like a shadow of a woman's arm in the doorway of the dining room, as if the woman it was connected to was standing just inside, out of sight. At first, I thought maybe it was just a shadow, but I saw it clear enough that it caught my attention. It was still there after I looked away once or twice. I was about to tell the Discord chat about it when it finally disappeared. I convinced myself I hadn't seen anything at all. A few months later, sometime around November 2021, February 2022, I was awakened one night by what sounded like a choir singing. It was as if people were singing in my room. Now there is a church next door, but I've never heard them practice before. It was around 3 a.m. in the morning. I lay there fully awake, very confused, until the noise finally stopped. I convinced myself that it was only a very late night practice for the church next door. Over a year later, earlier this year, I was sitting on the couch in the living room playing solitaire on my phone, and preparing to get ready for bed as I sat there, fully awake and aware of all the noises around me, I heard a young woman or maybe a child's voice say, uh-oh, from the direction of the dining room. I've heard other people's TVs and sounds from the apartments around me before, but they all sounded muffled and quiet. This wasn't. It was clear and loud. A couple of weeks later, I was in the dining room, bent over, grabbing a couple of water bottles from the cask in the corner of the room. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught some movement. I watched as something, perhaps a lady's skirt, moved from one corner of the room to the other. This wasn't just something that I saw and then wasn't there when I went to look back. I watched as it moved across the floor for several seconds. I never thought to stand up and turn around. Why, I'll never know. Finally, last night, I was listening to someone on YouTube talk about a 1980 film, when suddenly, along with the audio from the video, I heard what sounded like a woman's wordless, barely audible whispering right next to my left ear. It stopped me in my tracks. I frowned, rewound the video to where I had first heard it, and it simply wasn't there. It had never been in the video. All of these incidents have left me wondering what was going on in my apartment. Is it haunted, or is it just my imagination? I've tried to explain these things away, but the more they happen, the less I'm able to do so. The incident that stands out the most to me is the girl and young woman saying, uh-oh, in the dining room. It was so clear and loud that it couldn't be explained away by any logical means. And the fact that it was heard in the same room where I saw the shadow of a woman's arm and where I saw something move across the floor only adds to the mystery. I've tried to come up with explanations for these strange events. Maybe it's just my mind playing tricks on me. Maybe I'm tired, stressed, and just imagining things. Or perhaps there's something paranormal happening in my apartment. I have tried to research the history of the building and the surrounding area to see if there's anything that might explain these things. So far, I haven't found anything that would suggest that the building's haunted or that anything unusual happened in the area. At this point, I'm not sure what to do. Should I try to ignore these strange things and hope that they go away, or should I try to investigate further? The idea of investigating further is intriguing and terrifying. What if I find out something sinister is happening in my apartment? I have talked to some friends about it and what's been happening in my apartment, but they all seem skeptical. They think I'm overreacting or that there must be some logical explanation for what I'm experiencing. But I know what I've seen and heard and I can't explain it away. I've also considered reaching out to paranormal investigators to see if they can shed any light on what's been happening in my apartment, but I'm not sure if I'm ready for that level of investigation. For now, I'm just going to try to stay calm and continue to document any strange occurrences in my apartment. Maybe one day I'll find a logical explanation for what's been happening. Or maybe I'll uncover something that I never expected to find. Either way, I know that I'll never forget the strange events that have taken place in my apartment. Ask Reddit 1, Part 1 When I was 16, my family and I went down to Alabama to visit my relatives who owned a huge amount of land down in Huntsville. 
My uncle owned a big house and a bunch of trailers that they put out in the woods for hunting or camping. I was a city kid from Chicago, so my cousins teased me about camping in the woods. We collected food, killed a pig and some chickens, and brought necessities to camp out for a few days. When we arrived at the camp, it was obvious that something was weird. There was this strange electric smell in the air, like right before a storm, like ozone. However, we didn't think too much about it, and just unpacked and went down to the little creek to swim for a few hours. All of a sudden, an older white guy and a white teenager came out of the bushes. The guy had a shotgun in the crook of his arm and asked us what we were doing this far back in the woods. I told him about my uncle, who he knew, and said we were out camping. He warned us to be careful and stick together, because there was a big animal in the woods. His son, who was my age, asked if he could stay and hang out with us. His dad said okay. We ended up playing football and digging around for the day. As night fell, we went back to the camp and started to make a fire. Tanner, the white kid, said that his family property sat up against my uncle's, and he wanted to run home and ask his dad if he could come out camping with us. My cousin Rooster said he would go with him since it was getting dark real soon, and one of the girls also wanted to tag along. After about 40 minutes, we started to smell the same strange electric smell again. It was a nasty, coppery smell, like right after we've had a nosebleed and it stopped. We searched the trailers and found nothing was on, but we could all smell it. All of a sudden, Rooster, Tanner, and the girl all come running into the clearing, out of breath. and They don't even break stride. They all run to the trailer, right by where the fire is. We all get scared and go into the trailers. They end up calming down, but the fire's guttering lower and lower. So my other cousins say fuck it, and are about to go outside to get the generator out of the shed between the trailers. Tanner goes, fuck no. Lock the front door, ain't nobody else getting outside. He's been crying too, and his eyes are bloodshot and puffy, and his pants are dirty as hell. He goes on to tell us that they went up to his house. His father said sure, he could go out camping but to make sure that they were careful on the way back that maybe they should take one of the hunting rifles just in case. Evidently, Tanner had seen something in their yard a few days before. One of their pigs had come, ripped up and half-eaten. They assumed it was just some big cat or coyote, even though they don't usually mess with live animals. He had gone upstairs and packed his stuff and told his dad that they'd be okay without the rifle because the coyotes avoid people. So they started walking back, where they were camping. Rooster told us that they had gotten halfway into the woods toward the camp, when they started to hear shit in the forest. It was almost pitch black by this time, so they weren't sure at first where the fuck it was. The girl says that she heard something in the bushes, right off the trail, and they all beamed flashlights over there, and to their surprise, there was a man standing in the woods slightly closer to the path. The man had his back turned towards them, and he was just standing there, motionless, in the pitch-black darkness of the woods. They shouted at him and told him that he was scaring them, but he didn't respond or even turn around to face them. They started walking faster, and that's when they started smelling the nasty coppery ozone smell again. As they walked, they could hear a low, gibbering sound coming from both sides of the woods which only grew louder and louder as they got closer to the campsite. Finally, they saw the light from the campfire, and they just ran towards it as fast as they could. They didn't stop until they reached the trailer and got inside, locking the door behind them. They were all terrified and shaking, and some of them were even crying. As they recounted their experience, the coppery smell still lingered in the air inside the trailer and they all knew that something was out in the woods. They decided to stay inside the trailer for the rest of the night, huddled together and trying to calm themselves down. The next day, they packed up their things and left the campsite, never looking back. They never found out what it was that they had encountered in the woods that night, but the memory of the gibbering sounds and coppery smell, and the man standing motionless in the darkness, would stay with them forever. Experience.
experience of a spirit actually interacting with me at a haunted holiday retreat. Let me tell you about a time I stayed at the Mermaid Inn with my partner's family. It's a 600-year-old lodge located in the countryside with next to no signal and poor internet connection. Despite its reputation for being haunted, I didn't think much of it, just assuming it was a rumor to add some excitement to the place. When we first arrived, I was thrilled to have my own room, since I used to share one with my brother back when we lived in a trailer. We settled into a room above the bar, but it was too noisy for our child, so we moved into room 12, the only available one at the time. The night passed without any incidents, and I felt calm and happy. However, the second night was a completely different story. It was a night that I'll never forget, and made me believe in the afterlife without a doubt. I always struggle to sleep in silence, so I played white noise on my phone to help me relax. The phone was next to my bedside, and my partner's phone was on his side. It took me around an hour to fall asleep, but I kept hearing tapping on the side of the wardrobe and other parts of the room. The noise was keeping me awake, but I thought it would eventually stop. At around 3.27 a.m., the white noise stopped abruptly on my partner's phone, which made me jump. My phone then made three pulses of static, followed by a decrease in volume, and my partner's phone didn't come back on. I knew then that something wasn't right, and it was only going to get worse. I fixed the white noise on each phone and tried to go back to sleep. However, the tapping noise continued, and the white noise dimmed down each time it happened. It was happening randomly, and there was no pattern to it. That night, my little girl slept with us, and there were two empty bunk beds next to me on my side. I heard a creaky noise that sounded like someone sat in the bottom bunk, and then the noise of the mattress springs as it got up. Once again, the white noise dimmed down after the noise, and I sat up and said, Please stop now, I'm trying to sleep, and you're making so much noise, you win, I'll keep it at that volume. As soon as I said this, the hangers inside the wardrobe started moving. My partner sat up and asked me if I heard it, and I confirmed that I did. The wardrobe in the room wasn't big, and it was made of wood, which made it echoey. The spirit then started using a hanger, hung up and bang against the back of the wardrobe, and the banging continued for a while. I eventually said, Please just let me sleep, it's nearly 4.30 a.m. Then it made a loud bang, and I turned to my partner, who was scared and turned on the light, despite his fear told him that he couldn't deny how cool it was, because this was solid proof that the afterlife exists. I said that it was a 600-year-old building, and the spirits had probably been there for a long time. Suddenly, the movement around the room intensified, and I felt the end of my pillow being pushed down. I opened my eyes and saw a literal print being created on the pillow, getting bigger with each added pressure. I was freaked out, and I threw my pillow across the room, saying, no, don't even get close again. The movements continued, but I eventually fell asleep. The days after, I started hearing the noises earlier, but we were going to bed rather late and sleeping more heavily due to drinking, so I wasn't able to make myself aware of them. However, no one, no one believed me at all about what had happened, except for my partner, who had been a witness to the strange events. I couldn't help but think back to the experience and try to make sense of it all. I swear I wasn't exaggerating about what happened that night. It felt like a really interactive experience with a spirit, constantly going back and forth with the noise volume like it was just some sort of game to them. The entity seemed to be getting more confident with the noises and making louder ones, doing them after I spoke, getting closer. I didn't get bad vibes, just mischievous ones. Maybe a bit manipulative, but I could be wrong experienced a seriously evil entity as a child that scarred and yanked my covers, leaving a very cold handprint on me. I've also experienced what felt like drops of water coming down on me, a warm handprint, and a very comforting, loving energy shortly after my granddad died. I could go on about my experiences, and I've seen apparitions, took a picture with a woman in a dress smiling behind me, and seen so much stuff, but that was only... A shared experience. It was multiple encounters within a short span. My hair didn't stand up like it usually does, but the day after I began feeling a bit strange about the room. Anyway, it's super cool though, and I hope nothing has attached itself to me or anyone else. 
and that they're all doing is just messing around with me. I constantly have dreams of my dead family members. I'm starting to think it is actually them. I've lost so many people throughout my lifetime, and it's been a tremendous challenge for me. Two of the most significant losses I've ever experienced were my father and my uncle. They were half-brothers and had the same father. I was only eight years old when my father died by suicide. And then I was 16. My uncle also died by suicide. These losses left a deep void in my life that I've never been able to fill. As I was growing up, I had many dreams in which I talked to my uncle mostly. Before he passed away, we had a conversation about his beliefs regarding the afterlife. He shared with me that he believed in the quantum theory of death, which meant that he would exist in another plane or dimension. I had expressed my wish to have more dreams about my father, and my uncle promised me that he would visit me in my dreams after he passed away. He was only 24 years old when he died, and my father was just 26. I'll never forget the night that my uncle passed away. It was January 26th, 2019, and he had used a small pistol. At the time, I was asleep and I had a dream that I was in his car. I saw my uncle appear in the driver's seat, and I asked him what was happening. He told me how sorry he was, and I kept asking him what he did wrong. That's when I woke up to my mom calling me at 5.30 in the morning. She told me that my uncle had shot himself and warned me not to look at Facebook because some posts could trigger me. After that day, I was devastated. I threw up and sobbed constantly. Family members called me to check if I was okay because I was very close to my uncle. That night, I had another dream in which I was in his car again. I asked him why he left us, and he responded by telling me that he was sorry that he had to leave because he was in a lot of pain. He asked me not to hold on to my anger and assured me that we would be together again shortly. Weeks went by and I was still grieving when I found out in late March that I was pregnant. I was terrified because I was going to go through puberty and my doctor told me that I wouldn't be able to carry the child in term due to my hips not being fully developed. I had another dream in Jeremy's car and I told him about my pregnancy and how guilty I felt that I had to have an abortion at 16. He assured me that I wouldn't meet this child, that it wouldn't grow into one, and that this wasn't forever. After my surgical procedure, I kept seeing praying mantises in my room. I kept finding small gardener snakes, feathers at my doorstep. I still don't know what half of them mean, then seven months after my uncle's suicide, I was assaulted by one of his close friends. This friend gave a speech at my uncle's funeral, and he even got his name tattooed. The attack was violent enough to give me a neck and head injury. This friend also made a movie about my uncle, and I was on the cover of the film. I was disgusted with that and prayed for my uncle to do something about it. The next day on April 30th, he killed himself. I found out that my friend had told my aunt what he did. My aunt confronted him and he overdosed after admitting his crime. Around the same time, the man who had abused my mother died on the same day as my father. He had terrorized us for years and he was an addict. The news of his suicide hit me hard when I felt relieved that he could no longer hurt anyone else. I also couldn't help but feel a sense of loss. Despite everything that he had done to me, he was still a human being and I couldn't shake the feeling that his death could have been prevented had he gotten the help he needed. It was also a shock to learn that my friend had told my aunt about it. I had kept it a secret for so long and while I knew it wasn't my fault, I still felt a sense of shame and embarrassment. But my aunt's response was nothing but supportive and I was grateful for her compassion and understanding. The time of his death was eerie, as it coincided with the death of the man that had abused my mother. I couldn't help but feel that it was some kind of twisted justice, but at the same time, I knew that their deaths didn't erase the pain or the trauma that they had caused. 
In the weeks and months that followed, I struggled to come to terms with everything that happened. I sought therapy and support for the loved ones, but the scars of my trauma was still very real. It was a long journey for healing, but I knew that with time, I'd be able to move forward and find some semblance of peace. So let me tell you about the scariest night of my life. It was a few years ago when my cousin Tanner invited me and some other friends to go camping in the woods. We were all excited to get away from the city and have a fun weekend out in the nature, but little did we know, we were in for a horrifying experience. It started when Tanner's cousin came back from the girl who had been lagging behind us. He told us that he had tried to keep her in front of him, but she kept lagging behind. He also said that he smelled this really nasty smell, which got stronger as he got closer to the camp. And then something really strange happened. The girl had said something really low that he couldn't catch, and when he turned around, she was right up on him. He stepped back, asked her if he was okay, and reached out to grab her shoulder, but she had moved while he was looking at her. This made us all realize that something was wrong, and we knew it wasn't a prank because Tanner was almost pissing his pants. We loaded up our rifles, ate some more, and just sat around until 11 p.m. And then the stink of copper turned into a gross blood-like smell, like cooking blood or singed hair. Tanner and his cousins, Reese, immediately got up and grabbed their rifles. There was this knocking and clawing at the door, and we heard a voice that sounded like one of those YouTube cats or dogs whose owners teach them how to talk. It let me the fuck in. Stop fucking playing. This made my nerves creep up against my body, and one of the girls started crying and calling on Jesus. We kept yelling outside, Who is this? Stop fucking around, man. But it just kept saying, In, or let me the fuck in, for almost 15 minutes. It sounded like this almost not funny just for being on a tangent, but if you can't imagine how this shit sounded, then you can't really imagine how fucked up the whole situation was. For the next hour or so, we could hear someone basically creeping around in the woods, and every couple of minutes, we'd come back to the door and say something. At around 2 a.m., Reese said, man, fuck this, and opened the door and walked outside with his rifle. He fired a shot into the air and said something to the effect of, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away. He fired two more times, and then from the woods right up against the river across the trailer, it sounded like something was slowly gibbering and hooting. Then it started screaming, and it sounded almost like a woman and a cat in a bag screaming together. It was terrifying. We could hear the brush over that way start to shake. We said something had come out of the bushes, super low to the ground and crawling toward the cabin. He had shot at it. Pretty much that was how the rest of the night went. It was literally screaming constantly for the next two hours, and we could hear shit moving out in the tree line. But it never came back up to the cabin until everyone had finally fallen asleep. The scariest part of the story came from Tanner. He had been sitting in the chair watching the door with his rifle. Nobody else heard or saw this, and he told me two days later. After the whole thing was over, he said that he had been nodding off after screaming and the noises had finally stopped and he had been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom and then lay down in the middle of the room and go to sleep. At this point, I was almost asleep myself, but something felt off. I counted the people in the cabin and realized that there were nine of us, which was one more than there should have been. I didn't want to risk shooting at the thing and hurting us while causing a panic, so I decided to stay awake all night and keep an eye on it. I watched as it would stand up and do this weird jittery thing or heave like it was laughing before laying back down. It was truly terrifying. In the morning, we all woke up and packed our things to head back to Tan's house. Tan seemed a little bit jittery and avoided looking at us. He stayed last in the cabin and said that he would lock up and bring my uncle's keys. I wasn't thrilled about the idea of walking ahead without him, but we started on the path anyway. When Tan caught up to us, we jogged back to his house and his cousin drove us home. 
Later, Tan went back to the cabin to lock up and discovered that there was an open window in the bathroom. We had been too stupid to lock the screenless window, and the thing had been waiting for us to slip up and let it in. It had walked with us all the way back to Tan's house, and had even looked him dead in the eyes before walking back into the woods. To this day, the memory of that night still haunts me, and I hope to God that it was just all some elaborate prank that my cousins played on me. Experience while sleeping in my dead great-grandmother's room. I remember the night like it was yesterday. I was staying with my grandparents and aunt in Bryan, Texas when I was 12 years old. My dad was with us the first night, but he had to head off to do some work and left me with my grandparents for the remainder of the stay. I was staying in the room where my grandparents were caring for my since-departed great-grandmother, since it was the only free room in the house. The couple nights leading up into the incident, there was nothing out of the ordinary. Then on the third night, things took a turn. I went to bed like usual and everything was fine. I always left the door cracked, so it was also cracked on this specific night. The first thing I remember that startled me was the old rotary phone that makes noises out of nowhere. I don't know exactly how they work, but it made a really, really long, continuous beeping noise like beep for what felt like two or three minutes before it stopped. It kind of freaked me out, but I didn't really think much of it. It eventually stopped on its own, which made me feel better. But the thing that really scared me was shortly after the beep stopped. I noticed a shadow outside the cracked door, which appeared to be someone walking by, which didn't startle me at first, but as it went by, the door slammed really hard. My scared 12-year-old self instantly pulled the blankets over my head and I was scared, but eventually fell asleep. The next morning I woke up and saw my aunt. She seemed terrified. I asked her what was wrong and she asked if I was walking around last night. I said no. She seemed really scared, so I asked why she asked. She said she was awake in bed last night and heard something making noise. She said that she stared at the door and it opened and a tall black figure made its way into her room. Her bed was positioned so that there was a small gap between the bed and the wall, and she told me she saw the figure and got scared and basically rolled herself in her blanket into the gap between her bed and the wall and stayed there all night out of fear. This all freaked me out quite a bit. We both thought it was maybe her dad walking around at night. We also forgot to mention until now that the house also had a home security system that made a very loud beep every time a door or window was opened. So neither of us thought that it could be a home invasion or anything like that. Then, not five minutes later, both her parents woke up and came out of their room and asked if they were walking around last night because they heard lots of noises too. Neither me nor their aunt really said anything about it to each other since but I think we both came to the same realization. Looking back, it's hard to believe that we were all just brushing it off like it was nothing. It was as if we were all in denial, trying to rationalize the noises and the shadow as something other than what it really was, but deep down, I knew that it wasn't normal. I had never experienced anything like it before, and I hope I never will again. As we packed up to leave my grandparents' house, there was a feeling of unease that lingered in the air. We all tried to shake it off, but it was hard to ignore the strange events of the past few nights. I didn't bring it up to my dad, as I didn't want him to scare him. But I couldn't help but feel that something was off. Until this day, I still wonder what really happened that night. And if we were all in the living room, we started to hear the noise and footsteps upstairs. It was clear and distinct, like someone was walking around up there. We all froze and looked at each other in disbelief knew that we were the only ones in the house. We couldn't deny that we were hearing it. We sat in silence listening to the footsteps for what felt like an eternity. They were slow and deliberate, like someone was pacing back and forth. Finally, my aunt got up and said she's going to go check it. We tried to stop her, but she was determined to find out what was going on. As she climbed the stairs, the footsteps got louder and faster. It was like the person was running back and forth. We heard my aunt scream and we all ran upstairs to see what was happening. When we got to the top, my aunt was standing in the hallway, shaking and crying. She said she saw the figure at the end of the hallway, but it disappeared when she got closer. We didn't see anything, but we could feel the presence of something there. We were all scared out of our minds and didn't know what to do. 
We ended up calling a local paranormal investigator to come check out the house. They did an investigation and found that the house was indeed haunted. They picked up EVPs and had strange experiences while they were there. They told us that the entity in the house wasn't harmful, but it was still unsettling to know that we were sharing a house with a ghost. After the experience, we never really stayed at my aunt's house again. We were all too scared to go back. Until this day, we still talk about that night that changed our belief about the paranormal. And that's something you'll never forget. Was it an angel? Years ago, when I was two, I lost my mother due to cancer. A couple days later, we lost my grandpa on my father's side. And to top it all off, I almost lost my dad due to a train accident. I don't remember much of this time in my life, even though I'm told I should. The little I remember is from the accident when my father was able to come home. I remember him having burns in several parts of his body. I can still see some burn scars in his arms. And that often wouldn't play with me because he was in pain. But he would try his best to give me attention anyway. But he would often say that I was his little princess and that he would never ever leave me and that even death could never force him to abandon me. Since I don't remember anything for the rest of the story is what I was told by multiple family members. My father is and has always been a truck driver and has gone to multiple states. So we would often leave for extended periods of time. After my mother and grandpa died, he decided to take a break in order to look after me and my mom and mourn the loved ones we lost. Even though he wanted to stay at home, he couldn't. He had to work in order to support me and my grandma on the father's side, who had just lost her husband. I'm told that the day he was leaving, I clung to his leg even though I didn't say anything. I was told that after everything that had happened, I didn't speak and my bad nail-biting habits began. I wouldn't let him go until my grandpa pried me off and took me to watch TV. As soon as he closed the door, I ran to the window and watched him leave with tears in my eyes. My father was already driving the truck when he approached the train tracks. The warnings, bars, lights, they weren't on and the bars weren't up. So he drove through when suddenly the red light began blinking. The bars lowered, which didn't allow him to drive the truck to the other side. And he heard the train coming and the blowing of its whistle. Before he could get out, it was too late and the train hit the truck. He recalls, for that moment, it was like his soul left his body because he remembers being high up and seeing how the train railed the truck and how his body was still in there. After that, he said everything went dark and he could only hear my mother and my grandpa telling him to wake up. He slowly opened his eyes and swears that for that moment, he saw my mother and grandpa standing in front of him. He was in a helicopter which was taking him to the hospital and he said he couldn't move at all, and he only heard the people in the helicopter saying that it was a miracle he was still alive, but that he may not have much time left after he had blanketed out. In the following days in the hospital, my uncle says that a gentle old man would come almost daily, dropping off food or clothes for my father. My father only met this elderly man a couple of times, but he says that he was really nice and gentle. On the last day my father was in the hospital, the old man told my uncle that this was the last time he would come visit because my father was due to come home soon. The old man wrote down his name and phone number on a piece of paper and napkin and went on his way home. A couple of days passed and my father already home without telling him my uncle decided to call the old man and thank him for his kindness. My uncle recalls almost verbatim the conversation went like this calls the number the old man gave him. Young lady picks up. Uncle. Hello. Is this so-and-so's phone number? Young lady. Hi. Yes, this was his phone number. Can I help you? Oh, I just wanted to thank him for helping my brother out while he recovered in the hospital. Young lady. Sir, are you sure? Said his name was so-and-so. Uncle. Yes, I'm positive he even wrote his name and phone number on a piece of paper so I wouldn't forget. Young lady. So, sir. And so was my late father. He passed away years ago in an accident. That's impossible. My wife and the rest of my family spoke with. So did my brother. Young lady. 
I don't see how that's possible. He's been dead for years now. After that, my uncle finished speaking with the young lady, said his goodbyes, and hung up. To this day, no one's really sure why that kind old man chose to help my dad or how it's even possible. My bonus mom, stepmom, believes it was an angel who wanted to help my dad. However, my aunt believes that it was just a spirit who didn't want the same thing that happened to him to happen to my father. What do y'all think? Demonic Item Duplication Growing up in a house where my mother developed schizophrenia was not an easy experience. Our house was located in a unique spot. It was right under a water table on the edge of a vast woods, down the street from a Native American reservation, and down the street from a Catholic and Protestant cemetery that faced each other. It was also on the edge of a marsh, Looking back now, I realize that our old house was a nexus of spirits, a passing point, and in particular, I feel like there were more inhuman spirits than anything. As my mother's condition worsened, she began to research the occult due to her own experiences as a kid. She attempted to use a spirit board to converse with her voices, and she used that board to the point that it wore her down. I never liked the way it felt, and I never trusted that she was doing things properly. Unfortunately, after this became a pattern of behavior, there all of a sudden started to be a lot of tense activity in the house. One time in particular, I was playing the SNES game, Kirby Superstar. It was eight games in one, while my grandfather and uncle were stripping my mom's room of the umpteenth time. I was trying my best to ignore this and just play my game, when they finished, I was left in my hallway of the bedroom. I finished the final battle with Marks and turned off the game and went to put it into my big-ass entertainment center. That's when it happened. As soon as I opened the door, all the games, they felt weird. It was an instantaneous feeling. I reached in and grabbed a game cartridge, pulled it out, and instantly realized it was the exact same cartridge of Kirby Superstar. And when I say exact, I mean down to the dirt and grime that it was the other cartridge in my hand. I left them next to each other and I was overwhelmed with the feeling of how wrong and bad this felt. I immediately felt like this was not normal. I had no cousins that lived near me and there were no kids around my age that I grew up with that could have left this with me. No one went in or out of my entertainment center the few hours I was sitting in front of it. There was simply no explanation, so of course, I had to try playing it. I cautiously put it into the Super Nintendo, making sure I could tell which one I was originally playing and which one was the wrong version. I turned it on and immediately felt that there was a strange graphical interference. Red, blue, green colored lines streaking into weird fractal static, flashing on and off, from that to black. Within a few seconds, there was a loud, high-pitched electronic sound that almost sounded like a squeal, and it filled me with deep dread. I turned it off immediately, now sweating and panting, and put in my original cartridge. All of my game saves were gone, and it was as if I'd never played the game before, like it was a fresh copy. This experience made me panic, and I tossed the demon copy into the trash. I went downstairs to calm down. But an hour or so later, I found it sitting on top of the microwave. I don't have the courage to ask anyone if they had dug it out, so instead, I grabbed it and shoved it into the bottom of the trash so no one can see it and throw it out. After this incident, I never had anything else duplicate itself like that. But shortly after, I had random personal items be there one minute and then disappear, never to be seen again. I remember a Game Boy Color fell right behind my bunk bed into the dark under it, only to have never been found ever again, and I grew increasingly uneasy about what was happening in the house. My mother's schizophrenia and her fascination with the occult only added to the already eerie atmosphere of the house. Located under a water table on the edge of a vast expanse of woods near Native American reservation, and near a cemetery where Catholics and Protestants were buried next to each other. 
The house seemed to be a nexus of spirits. I couldn't help feeling that they were more inhuman spirits than anything else. Living in that house was a harrowing experience. The combination of my mother's schizophrenia and her interest in the occult, the location of the house and the strange occurrences made it feel like a nightmare. Even though I left that house long ago, I still feel a sense of unease whenever I think about it. Time slip. Teleport. What the hell? Back in 2010, I was a 25-year-old college student living with my incredibly supportive parents. My path to college was not conventional, having dropped out of high school and having two amazing children, but I was determined to make something of myself. It was an early autumn afternoon around 4 or 5 p.m., and I was in my room working on some homework on my trusty laptop seated at my desk. The desk faced the wall across from my bed, and my old-style box TV was on top of my dresser, to the left of my desk just two feet away. I was, as usual, procrastinating on my work, and had the TV in the background mindlessly watching some dumb show. Because my TV was so close, I stood up to change the volume, instead of using the remote, and then suddenly everything changed. It was as if a switch had flipped, and my entire environment transformed. This experience still affects me to this day, and I can still feel it deep in my soul. Something strange happened, and I know that it wasn't a hallucination or a dream. Suddenly, I was back in my childhood home, some 20 miles away, and seemingly 18 years in the past. I was standing in front of the only hallway closet in my one-bedroom house where I grew up. The house was over 100 years old, and the closet was one of those with sliding doors that always seemed to come off their tracks. The door to the closet was open, and my outstretched left arm was reaching for a distinct item. As a child, my mother had this cheap perfume bottle that I was absolutely in love with for some inexplicable reason. The bottle was made of glass and shaped like a bird, perhaps a dove, with its wings up and outstretched. It was beautiful, but it had a broken wing. I probably broke it myself, being the curious and clumsy child that I was, and still am to be honest. And there I was, one moment in my somewhat modern bedroom in 2010, the next in the old one-bedroom hallway across town, and back in time, 18 years. I was there, I saw the bird bottle, and I was within inches of grabbing it. My heart melted for that dumb little bottle of stinky perfume shaped like a one-winged dove. And I swear, this is not a Fleetwood Mac song, as amusing as it may seem. But before my hand could make physical contact with that precious bird, the switch flipped again. And just like that, I was back in front of my TV, outstretched left hand and all. My mind was reeling and I felt sick and dizzy. I was in a state of shock and confusion and I had no idea what had just happened. I stumbled out of my room, down the hall, and into the living room before finally making it out into the front yard. I could do nothing but lurch over hands on my knees, trying desperately to catch my breath and my sanity. This experience was so jarring and so real. I was physically in front of that open closet, reaching for that damn burn bottle. And then I wasn't. I wasn't particularly stressed about classes. It was just community college after all. And I'm not prone to hallucinations, nor was I under the influence of anything or under any unusual stress at the time. I've only shared this experience with a few people, as the subject of momentarily teleporting through time and space doesn't come up in conversation often, and I only know a few people who feel comfortable with telling. To this day, I still have no explanation for what had happened to me. It might have just been a strange break in my psyche, or perhaps something unexplainable occurred. Whatever it was, it was not a dream, and it felt all too real to me. I've tried to rationalize the experience in my mind, but it defies all logic and explanation. It remains a mystery, one that I may never fully understand. It has left a lasting impression on me. And it's given me newfound appreciation for the mysteries of life. I've often wondered if anyone else has had a similar experience, if there are others out there that have felt the same inexplicable sensation of traveling through time and space, even if only for a moment. It is a curious thought, and one that I cannot help but ponder from time to time. In the years since, 
that strange afternoon. I've completed my college degree and started a career in my chosen field. I'm grateful for the support of my parents who helped me through those difficult times and for the opportunities that have come my way since then. But I'll never forget the strange and inexplicable experience and the way it shook me to my core. It has become a part of my personal history, a moment that I will carry with me the rest of my life. As an individual who's always tried to find a logical explanation for everything, I've never really believed in the paranormal, but my new house has had some events that are hard to explain, making me question my beliefs. It all started when my family and I moved into our nearby brand new house last summer in July. The house is only three years old, and the previous family lived in it for two years. Coincidentally, we lived across the street from a fairly large cemetery, which may or may not have something to do with the incidences that we've been experiencing. The cemetery is quite new and doesn't really give off any creepy vibes, but it's hard to ignore its proximity to our home. The first incident occurred about two weeks after we moved in. I was sitting in the living room on the couch, reading The Mist, while enjoying our new fireplace. My sister was in the basement and my parents had gone out grocery shopping. Suddenly I heard what sounded like a car pulling into our driveway, and the garage door opened. My dog, who always comes to the door to greet my parents when they get home, came running out of the bedroom and looked out the front window. I expected them to come in the back door any second, but I heard nothing. My dog kept running back and forth from the front window to the front door, and I finally got up to go see what was taking them so long. But there was no one in the driveway. I figured maybe they were already in the garage, so I went and opened the garage door, but the garage was empty. At this point, I was a little bit freaked out, but I decided I wasn't used to the house and the noises it makes. My parents got home about 15 minutes later, though, and I mentioned it to my sister. She told me that when she was upstairs in the kitchen, it sounded like someone had come into the garage, yet no one was there again. The next story involves my mom. This happened probably a month or so ago, after we moved in. It was the middle of the day in the summer, and I was sitting in my room studying for my summer course finals. My mom was in the kitchen doing dishes. She called to me from the kitchen and asked if I heard anything. I told her no. I was just sitting in the room quietly. She then told me that while she was doing the dishes, she heard a loud male voice, basically right in her ear, yell, What are you doing? It was so loud that she assumed I must have heard it too. Our house has very high ceilings, and everything echoes, so you can hear noises from across the house. I didn't hear a thing. That story still freaks the both of us out, because either the house is haunted, or my mom is losing her mind. The next story, and probably the last one I'm going to mention, because this post is already getting too long, is one that involves me, and has been happening since before Christmas now. I live in a small bedroom on the upper floor of a house. All of the bedrooms have carpet that make a very distinct sound when you walk across them. I usually sleep with earplugs in because we have a toddler living in the house, and I enjoy my sleep, but occasionally, when she's away for the evening at my sister's boyfriend's house, I'll only sleep with one earplug in and lay on my other ear, so I have freedom to hear when I like. I woke up to the sound of footsteps. It was around 4.30 in the morning, and someone seemed to be walking across the carpet in my room. I immediately sat up, assuming it was my cat, but when I turned to my phone flashlight, there was nothing there. I felt a little scared because the footsteps sounded too human-like, and my cat couldn't have walked in and out of the room that fast. After a few minutes, my cat walked down the hallway and into my room. It was on the other side of the house, which made me even more confused. I tried to convince myself that it was just my earplug rubbing up against my pillow, making a sound familiar to the sound of my carpet, but the noises continued every few weeks or so, for a couple of nights in a row. I even heard the same sound with both earplugs in, which made me even more concerned. I thought maybe I was going insane or developing schizophrenia. I only talked about this to my mom because she believes in the paranormal stuff. Then she told that to my sister, who lived in the basement bedroom with her boyfriend and they had been hearing similar noises at night. They described it as someone crawling across their floor. 
The incidents continued to occur, and my sister and I were both worried about it. And one night, I heard that what sounded like multiple footsteps running around in my room. I didn't sleep for a couple nights after that, but lately I've been sleeping with both earplugs in, and I haven't heard anything for the last month now. This 26-year-old female had always been close to her grandmother, so when her grandmother's dementia began to worsen, she decided to move in with her and become her full-time caregiver. The old house where her grandmother had lived since the 60s was a beautiful old home, full of history and character. It was a two-story house, but her grandmother's condition meant that she couldn't make it upstairs. So, she slept in the upstairs bedroom. The first few nights, the old house were quite uneventful, but on the third night, startled awake with the sound of footsteps in the hallway. The creaky wooden floors amplified the sound, making it impossible to ignore. She got out of bed and went to investigate, but there was no one there. She shrugged it off and went back to bed, chalking it up to an overactive imagination. But the next night it happened again. This time the footsteps were accompanied by the sound of running. She bolted out of bed and raced to the hallway, but once again there was no one there. She couldn't explain it, but she felt a sense of unease creeping up on her. Something was not right in that old house. As time passed, the strange occurrences continued. Things would go missing only to turn up places that she had already checked. She heard knocking on the upstairs windows even though there was no one outside. And then there was the time that she was coming into the room and she found the sink running, even though she knew she turned it off earlier. She tried to ignore these events, chalking them up to coincidences or her imagination. But then one night, something happened that she couldn't ignore. She woke up to the feeling of someone playing with her feet. It was a strange sensation, as if someone was gently moving up and down the sole of her foot. She could feel it, and it didn't stop until she quickly moved her foot. She was scared, but at the same time, she felt a sense of curiosity what was happening in this old house. She decided to start investigating. She spent hours online, reading about ghosts and hauntings. She talked to people who had experienced similar things, and finally she decided to try and communicate with the entity that seemed to be haunting the old house. She set up a camera in her room, hoping to capture any evidence of paranormal activity. She also started to keep a journal, documenting every strange occurrence that happened in the house. And then one night she decided to try and communicate with whatever was there. She sat in her room with the lights off and began to speak out loud. If there is anyone here, please give me a sign, she said. She waited, but there was no response. She tried again. I don't want to harm you. I just want to understand. Can you please give me a sign? Suddenly she felt a chill run down her spine. She could sense that something was there watching her. She waited, holded her breath, and then she heard a faint whisper. It was a voice she couldn't quite make out, but it was there. She turned on the lights and looked around, but no one. As the weeks went by, she continued to document the strange occurrences in the house. She also tried to communicate with the entity, hoping to gain a better understanding of what was happening, and then one night she finally got her answer. She was in her room lying in bed when she heard a soft voice. It was her grandmother calling out her name. She got out of bed and went to her grandmother's room, but she was fast asleep. Confused, she went back to her room, only to hear her grandmother's voice again. This time, she realized that it wasn't her grandmother's voice she was hearing. It was the voice of the entity that had been haunting the house. She sat down on her bed and started talking to the entity. Who are you? she asked. The voice responded. I am the previous owner of this house. I died here and I never left. She was shocked. She never considered the possibility that the entity haunting the house could be a former owner. She started asking more questions, and the voice continued to answer. They talked for hours until finally she had a better understanding of what was happening in the old home. After their conversation, she felt a sense of relief. She knew that the entity meant no harm, and she was simply stuck in the house, unable to move. She continued to document the strange occurrence, but she no longer felt scared or uneasy. She had finally made peace with the entity and was able to live in the old house without fear. Years later, when she moved out of the old house, she left behind her journal and the camera she had set up to capture any evidence of paranormal activity. 
The new owners of the house never reported any strange occurrences, but she knew that the entity was still there, watching over the house that had been its home for so many years. It was a quiet night in the European-style house, and the only sound that could be heard was the soft hum of the air conditioning. The family that lived in the house had gone to bed, and the streets outside were deserted. All was peaceful until a sound interrupted the silence. It was a soft creaking, like someone walking on an old wooden board. But it wasn't coming from the family's apartment, it was coming from the apartment above. The family tried to ignore it at first, thinking it was just an elderly woman who lived there shuffling around her apartment. But as the nights passed, the sounds became louder and more frequent. It wasn't just creaking anymore, it was the sound of footsteps running up and down the length of the apartment. It was loud enough to wake the family up from their sleep and they began to worry. The family consisted of a father, a mother, and two sons. They were a close-knit family and they tried to comfort each other as the strange sounds continued. They talked about it and they tried to come up with a logical explanation. They couldn't find one. So one day the mother decided to talk to the elderly woman who lived above them. She went to her apartment and knocked on the door. But there was no answer. She tried again the next day and still no response. The family began to worry that something had happened to the elderly woman and they called the police. When the police arrived, they found the elderly woman had passed away in her sleep. She had no family, and it was up to the landlord to clean out her apartment. The family was relieved that the noises would finally stop, but they didn't. If anything, they became louder and more frequent. The family tried to rationalize it, but they couldn't. They began to believe that the elderly woman was haunting them from beyond the grave. The family began to see strange things around the apartment. Objects would move on their own. Doors would open and close, and the temperature in the apartment would drop dramatically. The father tried to dismiss it, and it was all imagination, but deep down, he knew something more. So one night, the father decided to investigate. He grabbed a flashlight and made his way up to the attic. The attic was dusty and cluttered with old furniture and boxes. The father looked around, trying to find the source of the noises, but he found nothing. He turned to leave, but as he did, he felt a cold breeze brush right past him. He shivered despite the heat of the attic and hurried back down toward his family. The family tried to ignore the haunting, but it was impossible. The sounds grew louder and more frequent and they began to fear for their own safety. They contacted a paranormal investigator and he agreed to come and investigate the apartment. The investigator arrived and set up his equipment. He walked around the apartment asking questions and trying to make contact with the ghost. Suddenly, his equipment began to beep wildly. The investigator was excited. I think he had made contact with the ghost. The family watched in awe as the investigator spoke to the ghost, asking questions and trying to determine why it was haunting the apartment. The ghost was reluctant to answer, but eventually it spoke. It was the elderly woman that lived in the apartment above them. She had been alone in life, and in death, she didn't want to be alone. The investigator tried to persuade the ghost to move on, but it was reluctant. It had grown attached to the family and didn't want to leave them. The investigator tried a different approach. He convinced the ghost to move on into the afterlife with the promise that the family would always remember and honor its presence. Reluctantly, the ghost agreed and the investigator performed a ritual to help it cross over. After that night, the family no longer heard any strange noises or felt any unusual presences in the house. They knew that the ghost had finally found peace and had moved on into the afterlife. However, the investigator couldn't shake the feeling that there was something else going on in the house. So, he continued to investigate. So, he continued to investigate and discovered that the ghost had been protecting the family from a malevolent spirit that had been lurking in the house. The malevolent spirit had been trying to harm the family for years, but the ghost had been keeping it at bay. Without the ghost's protection, the family would have been in grave danger. The investigator realized that the ghost had sacrificed its own chance to move on to the afterlife to protect the family. He was filled with a deep sense of gratitude and admiration for the ghost's bravery and selflessness. He made a vow to always remember the ghost's sacrifice and to help other spirits find peace and closure. And he knew that he would always carry the memory of the ghost's presence with him as a reminder of the power of love and strength in the human spirit.
When I was 12, my family had a paranormal experience. When I was 12 years old, my family experienced a paranormal event that, till this day, I can't rationalize. It was one of the most frightening experiences of my life, and I remember it vividly, even though it happened 14 years ago. We were staying at my aunt's house, where my mom and I lived at the time, along with my aunt, her two sons, E and D, and E's girlfriend, Cass, KP, D's best friend, and KP's girlfriend, C. My great-grandfather, Ma Ma, was also staying with us for the weekend. My family often discussed paranormal topics, and it was a common theme in our conversations. My mom mentioned that she sleeps facing the back of the couch because she sees things if she doesn't. We asked her what she sees, and she said that she sees faces in the curtains, over the windows, and shadows on the ceiling. Cass also said that she sees things when she closes her eyes. And we were all intrigued. She explained that she gets flashes of pictures, but only when she's out of the house. We asked her what she saw, and she closed her eyes to tell us. This is when things started to get really strange. I remember being terrified as it was midnight and I was only 12 years old. I don't recall how we started doing these things, but we did do them, and I was so scared and I never forgot it. In my family, we had a belief that there is a way to see if a ghost or spirit has a good or bad intention. If you're confronted with such things, you simply ask them, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, what do you want? If it has good intentions, It'll give you a sign or speak to you. However, if it has bad intentions, it will vanish, disappear, or leave you alone. Which is a temporary banishment to give you time to sort things out, to give you a break to think about your next steps. In the living room, Koss was sitting on a big overstuffed armchair, which was big enough for two people. My mom was sitting on the arm of the chair, and E was sitting on the other arm. Cass closed her eyes to tell us what she saw and my mom grabbed her arm and looked straight ahead, unmoving. We were all confused as Koss opened her eyes and looked at my mom, but she was not moving at all. She was frozen. I was so confused because I didn't know what was happening. Then I saw my mom's lips start to tremble, and tears slid down her cheek. I became scared because my mom doesn't just cry out of nowhere. I only seen my mom cry a handful of times. And to see her unmoving, crying, and not speaking was frightening. I said to the room, Someone say it. No one moved or spoke. I said it louder. Someone say it. It snapped my aunt out of her stupor, and she looked at my mom with intention and said with sternness, In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, what do you want? My mother collapsed into Casa's arms and sobbed. We all asked her what happened. But all she could say was that she didn't know. She couldn't move, and she was frozen. Suddenly we heard Dee gasp from the couch, and we looked over to see him covered in scratches on his back and chest. We were all staring at my mom, and no one knew how those scratches appeared, but they were there, big, red, angry scratch marks. Then we heard heavy footsteps running down the wooden porch steps outside, which sent shivers down my spine. I paused, my heart racing, and listened as the footsteps approached the front door. The sound of someone fumbling with the doorknob filled the air, and I realized with horror that the door was unlocked. Without thinking, I scrambled off the couch and darted into the kitchen, grabbing a knife from the back of the counter. I huddled behind the kitchen island, my hand shaking as I held the knife tightly. Suddenly, the door swung open with a loud bang, and a tall, imposing figure filled the doorway. For a moment, my mind went blank with fear, but then I realized that it was just my neighbor who had come home to borrow a cup of sugar. I let out a sigh of relief and put down the knife, feeling foolish for just having been so scared. My neighbor looked at me quizzically, but I just smiled and handed over the sugar, trying to act as if nothing were wrong. The Forgotten Voices So I like to go to cemeteries and walk around, and while doing so, I always record with my iPhone and my digital voice recorder. I 
find it interesting to see the different styles and types of headstones, as well as the ages of the deceased. And at times, when I review my recordings, I get EVPs. This time was no different than any others. The cemetery is from the early 1800s and sits on top of a hill. One side is overlooking a man-made lake, so there's plenty of water to help add to the energy, if you believe that it does or can. So last night I start to review my audio recording. It didn't take long before the next EVP showed up. A faint but clear whisper of help in a male voice. Then as I'm narrating about where the cemetery is located, and that's when I started. And there was no lake there yet, just a valley. Another faint EVP that says, look. Followed by a few seconds later by a male voice saying, don't look. Both of these are in different tones. I then say out loud, I then say out loud, here's a Civil War veteran. He lived until 1933. He was in the army. I say that I was in the army too. Thank you for your service. And as I walk, I get, come back soldier, which made the hair stand up on me. Now the sound of a small plane flying overhead is heard, and I get this EVP in a male voice that says plane. Now I know that I have a definite intelligent spirit with me. Then I come to this smaller headstone of a nine-year-old girl. I'm going to call her Clarissa. On the top above her name was a picture of a stork flying and carrying a baby. I found it very sad, the pain that these parents must have went through. I'm a father of six, all grown now. But it has always been my worst fear to lose a child. But as I'm describing her headstone and age, I say hello to her. Then in a female tone, I get this EVP. Leave here. And a split second, another one in a male voice. Dickhead. Maybe the mother and father? Then I come to another Civil War veteran. I'm going to call him Benjamin Suttles, who served with a COD 4th Ohio Cavalry. As soon as I said his name, there is a male voice that clearly says, it was the war. Then over the course of the next 3 minutes and 25 seconds, I hear my name, Clinton, said in the same voice four times with a forceful whisper of, listen thrown in one time in the same male tone of voice. At the end, I get out of the car to open the gate to leave. And as I'm opening the gate, it's inside the car still recording, and I get what sounds like a couple of hideous sounding growls. Now before someone says, well, you're near a lake, so it's probably voices of people out in boats. That's not the case. The temperature when I was there was the mid-40s with a stiff breeze and a wind chill lower to 40s and upper 30s. There were no boats out on the lake, and there's no one close to there to fish in the bank, and no parking areas near me. One side of the cemetery is the lake, the rest is the woods except for a narrow one-lane road, which is not used much until summer. And the sun had already set, and it was almost complete darkness. As I said, I use my phone for my video, and I use my old Sony ICD BX112 voice recorder. It's old as dirt, basically, but it's very sensitive and reliable. Only downfall is that there's no card to save it onto, so I log everything on paper when I review it. I go to a large number of cemeteries to do this. I don't do what everybody calls EVP sessions, I just record as I walk around and talk or ask questions. An incident at a cemetery very close to my home in 2019 got me into doing this. I've gotten some things that sound absolutely horrific or demonic. Please for help and even threats of bodily harm. I've been called by my childhood nickname numerous times, and they even told me of my father's upcoming death. It wasn't 100% accurate, but it was so close that I can't ignore it. I'm still somewhat skeptical, but that's slowly wearing off. This stuff is out there, and it's very real. Too real sometimes. Alu Akbar, loudly, and this thing screamed no in a high-pitched voice. This jinn would also constantly growl during the night at the bottom of the stairs like an animal. Let me share with you the last three experiences I had with this jinn. One night, I went to my cousin's house, and the house was mainly full of female family members. The only male was a boy who wasn't older than the age of seven. And one night, I woke up while everyone was fast asleep. I could hear snores. 
I got up, went to the kitchen, and started preparing breakfast. I decided to make pancakes, my favorite breakfast food. As I was mixing the batter, I realized I'd run out of eggs. I was annoyed because I didn't want to leave my house to go to the grocery store. However, I remembered that my neighbor, Mrs. Johnson, had some chickens in her backyard, and she often gave me fresh eggs. So I went over to her house and asked if she had any spare. When I knocked on the door, Miss Johnson greeted me warmly and invited me in. I explained my situation and she happily gave me a dozen eggs. As I was leaving, she reminded me that she was having a potluck later that day and invited me to join in the festivities. I accepted her invitation and told her that I'd bring some of my famous homemade salsa. After leaving her house, I went back to my kitchen and finished making pancakes. They turned out perfectly golden brown and I served them with a side of fresh fruit and some syrup. I sat down at the table and enjoyed my delicious breakfast. Later that day, I went to the potluck at Mrs. Johnson's house. She had a beautiful garden, and she had decorated her backyard with flowers and balloons. There were lots of people there, and I recognized many of them from the neighborhood. I brought my homemade salsa, and everyone raved about how delicious it was. We all sat together at the long table enjoying the food and conversation, and I learned that one of the guests was a retired astronaut who had been in space several times. He shared some amazing stories about his experiences and we all listened in awe. As the sun began to set, the party wound down and people started to say their goodbyes. I helped Mrs. Johnson clean up and we chatted for a while longer. She told me about her grandchildren and how much she loved spending time with them. After saying goodbye to Mrs. Johnson, I walked back to my house feeling grateful for the wonderful day that I'd had. I reflected on how lucky I was to have such a great neighbor to live in such a friendly and welcoming community. And as I walked into my house, I felt content and happy, ready to relax and enjoy the rest of my day. Gregorian chants heard through brown noise. For the past four years, I've been going through an incredibly intense spiritual experience that's left me feeling both amazed and bewildered. During this time, I've discovered that I have the ability to hear what's going on around me through different types of sound frequencies. It's a strange and fascinating phenomenon, one that I can only describe as being truly otherworldly. One of the most striking experiences I've had is hearing Gregorian chants while listening to brown noise on a speaker and headphones. The sound was incredibly clear and powerful, and it felt like I was being transported into another realm entirely. The chanting was unlike anything I'd ever heard before. It was both haunting and beautiful at the same time. It was a truly awe-inspiring experience, and one that I'll never forget. But that's not the only thing I've heard. There are other sound frequencies that allow me to hear different things that are going on spiritually. For example, there's one that lets me hear a deep, dark breathing. It's a sound that's both terrifying and intriguing all at once. And then there are others that let me hear screams and other things that sound as if they're on some sort of a loop. It's hard to describe exactly what I'm hearing, but it's definitely not of this world. I'm constantly amazed by what I'm experiencing, but I'm also a little bit scared. I don't really know what's going on or why it's happening to me. All I know is that it's something beyond my own comprehension, something that's both thrilling and terrifying at the same time. If anyone else out there has experienced anything like this, I'd love to hear from you. I'm trying to make sense of this crazy spiritual journey I'm on and any information or insight would be greatly appreciated. This is a strange and wondrous world we live in, and I feel like I'm just scratching the surface of what's out there. Should I be frightened of my house, or can I just be over it? My family and I, my dad, my sister, and my mom, moved into this house when I was six, When we first moved, I hated it here. I was constantly scared and seeing shadows and hearing weird stuff. And once I even jumped out of the shower with shampoo all over my head and ran downstairs crying to my mom because I felt someone breathe next to my ear. I would have friends over and when we were alone in the house, we would hear things and be scared. Almost the whole home is wood flooring and we'd hear creaking like someone was walking around. Throughout this time in our new home, I found out later that my parents were hearing music coming from the attic while they were in bed. Piano music. Sometimes radio music. 
My father is someone who takes no shit, and I've never seen him be scared of anything. So we'd walk right up and pull down the stairs to the attic and check it out. As soon as he got to the top, the music would stop. He checked the whole attic, and there was nothing that could produce music. My mother told me this years later, as she knew I was already too afraid. So in my high school years, I would go to bed and lock my door at night. But my dad wasn't one to knock, and I was often doing things I shouldn't be doing in there. And one night I woke up in the middle of the night, and mind you, I'm a person that you have to shake to wake, and to my doorknob being violently shaken in its locked state. Seeing the hour, I jumped out of bed and opened the door immediately, assuming it was my dad or something was wrong. No one was there. I go back to sleep thinking I must be dreaming or crazy or something. This happened a total of two or three times over a fairly large span of years. I've also had knocks on my door in the middle of the night and early morning. My response is usually, yeah, nobody enters. I open the door, nobody there. The last isolated incident I can remember was in 2016. I was working at a salon and the owner's daughter, who I became quite close to, died of an overdose. Our birthdays were three days apart and we'd always celebrate together at the salon. She had just passed in January and it was her birthday night. It was late, 1 or 2 a.m. I was on the toilet in my bathroom and happened to be thinking about her. I said out loud, Happy birthday, Bonnie. And boom, start hearing wild piano music above me in the attic. I freaked out and ran downstairs, woke up my mom, who was sleeping on the couch because my parents no longer slept in the same bed. And this is when she told me about the music when I was a kid. So two weekends ago, there was nothing good on TV on Sunday. Surprise, surprise. So I put on Unexplained. For those of you who don't know, it's a ghost hunting show with qualified people doing the hunting. Paranormal investigators and mediums. I kind of like the thrill of being scared watching stuff, but I don't like being scared in my own home. My mom and I watched for a few hours until I went to pick up food. I took her car because it was easier. There was this water bottle on her back seat swishing around and making noise in the car. I had been in her car the day before running hours worth of errands and didn't notice this at all. I felt a weird presence and scaredness while I drove. I told myself I'm just creeping myself out because of the show. That night, I go to bed, all good, not thinking about anything scary. At 9am I wake up to four soft knocks on my bedroom door. I assume it's mom and I say, yeah? Nothing. I go back to sleep for an hour or two. Wake up later and ask her if she knocked on my door this morning. Answer is no. So the very next night I go to sleep. I have this old Harman Kardon speaker and bass in my bedroom. It's 4 a.m. and the thing is humming. Like, loud and creepy. Hum, hum, hum. Each one of the tones sounds like it's more echoey and closer. I quickly turn on the phone's flashlight. It stops immediately. I've grown older in this house, and for a very long time I stopped feeling scared. I was watching that show and having odd things come back to light, and the spirit's own way of telling me they're still here. I don't know. Rant over. Step into the realm of the unknown with us, here at Paranormal M., Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to stay up to date with our latest mysterious tales. We hope you have a spine-chillingly good time listening. The Haunting of Rosewood Mansion Rosewood Mansion has always been a sight to behold. The sprawling Victorian mansion nestled in the hills of Virginia was surrounded by acres of lush gardens, towering oak trees, and a serene lake. It's always been a family home for generations, passed down from one wealthy family to another. But despite its grandeur and beauty, Rosewood Mansion had a dark and twisted history. The original owner, a wealthy plantation owner named Nathaniel Rosewood, had built the mansion in the mid-1800s. He was known for his cruelty to his slaves, and it was rumored that he built secret tunnels beneath the mansion, where he would keep his slaves imprisoned. As the years passed, the mansion changed hands, but the rumors of its dark past never faded. Strange things began to happen within its walls, 
and soon it became known as one of the most haunted houses in the region. In 1998, the mansion was purchased by a wealthy businessman named Jonathan Taylor. He was enchanted by the mansion's beauty and history, planned to turn it into a luxurious hotel. But as renovations began, the workers began to experience strange occurrences. One worker reported hearing the sounds of chains clanking in the basement, while another reported seeing a ghostly figure standing in the corner of one of the rooms. Despite this, Jonathan Taylor remained determined to turn the mansion into a success. In 1999, the mansion opened its doors to the public. The grand ballroom was adorned with crystal chandeliers and the walls were covered in ornate wallpaper. Guests from all over the world flocked to the Rosewood Mansion to experience its grandeur and luxury. But it wasn't long before the guests began to experience strange happenings. Some reported hearing sounds of footsteps in the hallways, even when no one was there. Others reported seeing the ghostly figure of a woman in a flowing white dress gliding down the grand staircase. As word of the haunting spread, fewer and fewer guests were willing to stay at the Rosewood Mansion. The staff, too, began to feel uneasy. Many of them reported feeling as though they were being watched, and some reported seeing shadowy figures lurking in the corners of their rooms. Despite these occurrences, Jonathan Taylor refused to acknowledge the possibility of the mansion being haunted. He believed that the stories were simply rumors, spread by those who were jealous of his success. Overnight, as Jonathan was closing up the mansion from... He heard a strange noise coming from the grand ballroom. It sounded like someone was playing the piano, but when he entered the room, he found it empty. He shrugged it off, convinced that it was just his imagination playing tricks on him. But as he turned to leave the room, he felt a cold breath on the back of his neck. He turned around to see the ghostly figure of a woman in a white dress standing before him. Her eyes were dark, empty. Her skin was translucent. Jonathan tried to run, but his feet felt as though they were rooted to the ground. He felt a cold grip on his shoulder. He heard a voice whisper into his ear. Leave this place, the voice said, or suffer the consequences. Terrified, John fled the mansion and never returned. The next day, he put the mansion up for sale and sold it at a loss. The new owners, a family of four, moved into it in 2001. At first, everything seemed normal, but soon strange things began to happen. Doors would slam shut on their own, and they would hear strange noises coming from within the walls. One night, the younger daughter woke up to see a ghostly figure standing at the foot of her bed. It was the same woman in the white dress that Jonathan had encountered. The family tried to ignore the strange happenings, but they became more and more frequent. They finally reached their breaking point when they found words saying, Get out, written in blood, on the walls of the master bedroom. My parents' dream house turned into a haunted nightmare. I was born in the early 90s in a time when the world was changing rapidly. My parents got married in 1991 and I came along in 1992. For the first two years of their marriage, my parents lived in a tiny apartment that needed a lot of work. When my mom found out that she was pregnant with me, finding a better home with more space moved to the top of their to-do list. My mom was about seven months pregnant with me and every house that they had looked at had fallen through. Until one. The one. It was located out in the middle of nowhere of our little town, but that's exactly what my parents wanted. It was a two, could be three, bedroom and one bath house. It had two enclosed porches, a massive kitchen and dining area, and a living room. The best part was that rent was just barely over the amount my parents were paying monthly for this tiny rundown apartment. While this wasn't a beachside luxury mansion, it was everything my parents wanted, and then some. Of course, they jumped on the offer. It didn't take long after moving in for the weirdness to start. Activity made itself known pretty much from day one. This experience in particular, I can remember even though I was only three or four years old. Halloween has always been a major holiday for the family. My parents decided to host their first annual Halloween party in this house. It was a huge success, in fact. Tons of family and friends attended. They had music, food, games, costume contests. 
I remember I was Baby Bob from Barney. And the best part, a fake haunted house in the garage that sat apart from the house. After it was over, my mom's two sisters and her middle sister's boyfriend decided to sleep over instead of making the hour-long drive back home so late. My parents made the living room floor, which was in between my parents' room and what I considered to be my room, as cozy as they could. At about 2 a.m., we said our good nights, and I followed my parents into their room to crash, as I was absolutely terrified of my room. I remember waking up to the sound of someone knocking on my parents' closed bedroom door. My dad was dead to the world, so my mom got up to answer it. I heard the frantic voice of my older aunt asking where my dad was. My mom opened the bedroom door more so she could see that my dad was completely knocked out in the bed. My aunt's voice became even more pleading as she asked if they could all move into their room and sleep on the floor. My mom agreed as my aunt swore that she would explain it in the morning, but not now. I remember how excited I was to see my aunt and my future uncle moving their bedding into the small bedroom to sleep. It was my first sleepover in my young mind. Come morning, or later in the morning, I should say, we would find out what exactly had happened. My aunt said that after everyone had gone to bed and the lights were out, they started hearing movements coming from my room. At first it sounded like footsteps walking around, then it started sounding like someone was moving stuff around. It got louder like someone was digging through my toy box. Both my aunts and my future uncle were on alert listening to this when creepy music started playing. They realized it was the music from my dollhouse, and it would play only when you pushed a special button. They were convinced my dad was behind this, as he is notorious for playing pranks on people. That's when my aunt ran and knocked on my parents' bedroom door to see if it was somehow his doing. When my mom showed her he was sound asleep, she said it felt like her heart stopped as she could still hear movement coming from my room on the other side of the living room. After this, the experiences in the houses got worse, and it was a very long time before my aunts and uncle would even visit again. Just days after this incident, my parents said I came running to them late one evening, completely inconsolable. I said in between sobs that there was a mean face glaring at me through the living room window. This window was in the same area my family had run from. Encounter number three. When my kids and I first moved into our new house, things seemed to be going smoothly. I was getting everything unpacked and organized, and we were all settling into our new home. I even got the old kitchen phone hooked up, which was still the only phone in the house. It was an old 70s wall phone, yellow with a long curly cord. I could walk around most of the first floor rooms with that long cord and talk on the phone. One day I was downstairs in the kitchen talking to my brother on the phone while the kids were upstairs doing their own thing. I walked over to the kitchen table and looked out the big window, admiring the view of our new neighborhood. Suddenly I felt three hard tugs on my shirt tail, just like a kid would do to get my attention. I asked my brother to hold on for a moment and turned around to see who needed me, but no one was there. I thought maybe I had it maybe tangled up on the phone cord so I straightened it out and resumed my conversation. But not two minutes later, it happened again. Three harder tugs on my shirt tail. This time, I turned around quickly enough to catch whoever was messing with me. But once again, no one was there. I was pretty freaked out because I could tell the difference between accidental pulls and intentional tugs. I ended my phone call and ran upstairs to check on the kids. They were all engrossed in whatever they happened to be doing in their rooms. None of them could have tugged on my shirt and disappeared into thin air. After that incident, I started noticing other strange things happening in our house. Objects would move from one place to another without any explanation. Doors would open and close on their own. The temperature in the house would fluctuate randomly, and I would hear strange noises in the middle of the night. At first, I tried to brush it off and convince myself that it was maybe just my imagination. But the tugging on my shirt was just too real to ignore, and I started to wonder if our new house was in fact haunted. 
I didn't know what to do, so I turned to the internet for answers. I found a paranormal investigation group in our area and reached out for them. They came to our house and performed an investigation using all kinds of high-tech equipment to try and detect any paranormal activity. They found some unusual energy in the kitchen and in one of the upstairs bedrooms, but couldn't find any conclusive evidence of a haunting. I was still convinced that our house was haunted, so I decided to do some research on my own. I found out that our house was built on the site of an old school, which had burned down many years ago. I started to wonder if the spirits of the students who had died in the fire were still lingering in our house. I decided to try and communicate with the spirits, so I bought a Ouija board and invited some of my friends over to try it out. We had some strange experiences with the board, and I felt like we were definitely making contact with someone or something, but I wasn't sure if it was a student from the old school or something malevolent. After that, I started to feel more uneasy in my house. I didn't feel safe there anymore, and I was worried about my kids. I decided to contact a local medium to see if she could help. She came out to her house and performed a ritual to try to cleanse the energy. Since then, things have been much better. We still have the old phone in the kitchen, but I haven't felt any tugs of my shirt tail lately. The strange noises and movements have stopped, and the temperature in the house seems to be more stable. My kids haven't reported seeing anything strange happening either, which is a huge relief. I'm not sure why exactly the haunting was happening in her house, but I'm glad that we were able to find some help and make it feel more like a safe and welcoming home. It was definitely a scary experience, but I'm grateful that we were able to get through it together. Possible Paranormal Activity During a Hiking Trip Several years ago, a friend and I went on a multi-day hiking trip during winter. While preparing for the trip, I found a forum dedicated to the trail we'd be hiking, and several threads about it, people going missing on it. Most of the members blamed the hikers themselves, saying they were most likely inexperienced, would-be adventurers who would go off the trail and get lost. There was one old man on the forum who claimed he'd completed the trail once a year for the past 50 or so years, and he believed there was something more sinister behind these disappearances. Naturally, the other members laughed at him. We set off before sunrise to get as many miles in as possible for the day. That entire day, we only met one other person, a friendly middle-aged man who lived somewhat locally. He seemed impressed that we were taking the trail in the winter and even invited us to camp near his property, but we declined and pressed on. That night, we were surprised by some pretty dangerous terrain around the edge of a lake and took the decision to sleep on our bivy sacks under the overhanging rock. Not exactly ideal camping conditions, but given the potential hazards we felt, this was the smartest choice. I don't sleep well at the best of times, and in a bivy sack, and if you've ever been zipped up into one, you'll know how claustrophobic it can feel. The rock hanging over my head didn't help either. A few hours after, I did eventually manage to fall asleep. I woke up suddenly to the sound of my friend shouting and swearing at me. I popped my head out of my bivy and saw that he was still zipped inside his. Had someone gotten off the relatively level ground, we would have been sleeping on, was slowly sliding down towards the lake. I quickly got up and dragged him, with great effort, back up to level ground. He was absolutely furious with me, claiming that he had felt something drag him, but soon calmed down accepted that he'd most likely rolled over and repeatedly in his sleep. We didn't go back to sleep and instead had some coffee and breakfast while waiting for the sun to come up. When we did set off, it started to rain heavily and didn't stop for most of the day. I was almost having some trouble with an old injury with my leg, which slowed us down considerably. The sun seemed to disappear rather suddenly near the top of the deceptively steep hill, so we set up camp and there and then, this time in the tent, After the rough couple of days we had, we were grateful to be inside of a tent, and the ground underneath us was actually not too bad. We talked and joked about the trip so far, and some of the reason I remember my friend expressing his disappointment that he'd forgotten to pack his iPad, and then we tried to sleep. Soon after, I began to hear what sounded like human footsteps. I thought to myself, 
Surely there isn't anyone else here climbing this hill at night. The sound continued, and the more intently I listened, the more I became certain of what I was hearing. I poked my head out of the tent and the sound stopped. I got out to pee and looked around, not a soul in sight. Shortly after getting back into my sleeping bag, the footsteps started again, and this time they started circling our tent. By this time, I was pretty frightened, and I asked my friend, are you hearing this? He responded, yes, I fucking am. Knowing that he'd been hearing them the entire time, and sounded as freaked out as I did, genuinely terrified me. We got out of the tent again and asked if anyone was there, but again, no one was around, and the sound had stopped suddenly. The footsteps around the tent continued for quite some time, and we didn't sleep. As soon as the sun came up, we packed our things, got off the trail, and hiked to the nearest village got a cab to the nearest town and made our way home. We've never been able to find a convincing explanation of what could have been causing the sound of the footsteps that night. My friend has since become a full-fledged missing person, paranormal and conspiracy enthusiast. What do I do with this doll? My dog thinks it's haunted. I have a doll that I bought at an antique shop, and I'm not sure what to do with it. I'm not a doll person, but I saw this Japanese, I think, doll, set up high in the corner shelf, priced at one dollar, and I bought it along with a three-piece vanity mirror. I don't know exactly why I got the doll, but I felt sorry for her or something. Her hair was poorly glued on and only halfway attached. She was covered in dust, but she had a kind of... maybe a happier, kind-looking face. I felt bad that she was priced so low. I brought her home and cleaned her up a bit and put her on the shelf of our bedroom with a couple of Japanese carvings for my grandpa. My mom was born in Tokyo and spent most of her childhood there, although we're born PNW white people. The same weekend I got the doll, I brought her home, and my one dog, Bonnie, starts freaking out. She's my favorite of our three, probably the best dog I've ever had. She's a little 11-year-old chocolate lab and has always been easy, simple, happy. And she's never had a care in the world. And that changed. Although I didn't connect the two situations at first. Bonnie's always been the easiest dog in the world, but she became clingy, extremely anxious and destructive. She didn't want to come into my room to sleep anymore and would pant, whine, and try to leave if I called her in. One day I left and came right back because I forgot something and I heard her barking like her life depended on it and it turned out she was standing and barking at my closed bedroom door. I also started having some worsening problems. I've had issues with insomnia and I'm pretty well versed on it but it became far worse than I ever thought possible. I started having night terrors and one in particular is what brought me here. I had the doll on my shelf for about a week and was questioning whether I wanted to keep her or also whether I wanted the antique mirror that I bought at the same time and put on the dresser, kept in my room. The same night, I dreamt I couldn't move and there was a presence that wasn't letting me speak or move. Well, during this nightmare, the freaking mirror shattered and woke me up. It was the middle of the night and made an enormous mess, but at least I woke up. I moved a bunch of the stuff, including the doll, to a storage closet. But we're always under some kind of home renovation, so there's no doors, just a curtain. Bonnie didn't waste much time. She tried to dig her way into the closet, which is where I stashed the doll. She had never in her life done anything like this. Bonnie has become easily stressed and doesn't want to be without us in the house. I tried putting her in a crate that she used to like as a youngster, but she stopped needing it and we needed the space. She cracked a tooth trying to escape. We began taking her everywhere with us, in our car, and even though it's pretty cold out, she prefers to come with us rather than be at home without us. The weird thing to me is that the other dogs don't care about the doll at all. I want to get rid of the doll, but I just don't think throwing her away is the right approach. Maybe some kind of burial. I just don't want to make things worse, but I'm not sure what to do next. I could give the doll away, but what if it's really haunted or something? I don't want anyone else to be negatively affected. I was thinking of going back to the store and leaving her where I got her, but is that a good idea? 
This is all new to me apart from watching the occasional scary movie. Mostly, to be honest, I really want my dog to get better. My parents took her for a few days and all she's done there is sleep like crazy. I don't think she was sleeping at all at home. I just want her back and her sweet, happy self. My grandparents came to say goodbye. When I was growing up, I was very close with my maternal grandparents. I called them Mama and Tata, Mama and Father. That's what I heard my mom call them and I assumed it was their names when I was about a year old. When speaking of them, I still refer to them this way till today. Tata passed away from a stroke when I was nine years old and I never got up to say goodbye. My mom didn't think such a small child should see their grandparent in such a state in the hospital. About 15 years ago, Mama's health was failing. She was in a coma for a couple of weeks. Then she recovered and there was even talk of sending her home with a nurse. Knowing Mama, since I was very close to her, I knew she would hate that. She was very independent and she wouldn't like to have someone help her with anything. I felt dread. A few days later, she went back into a coma. The doctor said there was very little chance she would recover. My parents and I were living in a different country from Mama at that time. My mom decided she would go and visit her and her sister who was taking care of Mama and asked me if I wanted to go as well. Although I really wanted to go see Mama one last time, I decided not to go for two reasons. One reason being I was on summer vacation and I had just gotten a job at a summer camp. Rent needs to be paid. But the main reason being that Mama always told me not to waste my money on traveling for sad occasions, only for happy ones. There was an incident years before, I don't remember what it was, but the lesson stuck with me. So I knew she wouldn't like me to waste so much money on a plane ticket to come and see her as she's dying. About a week goes by, and one night I'm laying in bed trying desperately to fall asleep. It's one of those nights where you keep looking at the clock repeatedly thinking, if I fall asleep right now, I will have this much time to sleep before I have to go to work. It just wasn't happening, so I gave up. Just laid in my bed on my back and stared at the ceiling. I blink. I'm standing on the beach near Mama's house. I can feel the breeze. I can smell and hear the ocean and the seagulls. I can feel the sun on my face. I turn slowly and about 20 feet in front of me stands Mama smiling at me. Then she turns around to face away from me and we both see my grandfather, Tata, standing just behind her. They walk towards each other smiling, they hug and kiss and they have the most heartfelt reunion I've ever seen. Tata passed away when I was just nine years old and nearly 20 years prior to that day. I just stared in awe. After what seemed like a few minutes of my grandparents both turn up and look at me. They're holding hands, smiling, tears of joy streaming down their faces. They're just glowing. They wave to me goodbye with their kisses and smiles still on their faces, turn around and start walking away from me and slowly fade. I open my eyes and I'm in my room, lying in my bed, on my back, staring at the ceiling. Tears running down my face. I knew that that moment, there's two things. One, Mama passed. Two, I'll not be falling asleep that night. The clock on my phone, on the bedside table, read 4 a.m. The next few hours were a bit of a blur since I had been inconsolable. I couldn't stop crying. My phone rang at 8 a.m. It was my dad telling me that Mama had passed. I asked him if he knew what time that she had passed. He told me in their country it was 11 a.m. That time difference between our time zones is exactly seven hours. They're ahead. I must stress that this wasn't a dream. I never actually fell asleep. I didn't feel tired at all that night. Not before and definitely not after that vision. I wasn't even sure which flair to add to this post. Either way, I'm so grateful to Mama and Tata for this wonderful memory, for the love that I felt from them that day. They went out of their way to come see me to say goodbye before moving on. I remember that for as long as I'll live. The Thing at the Abandoned School I was talking with friends earlier and decided to share here too. Me and my friend group will go to abandoned buildings to explore them. We've been to factories, mills, hospitals, schools, homes, and even an underground power facility. It's fun. One night, our planner in the group found a school that was shut down in early 2000s due to poor structural integrity. 
While doing some more digging, we discovered that there was a murder there not long after the school shut down, and the body was never found. That didn't stop us. We still went out because ghosts aren't real, right? Well, that's what I thought. That's what we all thought before we stepped into that school. Come the night of our expedition, we struggled to get everyone in the door because only two out of four of us could fit through the broken door. That was me and my buddy Chris. Seeing how me and Chris were already inside, we decided to glance around the place and see what we could find. While walking through the classroom, Chris tells me he's going to let the girls, the other two, know that we can't get everyone in this time around. I said okay and stayed behind because I don't usually scare easily. While in this classroom, I walk towards a shared closet and start feeling uneasy. I tell myself it's just dark and I'm alone now. I make my way into the closet, and just as I'm about to step into the other classroom, I get this strong feeling like I shouldn't go in there. I've never felt something like that, and I decided to trust my gut feeling. Right as I'm leaving, it feels like someone's behind me, and I start to hear this tapping on a metal desk. And the tapping gets faster and more violent, almost like someone tapping their fingers. I ran the fuck out of there. My friends all got a good laugh and we left. But I need answers. What made that tapping? Why did I have those feelings? If ghosts aren't real, then what was that? I literally couldn't sleep at night. I convinced my friends that we should go back. The next weekend came around and we were back, except this time we brought the right tools to get everyone in. After about 30 minutes, we get the girls in and we start walking through the gym. That's when something fell. Then another thing fell. I thought the roof was falling apart until I saw something arching in the dark. If it's falling from the roof, it should fall straight down. It shouldn't look like it was being thrown from ten feet away from me. But you could see the stuff flying horizontal if you caught it with your light. This went on for about twenty minutes before it stopped. At this point, me and my friends are pretty freaked out, but nobody wants to come and say what we're all thinking. So I moved to the classroom down the hall. As soon as we stepped in, me and one of the girls saw a piece of wood go flying from a desk. It went from sitting still to moving at an incredible speed on its own. It still blows my fucking mind and I still don't know exactly what it was. We could see stuff flying down the hall like someone was throwing it, but we couldn't hear any footsteps. There was no way anybody could make it through that school without making the floor beneath you squeak and pop. At some point, I started to interact with it. I started throwing trash and debris down the hall from the classroom door, and those objects would be thrown back. This went on for about an hour and a half before it finally stopped. The last thing it threw, it was like an MLB pitcher used all of its strength and just threw whatever it had. And that was that. I started looking at different religions the next day and eventually settled for Christianity. That school forever changed my life and my idea of the afterlife. I'm not superstitious. I don't think demons and angels are responsible like a religious fruitcake. However, I do believe in a higher power now, that's for sure. What just happened? My grandfather, who I was really close with my entire life, recently passed away in October of 2022. The news was given that he had one to five years and rapidly declined so fast that he only made it a month. The news was a devastating blow to my family. My grandfather was the wisest and most organized man that I'd ever met. He retired young, raised three children with a grandmother, and had three grandchildren, including myself. He was always someone I wanted advice from. However, he was also the funniest and most friendly man with the biggest heart. He had his stern side as well. But if he told you to do something, you did it, no questions asked. He just had that way about him. Unfortunately, the last time I saw him was in 2019 before it moved states away, and the last conversation I had with him was over Facebook. I gave him reassurance that his last heart surgery would be a success, and I told him that I loved him. After he passed, I took only a few days of bereavement leave for my job and notified only my boss to explain the situation. Fast forward to now, a couple months later, I've had some time to grieve and accept the finality of the situation, as have the rest of my family. I work in auto finance and customer service, and was recently promoted to team leader in August, 
before he passed. In November, I took over a brand new team of new hires to the company. I spent a month getting to know my new team and their different personalities. One man on my team is an older gentleman who is very religious. I myself can't say I ever considered myself to be religious, but after today's experience, I can't say my opinion remains the same. This morning I arrived at my office earlier than normal. I'd purchased some gifts for my team and I wanted to have it set up for them when they all came in since it was our last day in the office before Christmas. My team arrived and I proceeded to start my day as normal. As I walked past this particular team member, he asked me if I knew somebody in my life by the name of, well, my grandfather's name. I was taken back and said, yes I do, why do you ask? This team member proceeded to tell me that he saw my grandfather standing by my desk and he told him that I need to keep my family close and that he was very proud of me. The team member then went on to explain that the man he spoke to came off as stern and asked him to come here and without hesitation, the team member felt he needed to get up with urgency. He went on to explain that he had angel wings and he was in heaven and looking after me and my family. I sat back and tried to think logically about this experience. How did he know this stuff? Did he stalk my Facebook? No, because not only is my page completely private, but not one post was made about my grandfather on my page or any of my families. Did I tell anybody at all at work? My grandfather's name? No, I didn't. There's no logical explanation for this team member of mine to make these unusually specific claims. What really struck me was the statement, keep your family close. While vague, my grandfather was really the glue that held us together. I'm close with my mother, who now lives in the same state I moved to, but my aunt and uncle and grandmother still live in an old state. My aunt and uncle don't get along. I truly believe that he's worried about the family breaking apart and living separate lives now that he's gone. This really happened to us. I have a few experiences all on the same land, and down the road from our land. The land used to be part of Mexico and later became Texas. It had a couple of owners, settlers, in the beginning, but the land was eventually parceled out and roads were added. These occurrences were years ago, and one of them, husband and son, believed me immediately because they saw how shaken and excited I was when I came home. They were scared by my fright. They drove me back to where I'd had my particular experience. But what I saw was gone. All I'm going to say about it was that they were mostly in the trees. There were many of them. They all turned their heads and looked at me, and they were transparent. I was able to put my hand through some of them. But when I walked closer, and at least one followed me partway home, I told my brother and father, and the next day they showed up and asked if I was okay and if I might need to go to the psych hospital. I love them dearly, but I realized that we just had to keep it between me, my husband, and my children. The second incident was hearing a phone ringing in my daughter's room. We heard it at the same time and looked at each other confused. I called the phone company asking why there had been a phone ringing in my room with no phone. They just told me maybe my old house had a phone bell somewhere and it had been covered over. In the same time frame, we had the front door that the handle would turn right before it reached in to go in. The door didn't open, just the handle turned. It wasn't stuck. That happened to my family several times and the last two others who knew nothing about it. And they were caught by surprise. We decided the best thing to do was just ignore it and finally it stopped. The last episode was just up the drive at my mother-in-law's house, on the same land as our house. We started seeing a man, and it was clearly wasn't my deceased father-in-law. This man was shorter, always in a plaid shirt, jeans, and boots, and seemed to be in his fifties or sixties. He was transparent and shy. I thought I was losing my mind, but then others started seeing him too. My mother-in-law was bedridden from a stroke and had Alzheimer's, and even she saw this figure and would ask who he was. Then two different caregivers saw him at different times, and then the caregiver's grandchild. One caregiver became 
very afraid because she had lost her son in a car accident and was caring for her little grandson while she sat at her mill. Her grandson also reported seeing the man. He also always appeared peripherally and never straight on. None of us recognized him and we'd all just stand and he'd watch us. We tried speaking to him, we tried approaching him, and he'd vanish. We tried to beckon him to show himself, and finally we decided not to be afraid and just try to ignore it. One caregiver remained frightened for her grandson, but stayed on. This lasted a few years and at different times. After my mill died, everyone left. We never saw him again. Now, you may think I made this thing up or we imagined everything, but I'll swear until I die that it all happened. I feel a bit silly for bringing it all up, but I'm a pretty rational adult. However, these experiences stayed with me, and I've wondered how many times, what was it that I was seeing? I never really told anyone outside the ones who saw it for themselves. I can't explain it, can you? Greetings, fellow seekers of the unknown. Welcome to Paranormal M, where we delve into the most mysterious and unexplainable phenomena. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to stay up to date with our latest mind-boggling tales. We hope you enjoy the journey. My Personal Experience with an Entity When I was 14 years old, something terrifying happened to me that I'll never forget. I started hearing strange scratching noises above my bed in the middle of the night. The time was usually around 3.14 a.m., and it would always wake me up, and at first I just tried to ignore it and thought it was just some sounds of the house settling or rodents in the attic, but as time went on, the scratching became louder and more persistent. Around the same time, I began having eerie dreams about a dark entity that haunted me. It took on the form of a little girl or a jester but I could never see it clearly. The dreams were terrifying, and they always left me feeling uneasy. I tried to brush them off as just nightmares, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. One night, I woke up to find the entity standing next to my bed. It was real, and I could feel its presence. When I sat up, it turned its head towards me, and I froze in fear. In a panic, I threw my sheets over its head and began punching wildly hoping to hit something. But when I looked up again, the entity had vanished, leaving me alone in my dark room. As time went on, the scratching and dreams eventually ceased, but the memory of that time still haunts me to this day. I can't help but wonder what sort of malevolent force was behind those occurrences. Was it all in my head, or was something truly haunting me? It wasn't until years later that I discovered the likely cause of these events. The scratching might have been caused by mice nestled under the roof, but the more unsettling event that happened years before this was that my little brother had been dabbling in the occult. He had used a site to learn how to make our house haunted, and had even used a Ouija board, which my dad had thrown away after he found out. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How could my own brother do something like that? The worst part was that during one of these Ouija sessions, my brother intentionally failed to say goodbye. And since the board was gone, we couldn't undo the damage. It's hard to shake the feeling that this was the true cause of the scratching and haunting dreams. To this day, I still wonder what sort of malevolent force my brother may have unleashed upon her home, and what it could be capable of. It's been years since those terrifying experiences, and I'm an adult now but the idea of those dreams still haunt me. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night feeling like I'm being watched, and I can't help but think back to that time. I've tried to talk to my brother about what he did, but he refuses to discuss it, and I can't help but wonder if he knows more than what he's letting on. Maybe he's afraid of what he's unleashed, or maybe he's just ashamed of what he's done. Either way, I know that those experiences have left a lasting impact on me. Even now, when I'm alone in my room at night, I can't help but feel like I'm not really alone. I'll never forget the scratching, the dreams, or the fear that came along with them. And I'll always wonder what sort of darkness my brother may have unleashed upon her home.
My mother tried to possess me, but I miss her. I belong to a small town in Japan, and for many years, it's been very secluded from all the modern-day technology, and professes and conservative and backwards ideologies, but my dad, who was brought up in a different area for a few years of his childhood, didn't believe in any of that. My upbringing was also modernized because of his thoughts, processes, and parenting skills. I don't remember much of my mother as I'd lost her at a very young age of eight due to a terrible illness which totally destroyed her skin and made her look rather unpleasant. Many doctors and shamans refused to help her as she wasn't from the town, but actually came from because of her marriage. When the word about my mom got out, many kids started teasing her and calling her names like the ugly, scary woman who lives in the brown home, the scary woman who kidnaps young girls for new skin, the witch who took my father's youth. Basically, in conclusion, my mom was really not welcome in the area and she felt like it was home. When my mother passed, my dad couldn't take it. It was just hard being a single parent, so after the morning rituals and cremating her, we left for a new town, never to return back. But fate had some other choices. Naturally, we started adjusting to the new place and life was starting to come to a stable end when I started having visions of my mom roaming around her grave looking for us. At first, I didn't tell my dad because I didn't want to upset him. But the vision became more and more realistic and me imagining that my mom is unhappy with her grave place. She kept saying, I don't like this town. The other people buried me, made fun of me. This grave is so far from you guys, I can't see you or visit you often. Shift me to a new ground. I don't like this town. Many a time it scared me so much that I couldn't sleep the whole night and eventually I had to tell my dad. As already mentioned, my dad doesn't believe in spiritual things, and at first he took me various psychiatrists and took me to all kinds. They all said maybe it was because of the trauma, but the vision that scared me the most was when I saw my mom trying to open the new door handle after the most of the new things are blurry for me, and all I know is my dad's point of view. Apparently one day when my dad came home from work, he saw me cooking something which was super weird because I don't cook that often, and it had a very familiar smell. I asked him to sit down for dinner, and he happily obliged. The whole time I looked rather gloomy and didn't see him in the eye. Whenever my dad tried asking me about my visions, I dodged the questions and started talking about irrelevant stuff, but my dad, being tired, didn't take much notice of it. But everything came crashing down when suddenly my dad dropped the glass of water and the words that came out of my mouth horrified him. I said, Honey, you are as clumsy as ever. Please take care of yourself. My dad was horrified to hear those words because I would never call my father Honey and it's something my mother would have used to call him. After that, everything was kind of hurried down. Like in conclusion, he took me back to our hometown and we did rituals. My mom's grave was changed into our new town, which was less crowded and closer to us. My dad thinks my mom was just not happy there and used that as a way to express her emotions, but I'm not really sure. Last night, after seven years, I had a vision of my mother and she was in the same old grave, but this time, tied to her grave entrance with religious threads. She whispered with a lot of pain, it wasn't me. And then suddenly the grave door was closed by the lady in a black dress, and she smiled at me with a rather uncomfortable, eerie air. Apparition in Voices, Witnessed by Friends and I, as well as my parents, shared experiences. There's only one place I've ever been at that I believe was haunted, and it was my family's house in the mountains, which I won't disclose the location of. It was a nice three-story house with lots of places to sleep, and my friends and I had a lot of good memories there. My craziest experience was when I was playing Ghosts in the Graveyard, which is basically like a game of hide-and-seek, but with tag. Ghosts weren't really on my mind at all, and just messing around, I remember standing next to my friend who owned the house, and we were looking down the bottom floor stairs, and for some reason, it was night and I noticed that the room below was eerily dark. I shouted, ghost in the graveyard, come get us, as a joke, just friendly teasing my paranoid friend, and suddenly a veil of darkness rushed up the stairs and flew right into my face. My friend and I screamed and ran into the living room. When our friends came over, my friend explains exactly what I saw. He saw the darkness of the room deepen, and then he saw a black figure fly up the stairs into my face. I didn't feel anything when it happened. 
My other major experience, there was hearing voices. The craziest time was when me and my friends were hanging out in the living room, just having a normal conversation when we heard talking and footsteps upstairs. We assumed our friend's brother was home because that's where his bedroom was and thought nothing of it. It wasn't until like an hour later that my friend realized his brother wasn't home at all, and yet we were still literally talking to him like a few brief conversations upstairs and walking around and we were all totally thinking that he was home when it was only us in the living room. My friends have also reported alongside my brother, who visited only a couple times, observing the stove turn on by itself, with a knob set to heat. They also would hear the sound of marbles or something else similar, small objects dropping in the kitchen. When I was a baby, apparently I grew up in a haunted house as well. My parents said for years that they both saw shadows of children running around the yard, but they hadn't acknowledged it to each other for a very long time, and yet they both saw them. What's crazy about my dad's story, I think it's one of the craziest ghost stories I've ever heard. He was driving home late at night, and suddenly as if being pulled in the driveway itself, his car heavily bumped over something, and he was convinced he ran over either a person or an animal. He got out to investigate and saw nobody. He gets back in the car and says after sitting down, a girl suddenly appeared from a tube of smoke that traveled from the hood of the car to the side window. He said she wore clothing like you'd imagine a farmer's daughter wearing in early America, overalls and just long dark hair, and she was young. She said she was in a gray scale or black and white. He said he didn't feel afraid looking at her. She just stared at him through the window for a moment before vanishing. I'll also just add I'm no bullshitter, and neither are my dads or friends. These were isolated events in our lives, heavily tied to specific locations. My friend's house was either near an Indian burial site, or there used to be Indians on that land, I forgot which. My parents' old house was an old-ass house, too. I hate that people make up stories in places where real experiences are meant to be shared. These were real experiences, but I don't know the reality of what they really were. But these are the ones that can't be explained by us rationally. We met a guy who used to work in our house. He asked, have you met the ghosts yet? Oh, I can't believe I'm sharing this with you, but something really strange is happening in my house. Actually, my husband and I have been experiencing odd experiences for quite some time now. We always lived in houses where strange things happened, but this one is a whole different level of crazy. It's very, very haunted. I'm talking about noises, floorboards creaking with footsteps, bangs, doors opening, lights and sockets switching on and off, things moving, voices and shadows. It's enough to drive a person mad. But the worst part is that we're not the only ones who've noticed. The laborers working here have been very unsettled by events, and in some cases they refuse to come back. I mean, that's not a great sign, is it? It all makes sense now, though. My husband recently told us that this house was very old, and in recent years, it was a home for addicts with new babies. Serious, horrific trauma happened here, and I cried when he told us. It's unsurprising to me, therefore, the energy here is so charged. But even though we know this house is haunted, and that some seriously bad stuff went down here, my husband and I aren't frightened. In fact, we like it here. Our family and friends said, move out, but we're not ready to give up in this house just yet. We're skeptical and curious, and we want to see where this ride takes us. Last night, we decided to take matters into our own hands. We opened doors and windows all throughout the house, starting in the cellar and working our way up through the house. It was a mammoth task, considering that there are 28 rooms and spaces in this place, but we were determined to do it. We had white sage sticks, tea light candles, and a bowl each carrying the candles in, which were gifts from loved ones, and this pretty sentimental to us. We moved through the house room by room, talking out loud to any spirits who didn't respect us or who wanted to harm us and to leave our house. We made it clear that this was our home and we wouldn't tolerate any bad energy, and if anybody wished to stay, they could, but they must respect us and treat us with kindness. In the rooms where we felt the most oppressive energy, one bedroom in particular, I 
spent a while talking out loud to any spirits trapped here because of the traumatic history of the house. I told them they were free to move on now, find their loved ones, and leave this place behind. I don't know if it did anything, but we felt like we had to try. So we did, and we believed in our conviction. My husband had a strange interaction in the cellar where the sage was knocked from his hand, but he remained firm and told them that they had to leave and they weren't allowed. Our cat was avidly watching the house, and the house had a spirit cat, and as usual, started following it around. He then seemed to be watching and following things with his eyes. Through the kitchen to the back door, we were just watching, fascinated, and I said thank you just in case they were leaving. So here we are, waiting to see if things feel better here and more peaceful. I certainly slept well last night, so fingers crossed. We know that there's a possibility that some spirits may want to stay, and that's okay. As long as they respect us and don't cause any harm. It's a wild ride, but we're in it for the long haul. It was the year 2003 and Emily was living in a trailer out in the countryside with her boyfriend and their two daughters. The trailer was cozy, but it was located far from civilization, and they were the only ones living in the area. The nearest neighbor was miles away, and there were no street lights to light up the dark nights. The only sources of light came from the moon and the stars, which were often obscured by clouds. One evening, shortly after time had changed to darkness, Emily walked out in the hallway to get something from the kitchen. As she walked, she caught sight of a shadowy figure in the living room. She froze in her tracks and stared back at the figure. It was tall, dark, and seemed to be staring right back at her. Emily didn't get any bad vibes, but she felt uncomfortable, and the hairs on the back of her neck stood up. A few months after, Emily first saw the shadow man. She and her family were awoken in the middle of the night by what sounded like a full-grown person sprinting back and forth across the room. The sound was loud and clear, and it was coming from above them. Emily and her boyfriend were paralyzed by fear in their bed, unsure of what to do. The sprinting continued for what seemed like an eternity, but when it finally stopped, there was nothing but silence. Emily's boyfriend checked the snow and the footprints. There was none. Emily couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. She felt like the shadow man and the sprinting on the roof were connected somehow. The following night, when the shadow man appeared in the living room again, Emily decided to take action. She put out her energy and let the shadow man know that she wouldn't tolerate any more strange behavior. She told him to leave her family alone. She outlined the outside of her trailer with salt. For a year, Emily and her family continued to live in the trailer. She still felt the shadow man's presence, but there were no further instances of strange behavior. They eventually built a house and sold the trailer to a girl that Emily had gone to school with. Six months after the girl moved into the trailer, it burned down. The girl claimed that she left a candle burning, but Emily couldn't shake the feeling that the shadow man had something to do with it. A few months later, the girl passed away and the cause of her death was unknown. Despite no longer living in the trailer, Emily still felt an uneasy feeling most days. She felt like she was never alone, even when she was home alone. She knew that the shadow man was still with her, watching and waiting. Years went by, and Emily moved on with her life. She got married and had more children. But she never forgot about the shadow man. Whenever she would pass by the trailer, she would get a chill. She would remember the strange occurrences that happened there. One day, she received a call from a friend who was driving past the old trailer. The trailer was no longer standing, and in its place was a large, beautiful tree. Emily felt a sense of peace wash over her, as if the shadow man had finally moved on. She knew that the tree represented new life, and she felt like the shadow man's spirit had finally been put to rest. To this day, Emily still thinks about the shadow man and the strange occurrence that happened in the trailer. She'll never forget the feeling of being watched, but she knows that the shadow man meant no harm. She's grateful for the experience because it taught her to be more aware of her surroundings and to always trust her intuition. My childhood home used to be a school, and I'm pretty sure it traumatized me. 
Now, I don't know a ton about the history of my childhood home, but I know that it was old as hell, one of the creepiest places I've ever lived. It was a four-story house, fancy, right? With lots of dark spaces and long stairways. Basically, it was really big. There wasn't a moment in that house that I felt like I was truly alone, and there wasn't a hallway that felt truly empty. I was just barely out of toddlerhood when I started to develop severe anxiety. I was afraid to do anything alone. I was always checked behind me, sleeping with my head under the covers, seeing things and hearing things, you name it. I'm almost 100% sure that there was something paranormal making me feel that way. I wasn't the only one seeing and hearing things, though. My older brother shared a room with me, and he always slept on the top bunk. His bed was maybe a foot away from the ceiling, and the attic was right above us. He told me that some nights he'd hear adult footsteps right above his head just circling the attic. But it gets weirder. He told me that at one point he woke up next to a shadowy figure just lying in the bed with him. He claims the figure had two white specks for eyes and that it wasn't acting malicious, just lying there silently. This might have been some kind of sleep paralysis hallucination, but considering the other events... I wouldn't be surprised if it was some kind of spirit. And now on to the worst one, the playroom. That room was the creepiest fucking thing in the house, and I get shivers just thinking about it. I sat at the end of a long hallway on the top floor, just below the attic. My room was down the hall from it, and it was always pitch black. I remember staying up at night staring at it, just in case something moved. I often couldn't take my eyes away in fear of something appearing if I did. Somehow, every time I looked at that doorway, the door was wide open. And the door wasn't weak, either. It worked perfectly fine and wouldn't open unless you turned the knob. I'd ask my dad to close it before I went to bed, and it would just stay closed for a bit, until it slid open again. I'm not a door specialist, but it was just arguably creepy. But wait, there's more. Now that we're older and out of the house, me and my brother found out that we shared similar terrifying experience. We both saw something incredibly creepy in the same room at the same place. I remember it vaguely. It was a small, neutral, glowing white face in the playroom. It looked a bit like a little kid from my memory. It had no body, just a pure white face in the dark. It was around my height, and its eyes were kind of just... not there. I don't remember much, but I remember it was the single most terrifying thing I'd ever been through. I don't know if I hallucinated or what, but I know it felt incredibly real at the time. Maybe it was a dream or something. Because all I remember is seeing that fucking face, getting scared and running back to my bed. I don't think I screamed, but I seriously don't remember. I have a kind of a love-hate relationship thinking about it, because it just makes my hair stand on edge. Thanks to that house... I have now been diagnosed with anxiety. I'm taking medication for it, and I'm all right. But I thought it was worth noting. My grandpa's ghost saved me. As the days passed, the fear of death had been haunting me, and it became unbearable. Every night I found myself lying awake consumed by anxiety and the gnawing fear that my consciousness would simply seed into exist, and my physical death would come. The thought of nothingness, of simply disappearing into the void, was too much for me to fear. Despite my efforts to distract myself with books, movies, and anything else that could help me forget about my fear, I remained consumed by it. I even began to consider exploring religion or spirituality, just to find some comfort in the idea of afterlife. But nothing seemed to work, and the fear only continued to grow. Then one day a forgotten memory came to me like a bolt of lightning. It was a story my great aunt had told my grandmother many years ago about how her own father had come to her in her final moments. My great aunt had been bedridden for many years unable to walk and on the night she passed away she had begged my great grandmother to help her move to the other side of the bed. When asked why, she replied that her father had been visiting her every night for the past three nights and he had been gently petting her hair as if everything was going to be okay. At the time, my great-aunt had never spoken about ghosts or anything like that, so the story seemed strange and a little unsettling. But now as I lay in bed, consumed by my fear of death, 
That memory took on a whole new significance. The thought that our loved ones might be visiting us after they pass away, offering comfort and reassurance was a powerful one. It gave me a glimmer of hope and for the first time in months I found myself drifting off to sleep with a sense of peace. But as the weeks went by, strange things began to happen. I would wake up in the middle of the night convinced that there was someone in my room. I would smell the scent of my great aunt's favorite perfume, even though I knew it wasn't possible. And sometimes when I was alone in my apartment, I would hear footsteps or the sound of someone whispering my name. At first I tried to convince myself that I was just being paranoid, but the strange occurrences only became more frequent and I began to feel like I was losing my grip on reality itself. I started to wonder if I had somehow invited something into my life by dwelling so much on the idea of death and the afterlife. One night as I lay in my bed, the scent of my great aunt's perfume overwhelming my senses, I saw a shadowy figure standing at the foot of my bed. I couldn't make out any details, but I could feel its presence in the room with me, and it was terrifying. From that point on, I was never able to shake the feeling that something was watching me and following me wherever I went. I tried to tell myself that I was imagining things, but deep down, I knew that something was very wrong. Eventually, I sought help from a spiritual advisor who performed a cleansing ritual to rid me of any negative energy or entities that might be haunting me. The ritual was intense and frightening, but when it was over, I felt like a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. To this day, I'm not sure exactly what was happening to me during those months. Fear and paranoia. But I do know that the memory of my great aunt's final moments, which had brought me some comfort at first, had somehow invited something dark and terrifying into my life. I learned the hard way that sometimes it's better to leave the mysteries of death and the afterlife alone. Does anyone else experience discomfort from mirrors? Throughout my life, I've had countless paranormal experiences, especially when I'm alone. These strange occurrences were more frequent when I lived with my mother. I believe that there's an energy attached to her that attracts paranormal activity. Since moving out, I've had fewer experiences, but I still encounter odd events from time to time. Recently, I started working at a hotel, and I've been staying in a room there for the past two months. At first, I didn't spend much time in the room because of the ongoing construction in the building. I've had construction workers enter my room without permission, which is a whole other story in itself. As a result, I decided to stay with my friend for a few weeks until I felt comfortable returning. However, when I came back, I sensed a bizarre vibe in the room. There's a mirror bolted to the wall across from my bed, which seems to be the source of my discomfort. Although I tried removing it from the wall, was stuck on there pretty good. The strange feeling intensifies at night too, but I feel uneasy even during the day. It's as if someone's in the room with me or someone is watching me, and I find myself frequently glancing in the mirror. I've never had an issue with mirrors in the past, but this one is getting to me. To alleviate the uneasy feeling, I've decided to cover the mirror with a garbage bag. It helps a little bit, but I still sense a strange presence in my room finding it difficult to sleep without a light on because of it, even though I prefer sleeping in the dark. This morning, a co-worker of mine mentioned that someone passed away in the room, a few doors down from mine under gruesome circumstances. Could this be related to the strange vibes I'm experiencing? Also, has anyone else ever felt uncomfortable vibes from mirrors? I find myself avoiding them whenever possible. After sharing my experience on social media, I was overwhelmed by responses. Many people offered advice and shared their personal stories of similar encounters. I'm grateful for the support and comfort in knowing that I'm not alone. However, some people try to debunk my experience, which I also appreciate. I've confirmed that the mirror is not double-sided. The other side of my wall that the mirror faces is a stairwell, so no one can be watching me from there. I've also tried hanging a sheet over the garbage bag covering the mirror, but it doesn't seem to help. I still wake up feeling uneasy, and I often cover my face with blankets to avoid seeing the covered mirror. I told my co-workers about my experience, and now she's also scared to be alone in the building. She heard strange noises and seen doors close by themselves on occasion. In the basement, we both heard what sounded like someone walking in high heels. 
However, there is no one in the building wearing high heels that day. Although I've been given permission to remove the mirror, even though I haven't been given permission to remove the mirror, I'm considering prying it off the wall and risking the cost of damages it causes. I just need peace of mind and a good night's sleep. I plan to share my other paranormal experiences in a separate post, since it's comforting to know that others have gone through similar situations. I don't have any friends who've dealt with the paranormal, and I appreciate all the responses I've received. It had been a few months since the passing of the narrator's grandpa, and the family was still reeling from the unexpected loss. The house felt emptier, quieter, and there was a sense of melancholy that hung in the air. However, something strange was happening outside the house. Every now and then there'd be a scratching and tearing noises coming from underneath. The family had called in exterminators to investigate, but they found nothing. The narrator couldn't shake the feeling that there was something odd about the noises. They were too persistent, too unexplained. Each time they heard them, they tried to shine a light outside the window to see what was causing them. But each time they saw nothing. It was as though the source of the noise was just out of reach, taunting them from the shadows. One evening, the scratching became louder and more insistent than ever before. It was as though whatever was causing the noise was trying to claw its way out from underneath the house. The narrator and their family were gathered in the living room, tense and anxious, when suddenly the noise stopped. They exchanged a confused look, cautiously made their way outside to investigate, and the night was still and quiet. The only sound was a distant hum of cars on the nearby highway. The family scanned the area with flashlights, but they saw nothing out of the ordinary. As they began to make their way back inside, a feeling of unease settled over them. It was as though they were being watched. Over the next few days, the family couldn't shake the feeling that they were being followed. Strange occurrences began happening around the house. Objects would move on their own. Doors would creak open in the middle of the night. The family tried to brush it off as their imagination, but deep down they knew that something wasn't right. One night, the narrator woke up to find their grandpa standing at the foot of their bed. He was just as they remembered him. Kind eyes, warm smile, his favorite tweed jacket. The narrator sat up, heart racing, and tried to speak, but no words would come out. The grandpa beckoned them, and the narrator felt a sudden urge to follow. They got out of bed and followed their grandpa through the darkened house. The only sound was their footsteps on the creaky floorboards. They made their way outside, and the grandpa led them to the spot where the scratching had been coming from. There in the moonlight, the family saw a figure hunched over, digging frantically at the ground. They couldn't make out any features, but they could sense a malevolent energy emanating from it. The grandpa stepped forward, and the figure turned to face him. In the pale moonlight, they could see that it was no longer human, but something twisted and grotesque. The family watched in horror as the grandpa engaged in a fierce battle with the creature. They could hear the clash of steel against flesh, the clash of bones breaking. The grandpa fought bravely, but in the end, the creature was too powerful. The grandpa fell to the ground, and the creature vanished into the night. The family was left shaken and traumatized by the experience. They tried to explain it away as a nightmare, a hallucination, but deep down they knew the truth. Their grandpa had come back to protect them from the malevolent spirit that had been tormenting their home. From that day on, the family felt a sense of peace settle over them. The scratching and tearing noises ceased. The house felt less haunted, and they knew that their grandpa was watching over them, protecting them from the unknown forces that lurked in the darkness. The apartment building had always given me a strange feeling. It wasn't necessarily creepy or ominous, but there was just something about the atmosphere that made me feel uneasy. Despite this, I lived there for a few years without any significant occurrences until that fateful morning. I had been eagerly awaiting a package from Canada Post, and it had finally arrived. I woke up early to go check if it had been delivered yet, making my way to the third floor door that led to the stairwell. As I reached the round metal doorknob, I felt it turn on its own. At first, I assumed someone was on the other side of the door, about to walk through it. I waited patiently, but the door kept turning, and no one appeared. It did a complete 360. Then it stopped, as if someone had changed their mind about entering. 
I stood there puzzled and confused, listening for any sounds or movement, but the stairwell was silent. The only thing I could hear were my own heartbeat. I knew that no one could have entered or exited the stairwell without me seeing or hearing them, but I had no explanation for what had just happened. Finally, I gathered my courage and pushed the door open. The stairwell was empty. There was no one in sight. So I walked down the stairs, checking each door that passed, and they were all closed and locked. As I made my way to the lobby, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled in my gut. There was something not quite right about what had just happened, and I knew that I wasn't able to shake the experience off so easily. Over the next few days, strange things started to occur in my apartment. At first, there were minor occurrences like objects moving or strange noises coming from empty rooms. I tried to brush them off as coincidences or explain them away as the building settling, but deep down, I knew there was something more going on. Then one night, I woke up to a cold breeze blowing through my room. I sat up shivering and realized that the window was open, even though I knew that for a fact it had closed. Before I went to bed, I closed it. As I got up... I hear a faint whisper in my ear, but when I turn around, there wasn't anyone there. From that moment on, things started to escalate. I would often wake up in the middle of the night feeling as if someone was watching me. Sometimes I could hear footsteps pacing back and forth in my living room. My friends and family noticed a change in my behavior, and they would often comment on how on edge I seemed. One night as I was getting ready for bed, I felt a cold hand wrap around my ankle, causing me to scream and jump back. But once again, no one there. And I knew that I was the only one in the apartment. I knew then that I couldn't keep living like this. I started to research the history of the building. It turned out that the apartment building had a long and sordid history, with many deaths occurring within its walls. One particular gruesome story involved a woman who had been murdered by her husband in the third floor apartment, where I was currently living. As I read through the accounts of the building's past, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I felt as if the spirits of those who had died there were still present, trapped within the walls of the building. Over the next few weeks, I tried to find a way to rid myself of the presence that had taken over my home. I even consulted with psychics and spiritual healers. Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum As a young girl growing up in West Virginia, Abby had heard stories about the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. It was a place where they sent crazy people, the ones who were far beyond help. The stories were always told with a mix of horror and excitement, and Abby had always been intrigued by the idea of exploring the old asylum. When she grew up and moved away to college, she never forgot about the old building. Years later, Abby found herself living in the same state where the asylum was located. She knew she had to see it for herself. So one weekend, she gathered some friends and made the journey to the old building. The place had been turned into a museum, and they were able to take a guided tour of the whole building. As they walked through the halls, Abby couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. It was almost as if she could see and sense the ghosts they were still lingering in the air. After the tour, Abby and her friends decided to sign up for a ghost hunting event. They were given a small group of people and sent to explore one of the more notorious areas of the asylum. Abby had never been more excited. They started their investigation in a room where a murder had taken place. They turned off all the lights and sat in the dark, waiting for something to happen. After a few minutes, Abby felt a cold breeze brush across her face. She shivered and pulled her coat tight around her. Suddenly, one of her friends let out a loud scream. Abby could hear her friends scrambling around in the dark trying to find each other. When the lights were turned back on, Abby's friend was pale and shaking. She claimed that something had grabbed her arm and wouldn't let go. The rest of the group didn't see anything, but Abby believed her friend. She had felt the cold breeze after all. As the night went on, Abby and her friends explored other parts of the asylum. They heard strange noises and felt cold spots. Abby even claimed to see a ghostly figure walking down the hall. Eventually, the night came to an end, and they were sent back out into the real world. Abby couldn't stop thinking about the experiences that she had that night. She went back to the asylum several more times, always hoping to catch another glimpse of the paranormal. 
Years later, Abby found herself working as a tour guide at the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. She regaled visitors with stories of the building's dark past, always trying to give them a taste of the fear and excitement that she had felt all those years ago. But as time went on, Abby started to feel a sense of the burnout. She had seen so much, experienced so many things, but that was all starting to take a toll on her. She knew it was time to step up and away from the asylum and let someone else take over. Abby retired from her position as a guide and a ghost hunter event manager in 2021, but even though she's no longer working at the asylum, she still can't shake the feeling that the paranormal things that she experienced were very real. She knows that there are certain phenomena that can't be explained by science or rational thought, and even though it scares her, she still feels drawn to the old building and the ghosts that still haunt it. Once, I encountered an apple out of nowhere. It was a dark and eerie night in the park that covered several square miles with forests, hills, and ravines. The moon was the only source of light casting an ominous glow over the desolate landscape. It was so quiet that the only sound that could be heard was the crunching of leaves underfoot. The protagonist, having lived in the area all their life, knew the park like the back of their hand. They had spent countless hours exploring every inch of it during their childhood, and as an adult, they often visited the park at night for a leisurely walk, after a long day at work. After they were walking down one of the alleys, the protagonist suddenly heard something moving in the grass. At first glance, they assumed it was a field mouse or some other small creature scurrying about, but as they drew closer, they realized it was an apple, a small wild apple that looked unappetizing and unremarkable. But there was something odd about this apple, something that made the protagonist's heart race. They knew the park like the back of their hand, and they were certain there were no apple trees or wild apples in this particular part of the park. The closest apple trees were half a mile away, and they'd never seen an apple in this area before. As the protagonist picked up the apple, they could feel a sense of unease creeping up their spine. There was no logical explanation for this apple's presence, and it was making them feel uneasy. Suddenly, a gust of wind swept through the park, rustling the leaves and causing the protagonist to shiver. The apple seemed to glow in the moonlight, causing an eerie light on the protagonist's face. They looked around, but there was no one around for miles. The park was eerily quiet, and the only sound was the rustling of leaves in the wind. It was as if the world had frozen in time, and the protagonist was the only one left in this desolate wasteland. They decided to take the apple home with them determined to investigate its origin. But as they left the park and entered their home, they noticed that the apple seemed to be getting heavier and heavier with every step. Once they reached their home, they placed the apple on the kitchen counter and went to bed, hoping to get a good night's sleep. But the apple seemed to be calling out to them, its presence growing more and more ominous with every passing hour. When the protagonist woke up the next morning, they discovered that the apple had disappeared without a trace. There was no sign of it on the counter and no explanation for its disappearance. The protagonist decided to return to the park to investigate further, but as they reached the area where they had found the apple, they realized that something was terribly wrong. The trees were twisted and gnarled, and the ground was barren and lifeless. It was as if the apple had been the harbinger of something sinister, and its disappearance had unleashed an evil force that had taken over the park. The protagonist had stumbled upon something supernatural, something that had been lurking in the shadows, waiting for his chance to strike. From that day on, the protagonist avoided the park, knowing that something evil had taken root there. They had witnessed firsthand the power of the supernatural, and they knew that they had been lucky to escape with their life. I think my house is haunted. The incident that I'm about to describe is something that happened to me a week or so ago. It still sends shivers down my spine when I think about it. I was in the bathroom going through my nighttime routine, you know, washing my face, brushing my teeth and all that, when I heard a strange noise right next to my ear. It was a low, animalistic growl, and it sounded incredibly aggressive. 
At first I froze. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I stood there for what felt like an eternity, just waiting for something to happen, but nothing did. The noise stopped as suddenly as it had started, and there was just silence. I didn't say anything to Mother about it, which is strange for me, and usually the kind of person who tells her everything, but for some reason I didn't want to mention it. I think I was just scared that whatever it was that had made the noise would hear me talking about it, and then something even worse might happen. As I sit here typing this out, I can't help but feel a little paranoid. What if the thing that made the noise is reading over my shoulder right now? It's unlikely, of course. We're in a Spanish-speaking country, and I don't think it would be able to understand me even if it knew what I was typing. But then, that reminds me of something else that happened a few years ago. I was really into learning Korean at the time. Languages are kind of my thing. And I tend to hyperfixiate on them and learn them very quickly. Anyway, one day I was in the bathroom and I noticed something written on the wall. It was a Korean word, or at least I think it was a word. And I'd never seen it before. It looked like someone had run their wet fingers through the tile, leaving a faint mark that was only visible if he stood in just the right spot. I remember feeling uneasy about it at the same time. I didn't know what the word meant, and I didn't like the idea of something being written on my bathroom wall that I couldn't understand. I tried to look it up on Google, but it didn't really help. The closest translation I could find was, it's okay, but even then I wasn't sure if that was accurate. Thinking about that incident now makes me even more nervous about the growling noise I heard the other night. What if it's all connected somehow? What if there's something in my house that's trying to communicate with me, but I can't understand it? I've had other weird experiences in this house too. Sometimes I think I'll hear footsteps coming down the hall when I go to check. There's no one there. Or I'll remember that I left the lights on downstairs, but when I go turn them off, they're already off. It's all very unsettling. I've tried everything to make myself feel better. I've prayed, I've cleansed my room with holy water. I've even had a priest come and bless the house, but nothing seems to work. The feeling of unease just follows me around all the time. I know I sound like a total scaredy cat, but this isn't just normal fear. It's something deeper, something primal. It's like there's a part of me that knows something's wrong, even though I can't quite put my finger on it. I wish I knew what to do to make it stop. I heard my unborn daughter's voice years before she was born. In 2019, after a difficult breakup, decided to move back into the house I grew up in. It's the same house that I now own, having purchased it from my parents when I was just 21 years old. But even as a child, I knew that this house was haunted. There were countless paranormal activities happening all the time, like windows opening and closing by themselves, the storm door in the back of the house unlocking and opening on its own, and even disembodied voices or men yelling. So, in January 2019, after dealing with some health problems and losing my well-paying job due to bankruptcy, I found myself moving back into this house to live alone. The paranormal activity was still constant, with doors opening on their own and footsteps and an overwhelming feeling of being watched at night. So to cope, I would leave the light on, run the TV at a moderate volume, and I'd even block my bedroom door when I went to sleep just to feel safe and ignore the activity. After being back in the house for about three months, one night something strange happened. I was asleep and a voice woke me up. I heard a little girl say, hi. It paused and then it said it again. Hi, hi. With my eyes still shut, I assumed that it was the TV. But then the voice said, hi, in a happy kind of way. And it sounded as if the voice was inches from my ear. I opened my eyes and the TV was off. I checked the room and no one was in there. I checked my entire house at 3 a.m., but there was no one in or around my house. A ghost little girl's voice was not something any of us had ever heard before in this house. I never forgot the voice. Fast forward to May 2021, and my daughter was born. She was incredibly intelligent for her age, saying mama and dada around five months old. 
I don't remember when she started saying hi, but the voice that woke me up in 2019 was my daughter's. It was a shocking realization, but it brought me to tears. I feel like she knew that I was sad and lonely at that time in my life, knew that I'd gone to bed that night feeling defeated and lost. It was like she was trying to comfort me in her own way. Things changed for the better after that night. I got a decent job, and a year later, I opened my own business. I met my now fiancé and found out that we were expecting a baby, just 11 weeks into dating. Our little girl was born before our one-year anniversary, and she's been an incredible addition to our family. My business has grown substantially, and my fiancé and I have an amazing, happy relationship like we were literally made for each other. It's amazing to think that my daughter's voice woke me up that night, and it's even more amazing to see how much my life has changed for the better since then. I feel like she knew her dad I needed her that night, and I will be forever grateful for her comforting presence in my life. That time I woke up to an alien-like entity. Back to us, it was a night back when I was about eight years old. I had a very lucid dream that night. So lucid that I was still remembering the dream. I had a pretty simple plot. You can skip this part. In the dream, I was living it up with my dad in a house with no windows, pretty dark, and all painted orange. And in the dream, I was trying to sleep, but I couldn't. So I went to tell my dad that I was in the kitchen reading a journal. Then my point of view shifted from mine to my father's, and I started seeing what he was reading. And as soon as I put my eyes on the journal, I saw a skeleton skull that was laughing at me. I immediately woke up. Little do I know, I was waking up into the worst nightmare. And why? Because this time it was real. My bedroom was simple. My bed was located in the front of the bedroom door. When I woke up, I could see the door, and it was usually closed. And at the time, I usually slept with a little bit of a light on to put on the nightstand. Back to us. I woke up and out of the corner of my eye saw an entity standing in front of my nightstand. Initially, I didn't give it any attention, but after I rubbed my eyes, I saw that this thing was real and was not just a shadow or my imagination. I started freaking out as any child would have done. I started giving myself pinches trying to wake myself up, but nothing. I was definitely awake, and at this point I started looking at it and I could clearly see a gray alien-shaped face, and after years I came to this conclusion. It was more like five foot three and it didn't have any clothes on. It had an elongated skull and it had his back to me as if it was looking at something over my nightstand. And then it has a huge particular head. I remember this for later. At that point, my mind had two choices. Screaming at the top of my lungs to take my parents' attention and ask for their help, but I wasn't sure if they would wake up or not. I could look the other way and go back to sleep and stay awake until my mom would have opened the bedroom door to wake me up with the fucking alien in my room. I felt threatened. That was a live or die decision to me. What would have you done? After a lot of time, I came up with my decision, screaming for help. I screamed as loud as I could and I got the attention of both my mother and this alien figure, which from having its back at me, rotated a little bit showing off a large black eye, like a proper gray, and started staring at me motionless. We stared at each other with what seemed like an eternity until my mother opened up the bedroom door, put the main light on, and in that exact moment, I saw that figure disappear into thin air. That night, I slept with my parents, telling me it was just a lucid dream. After that, more than ten years later, my dad reminded me of this episode, which my brain completely erased from the back of my mind, and proceeded to tell me that the following day, while I was not at home, he came into my bedroom started looking around and realized on top of my nightstand there were some Star Wars Legos such as spaceships and a Lego shuttle, everything related to space. I still have goosebumps thinking about that terrible night, and now I'm happy I can share some of it with you. The Haunted Apartment, A Tale of Ghostly Encounters in the summer of 1997, I moved into a small apartment in a downtown area of a large city. It was an old building with creaky wooden floors and peeling wallpaper, but it was cheap and close to my job. At first, everything seems fine. I unpacked my boxes and settled in, enjoying my newfound independence. 
But after a few weeks, strange things started happening. And it started with little things, like doors opening and closing by themselves, and objects moving when I wasn't looking. I brushed it off like my imagination or the wind, but as time went on, the occurrences became more frequent and more unsettling. One night, I was getting ready for bed and I heard footsteps in the hallway outside my bedroom. They were slow, but deliberate steps. They seemed to be coming closer and closer, and I froze, convinced that someone had broken into my apartment. But when I flung the door open, there was no one there. Over the next few days, I started seeing strange shadows moving across the walls. They were human-like, but distorted and elongated, like something out of a horror movie. I tried to ignore them, but they were always there, lurking just beyond my peripheral vision. One night as I was laying in bed, I felt something sit down on the edge of my mattress. I was too scared to turn over and see what it was, but I could feel the weight of pressing down on my mattress. I lay there frozen in terror until the weight lifted and the presence was gone. By this point, I was convinced that my apartment was haunted. I started doing research into the building's history, and I did discover that it had been built in the early 1900s as a hotel for travelers passing through the city. Over the years, it had been converted into apartments, but rumors persisted that the hotel's original owner had died in one of the rooms. I knew I had to do something to get rid of the ghostly presence in my apartment. I consulted with a spiritual advisor who recommended a series of rituals involving sage, salt, and prayers. I did everything she told me to do, and for a few days it seemed like the apartment was back to normal. But then things took a turn for the worse. I started hearing whispers in my ear, and I felt cold spots in various parts of the apartment. Doors would slam shut by themselves, and the shadows on the walls became more menacing. I knew I had to leave, but I couldn't afford to break my lease. Finally, one night, I woke up to find the ghostly figure standing at the foot of my bed. It was a tall, thin man with a giant face and sunken eyes. He didn't say anything, but I could feel his anger and his despair radiating off of him. I knew then that I had to get out of this apartment no matter what the cost. I moved out the next day, leaving most of my belongings behind. I never went back to the apartment, but I did hear from a friend that the building had been condemned a few months later. The owners claimed that it was due to structural problems, but I knew better. The ghost of the haunted owner was still there, haunting the halls and scaring away anybody who dared to stay too long. It was a humid summer night and Sarah was wide awake, unable to sleep. She decided to get out of bed and go to the kitchen and grab a glass of water. As she walked down the hallway towards the kitchen, she noticed a cold breeze. She shrugged it off, thinking it was just air conditioning. As she reached the kitchen, she saw a shadowy figure out of the corner of her eye. She turned to look, but nothing was there. She rubbed her eyes, thinking it was just maybe her seeing things. She went to grab a glass and fill it with water, and when she heard a whisper in her ear, she quickly turned around, but no one was there. Sarah began to feel uneasy, but she decided to ignore it and go back to bed. As she climbed in, she noticed her dog, Jack, was staring intently at the door. Jack was a rescue dog, and Sarah always thought that he had an unusual sensitivity to things. She shrugged it off and fell asleep. The next morning, Sarah woke up and headed to the kitchen to make breakfast. As she was cooking, she noticed a photo on the counter. It was a photo of her grandfather, who had passed away a few years earlier. She picked it up and smiled, thinking of all the happy memories they shared. Suddenly, she heard the same whisper from the night before. It was soft, sort of gentle, but she couldn't make out what it was saying. She turned around, but no one was there, and her heart began to race. She couldn't shake the feeling that someone or something was watching her. As the days went by, Sarah started to notice strange things happening in her house. Objects would move, doors would creak open, and she would hear strange noises at night. She even started to see shadowy figures more often but they were always fleeting, disappearing as soon as she looked directly at them. One day, Sarah decided to call her best friend Lily, who was a psychic medium. She told her everything about what had been happening in her house and asked her for advice. Lily listened carefully and told her that her house was being haunted by a ghost. Sarah was skeptical at first, but Lily explained that the ghost was probably her grandfather. She said that it was common for a deceased loved one to visit their family members, especially if they were attached to a particular place or object. 
Lily suggested that Sarah try to communicate with the ghost to find out what it wanted or why it was there. Sarah was nervous but decided to give it a try. She sat in her living room and tried to talk with the ghost. At first, nothing happened. But after a few minutes, she heard a faint whisper in her ear. It was her grandfather's voice, and he told her that he was happy to see her again and that he loved her. Sarah was overwhelmed with emotion and tears started to stream down her face. She thanked her grandfather for visiting her and promised to always remember him. After that day, Sarah felt a sense of peace in her house. The strange occurrences stopped, and she no longer felt scared or uneasy. She knew that her grandfather was watching over her, and she felt grateful that she had the opportunity to communicate with him. In the end, Sarah realized that sometimes, even in death, our loved ones never truly leave us. They may visit us in ways we can't explain or understand, but their presence is always felt, and sometimes all we need to do is open our hearts and minds to the unknown to connect with them once again. The house was an old three-story Victorian style, with creaky floorboards, peeling wallpaper, and a musty smell that seemed to linger in every room. From the moment she stepped inside with her son, the hairs on the back of her neck stood on end. She chalked it up to the age of the house, but the fact that it had been empty for so long before moving in might have been a factor too. At first, everything seemed normal. Her son, like any child, was excited to explore the new space and make it his own. But then he started complaining about a shadow man. At first, she thought it was just an overactive imagination. But as the days wore on, her son's fear grew, and so did hers. The woman started to do her own research, poring over books about ghosts and hauntings. She talked to friends who claimed to have experience with the paranormal. She even went so far as to consult with a local psychic, but no one could explain what was happening in her home. The shadow man continued to torment her son. He was always there, lurking in the darkness, whispering in his ear, trying to lead him somewhere. She tried to comfort him and make him feel safe, but the fear in his eyes was too much to bear. One night, she decided to confront the shadow man. Along with nothing but a flashlight and her courage, she tiptoed into her son's room. There in the corner was the shadow man. It was darker than darkness itself, a black mass that seemed to absorb all the light in the room. Who are you? she demanded. What do you want? The shadow man didn't answer, just hovered there, watching her with its empty eyes. The woman tried to reason with it, to plead with it, to leave her son alone, but it didn't seem to care. It was content to stay, to whisper, to scare her son, to torment them both. Desperate, she reached out to a paranormal investigator. The investigator arrived with all the gadgets and gizmos of his trade, ready to uncover the truth. He took readings, set up cameras, and interviewed the woman and her son. As it turned out, the house had a long and sordid history. It had been on a site of a murder-suicide back in the 1920s. A man had killed his wife and children and then turned the gun on himself. The shadow man, it seemed, was the ghost of that man. The investigator tried to persuade the ghost to move on, but it was reluctant. It had grown attached to the family and didn't want to leave them. The investigator tried a different approach. He convinced the ghost to move on into the afterlife, promising that he and his family there would be reunited with them for all eternity. To the woman's surprise, the shadow man vanished the next day. Her son slept soundly for the first time in months, and the house felt lighter somehow, as if weight had been lifted from it. But the woman couldn't shake the feeling that they were still being watched. She would hear whispers in the night and footsteps in the hallway, and see shadows moving just out of the corner of her eye. She knew that the ghost was still there, watching over them, keeping them safe. And she was okay with that. She had to accept that ghosts were a part of her life now, and that sometimes they were there to help not just to haunt. One of my many happenings. As a single mother of three kids, finding a house that was both big enough and cheap enough for us was a challenge. But when I stumbled upon an old house that fit the bill, I thought it was too good to be true. Little did I know that it would be the beginning of a series of strange and unexplainable events that would occur in our home.
The first unusual occurrence happened one night after I'd finally gotten all three of my kids to bed. As my nightly ritual, I took off all my silver rings and placed them on my nightstand. I wore about six rings, all of which were sentimental to me. I then turned to my bed to remove the pillows and bedspread to grab my pajamas. When I turned back to my nightstand, I was startled to find all six of my silver rings sitting on their edges, lined up in a perfect row. At first I thought that I'd somehow managed to do this myself without realizing it. But as I tried to recreate the same effect, I quickly realized that it was actually impossible to make the rings stand up in that manner without a lot of effort. I then purposely sat them up on their edges, which was very difficult and a balancing act. However, they kept falling over and knocking over the other rings. It was clear to me that someone or something had moved my rings to make them stand like that. This was just the beginning of the strange occurrences that happened in our home. There were times when I would hear footsteps coming from the hallway or other parts of the house, only to find that no one was there. Doors would open and close on their own, and objects would move from one place to another without explanation. My kids also reported hearing strange sounds and feeling the presence of something in their rooms at night. I tried to rationalize these occurrences by telling myself that it was just an old house. Maybe it was settling, or maybe my mind was playing tricks on me. But as time went on, the incidents became more frequent and more bizarre. It got to the point where I couldn't ignore it anymore, and I began to feel like I was living in a haunted house. Eventually, I sought the help of paranormal investigators, and I had them come check out the house. They conducted a thorough investigation and found evidence of spiritual activity in the house. They also discovered that the land on which the house was built had a dark history, which may have contributed to the haunting. With their help, we were able to cleanse the house and make it a more peaceful and comfortable environment for my family. The strange occurrences have since subsided and the house now feels like normal in a peaceful home. Looking back on that night, when my silver rings were mysteriously lined up. Seems like the tip of the iceberg compared to everything else that happened to the house. But it was certainly a sign of things to come and a clear indication that we were not alone in our home. Strange something from the other side. I still vividly remember the day when I was about five or six years old and I started getting into these really morbid thinking patterns. It happened all after asking my mom what happened when we died, and her answer left me feeling shaken. No one really knows, she said. Some people think we go to heaven. Some people think we're reborn. But mostly, people think it's likely nothing. Everything just ends. That thought rattled around my head for a while, and the next day I couldn't stop thinking about how someday I'm going to die and there's no way to escape it. I felt like living was pointless if it was just going to end up abruptly someday, possibly without any warning, die. So I decided I'd rather just die right then and there. This thought consumed me, and I just kept wishing it, thinking it over and over. I want to die now, just take me now. I repeated my mantra all day and night. The next day I woke up and felt a really strange sensation. It was like a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach that filled my whole being with dread. We had these marble stairs in my parents' house that were really slippery, and I used to race up and down them all the time and fall a lot. My knees were always bruised and my shins had painful bumps on them from falling. I bet you all remember that from your youth, how painful those shin bumps get. Anyway, that day I was walking down the stairs from the top floor, uncharacteristically slowly and carefully, but my flip-flop got caught on the stair, and I felt myself begin to fall. Suddenly I was enveloped with this white, wispy, cloud-like apparition. The space it occupied around me felt cool, had no real form or shape, but it felt like it was cognizant. It seemed to be asking me if I really meant I wanted to die. Panic filled me and I thought, no, no, I don't really want to. 
As suddenly as it appeared, the white cloudy entity disappeared, and I was at the bottom of the stairs on my feet. I'm more of a skeptic when it comes to these things, so I often tried to think of a scientific explanation for what I saw and felt that day. Was it fainting? A seizure, maybe? But even after all these years, I can't explain it. I still think of this event often, and I never told any of my family except my husband a few years back. It's a memory that stuck with me, and I've often been wondering about some sort of divine intervention or just a coincidence. All I know is that it made me think twice about the things I wished for and the power of my thoughts. Now, as an adult, I realize that death is a natural part of life, and that we should cherish the time we have with our loved ones. But that experience has stayed with me, and I'll never forget the strange, white, wispy cloud that seemed to be asking me if I really was being sure about what I was wishing for. Maybe it was just my imagination, maybe it was something more. Either way, it's a memory that stayed with me for all these years. When I was younger, I experienced some pretty strange things in my house. There were two incidents in particular that stood out to me. The first one happened while I was doing laundry in my room. I happened to glance over at my closet and saw one of my pant legs fly out like it was being blown around. And I heard a loud noise like an elephant. The thing was, there were no vents or anything else that would have caused the air to blow like that. The closet was narrow and the door was off, so no one could have hidden inside. I even kept the door shut so my cat couldn't come in. It was the same room where my sister swore that a box had jumped in the air. She didn't imagine it because the cat actually hissed at the box when it happened. I would also hear rustling plastic bags, but I suppose it could have just been a rodent. But what was really strange is that I'd often hear my sister walking past my room to get to hers, but I'd go to greet her only to find no one there. The second incident happened in the backyard and I was playing with my dog late at night. He was a big husky and he was usually fearless, but I saw him hunker down across the yard and whine before running over to me in the deck. I decided to investigate and found a very tall, dark brown, glossy looking thing standing in a narrow alley between the shed and the fence. It was half covered in shadow, so I couldn't see its head or any other detail but it looked like a straight body with soggy, wet brown fur. I didn't hear anything, and my knees started shaking to the point where I thought they would give out. I ran back inside, scared out of my wits. I later saw a strange-looking face at the same spot while looking out the upstairs window, but I was far away, so I could have imagined that. For the record, no one died in the house as far as we knew. My dad had built the whole second floor, the garage, and the shed in the back and half the basement. However, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't quite right. Maybe one of my siblings, or I, had brought something paranormal into the house. But I believed that the negative energy that hung around could have caused strange things to happen. My mother was emotionally abusive to my siblings and me, and she even got physical with us several times. Perhaps her negative energy had an effect on the house. I always felt uneasy in the hallway and refused to sleep in the bedroom alone until I was 13. I had pretty creepy dreams about that room while sleeping in it. In one dream, there was a witch in there, and in another dream, the light went out and I had to go get a new bulb. When I came back, there was a ghost dude standing in the middle of the room. I got so scared that I fell over, and that's when I woke up. The feeling of fear stayed with me throughout the whole day. All in all, I'm not sure what was going on in my house, but I know that those experiences were real. Perhaps it was all just coincidence, or maybe there was something paranormal happening. Whatever the case may be, those memories have stayed with me for a long time. Help identify this, please. Greetings, my name is Joseph, and I have a bizarre encounter that puzzled me and my best friend for years. When I was a teenager around 14 or 15, my friend, whom I'm going to call Q, used to play in the woods with me, behind my great-grandmother's old house in North Carolina. We often rode our bikes and swung on a few thick kudzu vines that grew on a small gully and gulch that ran through the woods. 
One afternoon in June around 145, we heard something running towards us. Too fast to be an animal in our area, but too slow to be a human. We both bolted out of the woods as fast as we could. The odd part was that nothing chased us beyond the edge of my great-grandma's driveway. Despite our terrifying encounter during the day, we were curious kids and kept going back to see if we could catch whatever it was and figure out what it was. One night, we agreed to go around midnight to see if the reason that we couldn't catch the creature was that it was inactive during the day. We gave each other a 20-minute leeway just in case the other wasn't in the agreed-upon spot at midnight. Q was late, so I did what we agreed upon, which was, looking back now, an idiotic idea. I called out his name several times, and after the fifth time, I heard a voice that sounded like his, but not quite a yell out for help. When I looked out to where the sound seemed to come from, I saw something about five feet tall on all fours, standing at the end of the street, staring straight at me. I took off running under, hid under a moving truck, for what felt like forever. The creature I saw had an odd shape, and its fur was a dark color, but it had a human-like face. I couldn't get a good look at it as I was running for my life. The last time I saw a creature was when it ran off into the woods near my great-grandmother's old house. The only reason I know I didn't imagine it is that after I bolted into my house, and my friend Q came outside and told me the exact same thing happened to him. Before I could even mention it to him the next day, he described the creature in the same way that I saw it. We never entered those woods again, and we have vowed never to set foot in them again, until we know what it is and if we can kill it. Now that we're in our mid-twenties, we're still searching for answers and trying to figure out what kind of creature we encountered that fateful night. We've talked to many people, and we researched extensively, but still haven't found any answers. This incident has left us both with a sense of fear and unease that we haven't been able to shake off for years. Ask Reddit 1 When I was 13 or 14, I lived in Hawaii on a military base along the side of a volcanic crater known as the AMR. The townhomes we lived in were situated up along a slope of the mountains, but the last 500 feet or so was just empty hill space leading to a cliff that overlooked the crater, which did have businesses and such in it, long dormant. I lived with my family on the base and my friends and I loved to explore the surrounding area, especially the side of the crater which was mostly flat leading up to the edge, and there was a fence along most of it, so it wasn't as unsafe as it may sound. One day while hiking along the side of the crater, my friends and I stumbled upon an abandoned bunker, most likely from World War II, about a mile along the side of the hill. We were all very excited to go exploring, and we quickly made our way inside. The bunker was almost empty, there was a mount for what I would assume would have been a machine gun at some point. However, what caught our attention was a locked metal door in the back of the bunker. It was pretty rusty and sounded kind of hollow, like there were a few spots that you could probably see through, except for the fact that it was pitch black inside. Despite our initial hesitation, we continued to come back to the bunker, and we would hang out and play around it all the time. And this is until the last time we went... We got there at around 5 p.m. and we were sitting around talking about random things, probably Animal Crossing or Fantasy Star Online at the time. All of a sudden, we started having this faint banging noise coming from behind the door. We froze and got super silent, and the banging was rhythmically speeding up. At first, it would be a slight bang every 15 seconds or so. Then after about 20 faint bangs, there would be a 10 second apart. Then it got to the point where they were five seconds apart, and then it stopped altogether. We looked at the door and noticed some of the rust powder, I don't know what it's called, like crumbled rusty door, fall off the door. We were all freaked out by this point and quickly decided to nope the fuck out of there. 
We started climbing the ladder out, and the person that left last, there were three of us, and I was scared, swears that they heard a loud bang against the door as he finished climbing out. We ran down the hill, and some MPs spotted us and told us that we weren't allowed to be up there. About two weeks later, they had built a fence and sanctioned off the entire area. We were still left wondering what was down there, if anything. The experience stayed with us, and we'd still talk about it years later, after we had all gone our separate ways. And it was one of those moments that stayed with you for the rest of your life. We were all grateful to have experienced it together. Ask Reddit 3 When I was just 10 years old, I had an experience that I'll never forget. It was a Sunday morning, and my mother was in the kitchen preparing lunch. As she watched the vegetables, the water pressure from the tap started to fluctuate, going from flowing to stopping, and then repeating the process. My mom called out, asking who was messing with the water pressure. My dad went outside to inspect the valve for the water tank, and I followed him. But we found nothing was out of place, and as we walked back into the house, we witnessed something truly bizarre. Bloody chicken claw prints began to appear on the floor, one by one, as if a chicken with bloodied feet had walked through the hall. The prints just kept coming, one after another, until there were about five or six total. Everyone in my family saw it, and we were all stunned. We didn't discuss it immediately, and my parents just wiped the claw prints off the floor. What made this event even worse was the fact that it happened during a very turbulent period in my household. My mom had schizophrenia, but at that point, she wasn't diagnosed yet. She heard hostile voices in her head and was convinced that there was a grand conspiracy against her. She thought that people were planning to kidnap me and my sister, and she didn't trust my father, her mother, or her siblings. So when something legitimately paranormal happened... It just messed everything up even more. In a world where bloody chicken prints appear, why wouldn't there be some occult conspiracy? Those few months were the most traumatic of my childhood. My mom was admitted into a psychiatric facility a few weeks later after being diagnosed with schizophrenia. Dealing with her paranoia and violent outbursts against everyone not her children broke my world. Part of me even believed her. Having some legit paranormal shit happening in the middle of the day didn't help at all. Now, 17 years later, my mother is still on medication, but she's stable and fully functional. Even when she was going through the worst of her schizophrenic episodes, she was never neglectful. She was always loving towards her children, always dutiful. However, she was overprotective during those times. I've always been afraid that I'd get schizophrenia too, as it's somewhat hereditary. My mom's sister became quite unstable a couple of years ago, and to complete the double jeopardy of this insanity, my dad's sister also has paranoia, and her son was admitted for a manic episode. The propensity for psychotic disorders on both sides of my family tree has made me pretty resolute on not getting married and having kids. I don't don't want to pass on this genetic disposition to my offspring. It's a difficult decision, but one that I feel is necessary to ensure the cycle of mental illness ends with me. My statue is breathing. As I lie in bed, I can't help but notice the imposing statue of Themis, the Greek goddess of justice that stands outside of my window. In her hand, she holds a sword, while the other hand grips a balance, symbolizing her impartiality to delivering justice. I've always found the statue to be a comforting presence, a reminder that justice will always prevail. Tonight, however, as I prepare to sleep, I can't shake the feeling that something's off. I open my eyes one last time, and to my horror... I see that the statue seems to be moving. Her head is ever so slightly turning as if she's surveying her surroundings. Her arm that holds the sword sways gently as if it's grown tired of holding it up for so long. 
As I watch in disbelief, I see the statue seems to be breathing. The chest rises and falls in a steady rhythm. And even worse, it looks like she has a mouth that's moving, as if she's muttering to herself. I strain to hear what she's saying, but I can't make out the words. I feel a sudden surge of fear. What could be causing the statue to move like this? Is it some kind of malevolent spirit trying to frighten me? Or could it be that the goddess herself has come to life? I don't know anything about demons or spirits, and I'm not sure what to do. I try to calm myself down, telling myself that it's just my imagination playing tricks on me. Maybe I'm just tired and seeing things. But as I lie back down, I can see the statue is still moving. It's as if she's trying to communicate with me, to tell me something important. I decided to take a closer look to try and understand what was happening. I get out of bed and approach the statue slowly, trying not to make any sudden movements. As I get closer, I can see the statue is indeed breathing, but it's not a sign of life. It's just the wind blowing through the window and causing the statue to sway back and forth. Relieved, I let out a deep breath. I'm not crazy after all. It was just a trick of the light, a combination of shadows and wind that made the statue seem alive. I feel foolish for having been scared, but also grateful that I took the time to investigate. As I climb back into bed, I glanced at the statue one last time. It's still swaying gently in the wind, but now I can see, for what it really is, a symbol of justice and fairness, an embodiment of the values that we should all strive to uphold. I close my eyes, feeling safe and secure, knowing that Themis will always be watching over me. A ghost in our house. It all started around 18 years ago, maybe even longer, as I woke up as my grandpa and grandpa were at a get-together with friends. I sleep in the highest part of a three-floor, together with my grandma. While my grandpa slept, I woke up in the middle of the night and I heard whispers coming from the commode in my sleeping room, which takes up pretty much most of the wall. It sounded like somebody was calling for a cat to pet it or offer it food, and then it went down crying since it was scared. But below, like I said, there was no one. It was still like someone had been there. And as I opened the door, I heard snoring coming from my grandpa's room, which sounded pretty much like his. And I would, from memory, say that it was him, but he was away with my grandma. The next thing which happened was around two to three years after my grandpa died, which was six or seven years ago. As I came from my weekly drinking and chilling downstairs at around midnight, as I entered the dining room, I saw clear as day my grandpa lying on the couch in his favorite sleeping position, sleeping happily. But of course, he was gone pretty fast as I looked. For the next few weeks, I hoped to see him there again, which didn't happen again to this day. Now in the last three years, I have regularly long scratches on my back and my arms. It happens at least once a month. And there's a scratch which bled on my back, but it scraped off sometime before I woke up. Now, the most recent paranormal activity was around two years ago on a Monday. My grandma was at a meeting with her friends, and me and her shut everything off before she left. And I went to where I usually am in the house, upstairs. And after going upstairs for two hours, every light and TV was turned on. And at first, I thought my grandma had returned home early from the meetup without telling me, which would have been a bit strange, but nothing too special, till I was standing behind the living room door, as everything all at once turned off from one second to the next. I was engulfed in total darkness, and believe it or not, I was scared as hell. I made my way upstairs again and went to my computer, but after 30 or so minutes, I heard something, and maybe Freon the staircase had some noises. I heard someone, or I think that someone said something, to come up to where I am. I heard the steps getting closer and closer, and as I was sure it was now in my stock, I called out, Grandma. But no one answered, so I yelled out, Heidi. Every name from my family that I knew, but no answer. I heard the steps now at the door, but no answer. So I waited for whoever was standing at the door, but no one opened it, so I stood up to check. No one, so I go down. That are the ones that I can say, yeah, this has no explanation whatsoever till today. 
some other stuff that happened, I'd tell myself it might just be that I'm hallucinating from alcohol. Or maybe I'm just a doll which moved its head. The Ghost in the Woods As an avid nature enthusiast, I absolutely love taking long walks in the woods. There's something so serene and calming about being surrounded by the fresh greenery and chirping birds and the rustling leaves. However, as much as I love the greenery, I must admit that I've had my fair share of strange encounters in those woods. And one of the most bizarre and unforgettable experiences that have ever happened to me was a while back. It was a beautiful day, perfect for a hike in the woods. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and the leaves rustled gently in the breeze. I remember feeling so happy and carefree as I grabbed my backpack and set out for the trail. Little did I know that the peacefulness of the woods was about to be shattered by an otherworldly encounter. As I walked deeper into the forest, I noticed that the sounds of nature had grown quieter. It was as if the forest was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. And that's when I saw her. A woman dressed in white, standing at the edge of a clearing. She looked like she was from another time, with a long, flowing white dress, and a ribbon tied down around her waist. I must admit that I was immediately intrigued and approached her cautiously, thinking that she might be lost or in trouble. But as I got closer, she vanished into thin air, leaving only the sound of rustling leaves behind. I was shaken to my core, my heart racing with fear and disbelief couldn't believe what I had just witnessed, and yet I knew deep down that it was all too real. Despite my fear and confusion, I couldn't shake the feeling that I needed to follow her, so I continued on the trail, my heart pounding in my chest, determined to find out more about this mysterious woman in white. As I approached the clearing where I had seen the woman before, I heard the faint sound of music. It was a haunting melody played on a violin that seemed to be coming from the center of the clearing. I felt my heart skip a beat as I stepped into the clearing and I saw her again, the woman in white, dancing to the music of an unseen player. She twirled and spun, her dress billowing in the breeze, her hair flying around her face. But then as suddenly as before, she vanished again, leaving me alone in the clearing. I stood there, rooted to the spot, my mind racing with questions and emotions. Who was she? What did she want? And why had she chosen to reveal herself to me? I left the woods that day, feeling haunted by the memory of the ghostly woman in white. I never saw her again, but I'll never forget the feeling of being watched. Something not quite of this world was watching me. It's a reminder that the woods hold many secrets, and that we should always approach them with caution and respect. Who knows what other strange and supernatural occurrences are waiting to be discovered in the depths of the forest? Ask Reddit 4. In 2017, my life was completely turned upside down when I lost my fiancé to organ failure. The pain and grief that followed were unbelievable and I found myself spiraling into a deep state of depression. It seemed like there was going to be no hope for me to recover from such a devastating loss. But as time passed, I slowly started to make progress. I sought help from therapists and support groups and I began to take small steps towards healing. One of those steps was attending a convention in Novi, Michigan in April of 2018. I met up with a friend and we decided to grab some drinks at a bar. We chatted about upcoming conventions and reminisced about previous events. After a few Long Island iced teas, I was feeling pretty buzzed. That's when my friend suggested we check out the beer sampling session that the convention was hosting. We got to try five different beers, one from each vendor, and then rank them from best to worst. I was already a bit drunk from the hard liquor, but I thought it was a great idea to keep drinking beer. Before I knew it, I had downed 40 ounces of the stuff and I was completely smashed. As the night went on, we joined a group of people who were playing cards. Suddenly someone showed up with a bottle of Mountain Dew that had something other than Mountain Dew in it. I don't remember much after that point, but my friend tells me that I drank about 8 more ounces of the mysterious liquid. The next thing I knew I was blacked out. I have no memory of what happened next, but apparently, I was brought back up to my hotel room and left alone. 
When my roommate arrived, he found me face down on the bathroom floor, passed out, with an empty pill bottle of Benadryl in my room. He immediately called 911 and I was rushed to the hospital. What happened next is something that I'll never forget. Between the time that I passed out and woke up, I had the most vivid dream of my life. I was in an open room surrounded by people I didn't even know, except for one, my fiancé. I hugged her for what felt like an hour, but it could have been only seconds. All I remember was telling her how much I loved her before a bright light shined on my face and I slowly woke up. According to the doctors and EMT who treated me, I had to be revived because my heart had flatlined. It's scary to think about it, but it's entirely possible that I may have died and it was my first vision past where I am now. I'm grateful to the doctors who saved my life and my friend for calling 911 as soon as he saw me. Losing my fiancé was the hardest thing I've ever gone through, but this experience has shown me that I need to take care of myself and make better choices. Life is precious. I don't want to waste it by putting myself in dangerous situations. I know that I still have a long road ahead of me, but I'm determined to keep fighting and to honor my fiancé's memory by living my life to the fullest. Vehement atheist turned moderately spiritual after my mom's passing. My mom had battled cancer for over nine years. We never had a great relationship, but while it was tumultuous, I would never argue that she was a strong lady. She started declining really fast a couple of months before my wedding, and to our surprise, she ended up making it to it. She was frail and under 100 pounds and still got her ass on the dance floor. She went into hospice on Monday. She was tough to convince that it was time for hospice, but when she lost most bodily functions and was in too much pain, she just finally agreed. She was coherent, although tired. I worked from home, so I had been in and out of hospice that week, as work permitted. Every day seemed like it was the last, no change, and still coherent. Thursday came around and I was sitting at my computer when I suddenly got this overwhelming feeling that I needed to go to hospice. I shrugged, called my coworker, and told her. She immediately said, if you feel this, you need to go now. I rolled my eyes, assuming it was just anxiety. I decided I'd get ready to leave anyway, since it was a slow work day. As I'm getting ready, my other coworker, practically a surrogate mother, called me and asked how I was. I told her about the feeling, and she basically echoed what my cousin said, but added, that's weird, I just finished praying for you and hoping you'd make it to the right decision. I just felt called. At this point, I was like, what the fuck? So I get my laptop bag, and just as I'm walking out the door, my phone rings again. This time, it's my dad. He sounds somber and says, it's time. The death rattle has started. She doesn't have much time. So I get in my car and fly to the hospice. I get there, meet with my family, and spend time alone with her saying my goodbyes. I got there probably a little bit before noon, and she passed away before two. I was shook apart from the trauma of watching my mother die, and the feeling I got that told me that I was going to go and was so outrageous to me. I realized there is a likelihood that even though our relationship was rocky, we were connected. She always had this weird mom instinct to check in whenever I was home alone, even when she had no idea I was alone. Fast forward a few months and her sister calls me and says some creepy shit happened to another cousin of mine. I'll preface this by saying both my mother and this cousin had partners that were notoriously cheaters. Recently this cousin's husband had cheated and my cousin made the decision to stay with her husband. My aunt called me to tell her that months after my mother's death, my cousin got a text from my mother that said, he never changed. I was floored. I couldn't even, and I still can't to this day. I try to tell myself that both of these things have logical explanations, but it's just so bizarre. The Pale Lady standing in torrential rain. As a person with a deep interest in the paranormal world, I recently joined a sub to discuss and learn more about these fascinating topics. I've always believed that spirits, both human and inhuman, exist, and I've heard numerous stories of encounters with them. However, I never expected to experience something like this firsthand. 
It was June 30th, 2014, in Calcutta, India, when my father had been in an ICU for nearly a month in a semi-conscious vegetative state due to meningitis. We had been struggling to keep up with treatment costs, and the doctor had informed us that there was no hope. As a result, we decided to move him to a renowned government hospital. However, the hospital discharge formalities took several hours, and by the time my dad was put into an ambulance for the shift, it was already evening, and the heavy rain had begun to pour down. My sister, cousin, and my father were in the ambulance, while my uncle and I followed them in a car. We had to cross a junction that usually had heavy traffic, so we decided to let the ambulance go first, as the cops would allow it to pass. My uncle and I took a U-turn to take a different, slightly longer route, with lesser traffic, hoping to reach the hospital before or at the same time as the ambulance. As we continued down the road, we noticed an old lady standing almost in the middle of it. Her skin was as white as paper, and she was wearing a white saray while holding a thick walking stick, which appeared to be more like a branch of a tree. She was staring in the direction where the ambulance had gone. It was a strange sight to see, as all the shops were closed due to the rising level of water in the street. The water had risen so much that our driver couldn't take his foot off the accelerator, lest the water might seep in through the exhaust. Both my uncle and I saw the old lady, but we didn't talk about the experience until a couple of days later. We were still puzzled about what we had seen. Who was she? Why was she standing in the middle of the road in such heavy rain? Her pale and white skin was something I'd never seen before. Sadly, my dad passed away on the 13th of July. Until this day, the memory of that old lady haunts me. I've always believed in spirits, and this experience has only strengthened my beliefs. I wonder if she was a spirit, or was it just a coincidence that we saw her on that particular day? Perhaps she was trying to tell us something. Whatever the reason, it was an unforgettable experience that I'll always remember. The Old Asylum Secret The town had always been fascinated by the abandoned asylum, which sat on a high hill overlooking the town. They had heard rumors of strange happenings, ghost sightings and unexplained events taking place inside its walls. Some said that the building was cursed and that anyone who entered would never leave. Despite the rumors, people continued to explore the building, hoping to uncover its secrets. One such person was a young woman named Lily. She had been interested in the building since she was a child, and had always dreamed of exploring its halls. One day, Lily managed to get permission to visit the building. She was thrilled at the opportunity to set off early in the morning to explore. The building was even more eerie than she had imagined. She felt a chill run down her spine as she entered. The building was dark and musty, and Lily could feel the weight of its history all around her. She wandered through the halls, searching for anything that might give her a clue about the building's past. As she moved deeper into the building, the air grew colder, began to hear strange noises. She turned a corner and saw a shadow figure moving along the wall. She froze in terror, unsure of what to do. Suddenly, the shadow took on a more distinct shape. She realized that it was a person. The figure beckoned to her, and she felt an overwhelming urge to follow. She trailed the figure through the winding corridors of the building, feeling more and more lost as she went. Finally, they came to a door at the end of the long hallway. The figure pointed to the door, and Lily slowly pushed it open. Inside, she found a room that looked as though it had been frozen in time. There were old books, papers, and instruments scattered all around the room. In the center of the room was an old desk, and on it sat an old diary. Lily felt drawn to the diary and began to read. As she read, she realized that the diary belonged to a patient who had been admitted to the asylum in the late 1800s. The patient had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and had been subjected to cruel treatments and experiments. Lily felt her heart break as she read about the patient's suffering. She wondered how many other patients had been treated the same way and how much they had never left. 
As she closed the diary, she heard a voice behind her. She turned around to see the figure that had led her into the room. The figure spoke to her, telling her that there was more to the building than she could ever imagine. Lily left the asylum that day feeling haunted by what she had seen and what she read. She knew that the secrets of the building would stay with her forever, and she wondered how many others had been drawn into the building by its mysterious past. Nighttime Horror A few weeks ago, something happened to me that kept me up at night. I can't stop thinking about it. You see, I've been suffering from night terrors for the past six years. I think that's what it was, anyways. I feel like my eyes are open and I'm aware of my surroundings, but I see things that aren't there. At least, that's what I always thought. Some people have suggested that it might be sleep paralysis, but I've never been aware that I can't move, if that makes sense. I always thought that you couldn't move in sleep paralysis. Maybe one of you will know. I don't know what causes these night terrors, and I don't really know how to control them. I've somewhat gotten used to them, though, as they happen a few times a week. Normally I see a tall man standing behind my door. He doesn't do anything, just stands there silently and watches me. When I come home around the property, it's just my dressing gowns or coats hanging on the back door, causing the shape of a tall man. And every time it happens, my heart beats out my chest for a few seconds. But mostly, I can roll over and go back to sleep. On this particular night, I was in that sleep-awake state again. My bedroom door swung open and a child walked into my room. At first, I didn't think anything of it, as I have two children, an eight-year-old girl and a six-year-old boy. It was dark being the middle of the night, so I just saw the little figure. I watched the child walk around to my bed, to the foot of the opposite side of my king size, as if it were going to climb on the other side. I said, hey, are you okay? But they didn't reply. Without me feeling them climbing on the bed, a hand grabbed my foot, maybe five feet away from where they were previously standing. I have terribly ticklish feet, so I accidentally kicked out when they did, and kicked the child that I didn't feel climbing on my bed in the first place. My heart sank and I rolled away to turn on my lamp, saying, Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. When I turned back, there was no child jumped out of bed thinking I'd knock them off the bed or something and I didn't hear it, but there is no child to be found. I checked my children's room and sure enough, they were both safe and sound in their beds, fast asleep. I know I sound crazy, but I'm physically shaking as I type this. To this day, I don't know what happened and I think about it every night before I go to bed. Maybe I should speak to a sleep specialist about it, but I don't know if that would even help. All I do know is that nothing like this has ever happened to me before, and it's really been difficult to come to terms with. Something screamed at me. The night had been peaceful, or so I thought, as I laid on my left side facing the door, my daughter's voice screaming in my face, jolting me awake and scaring my daughter, who was sleeping on my other side. My heart raced as I tried to calm her down, but my own fear was too great. As I tried to go back to sleep, my arm suddenly got pulled off of the bed as if something had grabbed it. I immediately flipped on the light and there was nothing there. I knew then that there was something in the room with us. The next night, my daughter and I decided to leave the light on while we slept. As I was about to drift off, a man's voice whispered in my ear, Cut the light off. My heart raced as I stood up in bed knowing that something was watching us. An hour later, the same man's voice whispered again, The light. Cut it off. I couldn't take it anymore and I stayed awake the rest of the night, terrified of what might happen next. The next day, I was getting a soda from the kitchen when the chandelier suddenly swung and hit me in the head. I stepped away just as it fell, hanging by the wiring. The chandelier had never fallen in the almost nine years we'd lived in that house. As I looked up at it, I heard a woman's voice laughing. I knew then that something was in the house with us, and it wasn't friendly. I 
tried to tell whatever it was that it had to leave, but that it didn't have my permission to be there, but it didn't work anymore. I blessed the house weekly, but it seemed to have no effect. As the days went on, the presence in the house grew stronger. Objects would move on their own, doors would slam shut, and I could hear footsteps when no one was there. I knew then that we were also, yet again, not alone. One night as I tried to sleep, the room suddenly filled with a cold mist. I could barely see anything in front of me, but I knew that there was something there. I heard a voice, deep and menacing. You cannot banish me, I will never leave. I screamed for help, but no one came. The presence in the room grew stronger, and I knew that it was getting closer. I closed my eyes, and I prayed for protection, but I knew that it was too late. The next morning, I woke up alone in the room. The cold mist was gone, but I knew that the presence was still there. I knew that I had to do something, or else it would never leave. I reached out to a priest, but my mother refused to let him come to the house. So I did the only thing I could do. I gathered my strength and faced the presence head on. With every ounce of my being, I commanded it to leave and never return. The room shook as the presence fought back, but I refused to give up. Finally, with a burst of energy, the presence was gone. I collapsed onto the bed, exhausted but relieved. I knew that the battle had been won, but I also knew that the war was far from over. The presence was gone, but I could feel it lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next opportunity to strike. It's just a nightmare, right? Around two years ago now, I was working in landscaping, which means I woke up at 5 a.m. and I was at work by 6. Sometimes my now fiancé would spend the night with me for no particular reason other than to spend the night. And one morning I woke up and got ready for work and left. Everything seemed normal just another early morning. Around 1 p.m. I got a call from my fiancé asking where I was. I was really confused, but I told her I'm at work like always. She questioned me and asked if I'd gone in late or something, to which I told her, nope, left just like always. She then tells me that she vividly remembered me coming up, and going into bed and crawling in with her, saying I wasn't feeling good and that I was going to take the day off. She questioned me and I put my arm around her. We both drifted off to sleep. That didn't happen, and I chalked it up to her having a weird, vivid dream. About two and a half months later, the same circumstances, I get another frantic call at around 7 a.m., my fiancé is not a morning person, and she'll usually fall asleep until noon. She has the day off, so I was immediately wondering what happened. She tells me that it happened again, only this time when I went in to get into bed with her. She said, you're not hot sauce. I don't want to give out my real name, hope you all understand. To which whatever was posing as me gets angry and says, how did you know? This freaked her out, and she said she suddenly felt like she was in danger, so she finally sat up and looked towards where the voice came from and realized nothing was there. I eventually managed to calm her down and convinced that it was just a bad nightmare or something. We talked later that night, and she says that whatever it was felt dangerous. I am a believer in the paranormal, but had lived in this particular apartment for about two years at this point, and I'd never experienced anything. The next day, she decided to stay the night again, since I didn't have to go to work, and she felt safer sleeping with me that night due to the previous morning. I agreed, and we went to bed like normal. That night around 3 a.m., I would woken up to use the bathroom. Still half asleep, I do my thing, and suddenly the curtain to my shower flies open. I'm not talking about moving a little either. I mean like it was completely closed, and suddenly it was pushed all the way to the other side, showing the shower to me. I immediately awake and aware now, and jump out of the bathroom, stand there for a few seconds, almost waiting for something else to happen, but nothing ever did. I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I told my fiancé about what had happened. When she woke up, a few other small things happened after this too, but I'll end this here to see what y'all think of this. I'm honestly still confused about it to this day, and I never really understood what was going on for the rest of the time that I lived in that room. Scratches, door slamming, and knocks. As a student, I don't spend much time at home during weekdays, but when I've been there, I've had some less than pleasant experiences. 
It all started on a Saturday or Sunday when my mom, dad, sister, and I were all hanging out playing board games downstairs. That's when we heard what sounded like footsteps upstairs. Our house is old and the floorboards are very creaky, but we were all downstairs. We looked at each other puzzled, but we wrote it off to being one of our dogs and continued playing. That is, until we put away our dogs and kennels downstairs, and once again, we heard footsteps. My dad, who was reluctant to go upstairs, went to check if anyone was up there. He came downstairs with a I told you so look on his face. But that all changed when we heard three door slams as hard as they could be slammed in a row coming from upstairs. My dad grabbed a shotgun from the case and went up to the stairs to clear the house, but he found no one. A couple of days went by and I was walking in the house after coming back from school when I heard three loud knocks on the window at ground level. I wasn't too out of the ordinary and I figured my dad was saying hi, so I waved behind me and continued inside. When I asked my dad about it, he turned pale and said the same thing had been happening to him. At first I tried to write it off, but when my mom and sister came home and asked us what we were talking about, we told them. And to our surprise, they said they had experienced the same things. Nevertheless, we were already freaked out. Just a few nights later, I was laying in my room when my dad was working in his office. My mom was reading in their bedroom, my sister was doing laundry, and suddenly we all heard scratches on our doors. And we all knew we heard it at the same time because we all opened our doors to see what it was. We all pointed fingers until we heard the door from outside open, slam, and then another again. When we checked, the door was wide open, and as we all stood there in shock, we heard something shatter in the other room. My mom and sister bolted out of the door, and I tried to follow, but my dad held me back. We checked the other room to see a shattered mirror. As I turned around to get the fuck out of there, I heard my dad say, and I quote, Fuck me, fuck me, fuck me. Suddenly, he saw a tall, shadowy figure in the corner of the room waving at him. Of course, we were all freaked out and we planned to try and sell the house. The weird part about this, besides the paranormal factors, is that we've lived in this home for 10 years without anything happening to us. So why now? That's the question that still haunts us to this day. Did I encounter something paranormal? I remember a strange incident that happened to me 15 years ago, and it's something that I just can't seem to forget. I've always been curious to hear what others think about it, so here's my story. It was a winter evening, and I was around 13 or maybe 14. I had just finished my math tutoring class, and I was on my way home back. The snow was falling heavily and the street was completely dead and quiet, except for the street lights that were on. I was only 500 meters away from my house when I saw a man walking toward me. He was around 15 or 20 meters away and I couldn't see him well because of the snow, but I remember that he was quite short and bulky and that he was walking slowly. What struck me as odd was that his shape and walk reminded me of the penguin from the Batman movie played by Danny DeVito. I wasn't obsessed with the movie or the character, but it wasn't something that I had imagined either. As the man approached, I looked at his face, and what I saw made my blood run cold. It was my father's face, but he looked exactly like my dad, who was alive and well at the time, who was much taller and thinner than this man. Also, I had a perfect vision at that time, so I knew what I saw was real. The man slowly passed by me without stopping or looking at me, and I continued walking. It took me about ten seconds to process what I had seen, and by that time, the man was already around eight or ten meters behind me. Suddenly, I stopped and turned back, and what I saw made me freeze in my tracks. The man had also stopped a few seconds before me, and he turned toward me just staring. He was just standing there, staring at me while I was looking back at him. He didn't say a word, and we were just staring at each other for what seemed like an eternity. He then turned away and continued walking slowly in the opposite direction. I didn't see him again after that, which is strange because I live in a small town and I knew my neighborhood quite well, and I usually saw the same people often. To this day, I still don't know what it was. 
Was it something paranormal or just a random creepy coincidence? The fact that he looked exactly like my dad and turned back exactly when I turned back was unsettling. And the fact that two strangers just stared at each other for no reason seemed very odd. It's not something you do with a stranger. I've never experienced anything like that before or after the incident, and it still gives me goosebumps whenever I think about it. Not so sure if I should share it here or someplace else, but this is an experience I've had. When I was a young lad around five or seven years old, I used to work with my grandfather. Well, it was more like playing on his phone, but that's beside the point. One day while we were out, I found a stray yellow ball sitting in a ditch. It called out to me in a strange way. I couldn't resist taking it home with me. For the first two days, nothing happened. I didn't expect anything to happen, really. But on the third night, I had the urge to sleep with the ball in my bed because I wanted my old stuffed bear. I fell asleep quickly, but I woke up around 12 or 1 in the morning from a strange dream. In my dream, I was pushing a green cart from that ditch to where my grandparents' home was. There was a small child singing, and when I woke up, I found myself suffering from sleep paralysis. I slept on a bunk bed on the bottom bunk, and the top bunk was filled with boxes, so really nothing was able to be up there without sitting on the boxes. When I awoke, I found myself unable to move except my eyes. I saw a white fabric draped over the side of the top bunk. It was possibly a dress, and the singing was continuing. The only lyric I remembered that rings in my head is, put a smile on it. And something about sunshine. When I was finally able to move, I ran right out of the room, being too afraid to enter again. But when my grandfather woke up upset, he walked in, saw me the way I was, and after explaining, he grabbed the ball and stabbed it, destroying the vessel. This could have just been a coincidence, but before he stabbed it, I felt the ball and it was ice cold, and mind you, this was in Florida, nothing should really be naturally ice cold. After that incident, a few years passed by. I forgot about it all. Suddenly I woke up with sleep paralysis again, and there she was, the small girl standing in the distance. She was muttering something, and then she dashed straight towards me. I couldn't see her features since it was dark, but all I knew is that she wore a long white dress and had long dark brown, almost black hair that shadowed her face. Over the years I had other experiences that were similar to this one, just with singing and standing in the distance. But this one with the yellow ball and the girl in the white dress were the most unsettling to me. It left me wondering about the connection between the ball and the girl and what could have happened if my grandfather hadn't destroyed it. Was it a coincidence or was it something else? These questions linger in my mind to this day. I think we saw an extraterrestrial spacecraft five years ago. I remember the day vividly. It was five years ago. I was hanging out with three of my friends at a place on a hill overlooking the ocean. The view was breathtaking and the sky looked so beautiful, a few minutes before sunset. It was one of those moments where you just want to capture the beauty and cherish it forever. Little did we know that something bizarre was about to happen that would change our perspective forever. Out of nowhere, I noticed a small ball of light floating over the ocean, far away below. It was quite far to see it clearly, so at first we thought it was probably a small fishing boat. We couldn't tell how fast it was either, but as we kept watching it, the ball of light started to float closer to the surface, moving in a straight line. We still couldn't tell what it was until suddenly it started to move upwards, and it didn't stop. It just kept going up and up, until the sky grew darker and it became too small for us to see. We were all stunned and couldn't believe what we had just witnessed. We started to question what it could be and none of us could come up with any reasonable explanations. It was simply too baffling and out of the ordinary. Initially, we didn't think it was extraterrestrial in nature because it had never occurred to us that something like that would ever even happen where we lived. However, as years passed, and we still hadn't figured out what it was, 
I started to wonder if it had actually been an extraterrestrial object. Maybe we had been too stunned and confused to take our phones out and record it. It still haunts me that we might have missed our chance to capture this once-in-a-lifetime event. Since that day, I've been obsessed with trying to find an explanation for what we saw. I've researched extensively and read countless articles and reports on UFO sightings trying to find something that could explain what we witnessed. But nothing seemed to fit the bill. It was as if we saw something that didn't exist in any scientific or logical realm. I've shared this experience with people, but it's hard for anyone to believe it without evidence. However, the experience was so profound that it's left an indelible mark on me. It made me realize how much we don't really know the universe or the possibilities that exist beyond our own planet. Sometimes I think about the small ball of light floating over the ocean, and I wonder what it really was. Was it an extraterrestrial object, or was it something else entirely? I may never know the answer, but one thing's for sure. That experience changed my life forever. My paranormal encounter. Is there a plausible explanation? It was a dark and stormy night when I arrived at my friend's house. As I settled into the guest room, I felt a sense of unease wash over me. The room had an eerie atmosphere, as if someone was watching me. I tried to shake off the feeling and went to bed. Around 2 a.m., I woke up to an urgent need to use the restroom. As I turned on the light, I saw a figure move out of the corner of my eye. I froze as I saw a woman standing in the hallway. She was dressed in a white gown, but her face was obscured by long black hair. At first, I thought it was my friend playing a prank on me, but the longer I looked, the more it became real. The woman didn't seem to have any feet, and she was hovering a few inches above the ground. I was terrified and couldn't move or speak. I tried to rationalize what I was seeing, but the longer I looked, the more it became real yet again. And as I stood there, the woman slowly turned her head toward me. Her eyes were black and empty, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I tried to wake up my friend, but he was sound asleep. I reached for my phone to take a picture, but it wouldn't work. The woman just stood there, staring at me with those empty eyes. After what felt like an eternity, she started to fade away. As she disappeared, I felt the cold breeze brush against me. It was then that I realized the window in the bathroom was open. I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. I felt as though something was watching me from the shadows. The next day, I told my friend what had happened, but she didn't believe me. In the days that passed, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was wrong. I started seeing the woman in my dreams, and her presence felt more real with each passing night. I began to research the history of the house and discovered that it had a very dark past. There were stories of a woman who died in this house, and her spirit was said to haunt it. I tried to leave the house, but something kept pulling me back. The woman's presence grew stronger, and I could feel her watching me wherever I went. I became paranoid, and my sanity started to slip away. One night, I woke to find the woman standing at the foot of my bed. Her eyes were fixed on me, and I felt as though she was trying to communicate with me. I tried to speak, but no words came out. The woman slowly faded away, but I was left alone in the darkness. The next day, I left the house and never looked back, but the memory of that night still haunts me to this day. I've never been able to explain what happened, but I know that it was real. And I know that the woman's spirit still lingers in that house, waiting for her next victim. In 2010, I moved into an old house in the countryside with my husband and two children. It was a beautiful home, but something about it always made me feel uneasy. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I always felt like we were being watched. One night a few months after we settled in, I woke up to the sound of footsteps coming from the hallway. At first, I thought it was my husband getting up to use the bathroom, but then I realized that the footsteps were too heavy to be his. I nudged my husband awake and we both listened as the footsteps slowly made their way down the hallway and into our bedroom. We were both paralyzed with fear, and I remember holding my breath as the footsteps stopped at the foot of our bed. I could feel something watching us, but when I opened my eyes... There was nothing there. Eventually, the feeling passed, and we fell back asleep. 
Over the next few weeks, strange things started happening around the house. We would hear doors opening and closing on their own, and sometimes we would find things moved from their original positions. It was unsettling, but we didn't think too much of it at first. Then one night, we were awoke by a loud crashing sound coming from the living room. We both jumped out of bed and ran to investigate, but when we got there, there was no one there. However, we did notice that a vase had been knocked over and shattered onto the ground. It was at this point that we decided to try and communicate with whatever was in her house. We sat down at the kitchen table and placed a candle in the center, hoping to attract the attention of any spirits that might be present. We asked questions and waited for responses, but nothing seemed to happen. However, the next morning we found the candle had been burned down to the base, and the wax had formed strange shapes and symbols that we couldn't quite decipher. We didn't know what it meant, but we both felt like it was a sign that something was with us. As time went on, we started to experience more and more of the paranormal activity in the house. We would see shadowy figures out of the corners of our eyes, and sometimes we would hear voices speaking when no one was around. Eventually, we decided that we couldn't take it anymore and we sold the house to a young couple who were looking for a fixer-upper. We never told them about their experiences, but we couldn't help feeling guilty about passing on the haunted house to someone else. A few months later, I heard that the couple had abandoned the house, claiming that it was cursed that the strange things kept happening to them. We never found out what happened. We both knew that the house was haunted and that we had made the right decision to leave it behind. And to this day... I still feel like something is watching me, and I know that I'll never forget our experiences in that haunted house. The presence in the old hotel, and the staff knew. A few years ago I had an experience that still haunts me to this day. It was a dark and stormy night and I found myself alone and stranded in an unfamiliar town. I searched for a place to stay and my search led me to an old hotel. For the moment I walked in, I knew that something was off. The air was thick with a sense of foreboding and it seemed like the building itself was alive with malevolence. The room I was assigned to was small and cozy with antique furniture and with four big poster bed. As soon as I stepped inside, I felt a chill run down my spine. It was hard to explain, but I just had the sense that I wasn't alone. The walls seemed to whisper secrets, and the floorboards creaked ominously beneath my feet. As the night wore on, my unease grew. I heard unexplained noises coming from different parts of the room, and it wasn't just the usual creaks and groans of an old building. It was as if someone was walking around, moving furniture and whispering in my ear. The sound of disembodied voices filled the air, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. At one point, I even felt a cold, clammy hand on my shoulder, as if someone had touched me. I turned around, but there was no one there. The feeling of dread intensified, and I knew that I was not alone in that room. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination, but the feeling was too real. I barely slept that night, my eyes wide open and my heart pounding. The darkness seemed to stretch on forever, and I felt as if I was trapped in a nightmare from which I couldn't awake. When I told the hotel staff about my experience, they didn't seem surprised. In fact, they almost seemed pleased, as if they were eager to share the dark secrets of that haunted place. Apparently, there had been many reports of strange occurrences in that room. Some guests have even claimed to see a ghost figure standing at the foot of their bed, staring at them with hollow eyes and a gaping mouth. It was then that I realized I had not just encountered a ghost. I had stepped into a realm of darkness and terror, a place where the boundaries between the living and the dead were blurred. The hotel was a gateway to a world of horror, and I had unwittingly walked into its clutches. To this day, I can't forget the horrors that I witnessed in that room. I'm haunted by the knowledge that there are places in this world where evil still lurks, waiting to claim their next victims. If you ever find yourself in an old hotel on a dark and stormy night, Beware. You may not be alone like you think you are. Lila was at a point in her life where she felt like everything was going wrong. She lost her job, her long-term boyfriend had broken up with her, and she had been in a car accident that left her with a broken leg. She felt lost and didn't know which way to turn. 
One day while browsing through a thrift store, she came across an old Ouija board. She'd always been curious about them and decided to buy it. When she got home, she set up the board and started to play with it. At first, nothing happened, but after a few minutes, the planchette started to move up on its own. Lila was thrilled and asked the spirit questions about the future. The spirit told her that things would get better, but she needed to be patient and work hard. Lila became obsessed with the board and started using it every single day. She would spend hours talking to the spirits and asking for guidance. She felt like she had finally found a way to navigate through her rough times. But as time went on, Lila started to notice that things were getting worse instead of better. She was having nightmares, her relationship with friends and family were deteriorating, and she felt like something was watching her all the time. She started to wonder if the board was the cause of all of her problems. Lila tried to stop using the board, but she found that she couldn't. It was like an addiction, and she couldn't resist the urge to use it. She started to research online about how to safely use the board and found conflicting information. Some sources said it was just a game, while others warned against the dangers. She decided to reach out to a psychic who specialized in spirit communication. The psychic warned her that the Ouija boards could be dangerous and that she should be careful. The psychic advised how to cleanse her home with sage and ask for protection from her spirit guides before using the board. Lila took the advice and started to use the board more cautiously. She asked for protection from her spirit guides before each session and made sure to cleanse her home regularly. She noticed that things started to get better and she felt more in control of her life. But she also realized that the board wasn't the answer to her problems. She needed to take responsibility for her life and make positive changes. She started to focus on her passions and hobbies, and she even started her own business. Lila still has the Ouija board, but she only uses it on rare occasions. She learned that seeking guidance from spirits can be helpful, but it's not a substitute for taking action and making positive changes in your life. My mom brought home furniture, and I can hear them knocking. Sunday morning rolls around and my family and I get ready to head to the markets as per a weekly ritual. When we arrive, we park and head to the race course where the markets were held. We were walking around for 30 minutes or so before my mom found an antique stall. She fell in love with the wooden TV unit. It was beautifully stained oak wood with stained glass on the side covered doors and solid oak on the front cupboards. As soon as she saw it, she bought it instantly and got her now ex-husband to take it to the car. It was too heavy for any of my siblings for my help, so we all ended up going in the car. Once the unit was loaded in and my mom was satisfied, it was well hidden and safe. We headed back to the stall as my mom had seen a bookcase and a chest that looked to be a set with the unit. We arrived back at the same spot, but the stall had disappeared. My mom asked the neighboring stalls if they knew where the antique stall had gone, and everyone said the same thing. There are no antique stalls here. Defeated and confused, my mom decided that it was it for the markets and we headed home. First night the unit was brought into the house, I heard loud knocking coming from the living room. It grew louder and only continued for about 30 seconds, but it was enough to make me sleep under my blanket for the rest of the night. Next morning, after walking to the kitchen to get ready for school, feeling like death, I saw my older brother and mom had similar tiredness as me. I was too tired to ask, but thankfully my brother did anyways. Come to find out, they both heard the exact same knocking from the night before. It happened daily. Two weeks later, it got worse. At around 2 or 3 a.m., a couple of weeks later, I saw a figure standing in my doorway, looking away from me. I took my chance and slipped under my blanket again. This continued happening. The figure kept creeping closer and closer every night I awoke. Two days later, my mom encountered a man in a wheelchair sitting at the end of her bed, staring at her and her ex, watching them sleep. On the same night, my older brother saw a woman float past his room at the back of the house, facing the backyard, with only her upper half. The window is only at the top one-third half of the wall, so about three or four meters above the ground. My mom's ex didn't believe her until he woke up one day in the middle of the night, and this has now been about three days after my brother's sighting. This was the final straw for us. 
We found a new rental within two days and left everything behind to whoever moved in after us. We hope you made it. We hope you were able to stay hidden. We hope you were able to stay quiet. Is it possible to hear your own ghost? Living in a new trailer park can be an exciting and thrilling experience for anyone. For me, it was a chance to start fresh and create new memories, but little did I know that the trail I moved into held a dark and ominous secret that would soon reveal itself. As the first tenant of the trailer, I was unaware of the history of those who had lived there before me, but it wasn't until my roommate moved in that things started to take a dark turn. We would often hear strange noises and footsteps coming from different parts of the trailer, even when we were all away. It was as if someone was walking around the trailer, but we couldn't see them. At first, we thought it was just our imaginations, but we were all experienced it together, and it was just too eerie to ignore. We rarely heard each other speak, and when we did, it was just a simple hello, but it was the sounds of footsteps that chilled us to the bone. It was as if the previous tenants of the trailer were still there, walking around and haunting us with their presence. The strange occurrences continued for weeks until something even more terrifying happened. I heard my own footsteps coming from the other side of the trailer, but I knew I wasn't there. I was out running errands. It was as if my own presence had been duplicated and was now haunting me. As the days passed, the situation only grew more dire. We started to experience even more strange phenomena, including objects moving on their own, doors opening and closing by themselves, and an unexplainable feeling of dread that seemed to permeate every corner of the trailer. We began to research the history of the trailer and discovered that it had been used as a temporary morgue during a natural disaster that had occurred years before. It was then that we realized that the sounds and footsteps that we were hearing were the restless spirits of the deceased still trapped within the confines of the trailer. We were trapped in a nightmare, unable to escape. The spirits had taken up residence in our home. The trailer was no longer a sanctuary. It was a prison, a haunted house that we couldn't leave. The fear and dread consumed us, and we knew that we were in the fight of our lives. We desperately sought out help from paranormal experts, but even they were unable to rid the trailer of its ghostly inhabitants. It seemed as if the spirits were too powerful, too rooted in the trailer's history to be removed. Years have passed, and the trailer still stands, a haunted relic of the past that no one dares to enter. The spirits that haunt it still roam the halls, their presence felt by anyone who dares to come near. The trailer is a dark reminder that some things are best left untouched, and that there are some secrets that are often better off hidden. My sister wants to make a Ouija board, but I'm not sure it's a good idea. The ominous presence in the house has been growing stronger and more hostile by the day. Every night the air would grow heavy and an unnerving silence would fill the halls. We all felt it, but nobody wanted to talk about it. But my sister, always the bravest of us, wanted to confront the ghost head on. She believed communicating with the spirits was the only way to make it leave. And that's where the Ouija board came in. At first, I was hesitant to even entertain the idea. I'd heard countless horror stories about the dangers of using a Ouija board, how they could invite malevolent spirits into your life, and how they could never truly be disposed of once you started using them. But my sister was determined, and the days passed. Her resolve only grew stronger. Finally, she announced that she was going to make her own Ouija board. She spent hours researching online, reading up on the proper materials and techniques to create a board that would be both effective and safe to use. But as the days turned into weeks, the tension in the house continued to mount. One night while my sister was still in the process of making the board, I woke up to a feeling of intense dread. The air was thick and oppressive, and I could hear a faint whispering in my ear. I sat up, convinced that someone was in the room with me, but there was no one there. It wasn't until the next morning that I realized what had happened. The ghost had infiltrated my dream and was trying to send me a message. Despite the terrifying experience, my sister was undeterred. She finished making the board and waited until the next full moon to try it out. As the clock struck midnight, we all gathered around the board, our fingers trembling with fear and anticipation. My sister called out to the ghost, begging it to make its presence known. At first nothing happened, but then the planchette started moving on its own. 
spelled out words that none of us had typed. The ghost was communicating with us, and it was angry. It spelled out our names and then started making threats, promising to never leave us alone. We tried to end the session, but the ghost wouldn't let us. It kept spelling out more and more terrifying messages, taunting us with its power and malevolence. And then suddenly the board burst into flames, sending us all scrambling backwards in terror. In the end, we never did manage to get rid of the ghost. If anything, it only grew stronger and more vengeful after our ill-fated attempt at communication. The Ouija board had only served to make things worse, and now we were all trapped in a living nightmare. Demonic knocks. I never thought I'd experience anything like this before. I was always a skeptic when it came to the paranormal, but everything changed that one fateful night. I was sitting in my living room, staring intently at my computer screen when I heard a series of knocks on my front door. At first I thought it was just my imagination, but then it happened again and again. The knocking grew louder and more forceful with each repetition until it turned into a deafening pounding that shook my entire house. I was terrified, frozen in place, unsure of what to do. I knew I shouldn't answer the door, but the pounding was so persistent that I felt like I had no other choice. I cautiously made my way to the door, heart pounding in my chest and peered through the peephole. To my surprise, no one was there, just an empty porch, bathed in an eerie light of the moon. But the knocking didn't stop, it continued and so on, till I realized that it wasn't coming from the wooden door at all, it was coming from my glass sliding door, the one that led to my backyard. I hesitated for a moment but eventually mustered up the courage to take the look. As I approached the door, I could feel a chill run down my spine. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end as I peered through the glass, and that's when I saw it. It was a figure shrouded in darkness. It had black hair that cascaded down its body, and arms that stretched all the way to its knees. I couldn't see its face, but I could hear it mumbling something under its breath. The figure was so tall that it obscured the porch light with its head. I was paralyzed with fear, unable to move or speak, and then suddenly the figure took off running, racing around my house with lightning speed. I could hear its footsteps pounding against the ground, the sound growing fainter and fainter until it eventually disappeared completely. The next morning I went outside to investigate, and that's when I saw it, a trail of water on my porch leading to a chair that was sitting on the other side of a glass door. The chair looked like it had been sat in, and there was a damp spot where the figure had been. I took pictures of everything determined to document the strange occurrence. But even as I sat inside my house safe and sound, I could hear the figure outside, still mumbling incoherently as it ran around my property. I had no idea what I was dealing with, but I knew that it was something beyond my understanding, and I didn't know if I would ever be able to make it go away. Mimics and general weirdness in my new apartment. Moving into a new apartment can be exciting, but also a bit unnerving. For me, the initial weirdness I experienced, I thought it was just my paranoia getting the best of me. But then it started to become more than that. I've been hearing strange things when I'm alone in the bathroom, and at first it was just a faint sound that I couldn't identify. But then I heard my boyfriend's voice clearly speaking to me even when he wasn't home. The voice was so real that I even answered it a few times before realizing he wasn't actually there. Another time, I heard my dog's distinct whine, which was odd, because he wasn't even in the apartment at the time. He's a cranky old dog with a very theatrical way of making sounds. It was hard to mistake his whine for anything else, and it happened twice, which made it even more suspicious. But things really started to get strange when I noticed our magnetic spice shelves on the fridge slowly tilting forward off the fridge. I thought it was a fluke, but it happened again. Even though all that was on the shelf were the two spice jars and some honey, these shelves can withstand much higher weights, so I knew something was off. I checked to make sure that the magnet was secured, but when I realized it was, I got spooked and busied myself with other things. Then... Another bizarre incident occurred. 
I went to fill the bathtub up to soak a delicate scarf, but I knew the water would take maybe a second or two to warm up, so after turning on the tub, I left the room to grab my phone, but when I returned, I found that the water had been switched to the shower setting rather than the faucet. It takes some strength to switch it like that, so I knew it wasn't just a simple mistake. I got so freaked out that I ran into the living room and couldn't move until my boyfriend got home. I started researching things about her town to see if anything like this had happened before, and I found an episode of Dead Files that was filmed in our town. Oddly enough, the beginning of the episode took place at a local crystal shop that I frequent. The episode went into how a male spirit will mess with people in the bathroom and follow them home. After watching the episode, I couldn't help but feel that strange occurrences in my apartment were not just my imagination. I've since been on edge whenever I'm in the apartment alone, and I always feel like I'm being watched. It's a feeling that's hard to shake and I'm not sure what to do next. Something odd happened when my sister had a bad trip on shrooms. I remember a similar experience I had a few years ago. It was a beautiful summer evening and I was with a group of friends sitting around a campfire in the woods. We decided to take some mushrooms, and I remember feeling a sense of excitement mixed with a little bit of nervousness. It wasn't my first time taking them, but I was always a little apprehensive about it and the unpredictable nature of the experience. As the night progressed, we all started to feel the effects of the mushrooms. The colors around us seemed brighter, and the sounds of nature more intense, and the stars above us appeared to be dancing. We all had moments of deep introspection, and I remembered feeling a sense of oneness with the universe. But then when my friend started having a bad trip, she became paranoid and convinced that someone was watching us. She, we tried to calm her down, but nothing seemed to work. Eventually, we decided it would be best if we took her home. As we were walking back to the car, my friend turned to me and said, I feel like I've lived this day so many times. Her words struck me as profound, and I couldn't help but wonder if she was tapping into some sort of universal truth. We finally made it back to her house, and I put on her favorite TV show and tried to distract her. She seemed to be doing better, so I decided to head home. But as I was walking out the door, I heard a loud pounding on the front door. It was past midnight, and I couldn't imagine who'd be knocking at this hour. My friend looked at me with fear in her eyes. I couldn't tell, but maybe something wasn't right with her. I asked her if she knew who it was, but she said she didn't. The knocking continued, and I decided to go downstairs and check it out. As I opened the front door, I was greeted by nothingness. There was no one there. I turned around to go back upstairs and found that my friend was frozen in terror at the top. She said she heard knocking on the side of the window. But when we checked, no one there also. We both felt a sense of unease and decided to stay up a while longer. My friend asked me to pour cold water on her head and try to snap her out of it, and I did. Slowly she started to come back to reality and we both realized that something strange had just happened. I don't know if it was the mushrooms or if there was something else at play, but that experience stuck with me, it made me wonder if there are other dimensions or realities out there that we can't perceive with our normal senses. Or maybe it was just a strange coincidence. Either way, it was a night I won't forget. Something just knocked on my bedroom window. It was a cold winter night and the holiday season was in full swing. The house was decorated with Christmas lights and the smell of fresh baked cookies filled the air. The family had just retired to their beds, ready to call in a night, when something strange happened. As the young girl sat in her bed, scrolling through recipes for Christmas cookies, she heard a sudden knocking sound. Three loud and rapid knocks on her bedroom window shattered the silence of the night. She was instantly filled with terror and called out to her father. Her father rushed to her room and she told him what had happened. He ran outside to check for any signs of an intruder, but to his surprise, there was no one there. He returned to the room and reassured her that everything was okay. However, as soon as he left the room, the girl noticed a shadow lurking behind the curtains. It was as if someone was standing outside of her window, watching her. She immediately called out to her father and he rushed back to the room. He looked outside the window but found no one there. The girl was trembling with fear and her father tried his best to console her. He urged her to go to sleep, promising that everything was fine. 
but she couldn't shake off the feeling that something was still watching her. Suddenly, their dog started barking furiously, and the girl's fear intensified. She had never seen the dogs behave like this before. It was as if they sensed something sinister lurking outside the house. As the night progressed, the knocking on the window grew louder and more persistent. The girl's father tried to calm her down, but the sound of the knocking echoed in her ears, and she couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Hours went by, and the family waited for the night to pass, but the knocking on the window continued. The girl tried to close her eyes and force herself to sleep, but every time she did, the image of the shadowy figure behind the curtain would flood her mind, and she would jolt herself awake, paralyzed with fear. The night was long and grueling, and the girl couldn't wait for it to be over, and the first rays of sunlight crept through the window. The knocking finally stopped, and the girl felt a sense of relief wash over her. The family breathed a collective sigh of relief, glad that the night of terror was finally over. However, the girl couldn't shake off the feeling that something dark and malevolent was still lurking around, waiting to strike again. But she knew that she would never forget that terrifying night and the fear that consumed her. From that night on, she always slept with one eye open, knowing that the darkness held many secrets, some of which were best left undiscovered. Ghost cats? Ghost dogs? Ghost animals? Have you ever experienced the presence of a ghostly animal? Perhaps a feline friend or a spectral pup? I have, and it's left me feeling equal parts spooked and fascinated. It all started a few months ago when I first noticed a ghostly cat in my home. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but as time went on, I couldn't ignore the strange sightings any longer. The cat could appear out of nowhere, dissipating into thin air as soon as it sensed the gaze. At times, it seemed to fade in and out of visibility, leaving me feeling like I was losing my mind. As the days passed, I started to see more and more ghostly cats around me. Some were tuxedo cats, others were fluffy white cats and tabby spots, and there were even a ginger and a white cat that made an appearance. Each one was as see-through as the last, and I knew that for sure they weren't my own pets. I have a Russian blue mixed with a mackerel bobby tail tabby, both of which looked nothing like the ghost cats. But it wasn't just cats that I was seeing. One day I caught the sight of a ghostly dog that looked uncannily like my own. It was more white than my dog, but the resemblance was striking. I wonder if it could be a relative of my pet. But then I remembered that my dog was the only one of its kind in the area. The sightings continued, and I continued to wonder with these ghost animals and why they were appearing to me. Were they lost spirits, trapped between this world and the next, or were they simply figments of my overactive imagination? Despite my unease, I found myself growing more and more intrigued by these ghostly creatures. I started doing research, reading up on paranormal activity and the ways in which ghosts manifest themselves. I even visited a psychic medium, hoping to get some answers. The medium was able to sense the presence of the ghostly animals around me, confirming my suspicions that there were indeed spirits from another realm. She told me that these ghosts were drawn to me for some reason, but she couldn't say why that reason was. Instead, she advised me to keep an open mind and embrace the spiritual world around me. And so, that's what I've been doing. Every time I see one of these ghostly animals, I try to connect with it, to understand why it's there and what it's trying to tell me. It's not always easy. The spirits are elusive and hard to communicate with. But I'm determined to keep trying. I don't know if I'll ever truly understand the presence of these ghostly animals in my life, but I'm grateful for the experience and for the chance to explore the unknown. Who knows what other mysteries the world has in store for me. Chills down my spine. As an undergrad student at the College of Staten Island, I knew the history of the campus. There had been whispers of strange occurrences and unexplainable events, but I never truly believed them until what happened to me the other day. I was in the library on the third floor, trying to study for my upcoming exams. It was getting late and there were fewer students around me. I had my AirPods on and noise cancellation on, but no music playing when I suddenly heard the most blood-curdling scream. It was so loud and intense that it felt like it was right next to me. At first, I thought someone was being murdered or hurt. I felt chills run down my spine and quickly got up from my desk and looked around, but I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. The scream had stopped. 
but the silence that followed was deafening. I quickly ran down to the first floor to tell the librarian what had happened, but when I told her, she seemed skeptical and didn't believe me. She went and asked another librarian if she had heard anything, but she said no also. We both went back up to the third floor and we walked around. We saw a group of girls huddled together looking frightened. We approached them and asked if they had heard the scream. They said yes and had gone to look around, but they hadn't found anything or anyone. I felt relieved that I wasn't the only one who heard the scream, but it was also sending shivers down my spine. As we left the library, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something just wasn't right. I had heard stories of strange occurrences happening at the campus, but I never believed them until that day. The scream felt like it came from beyond this world. It made me wonder if there were any similar stories. That night I couldn't sleep. I kept hearing the scream echoing in my head, and I was afraid that something was watching me. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that there was something evil lurking on the campus, and it was coming for me. The next day I was asked around to see if anyone else heard the scream, but most people seemed reluctant to talk about it. The few who did speak about it had similar stories of unexplainable events happening on the campus. It made me realize that there was something sinister about this place. As the days passed, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was watching me still, and the scream kept echoing in my head. I began to see shadows moving in the corners of my eye, and I could hear whispers when no one was around. I knew then that I had to get the hell out of that campus before whatever was haunting me consumed me entirely. The thought of going back there still sends shivers down my spine. I can't help but wonder if the scream was a warning or something far more terrifying yet to come. When I was in my high school, my girlfriend's parents would let me stay overnight on the weekends. So long as I slept in their RV that was parked in the back of the house, I had done it multiple times. My girlfriend would come sit outside with me for a while until she got tired. Then she'd go outside and fall asleep, and I would listen to my Walkman while I tried to fall asleep myself. I remember one night I was having trouble falling asleep, which wasn't so unusual for me. But as I lay there, I started to notice an unfamiliar background sound. And it's when I removed my headphone that I realized it sounded like people outside the RV were having a loud discussion. But the number of voices started to multiply and multiply and get louder and louder until it was unbearable. I searched round and round, peering out the windows, but nobody was there. I was very shaken at this point, and I decided to run into the house and sleep in the living room, try to explain myself in the morning. Problem was, every time I got about six feet away from the RV, there would be a flash of white, and I would open my eyes and find myself back in the RV. Now, I was nearly having a panic attack, so I called my girlfriend on the phone so she could hear how terrified I was, so she could see me coming outside to get me. I heard the back sliding door to her house open. I heard her walk across the deck, down the steps, across the garden stones, and finally her hands fumble on the RV door, but when it swung open and no one was there. Now, I was pretty much in tears when suddenly felt the presence of something behind me. I turned around and found this massive red aura hovering there and I was just overcome with this immense sense of death and dread. It felt like I couldn't breathe, like I was being strangled. I remember feeling like this aura or energy was killing me, like absorbing my life force, if that makes any sense. I dropped to my knees and then I realized that if I didn't break free real fast, I was most certainly going to die. I don't know where I found my strength from, but I willed myself back from my feet and slammed the RV door open and bolted to where her mom, to much confusion, was. I explained everything that had happened, getting especially angry that my girlfriend never came outside like she promised. She said that we never spoke on the phone and that she had no idea what I was talking about at all. But when we compared our phones, her and her mom started talking me seriously and we began looking quite scared. The rest of the night was uneventful. Her mom let me sleep on the couch, but try as I might, I couldn't. Every time I closed my eyes, I would see a small circle of intensely bright white light. Spirit has been pretending to be me. When I was around nine years old, my younger sister and I were playing a game of hide-and-seek in our small house. I always tried to hide in the small enclosed spaces so I wouldn't be found easily. That day I decided to hide in our toy closet. While hiding I saw a light green glow growing to my left, 
And when I turned to face it, I saw a figure that looked like me, but taller, with a dead look in its eyes. The figure was wearing a white shirt with yellow-green stars, and the glow came from the shirt and lightly consumed its figure. I was frozen with fear and didn't know what I was even seeing. Was it real or just my imagination? After a while, I pushed the door open and ran out of the room to find my sister. I told her what had happened and she believed me. We took pictures with my DSI, but we couldn't find anything out of the ordinary on them except for one odd frame that my sister found later. She left the DSI in that room out of fear for what she found in that frame, and I never even saw the picture. Now, 13 years old, odd things have happened since that moment, but we all shrugged it off. However, my sister was particularly bothered by it. One day while I was home alone with her, watching Spongebob on TV, when suddenly the television turned off for no reason. I looked for the remote, but it was on a table a little away from me, and I heard my own voice not coming from my mouth, but from my parents' room, far away from me and my sister, and all I heard was, Mom? I was scared, but shrugged it off, thinking it was just my imagination. However, this happened two more times, but to my sister and mother while the TV was off, and they both heard me calling out for my mom from my mother's room, it was strange because I wasn't home at the time and my mother thought it was my sister who said it. I was confused and scared. Can someone tell me more about what this thing could be? Was it a ghost or something else? The single manifestation looked like me, but taller and had a dead look in its eyes. Could it have connections to the voices that we heard? I didn't know and it bothered me a lot. However, we continued to live in the house and nothing strange happened again. I hope it was just my overactive imagination, but deep down, I knew there was something else going on. Remodeling Ghost It was supposed to be a simple home remodeling job, just a few tweaks here and there, but as the days passed, things started to get strange. I would hear odd noises at night like something was shuffling around in the darkness. I tried to brush it off, thinking it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, but deep down I knew something was off. One morning after a long night of tossing and turning, I stumbled into the kitchen to find my husband already there, staring off into space. His eyes were wide and fearful, and I could hear the faint strains of music coming from the stereo. Suddenly we heard it the unmistakable sound of heavy footsteps pounding down the hallway with furious intensity. We both froze, our hearts pounding in our chests as we realized that something was very wrong. We slowly made our way towards the hallway door, peering around the corner, but nothing was there. No one. We searched the entire house, but there was no sign of anyone or anything out of place. But that was just the beginning. Over the following days, the strange occurrences increased in frequency and intensity. We heard the footsteps again and again, always accompanied by the overwhelming feeling of dread and unease. One night, I decided to check the security cameras, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever was causing these disturbances. To my horror, I saw two distinct figures moving through the house, their movements jerky and unnatural. They seemed to be gliding rather than walking, their bodies blurred and distorted. I showed my husband the footage, and we both realized with a sinking feeling that what we're dealing with is something far beyond our understanding. We tried to leave the house, but the doors wouldn't budge. We were trapped, at the mercy of whatever was haunting us. Days turned into weeks, and we descended into madness. The entities haunted our every waking moment, their ghostly presence driving us to the brink of insanity. We tried everything we could and everything we could think of, from calling in paranormal investigators to performing exorcisms, but nothing worked. The entity seemed to feed off of our fear and anxiety, growing stronger with each passing day. In the end, we were forced to accept our fate. We became prisoners in our own home, tormented by forces we could never hope to understand. And as the days turned into months, we knew that our lives would never be the same ever again. Something takes over, but what? It all started innocently enough. I'd feel this strange sensation inside of me, like something was trying to claw its way out from deep within my soul. 
was unsettling, but at first I tried to ignore it, thinking it was just a passing phase. But the episodes became more frequent and more intense. I'd black out for hours at a time, wake up to find myself in strange places with no memory of how I got there. And then there were voices, whispers in the back of my mind that seemed to urge me towards something dark and sinister. My daughter noticed the changes in me first. She said that my voice would change, becoming deep and gravelly, like something out of a horror movie. Then there were the blackouts. She said that everything around me would get darker, like a shadow was slowly creeping across the room, snuffing out all the light and happiness in its path. I tried to brush it off, thinking that this was just my imagination playing tricks on me, but the more I tried to ignore it, the stronger it became. I would wake up with scratches and bruises on my body, with no recollection of how it got there. It wasn't until my daughter started to become frightened of me that I knew something was seriously wrong. She said that whatever took over me during these blackouts was terrifying, but she didn't think I would ever hurt her. I sought out help of doctors and psychiatrists, but they all told me the same thing, that there was nothing physically wrong with me, and that my blackouts were likely caused by some form of psychological trauma. But that didn't explain the whispers or the deep ominous voice that seemed to be lurking just beneath the surface of my consciousness. I was beginning to fear that I was losing my mind. One night during a particularly intense episode, I felt something inside me snap. It was like a dam bursting open and all the dark, twisted energy that had been building up inside me was just suddenly unleashed. I remember very little of what happened next, but when I came to, I was surrounded by carnage. My daughter was cowering in the corner, her eyes wide with fear as she looked at me like I was a monster. I knew then that I had to get help, before it was too late but I also knew that there was something inside of me that was beyond my control, something dark and malevolent that was slowly taking over my mind and my body. As I sit here now writing these words, I can feel it stirring within me, like a sleeping giant slowly waking from its slumber, and I know that sooner or later it will take over again and there will be nothing I can do to stop it. I saw a shadow entity last night. I can still remember that stormy night vividly. It was around 3 a.m. And I was sound asleep in my room when the loud thunderclaps jolted me awake. I turned over in my bed trying to shake off the sleepiness that still hung over me, but then something caught my eye. There was this massive mirror facing my bed, and I saw a black mass halfway blocking it. First, I thought it was just a sleep hallucination or perhaps my groggy mind playing tricks on me. However, as I stared at the black mass for a moment, I realized that it was real. I kept my eyes fixed on it for a minute, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. As I gazed at the black mass, I could feel my heart pounding in my chest and my palms began to sweat. The longer I looked, the more frightened I became. However, I couldn't look away. It was too curious and too afraid to break the gaze. After a moment, I decided to shut my eyes, hoping that when I opened them again, the black mass would be gone. I did just that, and when I opened my eyes again, I saw that it had disappeared. I could see my full mirror now, where before I could only see half of it. As I sat there stunned, I realized that what I had just witnessed was a shadow person. It had just used the thunderstorm to manifest itself into our reality, and it had chosen my room to do so. The experience left me feeling rattled and disturbed. I couldn't believe that something like this could happen in my own room. However, at the same time, it sparked my interest in the paranormal, and it led me to learn more about shadow people and other unexplained phenomena. To this day, I still think about the night and wonder what would have happened if I had reacted differently or tried to approach the shadow person. Would it have disappeared? Would it have harmed me? These are questions that will always linger in my mind, but I'm grateful for the experience nonetheless. It's opened up a whole new world of possibilities and it's made me a believer in the supernatural.
sleepover at a haunted house. I remember my one and only paranormal experience like it was yesterday. Even though it happened over a decade ago, when I was only 10 years old, it was a night that I stayed over at a friend's house, whom I wasn't particularly close with. She was a relative of my neighbor who was a family friend, so I only stayed at the house one night. Her and her mother were aware that their house was haunted, and the story that the girl told me was quite chilling. Apparently a 14-year-old boy was murdered on the staircase, and his ghost still lingered in the house. The first thing I noticed was the cold spot on the stairs that her dog always laid on. I could feel the difference in temperature myself when I moved my hand from one side of that stair to the other. She also showed me that a cold burst of air would come back at you when you opened her bedroom door, which opened inward into the room. I remember feeling that cold burst of air at the time that she showed me. The TV channels would change by themselves, and even the voices of people talking would change. And when I was there, the TV channels did change by themselves, but I didn't experience the voice thing. However, the main aspect of the whole paranormal experience that really stuck with me throughout the years happened the next day after spending the night. I was sitting in the living room talking to my friend and her mom, and in between the dining room and the living room, there was a shelf that was built into the wall that I was sitting perpendicular to. Then suddenly, a plastic duck figurine that was sitting on the shelf flew off and hit the wall in front of it. It was as if someone had smacked it off the top shelf. And it definitely didn't just fall. It was absolutely gobsmacked. While her mom was just like, oh yeah, that's the ghost. And they were both completely unfazed. My aunt had also lived in the same house prior to them living there and claimed that the house was haunted. Although I don't remember what she told me about her experiences. I don't see her very often, but the next time I do, I'd like to ask her more about it, even though I haven't had any significant experiences that I would claim to be paranormal since then, I'm still a firm believer in the paranormal, just from that one night in that house. I've been having visions of the future for a while now, and for some reason, I always find myself coming back to share my story, for better or worse. My latest vision was quite an experience, but thankfully, someone in the comments really helped me out. I was on my way out to the city, and I'd rather not name when, but I got a flat tire, and luckily, a tire plug kit came in really handy, and I would have been screwed without it, honestly. This one might be a little bit longer than usual, as I want to try to hash out what these visions are and what they actually mean. Let me start by explaining one I had just three days ago. This one felt oddly ominous, for reasons that we'll get into later. Excuse any literacy or typos, as I can't say I'm the brightest cookie in the batch. It was around 8 a.m. on Monday, now sitting in my car getting ready to go to work for the day, when it happened, a strange twitching feeling set an odd shock through my body unlike any other twitch or muscle or chill. It was quickly accompanied by a series of mental images through my head, vivid pictures of me in a forest at night, seeming to have mud on my hands while crouched down, and the last one was me and some other figure in a hoodie by a building. I'm not a, I'm not a printer, so I can't say how much more detail without these weird spikes of my imagination. One thing to note is that I'm an avid airsoft player and even spend some time playing sport. However, I've never played at night, although night games are a thing. Sometimes these flashes in general, though, are alarming. Each vision I get normally gives me a sense of panic, but this one feels odd to me. I want to chalk it up to maybe envisioning a game of airsoft at late night, but I can't shake the feeling that this may be more ominous than I'd like it to be. If anyone takes the time to read this or hear this, I hope you can try to help me make sense of it. Outside opinions really help, and I just wonder why all of a sudden these things become more ominous than they've been for the past year or so, before the couple of bad ones. It's almost as if something's trying to warn me or tell me something, but I just can't quite figure out what it is. Maybe it's just my imagination running wild, or maybe it's something more. All I know is that these visions have become a part of my life, for better or worse. A 
obligatory, I don't work in the morgue, but story is relevant. I was on a bachelorette trip in Helen, Georgia, with the bride of some of her friends. I've had bad asthma, and I have this bad issue with breathing before the trip, but I still wanted to go. So I brought my nebulizer machine with me to use. We rented a really beautiful little cabin up in the woods, but the roads were windy, and we got turned around on the way up. The wrong turn accidentally led us to a really old, really small family cemetery. We just turned around and eventually found the place. I had already volunteered to sleep on the couch, and not enough bedrooms, and the couch was comfy. But it was off the kitchen. Not a big deal. One of the first nights we were there, I remember half waking up absolutely struggling to breathe and coughing a lot. A nice-looking younger quiet guy came over and smiled at me and helped load my mask with meds before placing it over my face. He then fixed the blanket covering me, turned on the nebulizer, and walked out of view, presumably into the living room. I felt so tired and dozed off again not long after. The next morning, we were all eating breakfast, and I casually asked whose boyfriend had arrived late last night. All the girls just looked at me, bewildered. I explained what had happened and how when I woke up, the machine was off and the mask was hanging in the arm of the couch. I said I wanted to thank whoever it was. The girls all nervously looked at me and re reiterated that none of their partners were there, or even in the state. We ended up leaving for a ziplining excursion, and I had to put it out of my head for a while. When we came back, though, I decided to take a walk through the woods with one of the other girls. Ended up back at the cemetery that we'd found earlier. There were only seven to eight grave markers, and most were so worn away that you couldn't see names or dates, except one. It was for a young man about our age. I felt a warm pressure around my shoulders like someone was putting a blanket or a sweater on me. But when I turned, no one was there. The girl who was with me relayed the name on the grave to the others when we got back. We spent the rest of our time there greeting him and saying goodbye to him out loud when we'd come and go. Never saw him again, though. Ever been in the woods when all the birds stop singing? I remember the first time I was playing disc golf with my friend on a public golf course in Lockport, New York. As we made our rounds through the course, I noticed something strange happening around me. A couple of times throughout the trip, I observed that all the birds had stopped singing and everything that made noise just stopped. The only thing that we could hear was the sound of the disc hitting the metal pole. I tried telling my friend, but he didn't seem to notice that all the birds had stopped singing and everything was dead silent. I couldn't help but feel uneasy and wondered if I was the only one experiencing this. I had heard of this happening before, but never really had it happen to me, especially in a public disc golf course. It wasn't deep or out of the way that one could get lost, and yet it was creepy as fuck. It happened twice during our rounds. The course was on the side of a mountain, and we were playing amidst the wilderness. I've seen deer and other animals watching us from high vantage points before, just chilling, but this was different. The silence was deafening, and it felt like the forest was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. I tried to shake off the feeling and continue playing, but I couldn't help but feel like we were being watched. Every time we threw a disc, it felt like something was following it, tracking its every move. As if it were... It was as if the woods had eyes, and that they were fixated on us. After we finished our rounds, I couldn't help but feel relieved that the silence had broke and the birds started singing again. I told my friend about my experience, but he didn't seem to think much of it. However, I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that it engulfed me during the game. To this day, I'm not sure what caused the silence in the woods that day. Was it just my imagination, or is it something else at play? Either way, it's an experience that I'll never forget, and it's made me more aware of my surroundings while playing disc golf in the wilderness.
weirdest experience in my home yet. I'm in my early 40s, and I've never had any paranormal experiences before moving into my house four years ago. Since then, I've had a lot of strange things happen while living here. It's like I'm constantly living in a haunted house. I've tried to brush it off as just coincidences, but there's too many things happening for it to be a coincidence. I've had a lot of lights turning off and on, sinks turning on by themselves full blast, the vacuum turn on by itself, items disappearing and reappearing, paintings starting to swing on the walls, music randomly playing from all the speakers in my home as examples. I can't explain any of it. Even the HVAC guy who recently worked on my furnace asked if my house was haunted because he witnessed things turning on and moving on their own. Earlier today, I was in my bedroom getting ready for work when I dropped an earring on the floor. I watched it as it dropped and hit the floor, and I saw it on the floor. I bent down to pick it up, and it disappeared, like it was there one second and gone the next. I looked all around for it, and I got a flashlight, moved furniture, sort of nearby, and looked underneath. I even got a broom and swept the area trying to find it, but it was gone. It literally disappeared into thin air, right in front of me. I felt like I was going crazy. I left the house and went on a long walk to clear my head. When I came back, I continued to look for the missing earring. I searched every inch of my bedroom and bathroom, but I still couldn't find it. I couldn't believe what was happening. I then said out loud, Very funny. You made your point. Just let me find it before I go crazy. I was desperate to find it. I then had an urge to look in a specific place, and I found it. But here's the thing. There's no plausible way it could have gotten to where I found it from, where I dropped it. It was like it was placed there on purpose, just to mess with me. For the record, I do live alone and no one else was in my house today. I've never been so scared in my life. It's like the house was having a life of its own, and it's not a friendly one. I've been considering moving out of this house for a long time, but I don't know where to go or what I'll do. I'm starting to think that this house is cursed. I'm trapped here forever. I might be a medium. I don't know what to call this thing I have. This captivating story that took place a few years ago revolves around a young woman and her friend who were hanging out late night and having a conversation. The friend was preparing for surgery the following day and the narrator was keeping her company to provide her with some much-needed emotional support. As they were chatting about their favorite anime, the narrator suddenly got a strange feeling that they were being watched from inside the friend's house. This unusual feeling was the beginning of an intriguing series of events that would leave the narrator and her friend perplexed. It's worth mentioning that the two had been friends since middle school, but this was the first time that the narrator had met her friend's mom and the other family members. After their anime discussion, they began talking about paranormal topics, which led the narrator to mention that she had experiences with the paranormal since she was a kid. The conversation took an interesting turn when the narrator jokingly offered to read her friend's aura to see if she could pick up on anything. They closed their eyes, and the narrator saw a green and purple color around her friend's outline. She mentioned that she felt like an older woman with curly hair like hers, who liked purple, was over her. The narrator thought that this woman was probably an aunt or grandmother to her friend, and that her passing was something that she had no control over. Following the reading, the friend revealed that the narrator had accurately described her aunt, who had passed away when she was a child. This aunt was one who would take care of her and always told her she was her favorite. The friend's older sister then confirmed that her aunt had died with a brain tumor. The accuracy of the reading left the two women amazed and questioning the reality of supernatural forces that might have played a role in the incident. Since that day, the narrator has more experiences with the paranormal, and she recently had another one just a few weeks ago. Her curiosity has grown, and she would like to understand what people would call this phenomenon. Despite her curiosity, the mystery remains unsolved, and she's left to wonder about the forces that lie beyond her comprehension. In conclusion, the story shows how paranormal experiences can leave people feeling both amazed and perplexed. It's an intriguing account of how our lives are influenced by forces that we cannot explain, leaving us to question the world around us. D. 
Did I witness a spirit leave the place they died? When I was a mere 11 years old, my father and I made a life-changing decision to relocate from Spain to Germany. We settled into an apartment that had previously been occupied by an old man who, according to the hearsay, passed away peacefully in his sleep. At the time, I was unaware of this, but I would soon come to realize the gravity of the situation. As I lay in bed at night, there loomed a massive pitch-black shadow that seemed to emanate from the corner of my room. I cast an eerie pall over the surroundings, and I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that came with it. At first, I assumed it was just my overactive imagination, perhaps fueled by the depression I was experiencing due to my recent move and other personal issues. But as the months and years wore on, I began to question the shadow's origins. Nothing in my room could have possibly cast such a deep, inky blackness into just one corner. I was stumped, and it nagged me like a persistent itch. Then one fateful day I stepped out of the shower and into my room, only to be greeted by a sudden, blinding flash of light that emanated from the very corner where the shadow had taken up residence. The brightness was so intense, it startled me to my core, and I fled to the living room couch to seek refuge from the night. When I returned to my bedroom, the shadow was nowhere to be found. It was as if the light had dispelled it once and for all. From that moment on, the room no longer felt creepy or unsettling. I never saw the shadow again, and as the years passed, I found myself wondering if the old man who had once lived there had somehow remained unable to depart until that fateful night. Now I'm almost 16 years later. I still reside in the same apartment, but my father, who had been my companion on this particular journey has passed since. The memory of that shadow in the light is... The light particularly that banished it lingers with me, and I can't help but wonder if it was a manifestation of something supernatural or simply a figment of my imagination. Nonetheless, it remains a mysterious and indelible part of my personal history. An invisible person in the washroom. I was in a towering commercial building yesterday, on one of the upper floors, when I suddenly had the urge to use the washroom. I looked around, but I couldn't find any washrooms nearby, so I decided to ask one of the office employees if there was a washroom nearby that I could use. One of the employees offered me and lended a key card that they would unlock the washroom on the same floor. I thanked her and headed off. When I arrived at the washroom, I was struck by its small size. It had only three stalls and two sinks, and the walls were a drab shade of gray that seemed to suck all the light out of the room. I headed for the stall furthest from the door, hoping to find some privacy. But as soon as I entered the washroom, I saw a woman walk out from the first stall and head to the sink to wash her hands. I didn't want to use the stall right after her, so I quickly headed for the third stall, hoping it would be cleaner. As I locked the stall door, I felt a creeping sense of unease. The stall was dark and cramped and smelt faintly of mold and decay. When I lifted the toilet seat, I was greeted by a nauseating sight. The bowl was filled with a thick, slimy substance that seemed to be moving on its own accord. I quickly decided to move to the second stall, hoping it would be cleaner. As I walked out of the third stall, I saw the woman still washing her hands at the sink. She glanced in my direction and said, Catherine, you done yet? I was confused. My name wasn't Catherine. But before I could say anything, I heard a voice from the third stall say, Not yet. Maybe you should head back to the office first. My blood ran cold as I realized what had just happened. There was someone in the third stall. Someone who had spoken to the woman as if they knew her. But I checked all three stalls, and they had all been empty. I quickly finished using the washroom and left as fast as I could, my mind racing with questions and fear. As I stepped out of the washroom, I listened carefully for a sound of someone entering or leaving the washroom, but there was only silence. The washroom door had to be unlocked with a card when entering or leaving, which made a loud beep sound, but I heard nothing. It was as if the person in the third stall had never been there at all. The whole experience left me shaken and afraid, wondering what other horrors might be lurking in that commercial building. I 
sat in the middle of a fairy ring, and this morning I saw this weird entity in my room. So something strange has been happening in my backyard lately. A fairy ring has been growing around the tree. I can't help but feel like there's something magical about it. As someone who knows about the lore behind fairy rings, I was both fascinated and intrigued by this mysterious occurrence. And I must admit, I felt a little daring too. One day I decided to take a chance and see if the lore was true or not. I sat in the fairy ring of mushrooms for about five minutes, waiting to see if anything would happen. I didn't really know what to expect, but I was hopeful that something would happen. But alas, nothing did. I got bored and got up, thinking that perhaps the whole thing was just a myth after all. However, the very next morning, something truly remarkable did happen. I woke up to find a black mass just chilling on my ceiling. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, with multicolored lights that were almost spider-like in appearance. It was there for about five minutes just hanging out before disappearing just as suddenly as it had appeared. What's more, I realized the time frame during which the black mass appeared coincided perfectly with the time frame I had spent in the fairy ring the previous day. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was almost as if the fairy ring had summoned the black mass. And surely enough, I didn't feel scared or worried about the whole thing. In fact, I felt strangely comforted by the presence of the black mass. It was as if I had been transported to a completely different world. One where magic and mystery were the norm. I mean, who wouldn't want to be abducted by the Fae? I couldn't help but feel like this was a sign that something amazing was about to happen to me. Maybe it's just wishful thinking, but I can't shake the feeling that this is just the beginning of something truly extraordinary. And as crazy as it may sound, I'm almost looking forward to whatever comes next. After all, who needs a 40-hour work week when you can have an adventure with the Fae? When I was a kid, my friend and I went on an adventure near a big factory in our city that was surrounded by tons and tons of trees that weren't cared for. My friend wanted to go on the tree grounds to look for lizards and cicadas, and I followed him around. We shuffled through trees and bushes, and after a while, he said he noticed something inside a gap in a tree. So he picked up a stick to poke at the gap. I was on the other side of the tree, and suddenly I heard him yell, Super huge spider! I turned around to face the tree, and there came this massive, quick-as-hell, green-brownish-looking spider, the size and morphology just like a facehugger from the Alien movies, crawled in a spiral downwards motion down the tree. Having never witnessed anything like that in my whole life, I yelped like a little bitch at the sight of this thing, and it took off running as fast as I could, my friend right behind me. After a few seconds, he said, wait, let's go back and get a good look at it. But there was no way in hell I'd go back anywhere near that thing. However, after much convincing, I agreed to go back. But only if we stayed the hell away and a good distance. So we found our way back to that tree, and that cursed thing was still hanging around there. Staying, unmoving. Not even micro-movements. We tried to get the best look at it as we could while trying to stay at a safe distance. I remember that it had long legs just like a face hugger, just minus the tail. And one strange thing about it was its body itself. My friend got a longer stick to poke at the thing and made it move a bit more before it moved around the other side of the tree, where we couldn't see it anymore. We would have to get closer to the tree in order to get it to go to the other side of it, and frankly, at that point, we were both too freaked out to do that, so we just booked it out of there. Later on, we told other friends about it. No one believed us. It was just too unreal for them to fathom that a spider that huge existed. Even I found it hard to believe that I saw such a creature. But the incident stayed with me for a long time, and every time I went near that factory, my mind would wander to that spider, and I would start feeling uneasy. The experience was a lesson for me to be careful while exploring unknown areas, because you never know what you might come across. The smell of rose after the funeral. 
When I was a kid, my school was located near Muslim Cemetery. I never thought much of it until one day when I was passed by and snuck through a gate. A funeral was happening and I was curious about the Islamic ritual. As I was not my practicing religion, I stayed for a few minutes watching people throwing flowers and paying their respects. Eventually I was asked to leave and I did so without incident. But as the night fell, I tried to sleep. I was suddenly overwhelmed by the strong scent of roses or maybe jasmine. It was a fragrance that no one in my family had ever used, and I was immediately on edge. I wondered where the scent could be coming from. But eventually my exhaustion overtook me and I drifted off into a troubled sleep. The next week I'd almost forgotten about the strange incident when it happened again. It was Friday night and after dinner I was in my room trying to sleep when the scent suddenly hit me again. This time I couldn't shake off the unease it caused me, and I felt as though I was being watched. Despite my fear, I didn't tell anyone, not wanting to sound foolish or paranoid. Years passed, and I moved to another country where I lived alone. One day when I was feeling particularly depressed, I was lying in bed in the middle of night when I smelled the same fragrance again. It was a comfort at first, reminding me of my childhood, but then I realized that I had no explanation for the smell. Over time, the scent kept returning, sometimes stronger than before. And as I lay in bed, the smell of roses or jasmine lingering in the air, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I became convinced that something had followed me from the cemetery, and that it was not a benign spirit. Despite my fear, I never told anyone, and I kept the scent to myself, afraid of being ridiculed or dismissed. Now, as I sit alone in my darkened room, the scent stronger than ever, I can't help but wonder if it's all in my head. But deep down, I know there's something sinister lurking in the shadows. Something that wants to harm me. And as the scent grows stronger still, I feel a cold hand wrap around my ankle, pulling me down into the darkness. A shadow person seems to show my grandma, cousin, and dogs deaths. This was over five years ago now, but it stayed fresh in my mind since the day it happened. I live in Huntington, West Virginia, and up until this point, I hadn't had many encounters with strange things, but the things I did have encounters with have stuck with me, and this is one of them. I was out late one night around 2 a.m. walking with my dog, who was named Link. We walked around the block like normal, and we cut up the alleyway near my home. As we were walking past a motion sensor light that my neighbors had installed, it kicked on. As we got closer to my home, Link turned around and put himself between me and something. I turned around and squinted, looked down the alleyway, and I saw a man just standing there. Couldn't make out any features, and he was dark. As dark as the night around him. I yelled at him, asking if he needed something. No response. At this point, Link is in full guard mode, growling and snarling at this guy. I pulled in Link's leash and tried to force him to move, and he wouldn't budge. After a moment, the guy started coming towards us. Once again, I spoke up telling him to back off or my dog would hurt him. He became faster, and as he neared the light of my neighbor's house, kicked on, and this guy seemed to absorb the light. No face, no hair, nothing. And as he stepped to where Link could get him, he vanished. Link turned tail and ran to our front door and went inside. I stayed up that whole night watching and listening. The next morning, I removed waking up and going to the bathroom. While using the bathroom, I heard my grandma plan a day and used my name. I called her and asked if she was okay, and she was happy to hear from me, but assured me that she was good. About two months later, she passed away, congestive heart failure. The very next year, around the anniversary of her death, Link died from kidney failure. The year after, my cousin died of suicide. What makes me think of this is maybe to tell me that we're all going to pass. And it's not only I and Link that night, but when this thing disappeared, it was the right level with the garage door of my neighbors, which is how my cousin hung himself. I grew up in the rural mining town in British Columbia. When I was a kid in the early 90s, I had a friend whose father, a doctor, resided in a large home in my neighborhood. 
The home originally built for a wealthy mining contractor was one of the first ones built in the community. The property was large, containing not only the house, but a surrounding private forest, an old mining shack, and a small house for what might be assumed to be servants or guests. It's hard to put into words the size of this forest. Despite being in the heart of the community, you could easily lose yourself in it. In part because it was a prime location for my childhood antics, my friends and I would play fight and hold adventures and use it as a playground. Nevertheless, we never went in there alone. It's true for most forests that, especially at night, they can often seem foreboding or scary to kids. But despite that, I felt like there was something really off about it, even during daylight hours. The few times we weren't playing and sat silent within it, the forest itself would be unnaturally quiet. It had that foreboding feeling, like a calm before the storm, where we'd get a tense anxiety about the location. As kids, it was something we'd brush off and move on from and try to forget. Forward many years, the family of a friend who lived in that house moved away. I worked as a page in a local library then. One task involved was cataloging the local newspaper collection we had available and making sure that it was in order. Sometimes curiosity would get the better of me, and I'd sit there reading some of the more fascinating stories that would make the town's top headlines. And then one in particular stood out. I wish I remembered the details, and it would have been nice to find again. Back in the late 60s, the teenager son of a wealthy contractor who owned that property went missing walking home from high school. Witnesses recall seeing him walking along the road and into the forest surrounding his home. One witness in particular remembered saying goodbye as she went into a different direction as he entered the forest. He never left the forest. His body was never found. The only evidence the police ever found was a bloody blanket in an old mining shack owned by a hunter who resided close to the property. Just saw a shadow person. It was a typical night just like any other, and the darkness of the room surrounded me in a warm blanket. I was lying on my bed scrolling through my phone when I felt a sudden chill run down my spine. I sat up feeling like someone was watching me and that's when I saw it. A small shadow person jumping down from my office table. At first I was confused and I thought maybe it was just a trick of the light, but as the shadow darted across the room and headed towards the door, my heart started racing. I tried to call out but the voice was stuck in my throat. The shadow person disappeared into the darkness and I was left feeling disoriented and scared. I tried to calm myself down, thinking that it was maybe my imagination playing tricks on me, but the unease stayed with me, and the more I thought about it, the more it had just happened, the more terrified I completely became. As I lay there in bed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every creak and rustle of the house made me jump, and my mind kept conjuring up terrifying images of what the shadow person might do next. I tried to tell myself that it was just a one-time thing and there was nothing to be afraid of. But deep down, I knew that something was wrong. The feeling of being watched never went away, and it seemed like the shadow person was always lurking, just out of sight. Days turned into weeks, and my fear only grew stronger. I tried to ignore it and push it to the back of my mind, but it was always there, like a shadow hanging over me. Every night I would lie in bed listening to the sounds of my house, waiting for the shadow person to make another appearance. And then one night it happened. I woke up to a cold breeze blowing through the room, and I knew that the shadow person was there. I could feel its presence all around me like a thick fog, and I couldn't escape. I tried to get up and run away, but my body wouldn't move. I was frozen with fear, and the shadow person seemed to be getting closer and closer. I could feel its breath on my neck, and I knew that this was it. I was going to die. But then, just as sudden as it had appeared, the shadow person was gone. I was alone in the darkness, my heart racing, my body shaking. I knew that I had encountered something truly terrifying, something that I would never forget. Did she send me a message? 14th of March is a difficult date for me. It's the day we lost my cousin. She was my best friend, my twin soul, and after 13 years of losing her, the pain's still fresh. 
She was killed when her drunk roommate crashed her motorbike with my cousin riding the pillion. My cousin never wanted to go out that night. Her roommate dragged her out and my cousin paid the ultimate price. I often wondered if she'd moved on or if she's not around us anymore. Because initially, after she died, I could feel her presence around me. I saw her in my dreams, smelled her perfume, and even heard her. Two months after she died, I went to her home for the first time and I couldn't sleep at night. We always slept together talking and singing late until night. I broke down and asked her for a sign, and then I heard her voice. It sounded like it came from the radio, but it was her. I always felt her presence, and for some reason, I felt like she was trying to comfort me, but I was freaking out, so she was maybe keeping her distance. It was heavy-handed, and we are Hindus, so we have many rituals involved in helping a departed soul cross over. After her rituals were done, I could no longer feel her. So I thought she was gone, but something happened today. After nearly 13 years, that has me questioning things. As always, her death anniversary sucks for me. I was getting ready to go to work, and I was trying to get outfits. I couldn't find a decent shirt. I was already mopey and suddenly thought, give me a sign she's still around. And suddenly I found an old blouse of hers that I still have. This blouse had been missing for over a year. I thought my mom had thrown it away. But finding it out of nowhere was weird considering that my mom had rearranged my wardrobe and it was under a few clothes that I wasn't sure were there before. I started crying when I found it and it was such a soothing feeling. My question is, did she really respond or was it simply coincidence? There was a banging on my closed bedroom door, and no one was there. I'm visiting my sister and sleeping in their only spare bedroom, because her two kids have the other rooms. These bedrooms are upstairs. My sister and her husband sleep in the only bedroom on the first floor. There's a sliding window in my bedroom, and it was closed during what happened to me. It was around 7 p.m. when the three- and two-year-old nephews were playing those push toys on the downstairs hardwood floor. I was upstairs in my bedroom playing my Nintendo Switch at the foot of the bed that's near the door to the upstairs hallway. Because of the kid's noise, I shut my door to limit it. Maybe 10 to 15 minutes later, I heard my two nine-year-old make a yelp, which made me realize my sister's putting him to bed. He's still at the age where he sleeps in a crib and my sister shuts her kid's door when they go to bed. The lights in the bedroom hallway three-year-old nephew's bedroom and my bedroom had their lights on. This is what happened. As I said before, I was playing my Switch, and then there was this constant banging on the door. I immediately thought that she was mad that the TV volume was too loud or something's wrong. I jumped from the bed and opened the door. No one was there. In a split second, I started panicking and ran for the stairs. The stairs are halfway across the living room downstairs where I saw my sister and her friends hanging around the three-year-old nephew as they watched a kid's show. I asked her, were you knocking on my door? And she replied with some worried look on her face and said, no, I didn't. What do I make out of all this? I can't think of an explanation for what happened. I never suspected my two-year-old nephew stuck in his crib escaping, opening the door and knocking and rushing back inside. The amount of time it took me to open the door was a few seconds, and I would have caught him rushing back to his room. There's no history of any terrible events happening at my sister's house. No one died there. There were no murders there. I know because my sister's house is the house I grew up in, and it was a new construction home. I'm baffled by what happened, but weirdly I got a thrill out of it. Step into the unknown with us, here at Paranormal M. We bring you stories that will make you question the very fabric of our reality. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications to stay up to date with our latest mind-bending tales. We hope you have a thought-provoking time listening. Creepy Doll Forest As I was visiting my mother, we got into a heated argument. 
I was only 15 years old at the time, and as any teenager would, I ran off in anger to a nearby forest. After wandering for a bit and calming down, I decided to explore the area, as I had rarely been there before. I took a few paths and eventually stumbled upon a clearing where I thought I saw someone. I cautiously approached, only to discover that this person was actually chained to a tree and wearing an orange construction worker vest. My heart sank as I realized that this was a real person who was in distress. I panicked and ran away, but as I was fleeing, I saw more people hanging from trees. It was a horrifying sight, and I knew that I had to tell someone about what I had just seen. I raced back to my mother's house and told her everything. At first, she was skeptical and thought that I was just imagining things. But after I pleaded with her and begged her to come with me to the forest, she finally relented. We made our way back to the clearing, and when we arrived, we were both stunned by what we saw. The people hanging from the trees were actually life-sized replicas, complete with clothes under their construction vests. It was a bizarre and unnerving sight, and we couldn't help but wonder who had put them there and why. We decided to investigate further and search the surrounding area for any clues, but we found nothing that could explain what we had seen. It was as if the replicas had simply appeared out of nowhere. To this day, I'm not sure what to make of that experience. Was it a prank or something more sinister? I may never know for sure, but it's a memory that stayed with me all these years. Weird noise, weird things happening. As I sit here in my living room, the weight of the unknown pressing down on me, I can't help but wonder what lurks in the shadows of my home. For years, I've moved from one house to another, hoping to escape the inexplicable phenomena that seem to follow me. But every time, the horrors only seem to intensify. In this latest home, I initially felt like I had found a sanctuary, perhaps. The atmosphere was calm and uneventful, and I'd hoped that perhaps, just maybe, the nightmare was finally over. However, it wasn't long before the strange happenings began to manifest themselves once again. At first, it was the occasional sound of footsteps that I would hear while I was at home alone. I tried to brush it off, telling maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, but the footsteps only grew louder and more persistent. Then came the orbs. Every time I reviewed the security footage, I would see these eerie balls of light dancing around the house, their movements seeming almost purposeful couldn't shake the feeling that they were watching me and studying me, but the worst was yet to come. One night I was woken by the sound of something cracking in the darkness. It was so loud that I thought it was a gunshot at first, but when I looked around I saw nothing out of the ordinary. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and I was paralyzed by a sudden and overwhelming sense of dread. Then in the corner of my eye I saw a dark shape moving. It was like a black spot a shadow that slithered through the room with an eerie grace. I tried to focus on it to get a better look, but every time I turned to face it, it was gone. That's when the smell hit me. It was a putrid stench that filled my nostrils like the smell of rotting eggs. It was so intense that I could taste it and I gagged on the fumes. I don't know how long it lasted, but it felt like an eternity before it finally dissipated. I don't know what to do. I don't know what any of this means. But what I do know is that I'm not alone in this house. Something is here with me. Something that I can't see or touch. But I can feel its presence, and it's getting stronger every day. I think I'm being stalked by a ghost or a paranormal entity specifically located in my room. Advice? I cannot begin to describe the fear and unease that has been plaguing me for what seems like an eternity. I can't even remember when it started. But one day I just had this gut-wrenching feeling that someone or something was lurking in the closet of my room. The feeling was so intense that I'd break out in a cold sweat and my heart would race uncontrollably. 
During those days, some nights were particularly hostile, and the presence that I couldn't see would be overwhelmingly terrifying. I tried to ignore it, but it was always there, watching, waiting, and menacingly silent. I started and closed the closet door before going to bed, hoping that it would somehow keep whatever it was in there from harming me. But the next morning, without fail, the closet door would be wide open again. This went on for over a year, and every night I would be trapped in a cycle of fear, anxiety, and helplessness. Finally, one day, the door remained closed, and the terror from the closet vanished. But the problem only shifted, and now I feel like I'm not alone in my main room. I can feel it, an ominous presence that I can't see, but I know it's there always watching and waiting for me. To make matters worse, I started experiencing sleep paralysis, something that never happened to me before. The fear is so intense that I'm terrified to sleep. Every time I switch off the lights or get too uncomfortable, I feel like something's watching me, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. I've tried to reach out to people for help, but to my disappointment, they accuse me of being insane or schizophrenic without even bothering to know me or understand what I'm going through. It's frustrating and disheartening, but I refuse to give up. Please, if you have any ideas what this entity is or how I can get rid of it, I'd appreciate any help that you can offer. I'm at my wit's end and I don't know how much longer I can take this torment. I have to shower, but I'm dreading it. The dread that fills his chest was suffocating as he stood in front of the bathroom, his hand shaking as he reached for the knob, the memory of what happened a few days ago still fresh in his mind, and he couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching him from behind the door. He took a deep breath and slowly turned the knob, cautiously pushing the door open. The room was dimly lit, the air thick with the smell of mold and mildew. His eyes scanned the room, searching for any sign of movement, any indication that he wasn't alone. The shower curtain was drawn, and he couldn't hear the faint sound of water running. He took a step forward, and the floor creaked under his weight. The sound echoed through the empty house, and he froze, waiting for a response. Silence. He cautiously walked toward the shower, his heart racing in his chest. He pulled the curtain back, and what he saw made his blood run cold. There... Standing in the shower was a figure. It was tall, impossibly thin, and its skin was pale and translucent. Its eyes were empty sockets, and it had a gaping hole where its nose should be. It turned its head towards him, and a low, guttural growl escaped from its lips. He stumbled backwards, slipping on the wet tiles, and fell hard on his back. The creature stepped out of the shower with its long arms reaching out toward him, He scrambled onto his feet and bolted out of the room, his heart pounding in his ears. As he ran down the hallway, he could hear the creature's footsteps behind him, its ragged breathing hot in his neck. He burst through the front door, his lungs burning from the exertion, and collapsed on the front lawn. He lay there, gasping for air as the creature stood at the threshold of the house, its eyes fixated on him. It raised its arms, and swarms of insects started pouring out of the holes of his body and crawled towards him closed his eyes and prayed for it to end, for the nightmare to be over, but when he opened them again, he was back in the bathroom. The creature was in front of him. He screamed and the creature lunges toward him, his fingers wrapped around his throat, and then everything went black. Something that happened when I was twelve. When I was 12 years old, my family and I moved into my grandpa's place after he passed away. It was a big change for us because before that, we had been living in a trailer, and I had to share my room with my brother, but now I finally got my own room and I was pretty excited about it. At first everything seemed calm and happy, but that all changed when I started seeing things. I can remember the first time I saw something. I was in my room, and everyone else was outside grilling and cooking. Suddenly, I saw the legs of a ghost walk into my mom and dad's bathroom. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, but I knew I had seen something. The next experience 
was even more terrifying. It was a slender man type experience. One night, a few days after my first encounter, I was lying in bed trying to sleep. It was pretty calm and chill until a figure started flashing in and out of my existence in front of me. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but it kept happening. It was getting more and more intense. It wasn't sleep paralysis because I got up multiple times out of fear. I was fully aware of my surroundings and just knew that I was awake. I tried turning on the TV to distract myself, but that didn't help figure was still there, flashing in and out of existence. It got so bad throughout the night that I couldn't sleep at all. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I had never experienced anything like this before, and I didn't know who to talk to about it. I was too scared to tell my parents because I didn't want them to think I was crazy. But the experiences didn't stop. As time went on, I started to see more and more strange things in the house. I saw shadows moving on their own and heard strange noises coming from empty rooms. It was like the house was alive with some kind of energy. I couldn't explain it. Looking back, I don't know what to make of those experiences. Maybe it was just my imagination running wild. Or maybe there was something more going on in that house. All I know is that those experiences have stayed with me all these years, and I still get chills thinking about them. put dishes away clean and they keep coming out dirty again. I've been living in an apartment for a few months now and I always put away clean dry dishes. A few times I've noticed a few small brown stains on the dishes after I take them out, like someone had spilled some coffee and let it dry. I didn't think much of it at first, maybe missed a spot, until one day the whole stack of plates had the same small dry brown spot on them. I washed every single one, wiped the cabinet, put them all away. I forgot about this until tonight, when I took out the gravy boat I had just used, washed, and put away a couple of weeks ago. It was completely dirty in the same way, but couldn't be explained away by anything. There's no evidence of any leaks coming from above the cabinet, and this has happened in the bottom shelf. I've tried googling and saw nothing, but I thought I heard something paranormal that had to do with dishes getting magically dirty in the cupboards. Any input is appreciated. Don't roast me for not doing this before. This is just short-term rental and we're moving out soon. We had a roof leak in the kitchen one time when there was a really heavy rain, but the drips were nowhere near the cabinet. There are angled, exposed beams that angle down toward the cupboard, which I never thought about until now. My boyfriend got up to the counter to look in the gap above the cabinet. and We were so grossed out. I guess the leaks happened more often, but didn't dip in a way that we noticed. The water likely ran down the angled beams, down the wall, and onto the top of the old cabinet. I guess through the seams, the water trickled down and got onto the dishes. However, not before soaking through a nasty oven mitt sometimes wedged and got the gap maybe to soak up the leaks. This honestly barely surprised me because this place is incredibly run down. Light comes through from outside through the cracks in the walls, and you can get splinters from the DIY hardwood floors. We just had no other options until next week. I knew it could have been maybe pest-based on the way the stains looked. I'm quite underwhelmed with the outcome of this mystery, but it also disgusted and somewhat looking forward to moving out. Creepy things that happened in my old house. Growing up, my family lived in a big Victorian house that was the epitome of horror. The walls were stained with age, and there were strange noises and inexplicable occurrences that never ceased. The wind would whistle eerily through the halls, making it sound like someone was whispering secrets. There were times when I would wind up awake in the middle of the night to see a ghostly apparition of some little girl standing at the end of my bed, her eyes hollow and her hair in disarray. It felt like she was watching me and waiting for something. I would often hear footsteps in the hallway when no one else was home. They would start off as faint tapping sounds, slowly growing louder until it sounded like someone was running towards me. And then, just as suddenly as they had started, they would stop, leaving me alone in the darkness, heart racing. But that was just the beginning. One day I returned home from school, 
to find that all the pictures on the walls had fallen down for no reason. The frames were smashed and the glass lay shattered on the floor. My parents dismissed it as a freak accident, but I knew better. I knew that something sinister was lurking in the shadows of that house. And then there was the time that I was home alone and I heard a sound of laughter coming from the basement. It was the sound of a little girl's laughter, and it echoed through the empty house. I tried to ignore it, telling myself that it was just my imagination, but then I heard footsteps coming from the stairs. I froze, unable to move, and then the laughter turned into a blood-curdling scream. Years later, after we moved out, I did some research and found out that there had been several deaths in the house over the years, including a little girl who had died in her sleep. Her name was Emily, and her spirit still haunted the house. I'm convinced that she was the one responsible for all the strange occurrences that had plagued my childhood. To this day, I can't shake the feeling that Emily's ghost is still out there, waiting for someone to join her in the afterlife. If you ever find yourself in an old house with a dark history, be warned. You never know what kind of horror might be waiting for you in the shadows. The Return of Max I never believed in the supernatural. Ghosts, spirits, and the paranormal were nothing more than fictional stories in my mind. That was until Max returned to me. Max was my dog, a golden retriever. He was my best friend for years. We had a bond that no one could understand. We would always go around the house and he'd be wagging his tail and barking joyfully. He was my constant companion and confidant. One day Max died. He had been sick for a long time, and it was a relief to see him finally at peace. I mourned his death for weeks, missing his constant presence in my life. But then one night, Max returned to me. I was lying in bed trying to fall asleep when I heard a noise at the door. It was a Max bark. I could recognize it anywhere. I thought it was just my imagination, but the barking continued. I got up, opened the door, and there he was, wagging his tail and barking with joy. I was stunned. Max had died weeks ago, so how was he standing in front of me now? It was like he had never left. He followed me around the house just like always. And I knew it wasn't a dream. Max was really there. Over the next few days, Max continued to visit me. He would bark at the door, and I would visit and let him in. And we would just spend hours playing and cuddling. It was like he had never died. I tried to explain it away as a hallucination or a dream, but it was too real. And one night, Max led me outside. He took me to a spot in the yard and started digging. I watched in amazement as he dug up a bone, his favorite toy. It was buried there years ago when we were playing in the yard together. It was like he wanted to show me that he was really there, that it wasn't a figment of my imagination. But then, just suddenly as he appeared, Max was gone. I never saw him again. I searched for him, calling out his name, but he never came back. It was like he had fulfilled his purpose to show me that he was still with me in spirit. I still don't know how to explain it. Was it a dream, a hallucination, or was Max really there with me? All I know is that it gave me comfort to think that it's still watching over me, even in death. When I was in college, I worked at a little gas station in the middle of nowhere in Alabama and it was open pretty late. It was a great job because after 10, we really had no one that came in, so I could turn on music and just work on my homework. One night a little after midnight, I was getting ready to count down the register and pack up my things. I went to the office and back, I proceeded to start counting money when I noticed a heavy-set guy standing at the counter, looking at the wall of cigarettes behind it. I figured I must have forgotten to lock the door, so I walk out to apologize, only to find that no one's there. I figured maybe the camera wasn't working, so I shrugged it off, and I walked around the store. I also checked the door, and it wasn't locked, so I locked it. I went back to the office. Nothing on the camera screen, so I go back to counting down. A few minutes later, I look up at the screen again, and the dude is still there. And now he's standing with his back to the camera, pressed up against the beer fridge. I walk back out, now firmly shitting bricks, as I was a tiny woman and far away from literally everything and everyone. No one was there. I was terrified. I grabbed a can of wasp spray and searched literally every inch of the store while trying to call my boyfriend at the time to drive out there. 
He was sadly too drunk to do so and said, you're probably fine, before hanging up. I summoned the remaining courage that I had and went back to the office. Locking that door behind me as I did before, I hurried through, counting everything again. Looking back up at the screen one more time, I saw the same dude standing there and looking at the office door where I was. He was perfectly still and not moving, but just standing there. I quickly finished counting the money down, threw it in the safe, and pretty much ran out of the store, not shutting off the lights behind me. The next morning, probably about 4 a.m., I was called by my boss asking me to open the store because he had felt a family emergency. The extra money was also nice, so I agreed, but asked if I could bring my friend with me, since it had only been about an hour or two and I told him what had happened the night before. Oh, you saw him, huh? Yeah, go ahead. He scares me too. I saw someone in the reflection of my laptop. As a private banker, I found myself enjoying my job and the sense of fulfillment that comes with helping clients navigate their financial lives. Typically, my workday ends promptly at 5 p.m., giving me ample time to unwind and enjoy the rest of my day. However, on this particular day, I found myself falling behind on some important tasks due to my recent vacation and made the decision to stay late and catch up on my work. As I sat at my desk surrounded by three computers that make up my workspace, I focused intently on the task at hand, determined to finish before the night was through. It was at this point that things took a strange turn. While attempting to send an email to my boss to let him know that I'd be working late, I heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps behind me. Assuming it was one of my coworkers coming to check on me, I politely asked them to wait a moment as I finished typing my message. However, what happened next left me feeling completely unnerved. As I looked up, the reflection of my laptop screen, I saw a figure walk past that was so tall and dark, it was almost impossible to believe. Standing at an imposing seven feet tall, this mysterious figure was like nothing I'd ever seen. Without thinking, I spun around in my chair expecting to see a colleague or some other explanation for the strange occurrence. But to my surprise, there was no one there. I quickly scanned the area, peering out of my office in both directions, but saw no sign of the figure that had just walked past me. Despite my best efforts to ignore the eerie experience and focus on my work, I found myself unable to shake the feeling of unease that settled over me. Fueled by a growing sense of dread, I worked as quickly as I could to finish my tasks eager to get out of the office and away from whatever strange presence had made itself known. In the end, I managed to complete my work and make my way home without further incident. However, the memory of that ominous figure remains with me, and I know that I'll never be able to be comfortable working late in the office ever again. was told to post this here, so here's my experience. I have a story to tell that happened to me and my cousin back in 2020. It all started after my grandfather passed away, leaving his house completely empty. He passed away inside the house, but he left behind his loyal dog, which would often run away from its new owner to return to my grandparents' house. The house was just down the road from ours. It wasn't much of a problem. We occasionally let the dog in the house so we could feel at home. And one day, my cousin and I decided to stay the night at my grandfather's house. We hung out and played some card games for a while until we heard three knocks on the outside of the front door. At first, we thought someone was at the door, so we answered it, but no one was there. We looked outside, but there were no cars in the driveway either. The dog came from the other room barking, so we knew it wasn't just us. It was strange didn't think much of it and we went back to our games. The next day, I told my brother about what had happened, and he informed me that my grandfather always knocked three times. He even demonstrated the knocks, and it sounded just like the ones we heard the night before. I was taken back, realizing that it might have been my grandfather's ghost knocking on the door. I couldn't explain it, but I had a feeling that it was him trying to communicate with us. Maybe to mess with us or scare us, 
maybe just to let us know that he was just still around. My grandparents were heavy smokers, and occasionally I would smell cigarette smoke in the house, even though no one had smoked there. I take that as a sign that my grandparents are near me, watching over me and letting me know that they're still around. Overall, the experience was spooky yet comforting. It made me realize that there might be something beyond our physical world, something that we can't always explain or see. While it may be scary to think about, it's also fascinating and awe-inspiring to consider the possibility that our loved ones might still be with us, even after they've passed away. I saw my friend after he died. When I was 12, I had a friend. His name was Jay. He was 14. He was my cousin's good friend. I was just starting to become good friends when this started. He was an eccentric person. He was very into medieval times and it would talk like them too. Because of that, he didn't have many friends. I didn't mind, I found him funny. He was also huge into botany. He would often go into the woods to study plants, finding edible ones and non-edible ones. I went with him a few times, and every single time, he would have his dog. It was a Jack Russell Terrier. He also always wore a specific orange hoodie with his last name on it. Just a bit of info on him. I remember the night before, I could have sworn I heard ambulances rushing nearby. The day of, I was supposed to go to my cousin's house... I was about a 25 minute walk or 10 minute bike ride. There is a clearing with a very small entry to the woods Jay liked using as a way to enter. When I'm about 50 yards away, I see him in his orange sweater and his dog walking to the entry. I yelled his name, but he never looked up. I eventually got to the opening and saw him and yelled his name again. He never turned and kept walking. Not even his dog, and that dog loved me. I was going to follow him but felt lazy so I just went straight to my cousin's house. When I got there, he wasn't home and his stepdad opens the door. He tells my cousin he isn't home and breaks the news that Jay was in an accident. Apparently he was coming back home from being in the woods later than usual and was hit by a drunk driver on his way home. He didn't die immediately but died a few hours later from his injuries. His dog died immediately. I called my cousin and he confirmed it. I was shocked and never told anyone what I saw. I always kept that doubt with me. He lived with his grandmother and I'll never forget her at the funeral. I miss that kid. He never bothered anyone and everyone left him alone when he did his botany stuff. Probably hallucinations or something. As a young child, I had a recurring experience with a shadowy figure that haunted my dreams. It was always the same size as me and made a terrifying moaning and screaming noise that sounded like a broken radio mixed with an angry cat, a zombie's uh, and a low tone of an angry goat. The scream would startle me awake, and when I pulled my head out from under my blanket, I would see the shadow figure looming over me. It was dark as night two gaping holes for eyes, and a large, deep, and seemingly endless mouth. The creature had a spike on top of its head that added to its menacing appearance. Every time this happened, I would scream until my father would come and pick me up and take me to sleep in his and my mom's bed. Even then, the shadow creature would follow us. My father would tell me to be brave and to not turn on the light. So we would lay in the dark, listening to the creature scream until I finally fell asleep. I didn't see the shadow creature again until I was 16 years old. When I told my father about it, he confirmed that he had seen it too. I was skeptical, so I asked him to draw a picture of the creature in another room while I drew it in mine. When we compared our drawings, they were eerily similar, except for a few minor details. This realization scared me, but my father had no more information than I did. I later learned about the concept of shadow people, but this creature was different from what I had read about. It was my size when I was about five years old, and it would continue to visit me during moments of shock and anxiety attacks as I grew older. Recently I came across an image that looked similar to the creature, but 
I couldn't find any information on when I searched it online. It's been several years since I last encountered the shadow creature, but I still have questions. Unfortunately, my father passed away seven years ago, and I'm the only one who's ever seen it. If anyone else has experienced something similar, I'd love to hear about it and finally find some answers. Brief experience that went away as a neighbor got better. I used to live in a cozy little apartment complex with three units. My place was situated on the second floor, with a neighbor on the other side and one below. I'd never experienced anything out of the ordinary in this place. That was, until my next door neighbor started having a really bad mental episode. It was no secret that she struggled with depression and possibly BPD, but things started to escalate quickly. Eventually, the police had to kick her door down for a wellness check, and that was just the beginning of my own strange encounters. It was a regular evening, and I was making dinner with some friends. <clears throat> we were all sitting on the couch when I decided to lay my ear down against a cushion. Suddenly, I heard what sounded like breathing coming from the cushion itself. I quickly got up to investigate, and that's when my friend told me that she had felt like something was watching her all night. The experience was unnerving, to say the least. As time passed, the situation with my neighbor got worse, and I started feeling more and more creeped out. One evening, while I was heading to my bedroom, I decided to speak out loud to whatever was there. I said, If there's anything here, you can make yourself known, but please don't break anything. Later that same night, while I was in bed, I heard a giant thud against my wall. My heart was racing and I quickly shot up to investigate. It wasn't my roommate and there was nothing that I could see. The experience left me shaken and I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. The strange events persisted for a while, but they finally ceased when my neighbor was involuntarily committed for a while. She came back seeming normal and happy and I haven't had any further issues since then. Looking back on it all, I think her negative and vulnerable mental state somehow invited bad energy or something. It's hard to say for sure. I don't know if anyone else has had similar brief hauntings, I guess we'll call them. But I wanted to share this and let others know that they are not alone. My two-year-old niece sees my uncle, who died from an overdose in 2012, I've always been fascinated by the paranormal, and it's all thanks to my mother's own experiences with it. Ever since I was young, she would tell me stories of things that couldn't be explained, and I was always eager to hear more. One story in particular stayed with me all these years, and it involves my Uncle Jim, who died of a heroin overdose when he was just 25 or 26 years old. When I was about 12 years old, my two-year-old niece saw a photo of my uncle holding my older sister when she was born. To everyone's surprise, my niece looked at the photo and said, Jim, I wasn't there when this happened, but my mother explained it to me. It was a chilling moment, and it only became more intense when my mother asked my niece where Jim was. My niece pointed at the closet. As my mother recounted the story to me over FaceTime, I felt my whole body tingle with excitement and anticipation. It was like something was stirring within me, something that I couldn't quite explain. And then when my mother asked my niece to say Jim again, she did, and this time even more clearly than before. It was as if my uncle was reaching out to us from beyond the grave. It was a powerful and emotional experience. After I hung up with my mother, the tingling sensation persisted, and I found myself weeping uncontrollably. I pleaded to see my uncle Jim. I was just a child when he passed away. I never really had the chance to know him, but now, with this strange and mysterious experience, I felt like I was somehow connected to him in a way I couldn't explain. I've always been curious about the paranormal, and this experience has only intensified my fascination. I can't help but wonder if anyone else out there has had a similar experience, whether it's with a loved one who's passed away or something else entirely. It's a strange and mysterious world we live in, and I feel like it's only just scratching the surface of what's out there. But I'm excited to explore it further and see where this journey takes me.
I need help as soon as possible. I keep hearing knocks. I am really scared right now and I don't know what to do. I've been hearing knocks on my door for a while, but no one's ever there. Even my friends have heard it, and I'm not looking for skeptics. I know what I'm experiencing, and I know that it's real. I need help to get rid of this ghost that keeps knocking on my door. It's been happening more frequently lately, and this morning it was worse. The knocking was so consistent and loud that it woke me up from my sleep. I opened my eyes, and I did one fast, loud knock before stopping. I've shouted to make it go away, but it never listens. I've even tried to catch it on video, but it always goes quieter when I record, or starts knocking after I stop recording. I'm really desperate for some advice on what to do. This ghost is really starting to scare me. I've heard more than just knocks, too. One time I heard a robot voice, and another time I heard a baby crying. One of my friends even heard me and some other friends' voices when she was using my shower. But we hadn't even returned from the shops yet, so we weren't there. And to top it off, the hall lights cut out the day after I heard the robot voice. I was too afraid to check the door when I heard the knocks. So it could have been someone outside messing with me, but I didn't want to find out. The only time I managed to catch something on video was when I heard the robot voice. But even then, I was too scared to check the door. I just had another update that's making me even more scared. After making this post, I got a notification saying that my friend replayed a video. I never sent him a video, so I called him to ask about it. He said that it was a video of the knocking, and he could hear it loud and clear. But the weirdest part was that he said he could also hear my voice. And it said, it's been knocking all day, even though I'd just woken up and never said anything to him. I really need help getting rid of this ghost. It's making my life a living nightmare. It was supposed to be a normal day, just like any other. But sometimes the most ordinary days can turn to the most terrifying experiences of your life. This is exactly what happened to me. I was visiting my girlfriend at her family's house, a century-old building with a rich history of death and tragedy. Despite experiencing a few strange occurrences in the past, nothing could have prepared me for what was about to happen. We were sitting in the living room talking to a grandmother about family history and ancestry when we heard an unexplained sound. First, we didn't think much of it, but it persisted, getting louder and more unsettling with each passing moment. My girlfriend asked me to investigate, so I headed into the kitchen, thinking it was just a mundane household sound. However, when I got there, it was anything but mundane. There on the counter was a fortune cookie from a Chinese takeout we had earlier, and then out of nowhere it moved. It wasn't just a slight shift or a simple vibration, it moved a whole inch, and the worst part? There was no explanation for it. There was no draft or wind, no logical explanation whatsoever. It was as if something unseen was playing a cruel game with us. My heart raced as I stumbled back into the living room trying to make sense of what I had just witnessed. Was it a ghost? A demon? Some other malevolent force? I had no answers, only a growing sense of fear and dread. In that moment, I realized that I had been foolish to doubt the existence of the supernatural. My skepticism was shattered and I was left with an overwhelming sense of vulnerability. I began to recite the Hail Mary prayer, seeking some sort of comfort and protection, but the fear remained. As the night wore on, the atmosphere in the house grew more and more ominous. Every creak and groan of the building seemed to be amplified, every shadow taking on a sinister quality. It was as if the house itself was alive, and it was not happy with our presence. To this day, I still don't know what caused that fortune cookie to move. But I do know that I'll never forget the terror I felt in that moment, or the sense of unease that lingered long after. Some things are better left unexplained, and some houses are better left unexplored. Welcome to Paranormal M, where we bring you stories that will leave you with more questions than answers. We hope you enjoy the ride. Story 1. Babysitting Ghost I remember when I was about 15 or 16 years old, I was asked to babysit some kids for the night. 
The kids were a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six or seven-year-old. It was a pretty easy job, and after putting them to bed, I went downstairs to do the dishes. As I was washing the dishes, I heard a sound like a bowling ball being rolled across the upstairs hallway. I assumed that the kids were playing around instead of sleeping, so I yelled up the stairs for them to go to bed. A few minutes later, the sound happened again, and this time I decided to check on the kids and make sure that they were actually sleeping. When I got upstairs, I was surprised to find all the kids were fast asleep in their beds. I was confused because I couldn't figure out where the sound was coming from if the kids were sleeping. It happened about two more times, and each time I yelled. And they were in their beds fast asleep when I went up to check. By this point, I was pretty creeped out. I went back to doing the dishes, and then I heard footsteps behind me, like someone was running across the kitchen. I turned around, and yet again, no one there. The running continued to the basement, and then I walked toward it. I even went down a few steps, but then I got a feeling and told myself, this is how people die in movies, and I quickly decided to leave the basement. When the mom of the kids got home, I told her what I had experienced. The lady told me that she had a similar experience with the ghost, and she believed it was a little boy. She explained that she was sitting on her bed talking on the phone while she heard running and felt something hit the end of her bed. When she got up to look, there was nothing there. The story still creeps me out to this day. I can just imagine how scared I must have been when it happened. It's strange to think that there might actually have been a ghost in that house. Especially one that seemed to be playing with us. But I'm just glad that it didn't stick around in my basement for too long. My paranormal experience in sixth grade, living in an old home. It was the house that no one wanted to live in, but my family couldn't resist the charm of this mid-1800s Victorian home. Little did we know we were moving into a haunted house, a place where terror and fear lurked around every corner. I was only in sixth grade when the first incident happened, a door slamming shut when there was no logical explanation for it. The pet was outside and there was no wind. The house had an eerie feeling and my mother and I would often hear noises that couldn't be explained. As time went on, things got worse. When home alone, I heard whispers calling out my name. Objects would vanish from one room, only to appear in another. It was as if the ghostly presence was playing a game, tormenting me and my family. My mother would wake up to scratches on her back, but there was no way she could have caused them herself in her sleep. The paranormal activity was terrifying but it was nothing compared to what I saw. I'll never forget that moment in the kitchen where I saw a white, foggy figure of a little girl with two pigtail braids and ribbons at the end of each. She was wearing a frilly dress and was standing in the doorway. I blinked and she was gone. The image was burned into my memory forever. Curiosity got the better of me and I decided to use the Ouija board with my friends. The board revealed a seven-year-old girl that had drowned in our clawfoot bathtub very likely the original fixture in the house. The little girl I had seen was probably the same girl who had died in her home. The thoughts sent chills down my spine. I wanted to investigate further, but the truth was too frightening. It was possible that there had been a young girl's death in the area, but the authorities might have kept the details hidden. I didn't want to delve into the darkness of the past any further. The ghostly presence in her home continued to haunt us, and we couldn't bear it any longer. Eventually, we moved out, leaving the house to its haunted past. Even now, years later, I'm still haunted by the memories of that house and the little girl that died there. My Experiences at the Hawthorne Hotel I have to say, I'm generally pretty skeptical when it comes to paranormal experiences. However, there are a couple of incidents that happened to me and my then-girlfriend, now wife, during our two-night stay at the Hawthorne Hotel in Salem. I was just wondering if anyone else had experienced anything similar. The first thing that kept happening was the water in the bathroom would turn itself on sporadically. We'd be lying in bed or just coming up from the bar downstairs, and the shower or sink would turn on full blast. It was strange because the knobs on everything have to be physically turned to shut it off, so we were left scratching our heads. 
I ended up freaking out my wife so much that when it happened throughout the night, she'd wake me up and go turn it off. The other strange thing that happened to us during the second night, as we were trying to get back to our room, we took the elevator. We definitely pushed our correct floor number, but for some reason, the elevator went down instead of up and took us to what I believed was maybe the basement. The doors opened to a dimly lit and fairly dirty looking floor with a short hallway and a single door with a circular window on it. Not a single light was turned on in the hallway either. We were both freaked out at this point, but curiosity got the better of us. We decided to leave and look through the window. What we saw inside was a really old looking furniture and chairs covered in dust and grime. My wife jumped and said she saw a shadow move. It was enough to make us both feel uneasy and run back to the elevator to spam our floor number again. Thankfully, this time, it brought us to the correct floor. Now, I don't typically believe in many paranormal things, but I really can't explain what we experienced in that hotel. The fact that the water would turn itself on and the elevator took us to a seemingly deserted and creepy basement still gives me chills when I think about it. Has anyone else had similar experiences at the Hawthorne Hotel or elsewhere in Salem? Evil Encounter at the Edinburgh Vaults In 2009, my family and I traveled to Edinburgh for our summer holiday. We decided to go to a ghost tour of the Edinburgh Vaults one evening. It was my two older brothers, my mother, my father, a retired policeman, and I, who was a seven-year-old boy at the time. My dad was the biggest skeptic you could ever meet, and he laughed off anything to do with ghosts or the paranormal. The Edinburgh vaults were a maze of old vaults built in the late 1700s located underground. They were created as a solution to the overpopulated city at the time. The poor were made to live there in these vaults as they had no other options. Many people fell ill here and died due to the damp, wet conditions. During the first half of the tour, we took pictures and looked for orbs, and nothing too out of the ordinary happened. Then we all gathered in a room named Mr. Boots' room, which is said to be haunted by a dark, malevolent spirit, and that's when things got weird. My dad distinctly remembers smelling one of the foulest smells he's ever encountered in his life. He said it came to him in just one inhale and then disappeared. He even remembers his nose burning from this ghastly smell that only lingered for a few moments. Not one other person in the room encountered this smell other than my dad, and it was a small vault with low ceilings. After the tour, we returned to our hotel room to get ready for bed. My dad remembers feeling a burning sensation on his back, and my mother noticed that his back was covered in three distinct scratches, like a claw mark of three fingers. The scratch was about eight inches long. We were all pretty alarmed as to what could have done this. By morning, the scratch had disappeared. We couldn't explain what had happened, and my dad began to wonder if it was a demonic encounter. The experience shook us all up, and we never forgot that trip to Edinburgh and the haunted vaults. Here's a couple of ghost encounters from my friend's cottage. Three years ago, me and three of my friends went to stay at my friend's cottage, and one of our friend's parents joined us too. It was a nice place, and we were excited to spend some time together. One day, two of my friends and their parents were outside at the beach, while I was inside with my friend Jay. We were upstairs playing video games, when suddenly, we felt like someone was watching us. At first, we didn't think much of it, but the feeling didn't go away even after 10 minutes. Then we heard a big bang downstairs and we were a bit scared, but decided to ignore it. Later on, when our friends came inside, they went upstairs and saw a big fork in the floor. We were all confused and couldn't understand how it got there. We told them everything that had happened and we were all a bit spooked by it. Later that night, I saw a man in the hallway to the room where we were sleeping and I almost shit myself. It was a terrifying experience that I'll never forget. One of my friends told me that someone who had lived in the house before had died on the stairs, which made the experience even scarier. After we left the cottage, the family who owned it 
sold because they couldn't afford to keep it. They took a few things from the house and brought them back to their own home, but they soon realized that their house was also haunted. Sometimes I can hear footsteps and knocking, and it always sends chills down my spine. Unfortunately, the man standing in the hallway wasn't the only strange occurrence that happened during our stay. I saw him multiple times, always looking at us with an eerie expression. I was so scared that I had to run most of the time, and whoever I had to go was the second floor kitchen or hallway. Overall, it was a frightening experience that I hope I'll never have again. Even though it was scary, it also left me fascinated by the supernatural and the unknown. I'm still curious about what exactly happened in that house and what made it so haunted. My cat visited me tonight. As the night grew darker, I brought my cat into my room and placed him gently on the ground. As I turned around to leave, something caught my attention. The sounds of his paws scraping against the surface of my dresser drawers. The same way my old cat used to do it when he was still with us. My heart skipped a beat as I watched him, puzzled and confused. Suddenly he became agitated and started to claw at my bed, his eyes fixated on something invisible to my human eyes. I searched the room frantically trying to find the source of his terror, but there was nothing there. It was just like he was chasing a phantom. Suddenly my cat stopped moving and his eyes met mine. It was then that I felt a cold and eerie presence on my hand, as if a ghostly entity was gently rubbing its cheek against my fingers. I could hardly believe it, but it was like the spirit of my deceased cat was still with me. My cat continued to stare into the void, and I realized that he was seeing something that I couldn't. It was like he was watching the ghostly apparition of my old cat running around my room, taunting him with its presence. My heart was pounding in my chest as I watched the scene unfold before me. As I looked down at my cat, I could see that he wasn't just staring blankly, he was actually communicating with the ghostly presence. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, but it was like they were having a conversation in a language that only they could understand. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as I realized that there was something truly supernatural happening in my room. I couldn't explain it, but it was like my old cat's spirit was still with me, watching over me and my feline companion. As the night drew on, I could feel the presence of the ghostly cat getting stronger and stronger, till it was almost overwhelming. I knew that I had to do something to try and make it go away, but I didn't know how. Eventually, my cat calmed down, and the ghostly presence faded away into nothingness. But the memory of that terrifying night stayed with me for a long time, haunting me with its supernatural power and its intensity. Energies in Chicago As I entered the lobby of the hotel, a chill ran down my spine. The eerie silence seemed to suffocate me, and the flickering lights added to the already unsettling atmosphere. Despite the uncomfortable feeling, I forced myself to check in and head up to my room. Upon entering, the room spun before my eyes, and I struggled to keep my balance. I dismissed it as jet lag, and I tried to settle in, but the feeling persisted. It was as if the air was thick with an inexplicable energy making it difficult to breathe. That night, I was jolted awake by a piercing scream that seemed to echo through the halls. I bolted upright, heart racing, but there was no one around. The room was empty, and the hallway was eerily quiet. I tried to shake it off and went back to sleep, but the nightmare that plagued me were beyond terrifying. The following day, I visited the Contemporary Art Museum, hoping to distract myself from the strange occurrences. As I walked through the exhibits, the same disorienting feeling returned, making me feel as though I were in a different dimension. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone or something was following me, watching my every move. Returning to the hotel room that night, the feeling of unease was stronger than ever. The air was so thick with energy that it was almost suffocating. That's when I noticed the scratches on the walls, the strange symbols etched into the woodwork, and the unmistakable stench of death. As I lay in bed trying to block out the horror that surrounded me, I began to chant the Maha Mantra. But instead of bringing peace, it only seemed to anger the unseen presence lurking in the room. The chanting turned into screaming and the walls seemed to close in on me, threatening to swallow me whole. 
I don't remember how I managed to escape the hotel, but I do know that I'll never forget the horror that I experienced in Chicago. I still hear the screams of my dreams and I feel the presence of evil lurking around every corner. Some places are better left unexplored, and that hotel in Chicago was definitely one of them. I want a campfire tale. I have one for you and your friends. As a child, my parents always took me camping. We'd pack up the car and head out to the local campsites in Oklahoma and Missouri. Those were some of my fondest memories. Late nights spent huddled around the campfire with my parents and their friends, telling stories and roasting marshmallows. But as I got older, I began to hear tales that would make my blood run cold. One night when I was around 12 years old, my dad and his friends told me about a blind man who would wander the campsites at night. They said he couldn't see anything, but if he saw a flame, he would make his way towards it. The story goes that if you're sitting around a campfire at night, you may look back to see someone in the distance making their way towards your campsite. At first, I thought it was just a silly ghost story, something to scare the kids, but as the night wore on, the fire burned low began to feel a sense of unease creeping up on me. It was as if someone was watching us, lurking just behind the circle of light cast by the fire. And then I heard it, a soft shuffling sound like footsteps in the dirt. I turned to look, but there was no one there. I tried to brush it off as just my imagination, but then I saw something out of the corner of my eye, a figure, a barely visible, but in the darkness making its way towards us. I froze my heart pounding in my chest as the figure drew closer and closer, and then I saw it, or rather the lack of it. This person had no eyes, just empty sockets staring back at me. I tried to scream, but my voice caught in my throat as a figure reached out to touch me. I don't remember much after that. My parents said that I must have just had a nightmare. But I know what I saw, and now whatever I'm camping and sitting around the campfire, I can't help but feel like something's watching me. Something just beyond the light of the flames, waiting to reach out and grab me. So be warned, my friend. The next time you're sitting around the fire, keep an eye out. What you hear may not be just the wind. Do you ever use tech to communicate with spirits? Since my family and I moved into our new home, we've been experiencing paranormal activities quite frequently. We would often hear and see a cat roaming around the house, and the activity intensified when we started renovating a few months after moving in. The electronics started going crazy, kitchen appliances were being messed with, lights were switched on and off, and physical objects were being moved around the house. Even our electrician was freaked out about the things that were happening from the first day we came to work on the house. I presume his drilling holes through the wall may have infuriated the spirits haunting our home. The activity has quieted down since the renovation work stopped. My family and I became intrigued by the technology created to communicate with spirits. I prefer the ones that use word banks or sound banks rather than white noise because it's easier for me to understand. I have an app on my phone that I use to communicate with the spirits. And some of the responses we get are genuinely astounding and contextual. We have no doubt that the spirits are telling us things about our house and things that have happened here. It's like a commentary. Although I have been cautious about using the app too frequently at home, I have been surprised at the words coming through when it's turned on. The app has been able to describe the context of our situation and even tell us about our problems in the house. I genuinely think using this app has made me feel much more connected and calm with the spirits that share our home. They've even told me when something has upset them, I've been able to explain why we need to do certain work and ask them not to sabotage it again. I know some people may think this technology is nonsense, but when you're living in a house that's very haunted and people won't visit because they're so freaked out, the perspective is different. I would love to hear about anybody's experiences that have been eye-opening like mine and if you've been able to communicate with spirits in your home.
Why I stopped doing EVPs. Throughout my life, I've had many strange and unexplainable experiences, and it's hard to know where to begin. From full body shadow apparitions to moving objects and unexplained doors opening and closing, I've seen it all. I've even captured over a dozen Class A EVPs that are so clear you'd swear that they were human voices. But one experience stands out above all the others as the most terrifying thing I've ever encountered. It started with me waking up out of a trance in front of my stove. The burner was on and there was a knife with a plastic handle in the frying pan, the handle melting. I had no idea what had happened or how I ended up there. It wasn't until my girlfriend told me that I'd called her in a state of confusion that I began to piece things together. As I looked around the kitchen, I noticed that there were pieces of food in the freezer with knife slashes all over them. It was like someone or something had taken control of me and used me to destroy things in my own home. But the worst was yet to come. In my bedroom, I discovered a room air cleaner balancing perfectly upside down on its surface. This was impossible to do and I tried to recreate the feat over a dozen times before and without success. It was as though the spirits were trying to send me a message, one that I didn't understand. For over half an hour, I had no control over myself. I was possessed, and it was the most frightening experience of my life. I started to think about murderers who claimed to black out while committing heinous crimes, and wondered if they were telling the truth. I couldn't shake the feeling that true evil existed, and it scared me to my core. What if my mother or someone else I loved had been in the house with me that day? What would I have done? The spirit seemed to be trying to tell me that I should be scared. For the first time in my life, I listened to them. Strange Smells and Sounds just to have some context on the area we live in my family, we live in a mobile home park where the trailers have been converted to homes. So recently, me and my wife and the rest of the family that lives with us have been hearing or smelling strange sounds. At first, we thought it was a stray cat or raccoons, but then things started getting weirder. We started hearing sounds. Sometimes it would be footsteps. Other times we would hear knocking. We thought maybe we smoked a bit too much of the devil's lettuce, but... Everyone else in the house was also hearing these things. That's when the sounds started, and people were talking to us now. But the weird thing was, it always sounds like they're incredibly far away. The most recent thing was the smell of a rotten corpse of some kind, but I couldn't for the life of me remember the last time I smelled a corpse like that. The smell seemed the most intense as it was right in front of me. I checked around her house and under it to make sure there were no dead animals. This happened at almost 12 at night when my wife and I were outside smoking had my brother come out and check, and even he agreed that it wasn't just me who smelled it, and he said it smells like a corpse of a person. That's when I remembered why the smell seemed so familiar, because a man had died a few years ago, and I remembered how many times we walked by his corpse. They realized he died inside the wall, but I never forgot the smell. It was very horrid. Still, the smell only happened about once, and it hasn't come back that I know of. I'm usually one to think of scientific reasons. I ended up checking if possible sewage had leaked from a pipe or if it came from our neighbor's house, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. These weird happenings only seem to happen at night, and most of the people who live near us are usually asleep by 10 p.m., and we stay up till about 12 or 1 in the morning. My neighbors have told me that on a few occasions, they've been outside at that hour, saying that they feel uncomfortable or that they hear something, but they chalk it up to maybe random animals or them being tired. Running Long Neck Man As time passed, Jim couldn't shake off the memory of the encounter with the pale, long-necked creature. He started to do some research and asked around about any similar sightings in the area. Jim's curiosity was piqued, and he wanted to know more about what he had witnessed that day. He found out that some locals believed in the existence of a creature called Naga, which was said to have a long neck and could stretch it for a reach food or prey. Jim was fascinated by the story and wondered what he had seen and if it was perhaps the Naga. 
He started asking around and discovered that several people had reported similar sightings. Some people even claimed to have seen the Naga devouring small animals such as chickens and rabbits in the area. Others believed that the creature was a spirit wandering the fields at night looking for food or prey. Jim's experience became a popular topic of discussion in the area, and many people were curious to know more about the creature that had chased him. Some people believed that Jim's encounter was a warning, while others thought that the Naga might have been attracted to the smell of food that he was carrying. Despite the many theories, nobody could explain why Jim's experience was different from others who had seen the creature. Some people even believed that Jim might have seen a different type of spirit altogether, and it wasn't Naga. As the years went by, Jim's experience remained a mystery, and nobody could provide a satisfactory explanation for what he had seen. However, the story of the Naga became more and more popular, and many people began to believe that the creature was real. Some even started to make offerings of food and incense to the Naga, hoping to appease the spirit and avoid any encounters with it. Jim continued to travel to the city every day, but he never forgot about the strange and terrifying encounter he had experienced years ago. The memory stayed with him for the rest of his life, and he always wondered if he would ever encounter the Naga again. New Orleans Terror When I was a kid, I went on church service trip to New Orleans. Her aim was to help clean up remaining damages from when Katrina hit. About midway into the trip, we helped remove brush and debris from some plot of land so a playground could be built. We were all ecstatic because the day was incredibly productive and we really believed that the spiritual forces of good and godliness were at work through us. That night, we visited Bourbon Street to have dinner, listen to some live music, and celebrate the work that had been done. At some point, one of the church leaders was taking pictures and pointed her camera to the sky facing a distant casino. The sky was clear and no clouds. She snapped a photo and when the screen displayed her photo, there was a silver looking face smiling heinously while clasping his hands protecting the casino. His face seemed metallic with many wrinkles. If you could imagine the heat leather joker, but without eyes, a huge mouth, no teeth and many wrinkles, like fabric being pulled in multiple directions. That's what it looked like. It had wet-looking orange hair that draped about midway down its face. Its nose was missing. The entire group went hysterical when they all looked at the photo, and the rest of the night we were disturbed. The joy we had felt all day instantly went away. Few of us slept. I had a variety of hallucinations in the dark of demons falling into me. I didn't get any sleep. There were a few girls in the room next to me who I could hear crying in terror about what had taken place. I say this to illustrate how the incident felt like a direct, successful attempt to hijack our spirits of positive energy. One person in the group tried to come up with multiple natural explanations for the incident, but the leader who took the photo always had new details to explain how it wasn't a natural explanation for what had taken place. This incident alone has been enough to keep my agnostic ass alert and aware of all possibilities. Dream Visitation I was always incredibly close with my grandfather. He was a hero to me, and he took me in when I was about 14 years old. He taught me how to drive, how to shave, how to fish basically everything a person needs to know to survive in this world. In the spring of 2016, his health began to deteriorate. His heart was failing. On a sunny Tuesday in May, his great big heart finally stopped. It was a good death, but it was hard on me. About a year after his death, I was working nights and spent most of the day asleep. One day I woke to my cell phone ringing. Being half asleep, I didn't bother to look at the screen to see who was calling, I just answered it. Hello? Cody, how are you? It was clearly my grandfather's voice. I'm fine, Grandpa. How are you? It was then that my mind finally caught up and I remembered that he was dead. As soon as the saw entered my mind, the phone hung up. I quickly forced myself from the semi to full consciousness state. I found myself holding my phone in my hand. The screen was on and it was unlocked. I opened my recent calls to see who or what there was on an incoming call, but there wasn't any didn't know what to make of the situation. 
I know I heard his voice. And why would I be holding the phone? The rational me wanted to think that it was just grief that manifested into subconscious actions of a phone call. But I also wanted to think that Grandpa was trying to reach out. A few weeks later, I looked up others that were speaking about their deceased loved ones through dreams or had phantom phone calls. And I discovered that phantom phone calls are relatively rare, but when it happens while you're asleep, it's dream visitation. The theory is that when you're dreaming, it's easier for a spirit to pierce that veil and communicate. I know how true that is, but occasionally I'll dream about grandfather. I always wake up hoping that he's still out there somewhere. I encountered the smell and very strange timing. It was a strange and eerie night when I experienced something inexplicable that left me feeling utterly terrified. It was around 4 or 5 a.m. and I had gone to the bathroom. As I was leaving, I heard a loud bang on the door. I immediately opened it, and nobody was there except my trusty dog. At first, I assumed my dog had smacked the door with his tail, but as I stepped out, I was struck by an overpowering aroma that filled the hallway. It was an intense fragrance of flowers or some other sweet-smelling substance like soap. It was as if someone had drenched themselves in soap and stood outside my door. I was bewildered and afraid and asked both my parents if they had used the bathroom during the night, but they both denied it. They also told me that we didn't have any soap with such a strong scent. The feeling of anxiety and fear washed over me like a wave, and I couldn't shake off the sensation that something ominous was happening. The smell was so powerful that I could almost taste it. It lingered in the air, as if someone had just showered and walked out in the hallway without rinsing off the soap. It was then that I mustered the courage to take a step forward, and I walked through the scent. It was so strong that I could almost touch it, but as soon as I took another step into my room, it vanished without a trace. It was the same spot where my fiancé and I had smelled a horrible, putrid odor that reminded us of rotten, maybe rotten old milk, like a really bad fart. It was a bizarre and unsettling experience that we both forgot until she reminded me of it. I was left wondering if anyone had any idea what could have caused this mysterious phenomenon. Was it a ghost or some other supernatural entity that had made its presence known that particular night? I may never know, but the memory of that strange and inexplicable incident remains etched in my mind. Heard a little girl crying for help near our pond. Well, tonight I was outside with my cousin, helping him set up for his new basketball hoop. We got finished with it, and he was shooting some hoops while I was watching it, and it's about dusk. Then he asks me if I want to go inside. I say, sure. And then all of a sudden I hear, help me, please help me, someone please help me. It sounded like a little girl crying for help near a pond. I was shaking and my cousin had already went inside the door, but it was waiting for me. At this point I'm shaking because it's almost like I knew what it was as soon as I heard it. My cousin came back out and I no longer heard it. Then I'm shaking my way back inside and tell my fiance. And she looks out from the bathroom window because it's looking out towards the pond and she sees a little girl out there. Then she tells me to come, and look not even ten seconds later, and there's nothing there. What the hell is happening? First it was knocking and howling, we're having actual experiences, so I'm seriously terrified. I checked for any sign of an actual little girl, and there's no sign of anyone having been down there. So for all you that say stupid shit because I didn't go down there and help the little girl, stop. It wasn't a real little girl, and I know it wasn't. I know who lives around this area, and I know what happens around here. It's just not some distressed kid, I promise. I've been reading up skinwalkers and also thinking about them. I'm about 60% native, and also just had a child. Lots of negative things are going on in the family right now. It's chaotic, and it's feeding off of these things. This wants a little girl that was kidnapped or anything like that. My fiancé, say you're out by the pond or the grass, she couldn't have fell in 10 seconds, and there was no sign. There was no splashing in the water, no ripples, and also when I checked this morning, there were no footprints or hair, or shoes, clothes, anything. It was muddy enough to see if someone had been there last night. 
I'm going to start catching all this on camera so all the people who are anal and calling me names will see what I mean. Did you ever encounter places where you suddenly feel anxiety every time you're there? As I reflect on my past travels through the streets of my old city, I can't help but recall the numerous times I felt an overwhelming sense of terror and anxiety while passing through certain areas. It didn't matter what time of year it was, or what the weather was like, the feeling was always the same. I remember one particular spot, just a small stretch of road that couldn't have been more than 30 meters in length. It was situated in an otherwise normal district, with no obvious signs of danger or ominous history. And yet, every time I walked down that street, I was filled with an inexplicable dread that made me want to run as fast as I could in the opposite direction. It wasn't just that one spot, there were others as well. Some were larger, encompassing entire blocks of houses, while others were more isolated. No matter where I went, it seemed like there was always some place that triggered that same sense of unease and fear within me. I tried to find an explanation for it, researching the history of various neighborhoods and scouring old maps for any clues, but there was nothing to suggest that these areas were any different from the rest of the city. No cemeteries, no ancient ruins, no evidence of alien activity, nothing that could explain the overwhelming sense of dread that I felt. One of my friends told me that she always felt uneasy at a particular subway station, which I later discovered had been built right in the middle of a medieval cemetery. But even there, I didn't experience the same feeling of terror that I did in those seemingly innocuous parts of the city. It was as if there was some unseen force lurking in the shadows, waiting to pounce on anyone who dared to cross its path. And no matter how hard I tried to shake the feeling, it followed me wherever I went. Even now, years later, the memory of those terrifying spots still haunt me. I can't help but wonder what dark secrets they might be hiding. Weird Creature Spotted in Minnesota I moved to Minnesota about six months ago. It's a pretty cold state. More or less, I love it here. It's very peaceful, and when it snows, it's really beautiful. However, my image of Minnesota has changed as of last night. Me and my mom and my stepfather were all sitting down watching a movie in the living room. As the movie was about to end, we paused it because my mom wanted to go smoke, and I had to use the restroom. Once I'm back from using the restroom, I go and sit down with my stepdad. A few seconds later, my mom opens the patio door and yells for us to get out there. We rush outside and she tells us that she started hearing a noise of something big walking in the snow. When she started to look around for where the noise was coming from, about 40 feet away was a white trailer. She said that when she looked over there, she saw something with red eyes staring at her. She said that it looked like a really big dog. First, my stepdad said that it was probably a coyote. Then I started to think of how my mom heard a coyote walking in the snow 40 or 50 feet away. I realized that it had to be something very big. I've always been one to believe in paranormal things. My mother, not so much. We looked around a bit longer and then we go back inside. A few hours later, I leave my room to go grab a soda so I can continue playing Halo. After the whole event, I've had this unshakable feeling. So I decided to just look outside and reassure myself that she was seeing things. As my eyes scan the edge of the woods, I don't really see anything, so I take a deep breath and I grab the soda and close the fridge. As I close the door, I glimpse out the window and freeze. Sure enough, I see a pair of red eyes peering at me through the trees. I couldn't see much because of how dark it was. It was around 3 a.m., but I know what I saw. I saw something that I've never seen before. Those red eyes went right through me. Then as quick as I had seen them, they disappear. What did I see? During my elementary and middle school years, I attended a school that was situated right next to a graveyard. I, along with many other students, have witnessed strange things in the corners of our eyes, and have felt deep feelings of dread or sadness. The worst case, however, was when a few students complained about feeling as if they were being touched randomly and how they sometimes felt as if there was a little pull on the grabbed part. 
One year, when I was in fifth grade, a new transfer student came in. He was a big, scaredy cat, and no one even warned him about the strange occurrences. During one class, he suddenly screamed at the top of his lungs as if he fell off his chair and started pointing at the classroom door. He claimed to have seen a hand holding a severed head with a big, creepy smile peeking out of it. First, no one believed him since the classroom door was shut at the start of the lesson. I was probably the first person to look at the door to confirm what had happened, and to my surprise, I found it partially open. There was no sound of the door opening, which was a strange occurrence, since the door in that classroom was always so noisy. Luckily, this was the only major incident that happened throughout the rest of the years that I spent at the school, but there were no more panicking or other bizarre occurrences that happened other than the transfer student leaving the school. But 12 years later, I found out that there were actually some graves in the school area. The school had supposedly run out of space and needed more places to fit children. The graves had been there for a long time and no one visited them anyway. It was a load of bullcrap to say the least. I don't know if it was illegal or not, but the school authorities for sure weren't arrested. The strange happenings in that school made a lot of sense now. It was eerie to think about. I, along with my classmates, had been studying and playing so close to the graves of those who had passed away. The experience has made me believe that there are things beyond our understanding, and that we should always be aware of the history and significance of places that we inhabit. Did I just let something sinister into my home? This morning I woke up at my usual time, 5 a.m., to go to the gym before class. I'm off campus staying with my parents, however they're away for a month, so I've had the house to myself. And while anyways, every morning I wake up, let my dog out and go do his business, shower, brush my teeth, let him back inside before I get dressed and leave. This morning I woke up a little weird. The house had a strange energy and my gut sensed that something was up. I let my dog into our pitch black backyard, the deck light didn't turn on like it usually does. Which is unusual, but I thought nothing of it and went to go take a shower. After my shower I went back to the sliding glass door to let my dog in and I could see him sitting there waiting for me. I opened the door and watched him, a large black lab, walk in and under the table, I then proceeded to close the door and walk to my room and get dressed. Here's where it gets weird. As I was leaving the area where the back door is, I felt the same strange feeling that I had been feeling all the morning. I decided to look at the dog's bed and notice that he wasn't in it, so I looked back at the door and saw to my utter confusion that he was still sitting outside. My stomach instantly dropped. I could have sworn on my life that I just watched him come into my house and under the table. I walked back to the door, let my actual dog inside, and as though, as I thought more about it, the thing I let in before looked more like a shadow rather than a dog. As she was waiting for me at the gym, she said it was probably just my imagination. But I never ever imagined something this real. I wasn't even tired. I noticed that my dog was acting a little strange, too, staring at one of our walls and growling quietly. I left soon after that, and I got on with my day. I'm at a loss. If anyone has a possible explanation to ease my nerves, because I'm really dreading sleeping there alone tonight. Should I share with my wife? Let me begin by sharing the story of my family in our 70-year-old house, a place that's been our home for the past eight years. Recently, my wife and I moved into an upstairs bedroom, hoping to make the most of the space and enjoy some much-needed privacy. However, things took a dark and unexpected turn when my wife and son went out for town for a week, leaving me alone in the house. As I slept soundly one night, I was jolted awake by the sound of a whispering voice saying, Get out. At first, I dismissed it, my imagination running wild, but the experience left me feeling uneasy and unsettled. When my family returned home, I tried to put the incident out of my mind and go about my daily routine as usual. However, that sense of unease only grew stronger as the days went on, culminating in another terrifying experience just last night. Once again, I was sound asleep when I suddenly awoke with the same whisper in my ear, Get out. This time, there was no mistaking it. The voice was clear and unmistakable, sending shivers down my spine, 
The more I thought about it, the more I began to wonder if there was something more sinister at play. After all, the previous owner of the house had lived here for their entire life, and they had passed away within these very walls. Her ashes were scattered in the backyard, leaving me to wonder if her spirit was somehow still lingering in the house and trying to communicate with me. Despite my fears, I'm reluctant to share my experiences with my wife, knowing how much it would terrify her. But the more I think about it, the more I realize I just can't keep this to myself forever. Something needs to be done to address this strange and inexplicable thing that keeps happening in her home. As I sit here alone with my thoughts, I can't help but wonder what the future holds for me and my family in this house. Will we be able to coexist peacefully with the ghostly presence that seems to be haunting us? Only time will tell. Advice for possibly haunted house with young kids. As I sit here writing this, I can't help but think about the strange occurrences that have been happening at my sister's house. It's a beautiful 1920s home that they've been living in for the past five months, but the paranormal activity only started recently. It's been so unsettling for everyone in the family, especially my sister. She heard footsteps on multiple occasions and even a loud sigh coming from an empty room. It's enough to make anyone feel uneasy, but my sister's been particularly affected by it. A week ago, I was there alone with my dog, and I heard a door in an adjacent room open. My dog was on the couch with me, so it couldn't have been her. The old doors in the house stick, and they're hard to open wide, even when they're not latched, so I doubt it could have been a draft either. I was so curious and went to investigate, but my dog was too afraid to follow me, which is very unlike her. The experience has been so strange that my sister's six-year-old son was also affected. He's been having trouble sleeping because of the people watching him in his room when the lights are off. As much as I want to believe that it's just his anxiety, it's still concerning to hear. We haven't noticed any signs of their one-year-old experiencing anything yet, but it's still early. We're all worried about the situation, especially because of the steep staircase that leads to the children's rooms. We don't want to encourage any spirits that may be in the house, and we certainly don't want anyone to be hurt. It's hard to say if whatever's in the house is aggressive or not, and that's what worries us the most. My sister and her family have been through so much already, and this is just adding to their stress. I wish I could do something to help, but I feel so helpless in this situation. All we can do is hope that the activity subsides, or figure out a way to handle it if it doesn't. Disappearing person in a raincoat. When I was around five years old, I was at my grandparents' house. It was a gloomy morning and my grandfather and I were chatting in the dining room. Suddenly, I saw a person walking by the window. They were moving at a fast pace, wearing only a yellow raincoat, and their head was down. They were heading towards the door, which was to my right, and anyone going in that direction would have seen him as they walked by. I had a strange feeling in the pit of my stomach. I asked my grandfather to check who was at the door, because I thought it might be my aunt who had come home from work. My grandfather ran to the door to check, but no one was there. I was confused because the distance between the window and the door was only a few feet away, and you would have had to see the person walking, unless they ran at a very high speed. Moreover, if they kept moving forward, they would have hit a fence. This incident left me feeling scared and bewildered, and I couldn't explain what I had seen. My father suggested that it might be a time traveler passing through our time, but I didn't know what to make of it. This was my first paranormal experience, and it stayed with me for a long time. As I grew older, I started researching paranormal phenomena and different theories that could explain what I saw. I came across different explanations, including the possibility of a ghost an alien, or even a glitch in the Matrix, and none of them seemed to fit perfectly, and I still couldn't explain what had happened that morning. Over time, I learned to accept that some things must remain unexplained, and that's okay. This experience taught me to keep an open mind and not to dismiss things that I can't explain. Who knows? 
Maybe one day I'll get an answer to what I saw that gloomy morning in my grandparents' house. The Devil by the River When I was 12 years old, my older brother and I went to visit family in Colombia in the summer of 2004. We had a lot of freedom and often played with the neighborhood kids outside. And that was during the day, and we would go back for evenings and dinner. One day, we decided to go for a walk around the river that was behind the apartments where we were staying. We had heard that the river was haunted by La Lorana, a Hispanic urban legend about a woman who drowned her children and would cry in agony at night mourning for them. Although we were slightly spooked about the urban legend, we decided to go anyway since it was broad daylight. After about five minutes of walking around and throwing rocks at nearby trees, something terrifying happened. I turned around and saw my friend Santiago's face in utter shock, and both my brother and his friend screamed, What the hell is that? Do you see that? I was too scared to turn and see what they were talking about, but I could hear the fear in their voices. Suddenly, Santiago and my brother were running ahead of me, and I didn't want to be left behind. We made it to the street and escaped whatever it was that scared them so badly. When I finally asked what had happened, they both described seeing a demonic creature hanging from a tree, smiling at them. They both confirmed the same description, and luckily, I didn't lay eyes on it at all. I couldn't believe that they had seen something so terrifying, but I assumed that they were trying to scare me. As time went on, I became more and more convinced that they had seen something real. Even now, at 26 years old, I sometimes ask my brother about the incident. At first, he was hesitant to confirm or deny what he saw, but eventually he admitted that it was the real deal. Looking back, I'm grateful that I didn't see whatever that scared my brother and Santiago so badly. Both my parents had a dream about my little sister that came true. Let me tell you a story about my sister, Mika. When she was around five or six years old, my parents had a dream about her. Now, it's important to note that my parents are not superstitious people, but this dream was so vivid and realistic that they took it very seriously. We were supposed to go to my step-grandmother's house for the day and fix something on the roof. But my parents told Mika to stay away from anything high because they had both dreamt that she fell from a high place. They were so worried about her safety that they asked me to watch her closely that day. I made sure to keep her away from ladders or anything where she could fall from a high place. And the day passed without any incident. But a week or two later, something happened that made us all wonder if the dream was a premonition. Mika fell in the basement, right beside the stairs. The basement was unfinished, which meant the floor was cement. And she landed head first on it. My parents and I rushed over to her, fearing the worst, but to our surprise, she was completely fine, a little shooken up, but otherwise unharmed. My parents took her to the doctor to ensure that there were no serious injuries. And by some miracle, there wasn't any sign of a concussion or anything else can't explain how grateful I am that she walked away from that fully unscathed. It's like someone was watching out for her that day. She's now 18 and living her best life, but the memory of that day still haunts me. And what's interesting is that my parents never had a dream like that again. They're not sure if it was a premonition or just a coincidence, but it's something that stuck with all of us all these years. It's a reminder that sometimes there are things beyond our understanding that maybe... Just maybe there's something out there looking out for us. Button Trails It was a house that was filled with secrets, and the longer I lived there, the more I discovered. It all started with the little buttons. I'd find them scattered along the hallway, leading to my grandma's room. At first it was just a few, but over time, the trails grew longer and the buttons became more numerous. I couldn't explain it. I didn't have siblings, and no one in my family seemed to know where the buttons were coming from. The only clue I had was a bag of sewing supplies in my closet, but it didn't make sense. 
I had never touched the bag, and it didn't seem like anyone else had either. As time rolled on, more strange things began to happen. I would hear whispers in the hallway at night, and sometimes I'd feel a cold breeze on my face, even though the windows were closed. My grandma would talk about feeling a presence in her room, and sometimes she would wake up to find buttons scattered across her bed. I began to research the history of the house and found out that it had once belonged to a seamstress who had died in the house. Her spirit was said to haunt the hallways searching for her lost buttons. But it wasn't just the seamstress's spirit that was haunting the house. As I delved deeper into the history, I found out that my grandmother's dad had died in the house many years ago, and as I pieced everything together, I realized that the buttons were a message from beyond the grave. My grandma's dad had always been a practical joker, and it seems that even in death he was still playing his tricks. There was a darker message in the buttons, too. There was a reminder that his passing was a way to let us know that he was still watching over us. I don't live in that house anymore, but I still think about it often. The buttons have been a small thing, but they opened a door to a world of paranormal activity that I never knew existed, and I know now that even in death, our loved ones are still with us, watching over us and guiding us on our journey. Ghost in my house. When I was around 12 years old, I had an experience that I'll never forget. It was a night that my dad was on a hunting trip and my mom was asleep in their bedroom. I was in my room playing Xbox and I was the only one up in the house. At the time, I was always into creepy stuff, but not necessarily ghosts or anything like that. As I was playing my game, I started feeling like there was a presence in the room with me or someone was watching me. It was a strange feeling that I couldn't quite shake off. Eventually, I paused my game and decided to look into the hallway from my room. That's when I saw it, a transparent mass that floated past my door. Now, normally, I would have thought that it was maybe just me seeing things, or was my mind playing tricks on me. But the thing that made this experience so creepy was that there was a grave in the woods about 80 or 100 yards from my house. The grave had dates 1803 through 1900 on it. I had always wondered if that had something to do with what I had just witnessed. I remember feeling a sense of fear and unease wash over me as I tried to process what I had just seen. I couldn't explain it, but it was like the atmosphere in the living room had suddenly changed. It was as if the air had become heavy and oppressive. Even though I was a kid, I knew that something strange was happening, and it terrified me. Looking back on that experience now can't help but wonder if it was a ghost or some kind of paranormal activity. I've heard countless stories about people encountering ghosts and spirits, but I never thought it would happen to me. But now I can't identify what I saw that night. And I can't deny that I saw it. It was a strange and unsettling experience that has stayed with me all these years. My family tree. I have many stories to tell, mostly passed down from my dad. One of the earliest tales goes back to when I was only two years old. My dad showed me a picture of my great uncles, and as he pointed to each person, I suddenly interrupted him and pointed to the guy in the photo, exclaiming, That's my Uncle Joe. My dad was taken back and asked how I knew him, to which I simply replied, He comes up to my room every night to tell me jokes. My dad then informed me that Uncle Joe had actually died before I was even born. It was a spooky realization for such a young age. But that wasn't the only spooky encounter my dad has had. He used to work on an apartment house and one day he was up on the roof talking to a neighbor when he noticed one of his tools started to smoke. Now nothing was plugged in or even on, but all of his tools suddenly caught on fire. In a panic, my dad started to throw his tools off the roof, losing about $100,000 worth of them in just one minute. It was a devastating loss, but it wasn't the only strange occurrence in that apartment. There was also a ball in the kitchen that seemed to have a mind of its own. Whenever anybody walked into the kitchen, the ball would roll over into the living room. And when someone walked into the living room, the ball would roll back into the kitchen. It was as if the ball was alive and had a mischievous nature. 
my dad decided to throw it out the window, thinking that that was going to be the end of it. And when he turned around, the ball was right back in front of him again. He turned to get rid of it. He tried to get rid of it by shredding it three times, but the ball always seemed to find its way back to him. Finally, he was able to get rid of it for good, though. It's amazing to think that we still own that same apartment house today. Whenever I think about these stories, it sends shivers down my spine, and they're just a few examples of the strange and unexplainable things that seem to happen in this world, and I'm grateful to have them as a part of my family's history. Cheeky Ghosts? My husband and I have lived together for around nine years now. We've lived in five different houses in three different states. We didn't experience anything paranormal together until we moved into our last house. It was a home built in 1915 in New England. It was quiet for a couple of months, and then we started to get a lot of activity. It wasn't really scary, just more mischievous. Our next-door neighbor at the time lived in a house that used to be a man cave garage from her house. He said that he had spookier stuff happen, aggressive knocking and voices and slamming doors. Our spirit mainly liked to steal tons of stuff, but my favorite experience was when we were cleaning before my in-laws arrived. There was a balloon that got trapped up in our high ceiling for many months. We had never seen it move and had no idea how to get it down. We jokingly yelled out, Spirit, could you help us get that balloon down? We laughed and then in seconds... We watched it scoot across the ceiling all the way to the stairs before we could get it. There was no moving air or wind. It was crazy to watch. We had a bunch of funny little things like that happen. Fast forward to our current house. The home was built in the 60s. We didn't have any paranormal experiences until this November. And now it's a daily thing. At 11 p.m., 3 a.m., 5 a.m., we clearly hear something walking around our hallway outside our bedroom door. Sometimes it messes with the closet door and our bedroom door. It'll quietly close them if we leave them open, for example. Lately, though, it's been touching us. It will lightly tug at my clothes during the day if I'm alone, and then my husband told me today it felt like somebody grabbed his butt. He thought it was me, and I was shocked that it wasn't me behind him. He's mostly a skeptic about this stuff, but he's definitely been shocked by our experiences in the last couple of years. Creepy Experience Back when I was in primary school, I had an unexplainable experience that still haunts me to this day. It happened during my last year of primary school when I was around 10 or 11 years old. I was sitting in class with a friend and our seats were facing the window. From where we were sitting, we could see some of the houses in the street that backed up right against the wall of the school grounds. There was a particular house that we could see from the side entrance of the school, which had been abandoned and was in a state of disrepair. It had boarded up windows, chains, and locks on the door, and an overgrown garden. It was clearly not lived in anymore. One recent school day, my friend and I saw something that we couldn't explain. We saw a man dressed in a pristine white suit, a wide hat to match, and a white tie. His face was in the shadows, so we couldn't see what he looked like. We both saw him, and then he took a half step directly backwards and seemed to vanish into thin air. The moment felt so creepy, put shivers down my spine. But wait, it gets even creepier. The following week, a machete was found in the woodlands, which was fenced off wooded area on school grounds used for nature lessons was like the Forbidden Forest in Harry Potter, but much more sinister. The knife was big and covered in blood, and it had been stabbed through a tree. The police were all over the school, but nothing else was ever found. I still don't know what happened or if these two incidents were linked, but it was one of the creepiest experiences of my life, and it makes me wonder what other unexplainable things are out there that we can't see or understand. It was a quiet evening and Emma was in her parents' room with their dogs. The dogs were playfully barking and Emma was enjoying their company. 
Suddenly, all three dogs stopped in their tracks and started intently staring at the doorway. Emma could feel her heart racing as the dogs refused to draw their attention away from the door. She could sense that something wasn't right. Emma tried to brush off the feeling of continuing to play with the dogs, but she couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. She remembered that her mom had told her that her grandparents' old room used to be haunted by a ghost. Emma had never believed in ghosts before, but she couldn't ignore the fact that her dogs were sensing something that she couldn't see. As the night went on, Emma began to hear strange noises in the room. The dogs were whimpering and growling and Emma could hear footsteps coming from the hallway. She tried to tell herself that it was just her imagination, but she couldn't ignore the fear that was creeping up inside of her. Suddenly the room went dark and Emma's dogs began to growl. She could feel a cold breeze brush past her and she knew that she wasn't alone. Emma reached for her phone, but the battery was dead. She was trapped in the darkness with whatever was in the room with her. After what felt like hours, the darkness began to lift, and Emma could see a figure standing in front of her. It was her great-grandfather who had passed away many years ago. He was staring at her with a look of sorrow and regret. Emma could feel his sadness, and she knew that he was trying to tell her something. As quickly as he had appeared, the figure vanished, and the room returned to normal. Emma was left in shock, unsure of what had just happened. She knew that her dogs had sensed something, and she had felt it too. Emma couldn't explain what had just occurred, but she knew that she would never forget the feeling of being watched by her great-grandfather's ghost. I didn't sleep much last night due to a supernatural encounter. Last night was one of the scariest experiences of my life. As I was lying in bed trying to fall asleep, I felt a strange presence in my room. Normally my cat sleeps with me every night, but my sister took him with her as she left a week ago. And since then I've been feeling a strange spiritual energy in the room that I just can't explain. I could sense the cat's presence even though he wasn't physically there. It felt like he was walking around the bed, but when I looked, there was nothing there. Then after a few minutes, the cat stopped moving, and I began to feel a growing sense of fear inside me. I couldn't move, and I started to hear voices inside my head. The voice was describing driving a car into a huge storm, and it was starting to freak me out. I kept telling the voice to calm down and everything would be okay, but the fear inside me continued to grow. Then suddenly the bed started shaking and the shaking became more and more intense with each passing moment. I tried to scream, but nothing would come out. Finally, I woke up, and the bed stopped shaking. I was crying and felt like I couldn't move for what felt like hours. The cat had come back and was standing next to me, but that only made me feel more scared. I knew that something wasn't right in that room, and I couldn't bear the thought of sleeping there another night. I moved to another room and I was finally able to get some sleep though. I still can't explain what happened, but I know that something isn't right. Before my sister took the cat, everything was normal. But now, I can't shake the feeling that something is in the room with me. I haven't slept properly in the room for some time now, and I know that I'll never sleep in there again. My first prayer to St. Anthony. Once upon a time, there was a family that consisted of several members, among whom was a person known as Dee Dee, who was an unfortunate victim of having their phone stolen by a supposed acquaintance who went by the name of Y. Despite being confronted by the other friend who had spotted the phone in Y's possession, Y vehemently denied any wrongdoing, leaving the family with no choice but to involve the police in the matter. Fortunately, even with the presence of an eyewitness, Dee was still unable to retrieve their phone, causing the family to feel a sense of despair, believing that Y may have disappeared and the device to eliminate any potential evidence against them. Feeling hopeless, the family returned home, and it was at this point that Dee's faith and spirituality were put to the test. In a desperate attempt to recover the stolen phone, Dee turned to prayer, specifically to St. Anthony, whom they had never prayed to before. They prayed that the phone would be returned to them in its entirety 
with no information or data deleted or tampered with. For the next three days, the family awaited a response, unsure of what to expect. However, to great surprise, Y showed up at their doorstep returning the phone with a flimsy excuse, claiming that a group of kids had found it in a bush and handed it to them. The family was naturally skeptical of Y's explanation, but to their relief, the phone was returned to them entirely intact, per Dee's prayer. It felt like a true miracle to Dee, who couldn't believe that their prayers had been answered. In summary, what started as a distressing incident for Dee and their family ended up being a testament to the power of faith and prayer. Despite the odds being against them, they managed to recover the stolen phone with the help of a higher power. It's a story that highlights the importance of never giving up hope, and the belief that sometimes, even in the midst of the most dire circumstances, miracles can happen. Strange Noises from the Woods To provide some context, I live on a 20-acre horse ranch in the panhandle of Florida, about a half hour from the Alabama border. Fifteen minutes ago, I heard the strangest animal sounds I've ever heard. It happened right outside the property, which is only 50 feet away from where I am right now. It was very, very loud, and it was a whistle. I heard it four times, spaced out like 50 or 30 seconds apart, and each whistle was different, no repeating tunes or notes. And it was loud enough to sound like it was echoing across the property. After the four whistles, it was followed up by an almost sigh sound and nothing. So to sum it up, it sounded like someone was facing the property just outside the fence line, whistling four different tunes, followed by an almost frustrated sigh and silence. What's even more strange is that it was dead quiet while this was happening. Shortly after the silence, I could hear a pack of coyotes in the distance, which happens all the time, and owls over the lake, which is also frequent. Also, to be clear, where the sound was coming from was an open field. It's just so dark outside I can't see in front of my face. The weirdest thing is that we're more likely to hear gunshots than other people out here. The closest neighbors are like a half mile away on the other direction. And this sound from the road was from the same side of the property. The closest neighbors in that direction are even further than a half a mile. And we have two donkeys on that property to ward off predators, and I didn't hear either of them warning or heard or just doing anything at all, really. Which would mean that maybe it was human and I was hearing things. But... Like I said, the property is fenced and gated, so it need to hop the fence, and whistling is a weird thing to do when you're trespassing in an area where shooting is common. Anybody have any ideas? On the night of my 13th birthday, I decided to spend the night at my grandma's house. I was up late playing video games probably until 1 or 2 a.m. After a while, I got thirsty and needed to get some water, so I decided to head to the kitchen. To get there, I had to walk down a hallway and past two other rooms. As I was walking past the last room before the staircase, something caught my eye. I saw a flame just in the middle of a dark room. I was confused and stepped closer to get a better look. For a second, I actually thought it was my grandma standing in the dark holding a lighter. I didn't know why she would be doing that, but I thought maybe she was just confused herself. But as I got closer, I was able to make out a figure. It was all black and over six feet tall, and it was definitely not my grandma. The figure just stood in the doorway, looking at me while it held a flame in its hand. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I ran as fast as I could downstairs and saw that my grandma was asleep. I couldn't believe what I had just seen. I didn't know what to make of it at all. Was it a dream? A hallucination? Or was it real? I tried to rationalize it, but nothing made sense. The next morning, I tried to ask my grandma if she had seen anything strange or if anything else was in the house. She didn't even seem to understand what I was talking about. I didn't want to scare her, so I decided to keep it to myself. Years went by and I still couldn't shake off the feeling of what I'd seen that night. It was one of the only few weird things that ever happened to me, and I still don't understand any of it. To this day, I wonder what that figure was and what did it want?
interaction with my mom. In 2006, I lost my mother to a brain aneurysm. It was a devastating blow to me, as my dad was never really there for me and my mom was my whole world. A few months later, my dad decided to move in to a new woman who didn't really like me and I didn't really like her. She wanted me to call her mom, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. She didn't like my friends or anything that I did. It made living at home a nightmare. To make matters worse, I started cutting myself when I was 13. And my dad didn't find out until I spent my 17th birthday in a mental facility. When I got out, things were still terrible at home. The only bright spot was that I became involved with a woman's son who I found very attractive. She didn't know about our relationship, but I didn't care. In November, my dad and his girlfriend decided to kick me out of the house because I took some of his prescription pills and sold them at school. I withdraw from school because I get expelled, but it didn't matter. My dad chose his girlfriend over me and it was heartbreaking. I ended up in a detention center, which is similar to a juvenile shelter. That's when the strange things started happening, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and see my mom sitting on the nightstand. At first I was scared and confused. How could my mom be here? Was she still alive, even though I watched her take her last breath? But after a few nights, I started looking forward to see her. We would have long conversations until early morning, and it was like she was really there with me. I didn't tell anyone about it, and I was afraid that they would think I was crazy. Have any of you ever experienced anything like this? I don't know if it was just my mind playing tricks on me or my mom's spirit was really there. But either way, it brought me comfort during a very difficult time. Two-year-old daughter seems to have paranormal skills. It was though something had taken hold of their small daughter, something beyond their understanding, and had set its sight on tormenting them with their own home. The family had been experiencing strange occurrences for weeks, but it was the incident with the pacifier that left them paralyzed with fear. Despite being an atheist and a skeptic, the father couldn't deny the inexplicable events that were unfolding before his eyes. Their daughter, only two years old, seemed to be breaking through an invisibility spell, revealing to them a world they never knew existed. The pacifier had vanished without a trace, and the family had searched every inch of the apartment multiple times. Yet, when their daughter pointed under her crib, there it was, as though it had been placed there by an unseen hand. It was just one of the many bizarre occurrences that had been plagued by the family. Their daughter had also pointed to an empty wall, claiming that a dead man was there. It was a word she had never heard before, yet she knew exactly what it meant. They had even heard voices coming from the empty room and lights would flicker and fall as they talked about the paranormal even as a joke. The family was living in a house of horrors and there was no escape. Other things disappeared or moved from one place to another during the night, leaving them feeling vulnerable and exposed. Every shadow was a potential threat. Every creak in the floorboards, a sign of something lurking just out of sight. The father had tried to rationalize the event to come up with a logical explanation for what was happening, but it was becoming increasingly clear that it was something beyond their comprehension at work. They were trapped in a nightmare with no end in sight. Eerie whistling noise in an abandoned high school. I have a story to share about an abandoned high school near my house. It's been shut down for almost 20 years now, and it's located in a not-so-great part of town. The windows are all boarded up, but there are a few entrances that are wide open. So a few friends and I decided to check out about half of the building. As we were exploring, we heard this eerie whistling noise that started in the middle of pitch black. And as we got higher, we made our way up to the second and third floor of the building. The pitch of the whistle was consistent, with no difference between the whistles, and I could hear it every few seconds. The strange thing was that on the ground floor, it was completely silent. At first, we thought that it could be maybe a gang call whistle of a street gang, but it didn't sound human-like at all. Also, the whistle was almost still, so it couldn't be that. As we continued to explore, we couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about the place. 
It was like we were being watched or followed by something, but we couldn't quite put our finger on it. And that's when we started to wonder if the building may have paranormal activity. To make matters worse, one of my friends claimed to have seen some kind of spirit or ghost that looked like a child hiding behind the door on the second floor. It was a chilling sight and we couldn't explain it. We just started to feel like we were in some kind of horror movie. And we couldn't wait to get out. I still think about that experience from time to time, and it gives me goosebumps. The abandoned high school near my house is not a place I ever want to visit again, especially after what we experienced that day. Who knows what other creepy things are lurking in the shadows of that building. The Hallway Ghost and the Shadow let me set the stage for you. It was a dark and stormy night, the kind of night that sets the stage for a horror story. This all happened a year ago, when I was living in a house that I suspect was haunted. I didn't have any concrete evidence until that fateful morning when I was in the bathroom taking a piss. I had forgotten to close the door and that's when it happened. Suddenly I heard a strange groaning noise and turned to see an old looking ghost pass by. He was balding at the top of his head and had a nightgown on. But what chilled me to the bone was the fact that he was floating. He moved by me so quickly I wasn't sure if I was seeing things. After that encounter, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off in my house. It wasn't until a month or so later that I experienced another haunting, and my fears were confirmed. It was in the dead of night that I was woken up, and I saw a shadowy figure hunched over walking out of my bedroom. The outline of his body appeared to be wearing an old devil costume, something you'd probably see in the 50s. It had a horned plastic mask and a poncho, and it was the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen. I felt frozen with fear, not sure of what to do next. The presence of these entities in my home confirmed my deepest fears that my house was indeed haunted. It felt like a constant source of dread and unease, not knowing when or where the next sighting would occur. I knew I had to get out of there, but part of me was scared that whatever was haunting me would follow me into my next home. To this day, I still can't shake the feeling of those two encounters. The fear and horror that I experienced still haunts me. I'll never forget the terror of seeing those apparitions, and I know that the supernatural is real, and it's lurking in the shadows, waiting to reveal itself to those brave enough to confront it. Still vividly remembering this 21 years later. When I was a young child of 5 or 6 years old, I had a haunting experience that stayed with me throughout my life. It was a night like any other, or so it seemed, when I woke up in the middle of the night, fully awake and not in a dream, when I saw was something I'll never forget. Right in front of my bed there was a man standing at the door. He had an Indiana Jones hat, a swirly mustache, red eyes, sharp teeth, and a snake-like tongue. He was watching me and laughing while posing like a hieroglyph. I was petrified with fear and started screaming, but the vision didn't disappear until my father burst into my room. It was a chilling experience, and even now, years later, the image of the man is burned into my brain. Just remembering it brings tears to my eyes. As a child, I'd often see things when waking up in the middle of the night. Some were just fleeting shadows, while others were more vivid and terrifying. But the image of that man has stuck with me like nothing else. My younger brother also had his own night terrors. He would dream of being in our residence parking lot and being chased by something. The thing chasing him would take on different forms, but it would always scream, ow, 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 like an owl. These dreams plagued him for a long time until we moved to another apartment. After that, we never had those dreams ever again. It's hard to explain what these experiences were, or why they even happened, but they have left a deep impression on both of us. And it makes me wonder if there's something more to this world than what we can see with our own eyes, and if there are these things lurking just beyond our perception that can only be glimpsed in moments of terror and confusion. Six 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 called me years ago. Let me take you back to when I was 16 years old in high school. 
I remember vividly that my sister was sitting beside me, and I received a call from a number that had the same area code as mine. This may seem like a coincidence, but for me, it was cause for alarm. You see, I had been experimenting with the Ouija board for several months, and unfortunately, I had encounters with the devil through it. So, when I picked up the call, I was expecting it to be a friend trying to mess with me. However, to my surprise, it was a man who sounded like he was in his 40s or 50s. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to wrap my head around who this could be. I went through a mental Rolodex of people I knew in that age bracket, but no one came to mind. The man asked me where I was, and I responded with a shaky and nervous voice, asking why he wanted to know. That's when things took a dark turn. The man laughed in a way that made my blood run cold. It was an elegant yet sinister laugh. It sounded like it was from the 1950s or 1960s. I can still feel the chills run down my spine as I think about it. It was at that moment that he said, Don't worry, I'll find you. I was terrified beyond words and hung up the phone immediately. I wanted to prove to my mother what had just happened, so I tried calling the number again, but to my horror, the number didn't exist. This experience left me feeling shaken to my core. I couldn't explain it and I had no idea who this person could have been or what they wanted from me. It's a memory that stayed with me all these years and I still shudder when I think about that phone call. White Orb Going Into Body Witness During my sixth grade year, I had an experience that I'll never forget. One day, as I was sitting in class, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It was a small white orb that came in through the window and floated around the room for a few seconds before it came straight towards me. To my surprise, it entered my body, and I was left feeling confused and disoriented. I thought I was just imagining things, but then I saw another girl in the room who seemed to have seen the same thing. We made eye contact, but we both ignored it and continued about our day. The girl and I were in choir together, and we stood on the same row. Even though we never talked about it, I knew for a fact that she had seen the white orb too. Her expression was the same as mine, jaw dropped and confused. I couldn't explain what had happened, but I was glad that I wasn't the only one who had seen it. After the white orb merged with me, I remember feeling weird, but I can't exactly describe how it felt. It was such a strange experience that I forgot about it over time, until I came across someone else's story online that was similar to mine. That's when it all came back to me and I realized that what I had experienced was real. I often wonder if anyone else has ever witnessed something similar to what I saw that day. Have you? Have you ever seen something strange with someone else and never talked about it? It's amazing how something so bizarre can happen and then just be forgotten about. But I'll always remember the day in sixth grade when the white orb merged with me and how it brought me closer to someone else who had experienced it too. Shadow over my shoulder. As I reminisce on that dreadful day, I shudder with fear after all these years. It was the week after my granddad's sudden death, and the air in the house felt heavy with grief. I was sitting in the front living room, flipping through a book, trying to distract myself from the sorrow that engulfed the entire family. The room was silent, except for the sound of pages turning. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow figure. First, I thought it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, but then it moved. It was leaning over the sofa peering over my shoulders as if reading the book with me. It was a two-dimensional shadow, like a human-shaped cutout, but blacker than the darkest night. My heart pounding, I froze with fear, unable to move or scream. The shadow figure was so close to me, and yet it had no substance or form. I tried to convince myself that it was just a trick of the light, but it was real. It was as if the shadow had become to life, and it was just watching me. I summoned the courage to look up, and in that moment, I saw the most terrifying thing I'd ever witnessed. The shadow figure moved, 
darting down the far wall at an unnatural speed and disappeared through a closed door leading to the hallway. As I sat there, my mind racing with fear, I realized that something otherworldly was in the house with me. The thought of being alone in the house with this malevolent force was just too much to bear. I bolted out of the room, ran up the stairs, and locked myself in my room for the rest of the night. That experience still haunts me to this day, and I can't help but wonder what would have happened if I had not seen the shadow figure and had continued reading my book. Sleep Paralysis Experience It's been years since this happened, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I was sleeping peacefully when I suddenly woke up to find myself unable to move. I knew immediately that I was in sleep paralysis, but it was still a terrifying experience. And then it got even worse. I heard a voice, a sinister voice that sent shivers down my spine. I'm going to get you, John, it said, before breaking out into a fit of laughter. I couldn't move or even scream for help. I was completely at its mercy. Thankfully, I managed to snap out of it eventually, but the experience left me shaken and disturbed. What did that voice mean? Who was John, and why was it after him? I didn't have any answers, and the more I thought about it, the more scared I became. The next day, I woke up feeling sick and decided to stay home from school. I thought it was just a case of the flu or something, but it turned out to be much worse. Suddenly, I felt a sharp pain in my stomach, and it was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. I was writhing in pain and couldn't sit still. I was rushed to the hospital, where I found out that my appendix had burst. It was a life-threatening situation, and I needed emergency surgery to remove it. Thankfully, the surgery was a success and I made a full recovery. But the whole experience left me wondering if there's a connection between the sleep paralysis and the burst appendix. Was something trying to get me, as the voice had said? Was it all just a coincidence? I may never know for sure, but I'm just glad I made it out alive. I've encountered something, but I need help. I'm not sure what I've encountered, but I know it was something unusual. I don't have much knowledge about paranormal activity, so I need some help to figure this out. My friend and I have been feeling bored lately, so we decided to look for some spooky experiences. We found a play farm, a place with animals for kids to play with, and decided to visit it at night. The first time we went there was around 10 p.m., and we encountered something that scared us. We ran away but decided to go there again, and this time to the field. We saw floating things that I know might sound unbelievable, but I swear I saw it with my own eyes. Today, we went there again, and we decided to go to the dark part of the farm, as usual. But this time, there was something standing on the path, and we didn't know what it was. I picked up a small rock and threw it at the thing, but it didn't hit anything. My friend was scared and he suggested we leave. At that moment, I was also scared, so we started walking away. We were almost out of the dark part of the farm when something charged at us. It scared us both so much that we started running in the opposite direction. My friend ran home and I was still running because I went the wrong way, but eventually I ran home too. Now my friend and I are wondering what it was that we encountered. We're asking if someone else has experienced something similar and could help us figure it out. What is it, and what should we do the next time that we go there? We really need some guidance because we don't want to encounter anything like that again. I'm still feeling uneasy about the experience, and I can't shake off the feeling that we might have encountered something that we shouldn't have. A UFO sighting when I was young. I have a vivid memory of a UFO sighting that occurred when I was very young, not over the age of 12. It was just me and my mother waiting for the bus, and as we were standing there, I looked up into the sky and saw a small blue light flying slowly. I was excited for whatever reason, and said to my mom, Look! She dismissed it, saying it was probably just a normal airplane or a helicopter. 
But then something strange happened. The light dot in the sky splintered into three parts, and suddenly there were three dots flying side by side at the same speed. I was in awe of the sight before me, and I kept urging my mother to look up and see what was happening. But she had no answer for this phenomenon. He told me to get back up on the bus, because the doors were just opening. As I got into the bus, I kept looking back at the sky, trying to keep an eye on the strange objects that I just witnessed. But eventually I lost sight of them, and I was left with so many questions. What were those lights? Why did they split into three? And why had my mother been unable to explain it all to me? Over the years, I've thought about the sightings many times, wondering if anyone else had seen it, or if there was an explanation for what I had witnessed. I've tried to rationalize it in my mind, but it defies all explanation. Despite the passage of time, the memory has stayed with me, a strange and unexplained event that left me with a fascination of the mysteries of the universe. And while I may never know what those lights were or where they came from, I'll always remember the feeling of wonder and amazement as I felt as a young child, looking up at the sky and seeing something that defied all explanation. The Ghosts of Life, Marietta, Georgia. During my time working at Life U in the 2000s, I had an incredibly eerie experience that I'll never forget. I was sitting in my open office when I saw a woman walk by wearing a black bonnet in a swishing black taffeta ruffled dress. She moved so quickly that I barely had time to react. I stood up and searched the area but couldn't find her anywhere. She had vanished into thin air. Later on, some of the students walked and mentioned that they had seen a woman running, and we all heard loud, rapid footsteps coming from the floor above us. We were all completely shaken, and I knew I had to take action immediately. So I called maintenance, and the security came to investigate. When they arrived, they searched the entire area but found no one inside, in the ceiling or outside. It was as if the woman and the footsteps had never even existed. However, what made this experience even more unsettling was that the site where this occurred was built on a Civil War era homestead. As if this wasn't enough, I had another encounter with a ghostly figure in the same building, and this time it was a man in a period dress peering into the window from the breezeway. Again, all the doors were locked and impulsively in that area. He appeared out of nowhere and then vanished just as quickly. These unexplained events left me feeling extremely uneasy and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something supernatural happening in that building. The thought that I was sharing my workspace with ghosts was unsettling to say the least. I met my doppelganger. Today was a typical day for me, and I decided to head to the supermarket near my house to grab a few things. I was in the chip section when someone wearing a white coat caught my eye. As someone who aspires to be a doctor or a scientist, seeing someone in a white coat piqued my interest, so I followed this person around the store, casually browsing the aisles and glancing at the person occasionally. As I was putting a few items in my bag, I finally caught a glimpse of the person's face, and to my surprise, it was like looking at a mirror image of myself. The stranger's skin tone and height were nearly identical to mine, and even the glasses he wore were similar to mine. But the most uncanny thing was his face. It was an exact replica of my own. Despite feeling unnerved, I couldn't resist following him around even more. It was as if watching myself from a different perspective, and I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling. The stranger continued to shop and eventually grabbed a can of Coke Zero, which is my go-to drink. I was still in shock as I watched the stranger check out. I couldn't help but wonder what it all meant. As he walked away, I wanted to follow him and ask him questions, but I couldn't abandon my own items that I had just begun to be scanning, leaving the store. I couldn't shake off the strange encounter. I wondered if it was a mere coincidence, or if I had some deeper meaning going on here. Was it a sign from the universe, or just a bizarre coincidence? The experience left me feeling both confused and scared, and I couldn't stop thinking about what I had just witnessed. It 
It was a strange encounter that I'll never forget. The little girl in the white dress on the fifth floor. Working in my local hospital has been a great opportunity for me. I don't have a medical job, but I've come across something intriguing, a ghost story. The story revolves around a little girl in a white dress who is known to haunt the hospital. She's not just confined to one area, but appears all over the place. However, she's mostly spotted on the fifth floor, which is split into two wings, five south and five north. Five South serves as a temporary residence for elderly people who are waiting in their assisted living. On the other hand, Five North is a hospice where patients go to spend their last months. Interestingly, the little girl is spotted the most on the fifth floor. Although she's considered to be a prankster and a bit mischievous, she's not believed to be evil in any way. In fact, it's believed that she's some sort of guardian angel who helps turn people into the afterlife. It's been reported that patients are dying and often ring for assistance and say that there's a little girl sitting at the end of their bed. And without fail, they always describe the same thing. A little girl dressed in white. Strangely enough, these patients would pass away within 24 hours after seeing the little girl. Not much is known about the little girl, or how she came to haunt the hospital. However, sightings of her have been happening for decades. It's a mystery that remains unsolved, but one thing is for sure. The little girl in the white dress is an enigmatic and fascinating presence in the hospital. Creepy Old Music Box I remember the day I went to my girlfriend's house for the very first time. It was an older house, and they had recently moved in. As we entered the house, I couldn't help but notice its unique features and its old-fashioned charm. At that moment, everything seemed pretty normal, and I didn't think much of it. As the evening progressed, we talked and flirted with each other, enjoying each other's company. But then out of nowhere, the light suddenly went out, plunging us into total darkness. At first, I thought it was just a power outage or something. But then I noticed a strange feeling in the air. It was almost as if the house was trying to tell us something. And that's when it happened. A few seconds after the lights went out, we heard a sound of an old music box coming from the corner of the room. We both froze in terror as the box played on, revealing a frickin' ballerina figure from her dead grandmother. It was creepy beyond belief, and we both knew that something strange was certainly happening. From that moment on, we both felt like we were being watched. We couldn't shake the feeling that something supernatural was happening in that house. We started to put things on top of the music box to prevent it from playing anymore, and we never saw or heard anything strange again. But even though we never experienced anything else out of the ordinary in that house, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still lurking in the shadows, waiting to reveal itself once again. And it's a feeling that I still can't shake off, even till this day. This just happened and I'm creeped out. It was a typical evening and I'm going about my business in the back of the house and suddenly I hear a sound that made my blood run cold, the front door opening. I froze in my tracks trying to process what I just heard. I knew that I was home alone, so the sound of the front door opening had to mean that someone was in the house with me. I slowly made my way down the hall, trying to keep as quiet as possible. As I approached the living room, I saw that the front door was standing open, swaying gently in the breeze. At first, I thought that my mother must have come home from work early, and was just in her room, which was near the front door, but as I called out to her, there was no answer. That's when things started to turn for the worse. The door suddenly slammed shut with a deafening bang, as if someone had pushed it from the other side. I stood there frozen in shock and terror trying to process what had just happened. There was no one in the house with me, and yet the door just closed on its own, as if some unseen force was at work. 
My mind raced with all sorts of possibilities, each one more terrifying than the last. Was it a burglar? A ghost? A demon? I frantically searched the house, but there was no sign of anyone or anything out of the ordinary. It was as if the door had closed all on its own with no explanation. For days afterwards, I was plagued by nightmares and a sense of deep unease. Every creak of the house, every gust of wind made me jump out of my skin, convinced that something was lurking just beyond my field of vision. Even now, as I sit writing these words, I can't shake the feeling that something malevolent is watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. The memory of that night still haunts me, and I fear that it always will. Alright, at this point, I think I'm crazy. I think my house may be a little haunted, if I'm being honest. I never believed in ghosts or paranormal activities until today. My family's been experiencing strange occurrences in our home. They claim to have seen someone standing in the doorway when they're alone and not looking. At first, I shrugged it off as their imagination or coincidence, but that all changed this morning. Last night was exhausting, so I slept in late. Suddenly, I was awakened by a noise at my door. I thought it was my mom waking me up, so I lazily looked up to see her. However, to my surprise, she wasn't there. I rubbed my eyes and tried to focus on the figure in front of me, but I couldn't see a face. As soon as I realized that, the figure pulled away from the door quickly. I was confused and scared. I got out of bed and started calling for my mom, but there was no answer. I searched the house, but nobody was home for an hour. I wasn't just a little freaked out. I was terrified. I had never experienced anything like this before. The thought of a ghostly figure standing in my doorway was haunting me. I couldn't shake the feeling of fear and unease. I decided to tell my mom about what had happened, and she seemed to believe me. Now, I'm starting to think that there might be something paranormal going on in her house. It's hard to believe, but after what I experienced, I can't deny the possibility. I'm anxious and scared about what might happen next, and I hope that that was maybe just a one-time thing and that it won't ever happen again. But deep down, I have a feeling that this is just the beginning of a very long and scary journey. Jin Dog Barking at Night as someone who's experienced sleep paralysis before, I know firsthand just how frightening it can be. But one particular night, I had an experience that was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. I remember waking up in the middle of the night completely paralyzed. My eyes were wide open, but I couldn't move a muscle. It was like I was trapped in my own body, unable to do anything but watch what was happening around me. As I lay there, feeling scared and confused, I heard a loud dog bark right next to my ear. At first, I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me, but then I heard it again, clear as day, and then a third time. The bark was so loud and so close that I could feel the vibrations in my ear. I was absolutely terrified. We don't have dogs in our house, and as a Muslim, I knew that it was highly unlikely that I would ever own one. So what could explain this mysterious barking that seemed to be coming from right next to me? The whole experience was incredibly eerie and unnerving. I lay there, unable to move, as the barking continued to echo in my ears. It was as if the dog was right there in the room with me, but I couldn't see it, I could only hear it. After what felt like an eternity, the barking finally stopped. I was left lying there in the darkness, still unable to move. It was one of the scariest experiences of my life, and one that I'll never forget. To this day, I have no idea what caused the barking, or why it only happened that one time, but I do know that it was a terrifying experience that I hope to never have to go through ever again. How could this be possible? I was only about four years old, which would make it about 50 years ago. My family was camping somewhere in the southwestern U.S. or maybe northern Mexico. It was a typical camping trip. We set up camp, my dad and sister went to explore, and my mother went to go get water to boil from the nearby creek or river. 
I was left sitting on the picnic table, playing with my doll or something, cross-legged and content. That's when something strange happened. I felt like I was rising up, but my legs stayed in the cross-legged position. I looked down and saw the picnic table a few feet below me, and I realized that I was floating in midair. I wasn't freaked out, though in fact I felt pretty happy and curious about it. Like it was just another fun and new experience to add to my four years of life. I didn't feel anything holding me up and I sensed no presence around me. Everything was quite still and I felt very content. I took in my surroundings, enjoying the feeling of the sun on my skin and the breeze blowing through my hair. I even heard insects buzzing around me. It was like I was in my own little world, disconnected from everything around me. I didn't want it to end. But then I heard my mother coming back to camp, and I knew that my floating adventure was over. I gently came back down to the picnic table and hopped off, running to tell my mom what had just happened. Of course she didn't believe me. She probably thought I was just playing around. But I knew what had happened, and it was a memory that will stay with me for the rest of my life. I've never experienced anything like that again, and I still have no explanation for what had happened. Sometimes I wonder if it was all just a dream or my imagination playing tricks on me. But I know what I felt and what I saw, and I'll never forget the feeling of weightlessness and contentment that I experienced on that day. Something really weird happened last night. I hope I'm not going crazy. As I lay in my bed trying to fall asleep, I realized I was parched and needed a drink of water. Checking the time, I saw it was around one in the morning. With a sigh, I got up and made my way to the staircase, cautiously descending each step, trying to make as little noise as possible. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I noticed that all the lights were off, casting an eerie shadow over the house. As I rounded the corners into the kitchen, something strange happened. Out of nowhere, I hear a child's voice singing Old MacDonald in a loud, clear voice. It was so loud that it startled me, but not too loud that it would wake anyone else up in the house. Frozen with fear, I stood in the kitchen for what felt like an eternity, waiting for the song to stop. But it continued on and on, and the child's voice was ringing in my ears. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to slowly make my way upstairs still able to faintly hear the song in the background. Once I reached my room, I turned off my fan to see if I could still hear the song more clearly. To my surprise, the singing stopped. This made me even more frightened, wondering where the sound could have possibly came from. Feeling paranoid and scared, I locked my door and tried my best to go to sleep, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't quite right. It was as if the song had somehow taken on a life of its own, haunting me with each note. I tossed and turned all night, the memory of the singing child's voice still echoing in my mind. Heard my dead cat last night. Four years ago, I had a cat that passed away. He was a special cat because he had this strange habit of going out into the living room in the middle of the night and just screaming, hello, repeatedly. The most fascinating thing about it was that he sounded like a person, not a cat. Whenever I had guests over, I'd have him warn them about his behavior because it would scare the living daylights out of them. Last night, I heard the same hello sound coming from the living room again, and it took me a moment to fully wake up and realize that it was impossible for me to hear it again. It was as if my mind was still trying to come to terms with what my ears were hearing. I sat up in bed and kept hearing the sound, so I knew I had to check it out. I got out of bed and ran into the living room. However, as soon as I got there, the sound stopped. I looked around the room, but there was no sign of any living creature making the noise. My other cats were all sound asleep, and they had never made that noise before, so I knew it couldn't have been them. At this point, I had no idea what to make of it. Some of my friends suggested that maybe it was just a dream, but I knew that it wasn't. I had been fully awake when I heard the noise, and it had been loud and clear. I couldn't ignore the fact that I had heard the same sound that my old cat used to make. It's hard to say what happened that night, but I can't shake off the feeling that maybe it was my old cat trying to say hello to me one more time. It's been four years since he passed, but I still miss him dearly. If it really was him, I'm 
Glad he stopped by to say hello. Strange moment at school. Today at school I experienced some strange happenings that left me feeling quite unnerved. A friend of mine had taken a test earlier than the rest of our classmates, so he was assigned a small study room to work in. Since I had no classes at the time, I decided to keep him company for the hour. At around 11.10, just a few minutes before I was about to leave, something bizarre occurred. My phone assistant suddenly started to read out loud the Wikipedia page on angels. I found this to be quite odd and mentioned it to my friend. However, what happened next is even stranger. As I opened the door to leave the room, the lights began to flicker. I've never seen anything like this in that room before. What really creeps me out is that I turned off all the sounds on my phone and yet my phone assistant still went off. Additionally, the number 111 is considered to be an angel number, which made the situation even more eerie. What's more, my friend and I weren't even discussing anything related to angels or religion at the time. Before I opened the door, I had jokingly mentioned that maybe an angel was trying to give us a sign, but there was no one near the light switch at the time when the flickering occurred. I can't help but feel uneasy about this whole situation. The fact that we were in a small, secluded room only adds to the mysteriousness of it all. I'm not sure what to make of it, but I can't shake the feeling that something otherworldly might have been at play. I've never been the one to believe in ghosts or paranormal activity, but after today starting to think there might be more to this world than meets the eye. What did I encounter on my college campus? The night was pitch black, and only the sound was the rustling of leaves in the wind. The small Methodist college in North Georgia mountains was eerily quiet, except for the fraternity meeting that went on late into the night. The last person to leave was a young student who gathered his belongings and exited the building. As he stepped outside, he was hit by an intense feeling of dread. It was like there was something watching him, following him, and it was close, too close. Despite his fear, he turned around and saw nothing, but the feeling persisted, growing more and more intense. He picked up his pace, hoping to shake off the ominous presence, but it only seemed to draw closer. It felt like a cold hand was reaching out to grab him, to drag him down to the depths of hell. As he walked, he felt the presence behind him getting closer and closer. He could feel hot breath on his neck and the feeling of eyes staring at him. He tried to shake it off, but the presence persisted. It was as if something was trying to possess him and take over his body and soul. He saw some chapel on the way, and as he crossed its path, the presence suddenly vanished. He could breathe again, and he felt like he had just escaped a horrible fate. But the memory stayed with him, haunting him for the years to come. Was it a ghost, a demon, or something more malevolent? He never knew for sure, but he did know that he never wanted to experience anything like that ever again. dark figure that used to watch me sleep when I was eight. I saw a ghost when I was younger, and I want some answers as to what happened. I'll try to give as much detail as possible. Fifteen years ago when I was eight years old, I had this dark figure stand in my doorway. But it wouldn't stand directly in the doorway, but more on the side, leaning into the doorway, as to sort of hide. I think it was hiding because when I went to look at it directly, it would remove its hand from grabbing the door frame, and it would hide back against the wall. But when I looked away, it would grab the door frame again and lean back into my doorway, just standing and watching. For two or three months, I would sleep under my covers. I wouldn't dare shut my door at night because I didn't want to risk being stuck in my bedroom with the dark figure. One night, I got fed up and I got out of bed and charged the dark figure. Now I saw this whole frame head to toe as he was running backwards away from me. But when I caught up to him at the end of the hall, I punched him straight through his chest and he vanished. He didn't disappear for good, though. I started seeing him during the day, and only during the day now. And one day I was sitting in my bedroom with my mom when the dark figure appeared standing beside my dresser. 
My mom didn't see it, but I did. To prove its existence to my mom, I asked it, Mr. Ghost, can you make the rain stop? And the rain stopped immediately. Not in a few seconds, but the moment I asked the ghost that question, and then I never saw it again, ever. I just want some answers as to what that whole thing was. And it happened again. About 20 days ago, I had a foresight that I really didn't want to have come true. And unfortunately, just two days after posting about it, it did come true. It was fascinating and unsettling at the same time. And now, I've had another twitch, but this one is different. A couple of days ago, I saw imagery in my head of a city skyline at night, and what appeared to be my car parked on the side of the road. But this visualization gave me a sense of panic and anxiety. I don't know if it's a premonition or something bad happening to me. Or if it's just my imagination running wild, but it's really bothering me. I felt compelled to share this experience with others, even though I know some may not believe me. But I'm hoping that someone can help me make sense of it all. Maybe someone can give me some insight into what it might mean or what I should do about it. If anyone needs more information about the image I saw, I can provide more details. It's a strange feeling to have these premonitions, especially when they feel so real and vivid. I don't know if they're just random thoughts or if they have some kind of significance, but I can't shake the feeling that something is going to happen. And if it does, I just hope I'm prepared for it. I'm trying not to let this consume me, but it's difficult when it feels like something's looming over me. It's like waiting for a storm to hit and you don't know how bad it's going to be when it'll arrive. I just wish I knew how to do it or how to stop it from happening. But for now, all I can do is wait and try to be ready for whatever comes my way. Shape-shifting spirit outside my home? Yesterday, a strange encounter left me feeling bewildered and unsure of what to do next. As I stepped outside my home, I came face to face with a spirit whose appearance was constantly shifting, as if they were undergoing a never-ending process of digital art editing. Their features were never static, changing every few seconds, and it was hard to keep up with the rapid pace of transformation. To make matters more perplexing, the spirit commented on my distracted state of mind, which was due to my attempt of astral planning being disrupted by my fiancé's loud snoring. Despite the strange circumstances, I didn't feel any overtly negative energy emanating from the spirit, but rather a sense of deep desperation and longing that left me feeling quite moved. The spirit then asked if it could come inside my home, to which I promptly declined, quickly returning to my body and reinforcing the house's protective barriers. However, despite my immediate reaction, I couldn't shake the sense that this spirit had been wandering aimlessly for a long time, searching for something that they couldn't seem to find. As I am situated close to a school, I also received a strong intuition that the spirit spends a lot of time around children, which only added to my growing concern Feeling a strong desire to help this lost soul, I'm now seeking any insight or guidance that can help me in my efforts to release them from their current predicament. Newbie this week sharing first experiences. Looking back on my childhood experiences, come to realize that I've had several encounters with the paranormal. One of my earliest memories was in 1977 when I was only 10 years old. I vividly remember hearing my deceased grandmother's voice speaking to me, either from across the room or directly into my ear. And this went on for decades. I always felt comforted by her presence. In 2004, my grandfather passed away and I could feel his presence in the kitchen for months afterwards. His favorite hobby was cooking, and I think he was curious to see what I was making. Sometimes I could even smell his old spice aftershave, which was a comforting reminder of him. When I was 11, my family and I were shopping in a small hardware store. We all separated to look at different things, and that's when a tall man appeared in front of me. He had haunted eyes, and he was frantic. 
asking me where his son was. I had been taught not to speak with strangers, so I was hesitant to say anything. But then he sadly nodded, and in that moment, he dissolved right in front of my eyes. It was a surreal experience and one that stayed with me for years. These are just a few highlights from my 50 plus years of life, and I knew that there had been many more encounters with the paranormal. It's not always easy to talk about, but I'm glad to have these experiences and to know that there's something beyond this physical world. My girlfriend said I might be haunted. I need some answers. This started out several years ago and I lived in a roughly 70 year old house, which isn't terribly old, but the oldest I've lived in. Within a week of moving in with my brother, we were in our separate bedrooms gaming and something made me look over my shoulder to where I saw a quick shadow in the very dark hallway. He was walking past my door towards his room and then the bathroom. I asked and he never left his room. Fast forward to a few months later, I meet my girlfriend and she starts noticing scratches all over my back mostly, but other places too. Places I can't physically reach, like in the center of my back. I chalked it up to nails or something from work as I worked in a lot of attics. They started off spontaneously, but now several years later, it's almost like two or three times a week. I have mysterious scratches in places I can't reach. I'm not the most restful sleeper. We do have that cat that likes to sleep on me but I'm never woken up from pain in the middle of the night. She often notices them when I'm showering or whatever. But most of the time, they're in the threes, which I know isn't very good. Additionally, as they become more frequent, I'm experiencing more physical symptoms like severe and worsening back pain, bad leg pain, knees getting weak. I feel like I'm going to pass out occasionally and get dizzy even while I'm sitting down, and very intense headaches that last days, even up to a week. Maybe it's just my age, but coincidentally, I'm also having not so good luck. Got laid off at my job. My girlfriend's having a high-risk pregnancy. Currently wondering, what is making the dogs bark when I don't have dogs? I'm currently visiting my family in the rural parts of Alabama, and I'm staying on a 20-acre farm with my loved ones, some horses, a barn cat, and a few other animals. The farm is completely surrounded by thick trees, making it feel secluded and far away from the hustle and bustle of the city. However, something strange is happening tonight that has kept me up and on edge. About five minutes ago, I heard a dog barking incessantly outside, and it sounded like it was very close if not from within the farm. The nearest neighbor is about half a mile away, and they don't even have dogs. The second closest neighbor is a mile away, on the same side of the highway, but separate by a quarter mile of trees. The dog won't stop barking, and it's starting to get on my nerves. As soon as I heard the dog start barking, the hairs on my neck and my arms stood up. I had a strange gut feeling that something was not right. My initial instinct was to go and investigate the source of the barking, but something inside of me told me not to go. I can hear the dog barking even now, almost outside my loft window, and it's giving me the creeps. I can't help but wonder, what is causing this incessant barking? Is it really a dog? Or is it something else entirely? The thought of it being something other than a dog makes my heart race and my palms sweat. Could it be a wild animal lurking outside? Or something even more sinister? I don't know what to do or what to think, but one thing is for sure, I won't be getting any much sleep tonight. Sometimes it sounds like my door is being punched. I've been experiencing something strange in my house lately. It's hard to explain, but sometimes it feels like someone or something is punching my door. It's not a forceful punch, more like a bump or a knock. The weirdest part is that it happens randomly, even when I'm home alone. I've tried to rationalize it by thinking maybe it's just the house settling or the wind, but it doesn't seem to fit. What's even more unsettling is that it's not just the door. I've noticed stacks of things falling without explanation as well. I can't help but feel like something's watching me from the corner of my eye. It's always just out of sight, and when I turn to look, there's nothing there started to make me feel uneasy in my own home. 
I've tried to investigate by checking for drafts or loose floorboards, but I can't seem to find anything that could explain these occurrences. But the knocking still persists. It's hard to explain, but I can't shake the feeling that it's something paranormal. Maybe there's a ghost or a spirit in my house. It's a scary thought, but it's the only explanation that seems to fit. I'm not sure what to do at this point. I've started to lock my bedroom door at night just in case. I don't want to take any chances with whatever is causing this. If anyone has any advice or had a similar experience, please let me know. I'm starting to feel like I'm losing my mind. My Nanny's Haunted House When I was younger, my nanny, my mom's mom, lived in an older house that always gave off a creepy vibe. We would hear bumps and bangs and other strange noises. My family would joke that the house was haunted, and as a result, I got to the point where I didn't even want to stay the night there unless I absolutely had to since my parents worked a lot. One night when I was 15, I was staying at my nanny's house with her and her older poodle, Brandy, the best dog ever. It was just the three of us in the house, and we were in the bathroom getting ready for bed when we heard a loud crash coming from the kitchen. We quickly rushed to the kitchen and found Brandy hiding under the kitchen table, trembling in fear. Her food dishes, which were very heavy ceramic bowls, sat in a metal dish tray, were upside down and across the kitchen from when they normally sat. There was food and water everywhere, and the stand was upside down in the middle of the kitchen. At first, we thought that Brandy had done something to cause the mess, but then we realized that the bowls and tray weighed more than she did. Plus, she was old and only weighed about eight pounds. We had no explanation for what had happened that night, but we were freaking out about the experience. Other strange things would often happen in the house, like items falling off walls and stuff like that. And looking back... I'm glad my nanny didn't live in that house anymore. It was just too creepy for me to handle. Do ghosts really exist? As the night fell and the moon cast its eerie glow upon the world, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The silence that enveloped me was deafening, and I could almost feel the eyes of the unseen watching me from the shadows. As I pondered on the existence of ghosts, a sudden chill ran down my spine. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as I felt the presence behind me. I turned around, but there was no one there. But then, I heard a faint whisper in my ear. Be careful what you wish for. Suddenly, the room was filled with a dense fog, and I could barely see anything in front of me. I heard a crackle that sent shivers down my spine, and then I saw it. A figure materialized right in front of me, dressed in a crazy outfit with Nike shoes. But it wasn't the outfit that sent a chill down my spine, it was the face. The face was twisted in an unnatural grin, and the eyes were dark and soulless. I stumbled back, trying to escape, but the figure kept coming closer. It spoke, but its voice was deep and unearthly. You wanted to play with a ghost, didn't you? Well, here I am. My heart raced as I tried to run, but I couldn't move. The figure laughed as it closed in on me, its breath cold on my face. I screamed for help, but my voice was lost in the darkness. Suddenly the figure vanished and the fog dissipated. I was alone in the dark, gasping for breath. I realized then that not all ghosts were friendly, and that sometimes it's better to leave them well enough alone. Car right behind, then nothing at all. Ghost car? One dark and quiet night, I found myself driving home alone on a deserted road in downtown Tulsa. It was around two in the morning, and I was the only one on the road. That is until I noticed another car, a grayish black one, driving erratically in front of me. As I got closer, I realized the car was all over the road, and I needed to pass it. Finally, the car moved into the right lane, and I began to pass. As I passed the car, I got a good look at it. It was a strange vehicle with a black tinted window that looked ominous in the darkness. Suddenly, the car's brights came on, and then it began to follow me, staying uncomfortably close. I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right, and I started to panic. But just as quickly as it had appeared, the car vanished from my rearview mirror, leaving me completely alone on a deserted road. 
I couldn't believe my eyes. How could a car be right behind me one minute and then disappear without a trace the next? There were no exit lines for miles, and I couldn't fathom how the car could have turned off the road so quickly. My mind raced with possibilities. Was it a ghost car, a figment of my imagination, or something more sinister? I made it home, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. For weeks after, I couldn't drive that stretch of road without feeling the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I still wonder what happened that night and what the driver of that strange car wanted with me. One of my many encounters. I remember this one encounter from four or five years ago that still gives me chills. It happened when my sister and I got home from playing volleyball, and I found that no one was home. We called our family and found out that we were at our cousin's house, and a few of our siblings would come back and pick us up. While we waited, my sister and I decided to hang out in my parents' room, because she wanted to use the computer. We closed and locked the door for some reason, and I started playing games on my phone. And she was busy clicking away on the keyboard. It was completely silent except for the sound of the mouse and keyboard when we suddenly heard a loud bang on the front door, followed by footsteps running away from it. We were both terrified by the sudden noise and just stared at each other and the door. We thought that maybe our siblings had returned, and they were playing a prank on us. So, we decided to check the whole house, every room and the garage. However, we found no one, and we immediately went back to my parents' room and locked the door again. We were shaken up by what had just happened and couldn't help but discuss the fact that we both heard footsteps running away from the door. We were lucky that our siblings arrived soon after, and we quickly ran out to meet them and told them about everything that had happened. This encounter is the one that still stands out the most for me, and it still terrifies me to this day. Back when I used to work in a half-shut-down hospital, I never experienced or encountered anything paranormal. The hospital had been closed for quite some time, but the company I worked for bought it as a satellite emergency room. However, due to lack of awareness about our services, the first few months were rather slow and uneventful. One of the doctors I worked with was into ghost hunting, and he often encouraged me to explore the old parts of the hospital during my night shifts. I wasn't really into the idea, but one night he gave me a radar and convinced me to go down to the back room. I didn't expect to find anything, but I went along anyway. As I was finishing up my exploration and preparing to go on a cigarette break, I heard a voice in the pitch darkness. It simply said, Don't smoke. I froze in place and looked down at my unlit cigarette in my hand, unable to believe what I'd just heard and what had just happened. In that moment, I was completely spooked and I immediately ran out of the room. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease and it lingered with me for days after the incident. It's worth noting that I quit smoking about five or six years ago now, and that experience may have played a role in that decision. Despite my skepticism about the paranormal, this experience definitely made me more open to the possibility that there may be more to this world than what we can see or understand. It's a memory that stayed with me for years. It's one that still gives me chills to this day. weird flash of light. To provide some context, I'm currently house-sitting for a close friend. It was approximately an hour ago at around 10.30 p.m. when I had an unnerving experience. As I was sitting in the living room, I saw a bright flash of light, akin to that of a camera flash. Given that all the blinds in the room were closed, I was almost certain that it couldn't be someone outside taking a picture of me. Additionally, I was able to confirm that there were no footprints in the snow outside which ruled out any physical presence outside the house. To assuage my fears, I checked the light bulbs and made sure none of them were burnt out. Furthermore, I thoroughly searched for any hidden cameras or motion light that could have been the source, but I found nothing, and despite my best efforts to rationalize the situation, I was left with no plausible explanation for what I had witnessed. As you can imagine, this experience is quite unsettling, especially since it caught me off guard. I couldn't easily explain it away. I'm left feeling quite confused and worried about what this could mean. 
Has anyone had a similar experience? Or could anyone offer any ideas as to what this could be? Perhaps there's something paranormal or supernatural happening in the house that I'm unaware of. It's times like these when I wish I had someone to turn to for answers, as the inexplicable nature of this occurrence has left me feeling both perplexed and uneasy. Something is jumping on my bed. What is it and why? As I lay down in my bed, a feeling of unease washes over me. I can sense that something is not quite right. Despite feeling exhausted, I'm hesitant to close my eyes and drift off to sleep. Just as I'm starting to doze off, I feel a sudden pressure on my head. I try to ignore it, but the sensation persists. It feels like something is jumping out of my bed and settling down beside my knees. At first, I think it might be my imagination, simply playing tricks on me. But the weight is too heavy for that. I can feel the entity's breath on my skin. But when I look down, there's nothing there. This is not the first time this has happened, but it's becoming more frequent. I have no pets, so I can't explain the presence of this unseen creature. It is larger than a cat, possibly the size of a fox. Despite my fear, I can't help but feel a strange sense of comfort when this creature visits me. It seems to lull me into a peaceful sleep, but the thought of an unknown entity lying beside me in bed is terrifying. I try to rationalize it, thinking it's maybe my mind playing tricks, but deep down, I know that something is there. Something I can't see, but can feel. And the idea of that something could be there is enough to make me never want to sleep again. Anybody know what this was? It was a few years ago, around seven to be exact, when I experienced something that I still can't explain to this day. I was at home with my ex-boyfriend and two other friends. My ex was standing in the doorway, one friend was sitting on the floor near the doorway, and the other was sitting on the TV stand at the foot of the bed. I was on the bed facing the doorway, and we were all just hanging out and chatting. Suddenly I jumped, and I was startled by something that I saw behind my ex. It was weird looking and looked like a black wolf that smiled, almost as if it was half human, part animal. I told my ex what I saw and he said that he felt like he was pushed too because we both jumped at the same time. That experience stayed with me for years until 2018 when I was in California. I met a guy out there who I had a prior connection to. When I was at his place, I saw the same wolf-like thing on a mask on his wall. It was a shocking realization. I couldn't help but wonder what it was and why I kept seeing it. I've been trying to gather more information about this wolf-like creature, but so far, I haven't found anything concrete. It's like it's a mystery that only a few people know about, and I'm left to wonder what it all means. All I know is that I never want to experience anything like that again, and I'll be sure to avoid any places or people that have anything to do with that creature. There's something in her attic. I live on a four-level traditional European house with my family, and our flat is situated just below an old woman's home and the attic. The woman is almost 90 years old and can barely walk, so I was understandably frightened when my brother and I started hearing someone running up and down her flat in the middle of the night. At first, I dismissed it as her being mentally ill and forgot about it. Recently, I spoke to my mother about the incident, and she shared that she hears the same noises too. However, her room's on the other side of our flat, and it's impossible for her to hear the old lady's footsteps. Instead, she hears the sounds coming from the attic. The creepy part, the noise have been going on for years, and even her neighbors living below the attic have complained about it. We regularly clean the basement and lock it up during the night, so it can't be a homeless person sneaking in. Besides, the footsteps are too loud to be from an animal or some other thing, so what else could it be? My parents also told me a spooky story from seven or eight years ago when they found all their books in the living room dropped in the middle of the room. It gave me goosebumps just hearing about it. 
I've decided to speak to my dad about this and try to place cameras around the house to get a good look at this ghost or thing. It's unsettling living in a house where you hear unexplained noises regularly, but I'm curious to find out what's causing it. Story of my life. The memories of strange occurrences still haunt me to this day. It seems as though I'm always the one to experience the unexplainable. It's almost as if I'm a magnet for the paranormal, but the events that occurred a year ago still sends chills down my spine. I was sitting in the living room with my family, enjoying a relaxing evening together, and suddenly out of nowhere I was hit in the head with a ball of paper towel. My mother and I looked around searching for an explanation, but there was none to be found. It was as if the ball had appeared out of thin air. Curiosity got the better of me and I decided to throw the ball in front of me to see what would happen. To my shock, a few minutes later I was hit again. It was as if someone or something was playing a game of catch with me. My family and I searched the room, but no one was there. We were all alone, yet we were not. The attacks continued until I decided to put the ball on a high shelf and leave it there. It was the only way to make it stop. But even after that, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me, waiting for me to let my guard down so we could strike again. I eventually moved out, hoping to escape the strange occurrences that seemed to follow me wherever I went. For a while, things were good, but I can never forget that feeling of being watched or the inexplicable events that occurred that night. I fear that they will never truly leave me alone. Saw a shadow figure under a bridge. It was a dark and eerie night, the kind that sent shivers down your spine. The group of friends were gathered under the bridge, surrounded by graffiti that adorned the walls. They were having a good time taking pictures and chatting about nothing in particular. That's when it happened. Out of the corner of her eye, one of the girls saw a shadowy figure sitting on the far right of the ledge. She rubbed her eyes, thinking it was just a trick of the light. But the figure remained. It was a man sitting there quietly, as if observing them. The girl tried to ignore it, thinking she was just imagining things, but the figure remained, almost taunting her. As the conversation turned to the paranormal, the girl finally spoke up and mentioned what she had seen. To her surprise, her friend confirmed that she had seen the figure too. They both felt a sense of dread as they realized that they were not alone. The figure remained watching them silently. The girl decided to leave, unable to shake off the feeling of unease. She walked away alone, praying and hoping that she would make it home safely. As she walked, she couldn't help but feel like the figure was following her. She quickened her pace, but the feeling only grew stronger. Finally, she made it home safe and sound. But the memory of that night would haunt her forever. She never went back to that bridge at night, afraid of what else she might see. There's a ghost in my laundry room. One day, as I was going to go do laundry... I went to close the laundry door, but to my surprise, I couldn't. It was as though something or someone was holding the door back. As I walked into the room, I felt an icy cold breeze that was uncharacteristic of the usually hot and stuffy laundry room, and in that moment, I realized that a ghost was present in my laundry room. At first, the thought of calling a priest or a paranormal investigator crossed my mind. However, upon further reflection, I realized that this ghost was harmless, and only wanted to play around. Although it could be unsettling to hear the laundry room door slowly open by itself, or feel its presence, it never caused me any harm. Initially, the ghost used to hold the door back frequently and prevent me from closing it. However, after a while, it seemed to grow bored of this activity and stop doing it. It still lingers in the laundry room, not really doing anything, but I know it's there. Overall, despite the spooky nature of the situation, it's become part of my everyday life, and I've grown accustomed to the presence of this friendly ghost. <laughs> 